Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Journey to the End of the Night by Louis Ferdinand Céline, translated from the French by Ralph Mannheim, narrated by David Colacci. Our life is a journey through winter and night. We look for our way in a sky without light. Song of the Swiss Guards, 1793 Travel is useful. It exercises the imagination. All the rest is disappointment and fatigue. Our journey is entirely imaginary. That is its strength. It goes from life to death. People, animals, cities, things, all are imagined. It's a novel, just a fictitious narrative. Littre says so, and he's never wrong. And besides, in the first place, anyone can do as much. You just have to close your eyes. It's on the other side of life. Preface to the 1952 Gallimard edition Hey, they're putting Journey on the rails again. What a feeling it gives me. A lot of things have happened in fourteen years. If I weren't under so much pressure, forced to earn my living, I can tell you right now I'd suppress the whole thing. I wouldn't let a single line through. Everything gets taken the wrong way. I've been the cause of too much evil. Just think of all the deaths, the hatreds around me, the treachery, the sewer it adds up to, the monsters. Oh, you've got to be blind and deaf. You'll say, but it's not Journey, it's your crimes that are killing you. Journey has nothing to do with it. You yourself have been your ruin. Your bagatelles, your abominable lingo, your imaging, clowning, villainy. The laws clutching you, strangling you. Hell, what are you complaining about, you jerk? Oh, many thanks, many thanks. I'm raging, fuming, panting, with hatred. Hypocrites, jugheads. You can't fool me, it's for journey that they're after me. Under the axe I'll bellow it. Between them and me it's to the finish, to the guts, too foul to talk about, pissed with mystique. What a business. If I weren't under pressure, forced to earn my living, I'm telling you right now, I'd suppress the whole lot. The homage I paid to jackals. That's right, a free gift, a tip. I threw my luck away, in thirty-six, gave it to the executioner's wives, the prosecutors, the undertakers— one, two, three admirable books to cut my throat with. Then listen to my groans. I made them a present. I was charitable, that's all. A world of intentions amuses me. Used to amuse me. Not any more. If I weren't under such pressure, such duress, I'd suppress the whole lot, especially Journey. Of all my books, it's the only really vicious one. That's right the heart of my sensibility. It'll start all over again. The Sarabath. You'll hear a whistling from above, from far away, from places without names, words, orders. You'll get an eyeful of their machinations. You'll come and tell me about it. Oh, don't imagine that I'm playing. I've stopped playing. I've even stopped being amiable. If I weren't under duress, as though standing with my back to something— I'd suppress the whole lot. Here's how it started. I'd never said a word, not one word. It was Arthur Gannat that made me speak up. Arthur was a friend from med school. So we meet on the Place Clichy. It was after breakfast. He wants to talk to me. I listen. Not out here, he says. Let's go in. We go in. And there we were. This terrace, he says, is for jerks. Come on over there. Then we see that there's not a soul in the street because of the heat. No cars, nothing. Same when it's very cold. Not a soul in the street. I remember now it was him who had said one time, The people in Paris always look busy when all they actually do is roam around from morning to night. It's obvious, because when the weather isn't right for walking around, when it's too cold or too hot, you don't see them anymore. 
They're all indoors, drinking their café creme or their beers. And that's the truth. The century of speed, they call it. Where? Great changes, they say. For instance, nothing has changed. They go on admiring themselves, that's all. And that's not new either. Words. Even the words haven't changed much. Two or three little ones here and there. Pleased at having proclaimed these useful truths, we sat looking at the ladies in the café. After a while, the conversation turned to President Poincaré, who was due to inaugurate a puppy show that same morning, and that led to Letton, where I'd read about it. Arthur Banat starts kidding me about Letton. What a paper, he says. When it comes to defending the French race, it hasn't its equal. And, quick to show I'm well informed, I fire back. The French race can do with some defending, seeing it doesn't exist. Oh, yes, it does, he says. And a fine race it is. The finest in the world, and anybody who says different is a yellow dog. And he starts slanging me. Naturally, I stuck to my guns. It's not true. What you call a race is nothing but a collection of riffraff like me, bleary-eyed, flea-bitten, chilled to the bone. They came from the four corners of the earth, driven by hunger, plague, tumors, and the cold, and stopped here. They couldn't go any further because of the ocean. That's France. That's the French people. Pardon me, he says very gravely and a bit sadly. Our forefathers were as good as we are. Don't speak ill of them. You're right, Arthur. There you're right. Hateful and spineless, raped and robbed, mangled and witless, they were as good as we are. You can say that again. We never change. Neither our socks, nor our masters, nor our opinions. And we're so slow about it that it's no use. We were born loyal, and that's what killed us. Soldiers free of charge. Heroes for everyone else, talking monkeys, tortured words. We are the minions of King Misery. He's our lord and master. When we misbehave, he tightens his grip. His fingers are around our neck. That makes it hard to talk. Got to be careful if we want to eat. For nothing at all, he'll choke you. It's not a life. There's love, Bartimou. Arthur, I tell him. Love is the infinite placed within reach of the poodles. I have my dignity. You do, do you? You're an anarchist, that's what you are. A wise guy, as you see, with only the most advanced opinions. That's right, you windbag, I'm an anarchist. And to prove it, I've written a kind of prayer of social vengeance. It'll bowl you over. The Golden Wings, that's the title. And I recite... A god who counts minutes and pennies, a desperate sensual god who grunts like a pig, a pig with golden wings who falls and falls, always belly side up, ready for caresses. That's him, our master. Come, kiss me. Your little peace doesn't hold water, he says. I'm for the established order, and I'm not interested in politics. What's more, the day my country asks me to shed my blood, it'll find me ready and no slacker. That's what he said. It so happened that the war was creeping up on us without our knowing it, and something was wrong with my wits. That short but animated discussion had tired me out. Besides, I was upset because the waiter had sort of called me a piker on account of the tip. Well, in the end, Arthur and I made up. Completely. We agreed about almost everything. It's true, I said, trying to be conciliatory. All in all, you're right. But the fact is, we're all sitting in a big galley, pulling at the oars with all our might. You can't tell me different. Sitting on nails and pulling like mad. And what do we get for it? Nothing. Thrashings and misery, hard words and hard knocks. We're workers, they say. Work, they call it. That's the crummiest part of the whole business. We're down in the hold, heaving and panting, stinking and sweating our balls off, and meanwhile, up on deck in the fresh air, what do you see? 
our masters having a fine time with beautiful pink and perfumed women on their laps. They send for us, we're brought up on deck. They put on their top hats and give us a big spiel, like as follows. You know, good swine, we're at war. Those stinkers in country number two. We're going to board them and cut their livers out. Let's go, let's go. We've got everything we need on board. All together now, let's hear you shout so the deck trembles. Long live country number one. So you'll be heard for miles around. The man who shouts the loudest will get a medal and a lollipop. Let's go, and if there's anybody that doesn't want to be killed on the sea, he can go and get killed on land. It's even quicker. That's the way it is exactly, said Arthur, suddenly willing to listen to reason. But just then... Who should come marching past the cafe where we're sitting but a regiment with the colonel up front on his horse, looking nice and friendly, a fine figure of a man? Enthusiasm lifted me to my feet. I'll just go see if that's the way it is, I sing out to Arthur, and off I go to enlist on the double. Ferdinand, he yells back, don't be an ass! I suppose he was nettled by the effect my heroism was having on the people all around us. It kind of hurt my feelings the way he was taking it, but that didn't stop me. I fell right in. Here I am, I says to myself, and here I stay. I just had time to call out to Arthur, All right, you jerk, we'll see, before we turned the corner. And there I was with the regiment. "'marching behind the colonel and his band. "'That's exactly how it happened. "'We marched a long time. "'There were streets and more streets, "'and they were all crowded with civilians and their wives, "'cheering us on, bombarding us with flowers "'from cafe terraces, railroad stations, crowded churches. "'You never saw so many patriots in all your life. "'And then there were fewer patriots.' It started to rain, and then there were still fewer and fewer, and not a single cheer, not one. Pretty soon there was nobody but us. We were all alone, row after row. The music had stopped. Come to think of it, I said to myself when I saw what was what, this is no fun any more. I'd better try something else. I was about to clear out. Too late. They'd quietly shut the gate behind us civilians. We were caught like rats. When you're in, you're in. They put us on horseback, and after we'd been on horseback for two months, they put us back on our feet. Maybe because of the expense. Anyway, one morning the colonel was looking for his horse. His orderly had made off with it. Nobody knew where to. Probably some quiet spot that bullets couldn't get to as easily as the middle of the road. Because that was exactly where the colonel and I had finally stationed ourselves, with me holding his orderly book while he wrote out his orders. Down the road, way in the distance, as far as we could see, there were two black dots, plunk in the middle like us. But they were two Germans, and they'd been busy shooting for the last fifteen or twenty minutes. Maybe our colonel knew why they were shooting, maybe the Germans knew, but I, so help me, hadn't the vaguest idea. As far back as I could search my memory, I hadn't done a thing to the Germans. I'd always treated them friendly and polite. I knew the Germans pretty well. I'd even gone to school in their country when I was little, near Hanover. I'd spoken their language. A bunch of loud-mouthed little half-wits, that's what they were, with pale, furtive eyes like wolves. We'd go out to the woods together after school to feel the girls up, or we'd fire pop-guns or pistols you could buy for four marks. And we drank sugary beer together. But from that to shooting at us right in the middle of the road without so much as a word of introduction was a long way, a very long way. If you ask me, they were going too far. The war, in fact, made no sense at all. It couldn't go on. Had something weird gotten into these people? Something I didn't feel at all? 
I suppose I hadn't noticed it. Anyway, my feelings toward them hadn't changed. In spite of everything, I'd have liked to understand their brutality. But what I wanted still more, enormously, with all my heart, was to get out of there, because suddenly the whole business looked to me like a great big mistake. In a mess like this, I said to myself, there's nothing to be done. All you can do is clear out. Over our heads, two millimeters, maybe one millimeter from our temples, those long, tempting lines of steel that bullets make when they're out to kill you were whistling through the hot summer air. I'd never felt so useless as I did amid all those bullets in the sunlight, a vast and universal mockery. I was only twenty at the time. Deserted farms in the distance, empty, wide-open churches, as if the peasants had gone out for the day to attend a fair at the other end of the county, leaving everything they owned with us for safekeeping. Their countryside, their carts with the shafts pointing in the air, their fields, their barnyards, the road, the trees, even the cows, a chained dog, the works, leaving us free to do as we pleased while they were gone. Nice of them, in a way. Still, I said to myself, if they hadn't gone somewhere else, if there were still somebody here, I'm sure we wouldn't be behaving so badly, so disgustingly. We wouldn't dare in front of them. But there wasn't a soul to watch us. Nobody but us. Like newlyweds that start messing around when all the people have gone home. And another thought I had, behind a tree, was that I wished Deroulède, the one I'd heard so much about, had been there to describe his reactions when a ball tore open his guts. Those Germans squatting on the road, shooting so obstinately, were rotten shots, but they seemed to have ammunition to burn, whole warehouses full, it looked to me. Nobody could say this war was over. I have to hand it to the colonel. His bravery was remarkable. He roamed around in the middle of the road, up and down and back and forth in the midst of the bullets as calmly as if he'd been waiting for a friend on a station platform, except just a tiny bit impatient. One thing I'd better tell you right away. I'd never been able to stomach the country. I'd always found it dreary, those endless fields of mud, those houses where nobody's ever home, those roads that don't go anywhere. And if to all that you add a war, it's completely unbearable. A sudden wind had come up on both sides of the road. The clattering leaves of the poplars mingled with the sharp crackling sounds aimed at us from down the road. Those unknown soldiers missed us every time, but they spun a thousand deaths around us. So close they seemed to clothe us. I was afraid to move. That colonel, I could see, was a monster. Now I knew it for sure. He was worse than a dog. He couldn't conceive of his own death. At the same time, I realized that there must be plenty of brave men like him in our army, and just as many, no doubt, in the army facing us. How many, I wondered? One or two million? Say, several millions in all? The thought turned my fear to panic. With such people, this infernal lunacy could go on forever. Why would they stop? Never had the world seemed so implacably doomed. Could I, I thought, be the last coward on earth? How terrifying! All alone with two million stark, raving, heroic madmen armed to the eyeballs? With and without helmets, without horses, on motorcycles, bellowing, in cars, screeching, shooting, plotting, flying, kneeling, digging, taking cover, bounding over trails, root toot tooting, shut up on earth as if it were a loony bin, ready to demolish everything on it, Germany, France, whole continents, everything that breathes, destroy, destroy, madder than mad dogs, worshipping their madness, which dogs don't, a hundred, a thousand times madder than a thousand dogs, and a lot more vicious. A pretty mess we were in. No doubt about it. 
This crusade I'd let myself in for was the apocalypse. You can be a virgin in horror the same as in sex. How, when I left Place Clichy, could I have imagined such horror? Who could have suspected, before getting really into the war, all the ingredients that go to make up the rotten, heroic, good-for-nothing soul of man? And there I was, caught up in a mass flight into collective murder, into the fiery furnace. Something had come up from the depths, and this is what happened. The colonel was still as cool as a cucumber. I watched him as he stood on the embankment, taking little messages sent by the general, reading them without haste as the bullets flew all around him and tearing them into little pieces. Did none of those messages include an order to put an immediate stop to this abomination? Did no top brass tell him there had been a misunderstanding, a horrible mistake, a misdeal, that somebody had got it all wrong, that the plan had been for maneuvers, a sham battle, not a massacre? Not at all. Keep it up, Colonel, you're doing fine. That's what General Desentrier, the head of our division and commander over us all, must have written in those notes that were being brought every five minutes by a courier, who looked greener and more shitless each time. I could have palled up with that boy. We'd have been scared together. But we had no time to fraternize. So there was no mistake? So there was no law against people shooting at people they couldn't even see. It was one of the things you could do without anybody reading you the riot act. In fact, it was recognized and probably encouraged by upstanding citizens, like the draft or marriage or hunting. No two ways about it. I was suddenly on the most intimate terms with war. I'd lost my virginity. You've got to be pretty much alone with her, as I was then, to get a good look at her. The slut. Full face and profile. A war had been switched on between us and the other side, and now it was burning, like the current between the two carbons of an arc lamp. And this lamp was in no hurry to go out. It would get us all, the colonel and everyone else. He looked pretty spiffy now, but he wouldn't roast up any bigger than me when the current from the other side got him between the shoulders. There are different ways of being condemned to death. Oh, what wouldn't I have given to be in jail instead of here? What a fool I'd been! If only I'd had a little foresight and stolen something or other, when it would have been so easy and there was still time. I never think of anything. You come out of jail alive. Out of a war you don't. The rest is blarney. If only I'd had time. But I didn't. There was nothing left to steal. How pleasant it would be in a cozy little jailhouse, I said to myself, where the bullets couldn't get in where they never got in. I knew of one that was ready and waiting, all sunny and warm. I saw it in my dreams. The jailhouse of Saint-Germain, to be exact, right near the forest. I knew it well. I'd often pass that way. How a man changes. I was a child in those days, and that jail frightened me, because I didn't know what men are like. Never again will I believe what they say or what they think. Men are the thing to be afraid of, always. Men and nothing else. How much longer would this madness have to go on before these monsters dropped with exhaustion? How long could a convulsion like this last? Months? Years? How many? Maybe till everyone's dead? All these lunatics? every last one of them. And seeing events were taking such a desperate turn, I decided to stake everything on one throw, to make one last try, to see if I couldn't stop the war, just me, all by myself, at least in this one spot where I happened to be. The colonel was only two steps away from me, pacing. I'd talked to him, something I'd never done. This was a time for daring. The way things stood, there was practically nothing to lose. 
"'What is it?' he'd ask me, startled, I imagine, at my bold interruption. Then I'd explain the situation as I saw it, and we'd see what he thought. The essential is to talk things over. Two heads are better than one. I was about to take that decisive step when, at that very moment, who should arrive on the double but a dismounted cavalryman, as we said in those days, exhausted, shaky in the joints, holding his helmet upside down in one hand like Belisarius, trembling all covered with mud, his face even greener than the courier I mentioned before. He stammered and gulped. You'd have thought he was struggling to climb out of a tomb, and it made him sick to his stomach. Could it be that this spook didn't like bullets any more than I did? That he saw them coming, like me? What is it? Disturbed, the colonel stopped him short. The glance he flung at that ghost was of steel. It made our colonel very angry to see that wretched cavalryman so incorrectly clad and shitting in his pants with fright. The colonel had no use for fear, that was a sure thing. And especially that helmet held in hand like a bowler was really too much in a combat regiment like ours that was just getting into the war. It was as if this dismounted cavalryman had seen the war and taken his hat off in greeting. Under the colonel's withering look, the wobbly messenger snapped to attention, pressing his little finger to the seam of his trousers as the occasion demanded. And so he stood on the embankment, stiff as a board, swaying, the sweat running down his chin strap. His jaws were trembling so hard that little abortive cries kept coming out of him, like a puppy dreaming. You couldn't make out whether he wanted to speak to us or whether he was crying. Our Germans, squatting at the end of the road, had just changed instruments. Now they were having their fun with a machine gun, sputtering like handfuls of matches, and all around us flew swarms of angry bullets as hostile as wasps. The man finally managed to articulate a few words. Colonel, sir, Sergeant Barus has been killed. So what? He was on his way to meet the breadwagon on the Etrape Road, sir. So what? He was blown up by a shell. So what, damn it? That's what, Colonel, sir. Is that all? Yes, sir, that's all, Colonel, sir. What about the bread? the colonel asked. That was the end of the dialogue, because, I remember distinctly, he barely had time to say, what about the bread? That was all. After that there was nothing but flame and noise, the kind of noise you wouldn't have thought possible. Our eyes, ears, nose, and mouth were so full of that noise I thought it was all over and I'd turned into noise and flame myself. After a while the flame went away. The noise stayed in my head, and my arms and legs trembled as if somebody were shaking me from behind. My limbs seemed to be leaving me, but then in the end they stayed on. The smoke stung my eyes for a long time, and the prickly smell of powder and sulfur hung on, strong enough to kill all the fleas and bedbugs in the whole world. I thought of Sergeant Barus, who had just gone up in smoke, like the man told us. That was good news. Great, I thought to myself. That makes one less stinker in the regiment. He wanted to have me court-martialed for a can of meat. It's an ill wind, I said to myself. In that respect, you couldn't deny it. The war seemed to serve a purpose now and then. I knew of three or four more in the regiment, real scum, that I'd have gladly helped to make the acquaintance of a shell like Barus. As for the colonel, I didn't wish him any hard luck. But he was dead, too. At first I didn't see him. The blast had carried him up the embankment and laid him down on his side, right in the arms of the dismounted cavalryman, the courier, who was finished, too. They were embracing each other for the moment, and for all eternity. But the cavalryman's head was gone. All he had was an opening at the top of the neck, with blood in it bubbling and glugging like jam in a kettle. 
The colonel's belly was wide open, and he was making a nasty face about it. It must have hurt when it happened. Tough shit for him. If he'd beat it when the shooting started, it wouldn't have happened. All that tangled meat was bleeding profusely. Shells were still bursting to the right and left of the scene. I'd had enough. I was glad to have such a good pretext for making myself scarce. I even hummed a tune and reeled like when you've been rowing a long way and your legs are wobbly. Just one shell, I said to myself. Amazing how quick just one shell can clean things up. Could you believe it? I kept saying to myself, Could you believe it? There was nobody left at the end of the road. The Germans were gone. But that little episode had taught me a quick lesson, to keep to the cover of the trees. I was in a hurry to get back to our command post to see if anyone else in our regiment had been killed on reconnaissance. There must be some good dodges, I said to myself, for getting taken prisoner. Here and there in the field a few puffs of smoke still clung to the ground. Maybe they're all dead, I thought. Seeing they refused to understand anything whatsoever, the best solution would be for them all to get killed instantly. The war would be over and we'd go home. Maybe we'd march across the Place Clichy in triumph, just one or two survivors. In my dream, strapping good fellows marching behind the general, all the rest would be dead like the colonel, like Barus, like Van Ey another bastard, etc. They'd shower us with decorations and flowers. We'd march through the Arc de Triomphe. We'd go to a restaurant. They'd serve us free of charge. We'd never pay for anything any more, never as long as we lived. We're heroes, we'd say when they brought the bill. Defenders of the patrie. That would do it. We'd pay with little French flags. The lady at the cash desk would refuse to take money from heroes. She'd even give us some, with kisses thrown in as we filed out. Life would be worth living. As I was running, I noticed my arm was bleeding. Just a little, though. A far from satisfactory wound. A scratch. I'd have to start all over. It was raining again. The fields of Flanders oozed with dirty water. For a long time I didn't meet a soul, only the wind and a little later the sun. From time to time I couldn't tell from where a bullet would come flying merrily through the air and sunshine, looking for me, intent on killing me there in the wilderness. Why? Never again. Not if I lived another hundred years would I go walking in the country. A solemn oath. Walking along, I remembered the ceremony of the day before. It had taken place in a meadow at the foot of a hill. The colonel had harangued the regiment in his booming voice. Go to it, boys, he had cried. Go to it, boys, and vive la France! When you have no imagination, dying is small beer. When you do have an imagination... Dying is too much. That's my opinion. My understanding has never taken in so many things at once. The colonel had never had any imagination. That was the source of all his trouble, and of ours even more so. Was I the only man in that regiment with any imagination about death? I preferred my own kind of death, the kind that comes late— in twenty years, thirty, maybe more, to this death they were trying to deal me right away, eating Flanders mud, my whole mouth full of it, fuller than full, split to the ears by a shell fragment. A man's entitled to an opinion about his own death. But which way, if that was the case, should I go? Straight ahead? My back to the enemy? If the M.P.s were to catch me roaming around, I knew my goose was cooked. They'd give me a slapdash trial that same afternoon in some deserted classroom. There were lots of empty classrooms wherever we went. They'd play court-martial with me the way kids play when the teacher isn't there. The non-coms seated on the platform, 
me standing in handcuffs in front of the little desks. In the morning, they'd shoot me. Twelve bullets plus one. So what was the answer? And I thought of the colonel again. Such a brave man with his breastplate and his helmet and his mustache. If they had exhibited him in a music hall, walking as I saw him under the bullets and shell fire, he'd have filled the Alhambra. He'd have outshone Fragson. And he was a big star at the time I'm telling you about. That's what I was thinking. My heart was down in the dumps. After hours and hours of cautious, furtive walking, I finally caught sight of our men near a clump of farmhouses. That was one of our advance posts. It belonged to a squadron that was billeted nearby. Nobody killed, they told me, every last one of them alive. I was the one with the big news. The colonel's dead, I shouted as soon as I was near enough. Plenty more colonels where he came from. That was the snappy comeback of Corporal Pistil, who was on duty just then. What's more, he was organizing details. All right, you jerk. Until they find a replacement for the colonel, you can be picking up meat with Ampuy and Kerdankov here. Take two sacks each. The distribution point is behind the church, the one you see over there. Don't let them give you a lot of bones like yesterday, and try and get back before nightfall, you lugs. So I hit the road again with the other two. That pissed me off. I'll never tell them anything after this, I said to myself. I could see it was no use talking to those slobs. A tragedy like what I'd just seen was wasted on such stinkers. It had happened too long ago to capture their interest. And to think that a week earlier they'd have given me four columns in my picture in the papers for the death of a colonel the way I'd seen it. A bunch of half-wits. The meat for the whole regiment was being distributed in a summery field shaded by cherry trees and parched by the August sun. On sacks and tent cloths spread out on the grass there were pounds and pounds of guts, chunks of white and yellow fat, disemboweled sheep with their organs every which way, oozing intricate little rivulets into the grass round about, a whole ox split down the middle hanging on a tree, and four regimental butchers all hacking away at it, cursing and swearing and pulling off choice morsels. The squadrons were fighting tooth and nail over the innards, especially the kidneys, and all around them swarms of flies, such as one sees only on such occasions, as self-important and musical as little birds. Blood and more blood everywhere, all over the grass, in sluggish, confluent puddles, looking for a congenial slope. A few steps further on, the last pig was being killed. Already four men and a butcher were fighting over certain of the prospective cuts. "'You crook, you! You're the one that made off with a tenderloin yesterday!' Leaning against a tree, I had barely time enough to honor that alimentary dispute with two or three glances before being overcome by an enormous urge to vomit, which I did so hard that I passed out. They carried me back to the outfit on a stretcher. Naturally, they swiped my two oilcloth sacks. The change was too good to miss. I woke up to one of the corporal's harangues. The war wasn't over. Anything can happen, and I, in my turn, became a corporal at the end of that same month of August. Many a time I was sent to headquarters with five men for liaison duty under General des Entriers. He was a little man, he didn't say much, and at first sight he seemed neither cruel nor heroic but it was safer to suspend judgment. What he seemed to value most of all was his comfort. In fact, he thought of his comfort all the time, and even when we'd been busy retreating for more than a month, he'd chew everybody out in every new stopping place if his orderly hadn't found him a nice clean bed in a kitchen with all the modern appliances. 
This love of comfort gave our chief of staff a lot of trouble. The general's domestic requirements got on his nerves, especially since he himself, yellow, gastritic in the extreme and constipated, wasn't the least bit interested in food. But he had to eat his soft-boiled eggs at the general's table all the same and listen on that occasion to his complaints. Those are the things a soldier has to put up with. But I couldn't feel sorry for him, because as an officer he was a first-rate swine. Judge for yourself. After a whole day spent dragging ourselves uphill and down glade through carrots and clover, we'd finally stop so the general could get to sleep somewhere. We'd find him a quiet, sheltered village where no troops had been billeted yet, or if they had been, they'd have to move on in a hurry. We'd throw them out even if they'd already stacked their rifles, and they'd just have to spend the night in the open. The village was reserved for the general staff, its horses, its mess, its luggage, and not least for that stinking major. The bastard's name was Pinson. Major Pinson. I hope they've killed him off by now, and not pleasantly. But at the time I'm talking about, Pinson was disgustingly alive. Every evening he'd send for us liaison men and give us a good chewing out to keep us on our toes and fire us with enthusiasm. Then he'd send us all over the place, after we'd run errands for the general all day. Dismount! Mount! Dismount again! and more of the same, carrying his orders in all directions. They might just as well have drowned us. It would have been more convenient for everybody. Dismissed, he'd yell. Get back to your regiments and on the double. Where is the regiment, sir? we'd ask. At Barbigny. Where's Barbigny? Over there. Over there, where he pointed, there'd be nothing but darkness same as everywhere else, an enormous darkness that swallowed up the road two steps ahead of us, only a little sliver of road about the size of your tongue was spared by the darkness. This Barbigny of his was at the end of the world. Try and find it. To find his Barbigny you'd have had to sacrifice at least a whole squadron. A squadron of brave men, what's more. And I wasn't brave at all. I couldn't see any reason to be brave, so obviously I had less desire than anyone else to find his Barbigny, the situation of which, incidentally, was pure guesswork as far as he was concerned. Maybe they thought they could make me go and commit suicide if they yelled loud enough. But either you have it in you or you don't. I knew only one thing about that blackness, which was so dense you had the impression that if you stretched out your arm a little way from your shoulder you'd never see it again, but of that one thing I was absolutely certain, namely, that it was full of homicidal impulses. As soon as night fell, that big mouth major couldn't wait to send us to our deaths. It was something that came over him at sundown. We'd try a bit of passive resistance. We'd pretend not to understand. We'd try to take root in that cozy little billet. But when we finally couldn't see the trees, we had to resign ourselves to going away and dying a little. The general's dinner was ready. From then on, it was all a matter of luck. Sometimes we'd find Barbigny and the regiment, and sometimes we wouldn't. When we found it, it was mostly by mistake because the squadron sentries would start shooting at us. So naturally we'd advance and be recognized and usually spend the night doing all sorts of details, carrying numberless bales of oats and buckets of water and getting chewed out till our heads reeled, in addition to dropping with sleep. In the morning our liaison team, all five of us, would report back to General des Entriers and get on with the war. But most of the time we didn't find the regiment, and we'd circle around villages on unknown trails, keeping away from evacuated hamlets and treacherous thickets, as much as possible we avoided those kinds of things because of German patrols. We had to be somewhere, though, while waiting, somewhere in the darkness. Some things couldn't be avoided. Ever since then I've known how wild rabbits must feel. 
Pity comes in funny ways. If we'd told Major Pinson that he was nothing but a cowardly, stinking murderer, we'd only have given him pleasure. The pleasure of having us shot without delay by the M.P. captain, who was always following him around and who lived for nothing else. It wasn't the Germans that M.P. had it in for. So for night after idiotic night we crept from ambush to ambush, sustained only by the decreasingly plausible hope of coming out alive, that and no other. And if we did come out alive, one thing was sure, that we'd never, absolutely never, forget that we had discovered on earth a man shaped like you and me, but a thousand times more ferocious than the crocodiles and sharks with wide-open jaws that circle just below the surface around the shiploads of garbage and rotten meat that get chucked overboard in the Havana roadstead. The biggest defeat in every department of life is to forget, especially the things that have done you in, and to die without realizing how far people can go in the way of crumminess. When the grave lies open before us, let's not try to be witty, but on the other hand, let's not forget, but make it our business to record the worst of the human viciousness we've seen without changing one word. When that's done, we can curl up our toes and sink into the pit. That's work enough for a lifetime. I'd gladly have fed Major Pinson to the sharks and his M.P. with him to teach them how to live. My horse, too, while I was at it, so he wouldn't have to suffer any more. The poor fellow didn't have any back left, it was so sore. Only two plaques of raw flesh under the saddle, as big as my two hands, oozing rivers of pus that ran from the edges of his blanket down to his hocks. I had to ride him all the same. Trot, trot. That trot, trot made him wriggle and writhe. But horses are even more patient than people. His trot was an undulation. I had to leave him out in the open. In a barn, the smell of his open wounds would have been asphyxiating. When I mounted him, his back hurt him so badly that he arched it, oh, very politely, and his belly hung down to his knees. It felt like mounting a donkey. It was easier that way, I have to admit. We were plenty tired ourselves with all the steel we had to carry on our heads and shoulders. General des Entriers was waiting for his dinner in his specially requisitioned house. The table had been set. The lamp was in its place. "'Beat it! Christ Almighty! The whole lot of you!' Pinson yelled at us one more time, shaking his lantern under our noses. "'We're sitting down to table! I'm telling you for the last time! Are those swine ever going to go?' he screamed. The passion of sending us to our death put a little color into his diaphanous cheeks. Sometimes the general's cook would slip us a bite before we left. The general had too much to eat, seeing the regulations allowed him forty rations all for himself. He wasn't a young man any more. In fact, he must have been close to retirement age. His knees buckled when he walked, and I'm pretty sure he dyed his mustache. The veins in his temples, we could see in the lamplight as we were leaving, described meanders like the Seine on its way out of Paris. He had grown-up daughters, so it was said, unmarried, and, like himself, not rich. Maybe those were the thoughts that made him so crotchety cranky, like an old dog disturbed in his habits, who goes looking for his quilted basket whenever anyone opens the door for him. He loved beautiful gardens and rose bushes. Wherever he went, he never passed up a rose garden. When it comes to loving roses, generals haven't their equal. It's a known fact. Anyway, we finally set out. It was hard to get the plug started. They were afraid to move because of their wounds, but in addition they were afraid of us and the darkness, afraid of everything to tell the truth. So are we. A dozen times we went back to ask the Major for directions. A dozen times he cursed us for gold bricks and goof-offs. Finally, with the help of our spurs, we'd pass the last outpost, give the sentries the password, and plunge into our murky adventure, 
into the darkness of this no-man's land. After wandering a while from side to side of the darkness, we finally got part of our bearings, or so at least we thought. Whenever one cloud seemed lighter than another, we were convinced that we'd seen something. But up ahead of us, there was nothing we could be sure of but the echo that came and went. The echo of our horse's hoofbeats, a horrendous sound you wanted so bad not to hear that it stopped your breath. Those horses seemed to be trotting to high heaven, to be calling everybody on earth to come and massacre us. And they could have done it with one hand, just steady a rifle against a tree and wait for us. I kept thinking that the first light we'd see would be the flash of the shot that would end it all. In the four weeks the war had been going on, we'd grown so tired, so miserable, that tiredness had taken away some of my fear. In the end, the torture of being harassed night and day by those monsters, the non-coms, especially the low-ranking ones, who were even stupider, pettier, and more hateful than usual— made even the most obstinate among us doubt the advisability of going on living. Oh, how you long to get away! To sleep, that's the main thing. When it becomes really impossible to get away and sleep, then the will to live evaporates of its own accord. Seeing we were still alive, we'd just have to look as if we were looking for our regiment. Before a thought can start up in the brain of a jughead, a lot of cruel things must happen to him. The man who had made me think for the first time in my life, really think, practical thoughts that were really my own, was undoubtedly Major Pinson, that torture master. I therefore thought of him as hard as I could as I clanked along, crushed by the weight of my armor, an extra in this incredible international extravaganza into which, I have to admit, I had leapt with enthusiasm. Every yard of darkness ahead of us was a promise of death and destruction. But how would it come? The only element of uncertainty was the uniform of the killer. Would he be one of us, or of them? I hadn't done anything to Pinson, no more than I had to the Germans. With his face like a rotten peach— his four bands that glittered all over him from his head to his belly button, his scraggly mustache and his bony knees, with his field glasses dangling from his neck like a cowbell and his one-to-one-thousand map. I kept wondering why he was so intent on sending other people to their death, other people who had no maps. We four horsemen on the road were making as much noise as a battalion— they must have heard us coming ten miles away, or else they didn't want to hear us. That was always a possibility. Maybe the Germans were afraid of us. Why not? A month of sleepiness on every eyelid. That's what we were carrying. And as much again in the backs of our heads, plus all those pounds of tin. The men in my party didn't express themselves very well. Actually, they hardly spoke at all. They'd come from the ends of Brittany, and what they knew they hadn't learned at school but in the army. That night I tried to make a little conversation about the village of Barbigny with the one next to me. His name was Kersuzan. Kersuzan, I say. We're in the Ardennes now. Do you see anything in the distance? I don't see a damn thing. It's as black as an asshole, Kersuzon says. That was enough. But, I suggest, haven't you heard anyone mention Barbigny in the course of the day? Give you an idea where it is? No. That was that. We never did find Barbigny. We went around in circles until morning and ended up in another village, where the man with the field glasses was waiting for us. The general was taking his black coffee in the arbor outside the mayor's house when we got there. "'Ah, Pinson,' he says in a loud voice to his chief of staff as he sees us pass. "'Youth is so wonderful!' After that he went out for a leak and then, stooped over, his hands behind his back— he took a little stroll. 
The general was very tired that morning, the orderly confided to me. He'd slept badly. Some trouble with his bladder, so it seemed. Kersuzon always gave me the same answer when I questioned him at night, as if I'd pressed a button. It kind of tickled me. Two or three times more he said the same thing about the asshole darkness, and a while after that he was killed. On his way out of some village, we'd mistaken for some other village by some French soldiers who'd mistaken us for somebody else. It was a few days, I remember now, after Kersuzon was killed, that we dreamed up a little trick that suited us fine to keep from getting lost in the darkness. So they were throwing us out of the billet. All right, all right, we don't say a word. No griping, no comeback. Clear out! Old Waxface yelled as usual. Yes, sir, very good, sir. And off we go in the direction of the gunfire. We didn't wait to be asked twice, all five of us. You'd have thought we were going to pick cherries. It was rolling country around there, the Meuse with its vine-covered hills, grapes that weren't ripe yet, and autumn, wooden villages well dried by three months of summer, highly inflammable. We'd noticed that one night when we couldn't figure out where to go. There was always a village burning in the direction of the gunfire. We didn't go too close. We gave that village a wide berth and just watched, like an audience, so to speak, from maybe seven or eight miles away. And every night from then on all kinds of villages would burst into a blaze on the horizon, one after another. We'd be surrounded by them. Dozens of burning villages in a circle, up ahead and on both sides, like a crazy carnival, sending up flames that licked the clouds. We'd watch the flames as they swallowed up everything, churches and barns, one after another. The haystacks burned higher and livelier than anything else. The beams reared up in the darkness, throwing off sparks before crashing into a sea of light. Even from ten or fifteen miles away, you get a good view of a burning village. It was a merry sight. The tiny hamlet that you wouldn't even notice in the daytime, with ugly, uninteresting country around it, you can't imagine how impressive it can be when it's on fire at night. You'd think it was Notre Dame. A village, even a small one, takes at least all night to burn. In the end, it looks like an enormous flower, then there's only a bud, and after that, nothing. Smoke rises, and then it's morning. We'd leave the horses saddled in a field close by, and they wouldn't move. We'd go and saw wood in the grass, all but one, naturally, who'd take his turn on guard. But when you've got fires to watch, the night passes a lot more pleasantly. It's not a hardship any more. You're not alone. Unfortunately, the villages didn't last. After a month's time, there wasn't a village left in that neck of the woods. The forests were shelled, too. They didn't last a week. Forests make nice enough fires, but they don't last. After that, the roads were all clogged with artillery columns going in one direction and civilians running away in the other. So, naturally, we couldn't go either way. We could only stay where we were. We'd line up for the privilege of getting killed. Even the general couldn't find any billets with no soldiers in them. In the end, we were sleeping in the fields, general or no general. Those who still had a bit of spirit lost it. That was when they started shooting men to bolster their morale, whole squadrons, and when our M.P. got a citation for the way in which he was carrying on his little private war, the real honest-to-goodness war. They gave us a short rest, and a few weeks later we climbed back up on our horses and started north. The cold came with us. The gunfire was never far away. But we never came across any Germans except by accident— a hussar or a squad of riflemen here and there, in yellow and green. Pretty colors. We seemed to be looking for them, but we beat it the moment we laid eyes on them. 
At every encounter, two or three horsemen bit the dust, sometimes theirs, sometimes ours. And from far in the distance, their riderless horses, with loose clanking stirrups, would come galloping toward us. We'd see their saddles with the peculiar cantles, and all their leather as fresh and shiny as pocketbooks on New Year's Day. They were coming to see our horses. They made friends in no time. They were lucky. We couldn't have done that. One morning, when they rode in from a reconnaissance patrol, Lieutenant de saint Jean swore to the other officers that he hadn't made it up. I carved them, I tell you, two of them, he insisted, showing everyone his saber, and true enough, the little groove was full of caked blood. That's what it's made for. Captain Ortolan backed him up. He was splendid. Bravo, saint Jean. Ah, messieurs, if you'd only seen him, what a charge! Ortolan was in command of the squadron. I saw every bit of it. I wasn't far away. A thrust to the right, zing, the first one drops. A thrust full in the chest. Left, cross, championship style. Bravo again, saint Jean. Two lancers, less than a mile from here. Still lying there, in a ploughed field. The war's over for them, eh, saint Jean? A double thrust, beautiful. I bet they spilled their guts like rabbits. Lieutenant de saint whose horse had galloped a long way, received his comrade's compliments with modesty. Now that Ortolan had authenticated his exploit, his mind was at rest, so he rode off some distance and cooled off his mare by circling slowly around the assembled squadron, as if he were just coming in from a steeplechase. "'We must send another patrol over there,' cried Captain Ortolan. "'Immediately!' He was terribly excited. "'Those two poor devils must have been lost to come this way, but there must be more behind them. Ah, Corporal Bardemou, go take a look, you and your four men.' The captain was talking to me. And when they fire at you, try to make a note of their position and come right back and tell me where they are. They must be Brandenburgers. The regular army men told me that in peacetime this Captain Ortolan hardly ever showed up for duty. Now that a war was on, he made up for it. He was indefatigable. His vigor and verve, even among all those other lunatics, were getting more unbelievable from day to day. It was rumored that he sniffed cocaine. Pale, rings under his eyes, always dashing around on his fragile legs. Whenever he set foot on the ground, he'd stagger at first, but then he'd get hold of himself and stride angrily over the furrowed fields in search of some new feat of daring. I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd sent us to get a light from the muzzles of the enemy's guns. He was in cahoots with death. I'd have sworn they had a contract, death and Captain Ortolan. He'd spent the first part of his life, I had made it my business to find out, breaking his ribs in horse shows several times a year. And his legs, because of also being broken and not being used for walking, had lost their calves. When he walked, it was with nervous, pigeon-toed steps, as though walking on eggs. Seeing him in his enormous greatcoat, stooped over in the rain, you'd have taken him for the phantom hindquarters of a racehorse. It needs to be said, though, that at the start of that monstrous enterprise, during the month of August and through September, certain hours, whole days now and then, certain stretches of road and parts of the forest, were still propitious to the doom. In those places you could toy with the illusion that you were more or less safe. You could finish eating your bread and bully beef without being too much plagued by the foreboding that this was the last time. But from October on there were no more of these little lulls. The hail fell thicker and sharper and faster, spiced with shot and shell. Soon we'd be at the heart of the storm, and the very thing we were trying not to see, our death, would be so close to our noses that we couldn't see anything else. The night, which had terrified us at first, seemed almost pleasant by comparison. 
In the end, we longed for the night and waited for it. It was harder for them to shoot at us then than in the daytime. That was the only difference that counted. It's hard to face the facts. Even in connection with war, the imagination holds its own for a long time. Cats who've been threatened by fire too long end up by jumping in the water. During the night, we'd catch a few minutes here and there that came pretty close to the blessed days of peace, those days that now seem too good to be true, when everything was benign, when nothing really mattered, when we did so many things that had come to seem so marvelously, superlatively delightful. Days of peace. Days of living velvet. But soon the nights as well were a merciless torment. Almost every night we'd have to keep our weary bones at work, put up with a little extra torture, just so as to eat or catch a little nap in the darkness. The food convoys moved up to the front lines at a disgraceful crawl, long, limping lines of shaky wagons bursting with meat, prisoners, wounded, oats, rice, and MPs, and don't forget the wine in big, jiggling, pot-bellied jugs that reminded us of high old times. Behind the rolling forge and the bread wagon, men came dragging themselves on foot, prisoners in handcuffs, some of theirs and some of ours, condemned to this or that, lashed by the wrists to the MP's stirrups, some due to be shot the next day, and no downer in the mouth than the others. It didn't spoil their appetites, either. They ate their ration of that tuna fish that's so indigestible they wouldn't have time to digest it, while waiting by the side of the road for the convoy to shove off. And they ate their last chunk of bread, too, with a civilian chained to them, who was said to be a spy, but he didn't know it. Neither did we. The military torture continued in its nocturnal aspect. Groping our way through the humpbacked streets of a village without light or face, bent under sacks that weighed more than a man, from one unknown barn to another, threatened and yelled at, haggard, with no better prospect than to end in a sea of liquid manure, sickened at the thought that we'd been tortured, duped to the entrails by a gang of vicious lunatics who had suddenly become incapable of doing anything else than killing and spilling their guts without knowing why. We'd flop down between two manure piles, but the non-coms would soon kick and bellow us to our feet and send us to a different part of the convoy to load or unload something else. The village darkness was gorged with food and soldiers, bloated with fat, apples, oats, sugar, that we had to haul around and distribute to this squad and that squad. That convoy had brought everything except a ticket home. Our detail was dead tired. We'd drop right next to our cart, and the sergeant major would come around and shine his lantern on the corpses. He was an ape with a double chin. Regardless of the chaos, he had to find a watering place for the horses. Oh, yes, the horses had to drink. But I've seen four men, ass and all, drop with fatigue and fall fast asleep with the water up to their necks. After the watering, we had to find the alley we'd come by and get back to the farm, where we thought we'd left the rest of our squad. If we didn't find it, we could always pass out at the foot of some small wall and sleep for an hour, if there was an hour left. In this business of getting killed, it's no use being picky and choosy. You've got to act as if life were going on, and that lie is the hardest part of it. The wagons started back to the rear. In flight from the dawn, they hit the road again. Squeaking in every crooked wheel, off they drove, and with them went my prayer that they'd be ambushed, cut to pieces, burned that same day, the way you see in war pictures. Supply column wiped out forever and ever, with its escort of M.P. guerrillas, horse soldiers, and lantern-swinging noncoms, with its work details, its sacks of lentils and flour that would never be cooked and never be seen again. 
because there are many different ways of kicking in, of exhaustion or something else. But the worst is to do it while hauling enough sacks to fill the night with. The day when those motherfucking wagons would be shattered to the axles, they'd leave us alone, I thought, and even if only for one night we'd be able to sleep with body and soul. This food supply business was just one more nightmare, a nasty little monster on top of the big one, the war. Brutes to the right of us, brutes to the left of us, they were all over the place. Condemned to a deferred death, the only thing that really mattered was an enormous longing for sleep. All the rest was torture, even the time and effort it took to eat. A bend in the brook, a familiar-looking wall. But mostly it was the smells helped us find our farm. We'd reverted to dogs in the wartime night of the deserted villages. The smell of shit was the best guide of all. The quartermaster Top Kick was the guardian of the regiment's hatreds. He, until further notice, was master of the world. Anybody who talks about the future is a bastard. It's the present that counts. Invoking posterity is like making speeches to worms. There, in the wartime village night, the Top Kick was corralling human cattle for the big slaughterhouses that had just opened. The Top Sergeant was king. King of Death, Sergeant Crittell. Absolutely, nobody more powerful, and nobody as powerful, except one of their top sergeants on the opposite side. Nothing was left of the village, no living thing except terrified cats. First the furniture went, smashed up for firewood, chairs, tables, sideboards, from the lightest to the heaviest, and anything that the boys could carry they made off with. Combs, lamps, cups, silly little things, even bridal wreaths, everything went. As if we'd had years of life ahead of us. They looted to take their minds off their troubles, to make it look as if they had years before them. Everybody likes that feeling. As far as they were concerned, gunfire was nothing but noise. That's why wars can keep going. Even the people who make them, who fight in them, don't really get the picture. Even with a bullet in their gut, they'd go on picking up old shoes that might come in handy. The way a sheep, lying on its side in a meadow, will keep on grazing with its dying breath. Most people don't die until the last moment. Others start twenty years in advance, sometimes more. Those are the unfortunates. I wasn't very bright myself, but at least I had sense enough to opt for cowardice once and for all. I imagine that's why people thought I was so uncommonly calm. Be that as it may, I inspired a paradoxical confidence in our Captain Ortolan, who decided that night to entrust me with a delicate mission. It consisted, he told me in confidence, of trotting before daylight to noisur sur la lys a city of weavers, situated some ten miles from the village where we'd camped. My job was to find out at first hand whether the enemy was there or not. All that day patrols had been contradicting one another, and General Desentrier was good and sick of it. For that reconnaissance mission I was allowed to pick one of the less purulent horses in the platoon. I hadn't gone out alone in a long time. It made me feel as if I were starting on a trip, but my feeling of deliverance was illusory. I was so tired when I set out that, hard as I tried, I couldn't properly visualize my own murder. I couldn't fill in the details. I moved from tree to tree, accompanied by the clanking of my hardware. All by itself, my pretty saber made as much noise as a piano. I don't know if I was deserving of sympathy, but for sure I was certainly grotesque. What could General Desentrier have been thinking, sending me out alone into that silence, all clothed in symbols? The Aztecs, so the story goes, routinely disemboweled eight thousand faithful a week in their temples of the sun, a sacrifice to the god of the clouds to make him send them rain. 
Such things are hard to believe until you get mixed up in a war. Once you're in a war, you see how it is. The Aztec's contempt for other people's bodies was the same as my humble viscera must have inspired in our above-mentioned General Celedon des Entriers, who, thanks to a series of promotions, had become a kind of chicken-shit god, an abominably exigent little son. The one tiny bit of hope I had left was of being taken prisoner. It didn't amount to much. A shred. A shred in the night, because the circumstances weren't conducive to polite preliminaries. Far from it. The foe would shoot first and introduce himself afterward. Besides, what would I say to this soldier, hostile by definition, who'd come from the other end of Europe for the express purpose of murdering me? Suppose he hesitated for one second. That was all I'd need. What would I say to him? And come to think of it, what would he be? A sales clerk? A professional soldier? A grave digger? In civilian life, a cook? Horses are lucky. They are stuck with the war, same as us, but nobody expects them to be in favor of it, to pretend to believe in it. Unfortunate, yes, but free. Enthusiasm, the stinker, was reserved for us. I could see the road clearly just then, and, plunk down on the mud beside it, big squares and cubes of houses, their walls whitened by the moonlight, like big unequal blocks of ice, pale and silent. Would this be the end of it all? How much time would I spend in this desolation after they'd done for me? Before it was all over? In what ditch? Beside which one of these walls? Would they come and finish me off? With a knife? Sometimes they gouged out your eyes, cut off your hands, and so on. There were all sorts of rumors on the subject, and they were no joke. A hoofbeat, another, would be enough. This beast makes a noise like two men with iron boots fastened together, running with a jerky, uneven step. My heart, a rabbit, warm in its little ribcage, fearful, cowering, bewildered. You must feel pretty much the same way when you jump off the top of the Eiffel Tower. You'd like to stop yourself in mid-air. That village kept its menace secret, but not entirely. In the center of a square, a tiny fountain gurgled just for me. That night I had everything to myself. I was the owner of the moon, the village, and of an enormous fear. I was about to break into a trot with a good hour's ride ahead of me to noisir sur la lys when I caught sight of a well-veiled light over a door. I headed straight for that light, surprised to detect inside myself a kind of daring, a deserter's daring, to be sure, but more than I'd ever suspected. The light disappeared the next second, but I'd seen it all right. I knocked. I kept at it. I knocked again. I called out in a loud voice, half in German, half in French, to be on the safe side, to those strangers locked in the darkness. The door finally opened by just a crack. A voice asked, Who are you? I was saved. A dragoon. French? A woman speaking. I could see her now. Yes, French. Some German dragoons were here this afternoon. They spoke French, too. Yes, but I'm really French. I see. She seemed to have her doubts. Where are they now? I asked. They left at about eight o'clock, heading for Noisur, she pointed north. A young girl, shawl and white apron, emerged from the shadow. "'What did the Germans do to you?' I asked. "'They burned a house next to the town hall, and they killed my little brother, ran a lance through his belly. He was playing on the red bridge, watching them go by. "'Look!' she showed me. "'There he is!' She didn't cry. She relit the candle. 
That was the light I had seen. At the back of the room I saw, it was true, the little corpse lying on a mattress. It was dressed in a sailor suit with a big square collar. The face and throat were as livid as the candlelight. The child's arms and legs and back were bent. He was all doubled up. The lance had passed, like an axis for death, through the middle of his belly. His mother was on her knees beside him, crying her heart out. So was the father. Then they all started moaning at once. But my trouble was thirst. You wouldn't have a bottle of wine to sell me, I asked. You'll have to ask my mother. She may know if there's any left. The Germans took a lot just now. The two women talked it over in an undertone. The daughter came back and announced, There's none left. The Germans took it all. We'd given them plenty without being asked, but even so. Oh, yes, they drank and they drank, said the mother, who'd suddenly stopped crying. They're crazy about it. Must have been more than a hundred bottles, said the father, still on his knees. And there's not a single one left? I kept at it, still hoping because of my terrible thirst, especially for white wine with a good bitter tang that wakes you up a little. I don't mind paying. There's nothing left but the best, the mother conceded. It costs five francs a bottle. That's fine, I said, taking a big five-franc piece out of my pocket. Go and get one she said to the sister in a whisper. The sister took the candle and a moment later brought up a bottle from the hiding place. I had what I wanted. There was nothing more to stay for. Will they come back? I asked, anxious again. Maybe, they all said together. If they do, they'll burn everything in sight. They promised they would when they left. I'll just go and see what they're up to. You're very brave. It's that way, said the father, pointing in the direction of Noisur sur la Lys. He even stepped out on the road to see me on my way. The girl and her mother stayed behind, fearful, watching over the little corpse. Come back in, they called out to him. Joseph, come back in. You've no business out there on the road. You're very brave, the father said to me again shaking me by the hand. I started off again, northward at a trot. At least don't tell them we're still here, the girl was shouting. She'd come out just for that. They'll see for themselves tomorrow whether you're here or not, I called back. I wasn't happy about giving them my five francs. There was five francs between us. Five francs is reason enough to hate people and make you want them dead. There won't be any love to spare in this world as long as there's five francs. Tomorrow, they repeated, fearing the worst. Tomorrow, for them too, was far away. There wasn't much sense in that kind of tomorrow. The one thing any of us really cared about was living for one more hour. One more hour is a big deal in a world where everything has reduced itself to murder. I didn't have far to go after that. I trotted from tree to tree, expecting to be challenged or shot from one minute to the next. Nothing happened. It must have been about two in the morning, not much more, when I got to the top of a little hill at a walk. Suddenly, looking down from there... I saw rows and rows of burning gas jets, and then in the foreground a station all lit up with its cars and its buffet, but not a sound came up to me. Nothing. Streets, avenues, street lamps, and more lights in parallel lines, whole neighborhoods, and everything else a black, voracious void, with this city plunked down as if it had been lost, lying there all lit up in the heart and center of the darkness. I got down off my horse, made myself comfortable on a little hummock, and sat there looking at that city for quite some time. 
That didn't tell me if the Germans had moved into Noisure. But since I knew that in a case like that they usually set fire, I figured if they'd moved in and hadn't set fire to the place right away, they must have something very unusual up their sleeve. No gunfire, either. All very suspicious. My horse wanted to lie down, too. He'd tugged at his bridle, and that made me turn around. When I turned back to the city, something about the look of the hummock in front of me had changed. Not much, but enough to make me sing out, Hey, who goes there? That change in the layout of the darkness had taken place a few steps away. Must be somebody there. Don't shout too loud, came a deep, hoarse voice, very French. You lost too? he asked me. Now I could see him. A foot slogger. The peak of his cap was cracked in goodbye to the army style. After all these years, I remember that moment, his silhouette emerging from the grass the way targets used to in shooting galleries. Soldier targets. We came closer. I was holding my revolver. For two beans I'd have fired, don't ask why. Hey, he asks, you seen them? No, but I've come here to see them. You from the 145th Dragoons? That's right, you? I'm a reservist. Oh, I said. That amazed me. He was the first reservist I'd met in the war. We'd always been in with the regular army men. I couldn't see his face, but his voice was different from ours. Sadder, which made him sound nicer. Because of that, I couldn't help trusting him a little, which was something. I'm fed up, he said. I'm going to get myself captured by the Bosch. He wasn't keeping any secrets. How are you going about it? All of a sudden his plan interested me more than anything else. How was he fixing to get taken prisoner? I don't know yet. How'd you manage to get away? It's not easy to get taken prisoner. To hell with that, I'll just surrender. What's wrong? You scared? I'm scared, and besides, the war is stupid. I don't give a damn about the Germans. They never did anything to me. My feeling was that I should be polite to the Germans. I'd have liked this reservist to explain, while he was about it, why I had no stomach either to make war like everybody else. But he didn't explain a thing. He just kept saying he was fed up. Then he told me how his regiment had been dispersed at dawn the day before because some of our sharpshooters had fired on his company by mistake. They hadn't been expected just then. They'd arrived three hours ahead of schedule. So these sharpshooters, tired and taken by surprise, had fired across the fields and riddled them with bullets. I knew the story. I'd been through it myself. Never fear, he went on. I saw my chance and I took it. Robinson, I says to myself. Robinson's my name. Leon Robinson. It's now or never, I say to myself. This is the time to get going, right? So I started through a little clump of woods, and pretty soon, what do you think? I run into our captain. He's leaning against a tree in very bad shape, dying. He was holding his pants in both hands and vomiting, bleeding all over and rolling his eyes. There was nobody with him. He was through. Mama, mama, he was sniveling, all the while dying and pissing blood. Shut up, I tell him. Mama, mama, fuck your mama. Just like that on my way past out of the corner of my mouth. I bet that made him feel good, the bastard. What do you think of that? It's not every day you can tell the captain what you think. It's too good to miss. A rare opportunity. To get out of there faster, I chucked my pack and gun, dropped them in a duck pond. You see, I don't take to killing people. I never learned to. Even in peacetime, I never cared for fights. I'd walk away, 
See what I mean? In civilian life, I tried to go to the factory regularly. I was kind of an engraver, but I didn't like it because of the arguments. I was happier selling the evening papers in a quiet neighborhood where I was known, around the Bank of France. Place des Victoires, if you want to know. Rue de Petit Chambre. That was my territory. I never went beyond the Rue du Louvre and the Palais Royal on one side, get the idea? In the morning I'd run errands for shopkeepers. Sometimes a delivery in the afternoon. Odd job, see? Kind of unskilled, but one thing I don't want is weapons. If the Germans see you with a weapon, you're cooked. But if you're dressed, free and easy, like I am now, nothing in your hands, nothing in your pockets, they get the idea that it won't be hard to take you prisoner, see? They know who they're dealing with. If you go up to the Germans, mother naked, that would be even better. Like a horse. They wouldn't know what army you belong to. That's a fact. I caught on that being older is good for the mind. It puts sense into you. So you say they're down there? We figured. We estimated our chances and looked for our future in the great luminous expanse of the silent city as though consulting the cards. Let's get started. First we'd have to cross the railroad tracks. If there were sentries, they'd see us. Or maybe they wouldn't. We'd soon find out. Maybe there'd be an overpass. Or maybe we'd take the tunnel. We'll have to hurry, said Robinson. Gotta do these things at night. People aren't friendly in the daytime. Everybody plays to the gallery in the daytime, even in the war. The daytime is a circus. You taking your horse? I took the horse. A precaution. To get away quicker if the reception was bad. We got to the grade crossing. The big red and white arms were up. I'd never seen that kind of gate before. They weren't like that around Paris. Think they've moved in already? Positive, he says. Anyway, keep going. Now we were forced to be as brave as the brave, because of the horse who was plodding slowly behind us and seemed to be pushing us with his noise. We couldn't hear anything else. Clop, clop, went his hooves. He'd put his foot down in the middle of the echo, as if he hadn't a care in the world. So this Robinson was counting on the night to save us. The two of us were walking down the middle of the street, with no attempt at concealment. In step, what's more, we could have been drilling. Robinson was right. The daytime was pitiless, from the earth to the sky. The way we were walking in the street, we must have looked perfectly harmless, as innocent as if we'd been coming back from a leave. Did you hear about the first hussars, taken prisoner in Lille? Every last one of them. Marched right in, the way I heard it. They didn't know. The colonel in the lead. Down the main street, boy, oh boy, and then the trap closed. In front of them, behind them, Germans everywhere. At the windows, everywhere. There they were, caught like rats. Like rats. Talk about luck. The bastards. Yeah, wasn't that something? We couldn't get over that marvelous capture. So neat, so conclusive. It really floored us. The shops had all their shutters closed. So did the houses, with their little gardens in front, all so neat and prim. But after the post office we saw a house, a little whiter than the rest, with all the lights on at all the windows, upstairs and down. We went and rang the doorbell. We still had our horse behind us. A thick-set man with a beard opened. "'I am the mayor of Noisur, he told us right away without our asking. "'And I am expecting the Germans.' This mayor steps out into the moonlight to look at us. When he saw we weren't Germans but still French, he wasn't so solemn any more. Friendly, yes, but embarrassed. Obviously he hadn't been expecting us. We didn't quite fit in with the arrangements he must have made— the decisions he'd taken. 
The Germans were supposed to enter Noisseur that night. He'd been notified, and he'd settled everything with the prefecture, their colonel here, their field hospital there, etc. And what if they turned up now, with us there? There'd certainly be trouble, dreadful complications. He didn't come out and say all that, but we could see what he was thinking. So there in the darkness he starts talking to us about the interests of the public at large, in that enveloping silence. The public at large, that's all he could talk about. The material interests of the community. The artistic patrimony of Noisseur, entrusted to his care. A sacred trust, if ever there was one. Especially the fifteenth-century church. Suppose they burned it down, like the one in Condé sur Isère. Have we thought of that? In a fit of temper, annoyed at finding us there, he impressed us with the full extent of our responsibility, hair-brained youngsters that we were. The Germans had no use for unsavory towns with enemy soldiers still prowling around in them. That was common knowledge. While he was lecturing us like that in an undertone, his wife and two daughters, luscious, hefty blondes, put in a word here and there to back him up. The long and the short, they didn't want us there. In the air between us there hovered sentimental and archaeological considerations, suddenly sprung to life, since there was no one in Noisseur that night to contest them. Patriotic, ethical, word-propelled considerations, ghosts that the mayor tried to hold fast, but they faded away, undone by our fear and selfishness, and by the plain truth, for that matter. The mayor of Noisseur himself was knocking himself out with his touching effort to convince us that our duty was to clear out instantly. He wasn't as brutal about it as our Major Pinson, but in his way he was every bit as determined. The only argument we could have pitted against all those wielders of power was our contemptible little wish not to die and not to be burned alive, which didn't amount to much especially when you consider that you can't come out with sentiments like that in the middle of a war. So we wandered off into other deserted streets. Everyone I'd met that night had bared his soul to me. "'Just my luck,' said Robinson as we were pushing off. "'If only you'd been a German. You're an obliging sort. You'd have taken me prisoner and we'd be all set. It's hard for a man to get rid of himself in a war.' "'What about you?' said I. "'Wouldn't you have taken me prisoner if you had been a German? "'Maybe they'd have given you the Medaille Militaire. "'Some funny word the Germans must have for their Medaille Militaire.' "'Seeing there was absolutely no demand for us as prisoners, "'we finally sat down on a bench in a little park "'and opened up the can of tuna fish "'Robinson had been warming in his pocket since morning.' Now we could hear gunfire far in the distance, very far. If only both sides could have stayed in the distance where they were and left us alone. Then we walked by the river, and alongside of some half-unloaded barges we urinated long streams into the water. We were still leading the horse by the bridle. He tagged behind us like a great big dog. Near the bridge, in the ferryman's one-room house, there was a dead man stretched out on a mattress all alone, a Frenchman, a major of light cavalry. Actually, he looked something like Robinson. "'Ugly son of a bitch,' says Robinson. "'I don't know about you, but I don't like dead people.' "'The funny part of it,' I said, "'is that he looks something like you. "'The same long nose, and you're not much older.' Well, you see, it's being so tired that makes us all look alike. But, oh, if you'd seen me before, in the days when I went bicycle riding every Sunday, I was really handsome. You should have seen the calves on me. You can't beat bicycling. It develops the thighs, too. We left the house. The match we'd lit to look at the stiff had gone out. You see? It's too late, you see? Already in the darkness at the end of the town, a long gray and green line marked the crest of the hill. Day. 
One more, one less. We'd have to try and get through this one the same as the rest. The days had got to be like hoops, tighter and tighter to get through, and filled with bursts of shrapnel. Coming back this way tomorrow night? he asked before we separated. Tomorrow night? There's no such thing. What do you think you are, a general? I don't think about anything, he says. No thoughts at all. I think about not getting killed. That keeps me busy. One more day is one more day, that's what I think. You're right. So long, pal, and good luck. Good luck to you, too. Maybe we'll meet again. We each went back to his own war. And then things happened, and a lot more things that it's not easy to tell about now, because people nowadays wouldn't understand them any more. If you wanted to be respected and looked up to, you had to hurry up quick and pal up with the civilians, because they were becoming more and more vicious as the war went on. I saw that as soon as I got back to Paris. It also became clear to me that the women had ants in their pants, and that the old men were talking big and their fingers were all over the place, in assholes, in pockets. The civilians back home were infected with the idea of glory. They picked it up from the soldier boys and soon learned how to bear up under it, bravely and painlessly. Nurses and martyrs by turns. Mothers were never without their long dark veils and those little diplomas the ministry never failed to send by special messenger. In short, the home front was getting organized. At a well-conducted funeral, you're sad, too, but you think of other things. The will, your next vacation, the widow, who's a good looker and said to be passionate, and your plans for continuing to live a great deal longer by contrast, and maybe never dying. You never can tell. And as you follow the hearse, everybody lifts his hat to you. It's heartwarming. Then's the time to behave properly, to look dignified, not to laugh out loud, to gloat only internally. That's permissible. Everything's permissible internally. During the war, instead of dancing on the mezzanine, you danced in the cellar. The boys had no objection. In fact, they were all for it. They demanded it as soon as they got to town, and nobody thought it indecent. The one thing that's really indecent is bravery. You expect physical bravery? Then ask a worm to be brave. He's pink and pale and soft, just like us. For my part, I had nothing to complain of. Actually, thanks to the medaille militaire I'd won and my wound and all, I was about to lose my innocence. They'd brought me the medal while I was in the hospital convalescing, and that same night I went to the theater to let the civilians see it during intermissions. A triumph! Those were the first medals seen in Paris. It floored them. That was when I met little Lola from America in the lobby of the Opera Comique, and it was thanks to her that I really found out what was what. There are certain dates that stand out after months and months when you might just as well have been dead. That evening at the Opera Comique with my medal was a turning point in my life. Lola made me curious about the United States because of the questions I started asking right away and that she hardly answered at all. When you start traveling that way, you never know when or how you'll get back. At the time I'm speaking of, everybody in Paris wanted a uniform. Practically nobody was without one, except for neutrals and spies, which to all intents and purposes were identical. Lola had a genuine official uniform, and it was really natty, decorated with little crosses all over on the sleeves and on the tiny cap that she perched at a rakish angle on her wavy hair. She'd come to help us save France, as she told the hotel manager, to the best of her humble ability but with all her heart. 
We understood each other right away, but not completely, because the transports of the heart were beginning to give me a pain. I was more interested in the transports of the body. You can't trust the heart, not at all. I'd learned that in the war, and I wasn't going to forget it in a hurry. Lola's heart was tender, weak, and enthusiastic. Her body was sweet. It was adorable. So what could I do but take her altogether as she was? Lola was a good kid, all right, but between us stood the war the monstrous frenzy that was driving half of humanity, lovers or not, to send the other half to the slaughterhouse. Naturally, this interfered with our relationship. For me, who was dragging out my convalescence as long as possible, and wasn't the least bit eager to go back on duty in the flaming graveyards of no man's land, the absurdity of our massacre was glaringly obvious at every step I took in town. Whichever way I looked, I saw cynical, grasping cunning. Still, I hadn't much chance of keeping out of it. I lacked the indispensable connections. The people I knew were all poor, people whose death is of no interest to anybody. And I could hardly count on Lola to keep me safe at home. Even if she was a nurse, I couldn't have conceived of anyone more bellicose than that sweet young thing except maybe Ortolan. If I hadn't been through the muddy fricassee of heroism myself, her little Joan of Arc number might have stirred and converted me. But since my enlistment at the Place Clichy, I had grown phobically allergic to heroism, verbal or real. I was cured, radically cured. For the convenience of the ladies of the American Expeditionary Force, the group of nurses Lola belonged to were quartered in the Hotel Paritz, and to make things even more delightful for her personally, she had been put in charge—she had connections—of a special service, whose mission it was to supply the Paris hospitals with apple fritters. Every morning thousands of dozens of them were handed out. Lola performed this benign duty with a touching zeal, which, as it turned out, was later to have disastrous consequences. Lola, it has to be admitted, had never made a fritter in all her life. She therefore hired a number of mercenary cooks, and after a few trials the fritters were ready for delivery, as juicy and sweet and golden as anyone could wish for. All Lola had to do was taste them before they were delivered to the various hospital wards. Every morning Lola got up at the stroke of ten, took her bath, and went down to the kitchens, which were situated deep in the basement. This, I repeat, she did every morning, clad only in a black and yellow Japanese kimono that a boyfriend in San Francisco had given her the day before she left. In short, everything was running smoothly, and we were happily winning the war, when one fine day at lunch I found her shattered, refusing to touch so much as a single dish. I was seized with foreboding. What misfortune or sudden illness had befallen her? I begged her to entrust herself to my watchful affection. After conscientiously tasting fritters every day for a month, Lola had put on two pounds. Her little belt bore witness to the disaster. She found herself obliged to move on to the next notch. She burst into tears. I did my best to comfort her. In a turmoil of emotion, we repaired by taxi to several pharmacies, situated at a considerable distance from one another. The scales proved implacable. As ill luck would have it, they all confirmed that two pounds had indeed and undeniably been gained. I suggested that she turn her job over to a friend, who, on the contrary, was eager to enlarge her allurements. Lola wouldn't hear of such a compromise, which she regarded as shameful, as a kind of desertion. That, I recall, is when she told me that her great-great-uncle had been a member of the crew of the eternally glorious Mayflower which landed in Boston in 1677, and that in view of such a past she couldn't dream of shirking her fritter duty, which may have been humble but was nevertheless a sacred trust. 
The fact remains that from that day on she barely touched her teeth, which incidentally were evenly set and very, very enticing, to the fritters. Her dread of putting on weight completely destroyed her enjoyment of life. She began to waste away. Soon she was as afraid of fritters as I was of bullets. Because of the fritters we spent most of our time taking long, healthful walks on the river banks and boulevards, and we stopped going to the Napolitan, because ice cream is another thing that makes ladies put on weight. I had never dreamed of a place so comfortable to live in as her room, all pale blue with a bathroom adjoining. Photographs of her friends were all over, with dedications. Not many women, lots of men. Handsome, dark, with curly hair, that was her type. She'd talk to me about the color of their eyes and read me the dedications, which were tender, solemn, and every last one of them absolutely irrevocable. At first those effigies embarrassed me. I felt I was being rude. But then I got used to it. The moment I stopped kissing her, I was in for it. She'd start on the war and her fritters. France figured prominently in our conversation. To Lola's way of thinking, France was some sort of chivalric being, not very clearly defined in space or time, but at the moment dangerously wounded and for that very reason too, too exciting. When anybody mentioned France to me, I instantly thought of my guts, so I wasn't nearly so open to patriotic ardor. Each man to his fears. Nevertheless, since she was sexually accommodating, I listened and never contradicted her. But when it came to my soul, she wasn't at all satisfied with me. She'd have liked to see me bubbling and bursting with enthusiasm, where I couldn't see a single reason for adopting that sublime state of mind. In fact, I could see a thousand, all equally irrefutable, for persevering in the exact opposite direction. Obviously, Lola was nuts with happiness and optimism, like all people on the good side of life, the ones with privilege, health, security, who still have a long time to live. She kept bothering me with the soul. She was always going on about it. The soul is the body's vanity and pleasure as long as the body's in good health. But it's also the urge to escape from the body as soon as the body is sick or things are going badly. Of the two poses, you take the one that suits you best at the moment, and that's all there is to it. As long as you can choose between the two, you're all right. But I couldn't choose any more. My die was cast. I was up to my neck in the truth. Death dogged my every step, so to speak. It was very hard for me to think of anything but my suspended sentence to be murdered, a fate which everyone else regarded as just the right thing for me. In this kind of deferred death agony that hits you when you're lucid and in good health, the mind is open to nothing but absolute truths. Once you've been through it, you'll know what you're talking about till the end of your days. My conclusion was that if the Germans were to come and pillage, massacre, and burn everything in sight, the hotel, the fritters, Lola, the Tuileries, the cabinet ministers, their little boyfriends, the cupole, the Louvre, the department stores, if they were to swoop down on the city and unleash the wrath of God and the fires of hell on this putrid carnival, to which nothing in the way of sordidness could possibly be added— I would have nothing to lose and everything to gain. You don't lose much when the landlord's house burns down. Another landlord will always turn up, unless it's the same one, German or French, English or Chinese, to collect the rent. In marks or francs. What difference does it make, seeing you've got to pay? In short, my morale was low. If I'd told Lola what I thought of the war— she'd have taken me for a monster and banished me from the ultimate joys of her boudoir. So I was careful to keep my sentiments to myself. Besides, I had outside difficulties and rivalries to worry about. Quite a few officers were trying to filch her away from me. Their competition was redoubtable, 
armed as they were with the seduction of their legions of honor. And just then the American papers were beginning to be full of this damned legion of honor. She cuckled at me two or three times, and I'd go so far to say that our relationship would have been in serious danger on those occasions if it hadn't dawned on her that I could be put to a higher use, namely, made to taste the fritters every morning in her stead. This last-minute specialization saved me. She could accept me as a substitute, for I was a valiant comrade in arms, hence worthy of so sacred a mission. From that moment on, we were more than lovers. We were partners as well. The modern age had dawned. To me, her body was a joy without end. I never wearied of exploring that American body. I have to admit that I was a terrible lecher. I still am. And I formed the pleasant and fortifying conviction that a country capable of producing bodies so daringly graceful, so tempting in their spiritual flights, must have countless other vital revelations to offer of a biological nature, it goes without saying. I made up my mind, while feeling and fondling Lola, that sooner or later I'd take a trip, or call it a pilgrimage to the United States, the sooner the better. And the fact is that I knew neither peace nor rest, in an implacably adverse and harassed life, until I managed to go through with that profound and mystically anatomical adventure. So it was in the immediate vicinity of Lola's rear end that I received the message of a new world. Of course Lola wasn't all body. She also had a wee little face that was adorable and just a bit cruel because of her gray-blue eyes that slanted slightly upward at the corners like a wildcat's. Just looking at her made my mouth water, like a sip of dry wine, that flinty taste. There was a hardness in her eyes, unrelieved by the amiably commercial oriental fragonard vivacity you find in nearly all the eyes in these parts. We usually met in a café nearby. There were more and more wounded men hobbling through the streets, many of them very bedraggled. Collections were taken for their benefit, days for this group and days for that group, especially for the organizers of the days. Lying, fucking, dying. A law had just been passed prohibiting all other activity. The lies that were being told surpassed the imagination far exceeded the limits of the absurd and preposterous in the newspapers, on posters, on foot, on horseback, on pleasure boats. Everybody was doing it, in competition, to see who could lie the most outrageously. Soon there wasn't a bit of truth in the city. The little that had been left in 1914 people were ashamed of now. Everything you touched was phony, the sugar, the aeroplanes— the shoes, the jam, the photographs. Everything you read, swallowed, sucked, admired, proclaimed, refuted, defended, was made up of hate-ridden myths and grinning masquerades, phony to the hilt. The mania for telling lies and believing them is as contagious as the itch. Little Lola's French consisted of only a few phrases, but they were all patriotic. On les aura, Madelon vient. It was enough to make you cry. Stubbornly, shamelessly, she harped on the deaths of those doomed to die. Actually, all the women did, as soon as it became fashionable to be brave for other people. Just as I was looking within and discovering such an extraordinary taste for everything that took me away from the war. I often asked Lola questions about America, but her answers were vague, pretentious, and manifestly unreliable, calculated to make a brilliant impression on me. But by that time I distrusted impressions. I'd been taken in once by an impression, and nobody was going to hoodwink me again. Nobody. I believed in her body. I didn't believe in her soul. I thought of Lola as a charming gold brick, miles away from the war, miles away from life. 
She flitted across my nightmare with the mentality of the patriotic press, the poilu in the trenches, our own Lorraine, the cadets in their white gloves. In the meantime, I made love to her more and more. I convinced her it was a good way to lose weight. But she set more store by our long walks. I hated long walks, but she insisted. So we spent several hours every afternoon being athletic in the Bois du Boulogne, walking around the lakes and back. Nature is a frightening thing. Even when it's solidly domesticated, as in the Bois, it gives real city dwellers an eerie, anxious feeling, and that puts them in a confiding mood. The Bois du Boulogne may be damp, fenced in, greasy, and trampled, but there's nothing like it for sending memories rushing irresistibly to the minds of city dwellers strolling under the trees. Lola was not immune to that melancholy, confidential anxiety. As we walked along, she told me, more or less truthfully, a thousand things about her life in New York and her little girlfriends over there. I couldn't quite make out how much of the potpourri of dollars, engagements, divorces, dresses, and jewelry that seemed to have made up her existence was worth trying to believe. That day we headed for the racetrack. In those days, in that neck of the woods, you still saw lots of horse-drawn carriages, children on donkeys, other children kicking up dusk, and cars full of soldiers on furlough, always in desperate haste, between two trains, to track down the women strolling on the side paths, raising more dust in their hurry to go to dinner and make love, jumpy, oily, peering this way and that, tormented by the implacable clock and the lust for life. They sweated with passion, but also with the heat. The bois wasn't as well cared for as usual. It was neglected, in a state of administrative suspense. It must have been pretty here before the war, Lola observed. So chic. Oh, tell me about it, Ferdinand. Your race is here. Were they like ours in New York? To tell the truth, I'd never been to the races before the war, but to amuse her I instantly made up dozens of colorful details— drawing on stories various people had told me. The toilettes, the ladies of fashion, the gleaming carriages, the start, the joyous imperious horns, the water jump, the president of the republic, the undulant betting fever, etc. My idealized account was so much to her liking that it brought us together. At that moment Lola seemed to discover that we had at least one taste in common— well concealed in my case, namely a taste for social functions. She went so far as to kiss me in a burst of spontaneous emotion, something I have to admit that she seldom did. And then she was touched by the sadness of bygone fashions. Everyone has his own way of mourning the passage of time. It was through dead fashions that Lola perceived the flight of the years. Ferdinand she asked. Do you think there will be races here again? When the war is over, Lola, I should think. We can't be sure, can we? No, we can't be sure. The possibility that there would never again be races at Longchamp overwhelmed her. The sadness of the world has different ways of getting to people, but it seems to succeed almost every time. Suppose, Ferdinand, suppose the war goes on a long time, maybe for years. Then it'll be too late for me to come back here. Do you understand, Ferdinand? You know how I love beautiful places like this, so grand, so chic. It'll be too late, forever too late. Maybe, maybe I'll be old, Ferdinand. When the races start up again, I'll be old. You'll see, Ferdinand, it will be too late. I can feel it will be too late. She was as desolate as if she'd put on two more pounds. I said everything I could think of to comfort her and give her hope. She was only twenty-three, after all. The war would be over soon, oh, very soon, 
good times would come again, as good as before, even better, for her at least, being so adorable, the lost years, she'd catch up with no harm done. She wouldn't run short of admirers, so soon. To please me, she pretended she wasn't sad any more. Do we have to keep walking? she asked. Your weight. Oh, that's right, I'd forgotten. We left Longchamp. The children had gone. Nothing left but dust. The furlough boys were still chasing happiness, but no longer in the copses. The pursuit of happiness had moved to the café terraces around the Port Maillot. We headed for saint Cloud along the river bank, shrouded in a dancing halo of autumn mists. As we approached the bridge, some barges loaded to the gunnels with coal and lying low in the water were thrusting their noses under the arches. Above the fences, the park deployed a great fan of greenery. Those trees are as vast and gentle and strong as dreams. But trees were something else I distrusted, ever since I'd been ambushed. Behind every tree, a dead man. Between two lines of roses, the avenue, rising gently, led to the fountains. Outside the kiosk, the soda-water lady seemed to be slowly gathering the evening shadows around her skirt. Further on, along the side-paths, great cubes and rectangles of dark-colored canvas were flapping, carnival booths, which the war had taken by surprise and suddenly filled with silence. It's been a whole year since they went away, the soda-water lady told us. You won't see two people here in a whole day now. I come out of habit. There used to be so many people. That was all the old lady knew. The rest of what had happened was a blank to her. Lola wanted to go and look at the empty tents, one of those funny, sad impulses. We counted about twenty of them, a long one full of mirrors and a lot of small ones, candy stands, lotteries, even a small theater traversed with drafts. There was a tent in every space between the trees. One of them, near the Grand Avenue, had lost its flaps. It was as well ventilated as a punctured mystery. These tents were leaning close to the mud and fallen leaves. We stopped near the last, the one that was bent lowest. It was pitching on its poles like a ship in the wind, with wildly flapping sails ready to snap the last of its cables. It swayed in the rising wind. A sheet of canvas flew up above the roof and flapped and flapped. The old name of the stand was written on the front in green and red letters. It had been a shooting gallery, the Gallery of the Nations. There was no one to take care of it now. Maybe the owner had gone shooting with the rest of them, with his customers. What a lot of bullets the little targets in the stand had taken all of them riddled with little white dots. A wedding, that always got a laugh out of them. Tin figures in the first row, the bride with her flowers, the cousin, the soldier, the groom with a big red face, and in the second row the guests, who must have been killed a good many times when the carnival was still operating. I bet you're a good shot, aren't you, Ferdinand? If the carnival were still running, I'd challenge you. You are a good shot, aren't you, Ferdinand? No, I'm not a very good shot. In the last row behind the wedding, another row was daubed in, the town hall with its flag. People must have shot at the town hall, too, when the gallery was working. At the windows, they'd open and a bell would clang, and they even shot at the little tin flag and they'd shot at the regiment marching on an incline nearby, like mine on the Place Clichy. This one was between the pipes and the little balloons. People had shot at those things for all they were worth, and now they were shooting at me, yesterday and tomorrow. They're shooting at me too, Lola, I cried. It slipped out of me. Let's be going, she said. 
You're talking nonsense, Ferdinand, and we'll catch cold. We descended the main avenue, the Avenue Royale, towards St. Clou, avoiding the mud. She held me by the hand. Hers was tiny. But I couldn't think of anything but the tin wedding at the shooting gallery up there, which we had left behind us in the shadow of the trees. I even forgot to kiss Lola. Something had come over me. I felt very funny. I think it was then that my head became so agitated with all the ideas going around in it. It was dark when we got to the Pont du saint Clou. Ferdinand, would you like to have dinner at Duval's? You like Duval's, don't you? It would cheer you up. There's always such a big crowd. Unless you'd rather eat in my room. She was being very considerate that evening. We finally decided on Duval's. But we'd hardly sat down when the place struck me as monstrous. I got the idea that these people sitting in rows around us were waiting for bullets to be fired at them from all sides while they were eating. Get out! I warned them. Beat it! They're going to shoot! They're going to kill you, the whole lot of you! I was hurried back to Lola's hotel. Everywhere I saw the same thing. The people in the hallways of the Paritz all seemed to be on their way to be shot, and so did the clerks behind the big desk, all of them just ripe for it, and the character down at the door with his uniform as blue as the sky and as golden as the sun, the doorman, and the officers and generals walking this way and that, not nearly so gorgeous, of course, but in uniform all the same, all ripe to be shot. There'd be shooting from every side. No one would escape. Not this one, not that or the other. The time for joking was past. They're going to shoot! I yelled at the top of my lungs in the middle of the lobby. They're going to shoot! Beat it, all of you! I went to the window and shouted some more. What a disturbance! Poor soldier boy, the people said. The concierge led me gently to the bar, by suasion. He gave me something to drink, and I drank quite a lot. And then the MPs came and took me away, not so gently. There'd been MPs at the Gallery of the Nations, too. I'd seen them. Lola kissed me and helped them to take me away with their handcuffs. Then I fell sick. I was delirious, driven mad by fear, they said at the hospital. Maybe so. The best thing to do when you're in this world, don't you agree, is to get out of it. Crazy or not, scared or not. There was quite a commotion. Some people said, That young fellow's an anarchist. They'll shoot him. The sooner the better. Can't let the grass grow under our feet with a war on. But there were others, more patient, who thought I was just syphilitic and sincerely insane. They consequently wanted me to be locked up until the war was over, or at least for several months, because they, who claimed to be sane and in their right minds, wanted to take care of me while they carried on the war all by themselves. Which proves that if you want people to think you're normal, there's nothing like having an all-fired nerve. If you've got plenty of nerve, you're all set, because then you're entitled to do practically anything at all. You've got the majority on your side, and it's the majority who decide what's crazy and what isn't. Even so, my diagnosis was very doubtful. So the authorities decided to put me under observation for a while. My little friend Lola had permission to visit me now and then, and so did my mother. That was all. We, the befogged wounded, were lodged in a secondary school at issy le moulineaux especially rigged to take in soldiers like me, whose patriotism was either impaired or dangerously sick, and get us by cajolery or force to confess. The treatment wasn't really bad, but we felt we were being watched every minute of the day by the staff of silent male nurses endowed with enormous ears. After a varying period of observation, we'd be quietly sent away and assigned to an insane asylum, the front, or, not infrequently, the firing squad. 
Among the comrades assembled in that suspect institution, I always wondered, while listening to them talking in whispers in the mess hall, which ones might be on the point of becoming ghosts. In her little cottage near the gate dwelt the concierge, who sold us barley, sugar, and oranges, as well as the wherewithal for sewing on buttons. She also sold us pleasure. For non-coms, the price of pleasure was ten francs. Everybody could have it. But watch your step, because men tend to get too confiding on such situations. An expansive moment could cost you dearly. Whatever was confided to her, she repeated in detail to the chief medical officer, and it went into your court-martial record. It seemed reliably established that she'd had a corporal of spahis, a youngster still in his teens, shot for his confidences, as well as a reservist in the Corps of Engineers who had swallowed nails to put his stomach out of commission, and a hysteric who had described his method of staging a paralytic seizure at the front. One evening, to sound me out, she offered me the identification papers of a father of six, who was dead, she told me, saying they might help me to a rear echelon assignment. In short, she was a snake. In bed, though, she was superb. We came back again and again, and the pleasure she purveyed was real. She may have been a slut, but at least she was a real one. To give royal pleasure they've got to be. In the kitchens of love, after all, vice is like the pepper in a good sauce. It brings out the flavor. It's indispensable. The school buildings opened out on a big terrace, golden in summer, surrounded by trees, with a magnificent panoramic view of Paris. It was there that our visitors waited for us on Thursdays, including Lola, as regular as clockwork, bringing cakes, advice, and cigarettes. We saw our doctors every morning. They questioned us amiably enough, but we never knew exactly what they were thinking. Under their affable smiles, as they walked among us, they carried our death sentences. The mealy-mouthed atmosphere reduced some of the patients under observation, more emotional than the rest, to such a state of exasperation that at night, instead of sleeping, they paced the ward from end to end, loudly protesting against their own anguish, convulsed between hope and despair, as on a dangerous mountain spur. For days and days they suffered, and then suddenly, one night, they'd go to pieces, run to the chief medical officer, and confess everything. They'd never be seen again. I wasn't easy in my mind myself, but when you're weak, the best way to fortify yourself is to strip the people you fear of the last bit of prestige you're still inclined to give them. Learn to consider them as they are, worse than they are, in fact, and from every point of view. That will release you, set you free, protect you more than you can possibly imagine. It will give you another self. There will be two of you. That will strip their words and deeds of the obscene, mystical fascination that weakens you and makes you waste your time. From then on you'll find their act no more amusing, no more relevant to your inner progress, than that of the lowliest pig. Beside me, in the next bed, there was a corporal, a volunteer like me. Up until August, he had been a teacher at a secondary school in Touraine, teaching history and geography, so he told me. After a few months in the front lines, this teacher had turned out to be a champion thief. Nothing could stop him from stealing canned goods from the regimental supply train, the quartermaster trucks, the company stores, and anywhere else he could find them. So he'd landed there with the rest of us, while presumably awaiting court-martial. But since his family persisted in trying to prove that he had been stupefied and demoralized by shell-shock, the prosecution deferred his trial from month to month. He didn't talk to me very much. He spent hours combing his beard, but when he spoke to me, it was almost always about the same thing, about the method he had discovered for not getting his wife with any more children. Was he really insane? 
at a time when the world is upside down and it's thought insane to ask why you're being murdered, it obviously requires no great effort to pass for a lunatic. Of course, your act has got to be convincing, but when it comes to keeping out of the big slaughterhouse, some people's imaginations become magnificently fertile. Everything that's important goes on in the darkness, no doubt about it. We never know anyone's real inside story. This teacher's name was Princhard. What can the man have dreamed up to save his carotids, lungs, and optic nerves? That was the crucial question, the question we men should have asked one another if we'd wanted to be strictly human and rational. Far from it, we staggered along in a world of idealistic absurdities, hemmed in by insane, bellicose platitudes. Like smoke-maddened rats, we tried to escape from the burning ship, but we had no general plan, no faith in one another. Dazed by the war, we had developed a different kind of madness. Fear. The heads and tails of the war. In the midst of the general delirium, this Princhard took a certain liking to me, though he distrusted me, of course. In the place and situation we were in, friendship and trust were out of the question. No one revealed any more than he thought useful for his survival, since everything, or practically everything, was sure to be repeated by some attentive stool pigeon. From time to time one of us disappeared. That meant the case against him was ready, and the court-martial would sentence him to a disciplinary battalion, to the front, or, if he was very lucky, to the insane asylum in Clamar. More dubious warriors kept arriving from every branch of service, some very young, some almost old, some terrified, some ranting and swaggering. Their wives and parents came to see them, and their children, too, staring wide-eyed, on Thursdays. They all wept buckets in the visiting room, especially in the evening. All the helplessness of a world at war wept when the visits were over and the women and children left, dragging their feet in the bleak, gaslit corridor. A herd of sniveling riffraff, that's what they were, disgusting. To Lola it was still an adventure, coming to see me in that prison, as you might have called it. We two didn't cry. Where would we have got our tears from? Is it true that you've gone mad, Ferdinand? she asked me one Thursday. It's true, I admitted. But they'll treat you here? There's no treatment for fear, Lola. Is it as bad as all that? It's worse, Lola. My fear is so bad that if I die a natural death later on, I especially don't want to be cremated. I want them to leave me in the ground, quietly rotting in the graveyard, ready to come back to life. Maybe. How do we know? But if they burned me to ashes, Lola, don't you see, it would be over, really over. A skeleton, after all, is still something like a man. It's more likely to come back to life than ashes. Reduced to ashes, you're finished. What do you think? Naturally, the war— Oh, Ferdinand! Then you're an absolute coward. You're as loathsome as a rat. Yes, an absolute coward, Lola. I reject the war and everything in it. I don't deplore it. I don't resign myself to it. I don't weep about it. I just plain reject it and all its fighting men. I don't want anything to do with them or it. Even if there were nine hundred and ninety-five million of them and I were all alone, they'd still be wrong and I'd be right, because I'm the one who knows what I want. I don't want to die. But it's not possible to reject the war, Ferdinand. Only crazy people and cowards reject the war when their country is in danger. If that's the case, hurrah for the crazy people. Look, Lola. Do you remember a single name, for instance, of any of the soldiers killed in the Hundred Years' War? Did you ever try to find out who any of them were? No. You see, you never tried. As far as you're concerned, they're as anonymous, as indifferent, as the last atom of that paperweight, as your morning bowel movement. 
Get it into your head, Lola, that they died for nothing, for absolutely nothing, the idiots. I say it and I'll say it again. I've proved it. The one thing that counts is life. In ten thousand years, I'll bet you this war, remarkable as it may seem to us at present, will be utterly forgotten. Maybe here and there in the world a handful of scholars will argue about its causes or the dates of the principal hecatombs that made it famous. Up until now, those are the only things about men that other men have thought worth remembering after a few centuries, a few years, or even a few hours. I don't believe in the future, Lola. When she heard me flaunting my shameful state like that, she lost all sympathy for me. Once and for all, she put me down as contemptible and decided to leave me without further ado. I was too much. When I left her that evening at the hospital gate, she didn't kiss me. Evidently, the thought that a condemned man might have no vocation for death was too much for her. When I asked her how our pancakes were doing, she did not reply. On my return to the dormitory, I found Princhard at the window with a crowd of soldiers around him. He was trying out a pair of dark glasses on the gaslight. The idea, he explained, had come to him last summer at the seashore, and since it was summer now, he was planning to wear them next day in the park. The park was enormous and exceedingly well policed by squads of vigilant orderlies. The next day, Princhard insisted on my going for a walk on the terrace with him to try out his beautiful glasses. A blazing afternoon beat down on him, defended by his opaque lenses. I noticed that his nose was almost transparent at the nostrils, and that he was breathing hard. My friend, he confided, Time is passing, and it's not on my side. My conscience is immune to remorse. I have been relieved, thank God, of those fears. It's not crimes that count in this world. People stopped counting them long ago. What counts is blunders. And I believe I've made one that's absolutely irremediable. Stealing canned goods? Yes, just imagine. I thought I was being so clever. My idea was to abstract myself from the battle and return, disgraced but still alive, to peace as one returns exhausted to the surface of the sea after a long dive. I almost succeeded. But this war undoubtedly has been going on too long. So long that cannon fodder disgusting enough to disgust the patry is no longer conceivable. She has begun to accept every offering, regardless of where it comes from, every variety of meat. Today there's no such thing as a soldier unworthy to bear arms, and above all to die under arms and by arms. They're going, latest news, to make a hero out of me. How imperious the homicidal madness must have become if they're willing to pardon, no, to forget, the theft of a can of meat. True, we have got into the habit of admiring colossal bandits whose opulence is revered by the entire world, yet whose existence, once we stop to examine it, proves to be one long crime repeated ad infinitum. But those same bandits are heaped with glory, honors, arid power, their crimes are hallowed by the law of the land, whereas as far back in history as the eye can see, and history, as you know, is my business, everything conspires to show that a venial theft, especially of inglorious foodstuffs, such as bread crusts, ham, or cheese, unfailingly subjects its perpetrator to irreparable opprobrium, the categoric condemnation of the community, major punishment, automatic dishonor, and inexpiable shame. And this for two reasons. First, because the perpetrator of such an offense is usually poor, which in itself connotes basic unworthiness, and secondly, because his act implies, as it were, a tacit reproach to the community. A poor man's theft 
is seen as a malicious attempt at individual redress. Where would we be? Note, accordingly, that in all countries the penalty for petty theft are extremely severe, not only as a means of defending society, but also as a stern admonition to the unfortunate to know their place, stick to their caste, and behave themselves, joyfully resigned to go on dying of hunger and misery down through the centuries forever and ever. Until today, however, petty thieves enjoyed one advantage in the Republic. They were denied the honor of bearing patriotic arms. But that's all over now. Tomorrow I, a thief, will resume my place in the army. Such are the orders. It has been decided in high places to forgive and forget what they call my momentary madness, and this, listen carefully, in consideration of what they call the honor of my family. What solicitude? I ask you, comrade, is it my family that's going to serve as a strainer and sorting house for mixed French and German bullets? It'll just be me, won't it? And when I'm dead, is the honor of my family going to bring me back to life? I can see how it will be with my family when these warlike scenes have passed, as everything passes. I can see my family on fine Sundays, joyfully gambling on the lawns of a new summer, while three feet under Papa, that's me, dripping with worms and infinitely more disgusting than ten pounds of turds on the 14th of July, will be rotting stupendously with all my deluded flesh. Fertilize the fields of the anonymous plowman. That is the true future of the true soldier. Ah, comrade, this world, I assure you, is only a vast device for kidding the world. You are young. Let these minutes of wisdom be as years to you. Listen well, comrade, and don't fail to recognize and understand the tell-tale sign which glares from all the murderous hypocrisies of our society, compassion with the fate, the condition of the poor. I tell you, little man, life's fall guys, beaten, fleeced to the bone, sweated from time immemorial, I warn you, that when the princes of this world start loving you, it means they're going to grind you up into battle sausage. That's the sign. It's infallible. It starts with affection. Louis the Fourteenth, at least, and don't forget it, didn't give a hoot in hell about his beloved people. Louis the Fifteenth ditto. He smeared his asshole with them. True, we didn't live well in those days. The poor have never lived well, but the kings didn't flay them with the obstinacy, the persistence you meet with in today's tyrants. There's no rest, I tell you, for the little man, except in the contempt of the great, whose only motive for thinking of the common people is self-interest, when it isn't sadism. It's the philosophers, another point to look out for while we're at it, who first started giving the people ideas when all they'd known up until then was the catechism. They began, so they proclaimed, to educate the people. Ah, what truths they had to reveal! Beautiful, brilliant, unprecedented truths, and the people were dazzled. That's it, they said, that's the stuff, let's go and die for it. The people are always willing to die, that's the way they are. Long live Diderot, they yelled, and long live Voltaire. They, at least, were first-class philosophers. And long live Carnot, too, who was so good at organizing victories. And long live everybody. Those guys, at least, don't let the beloved people molder in ignorance and fetishism. They show the people the roads of freedom, emancipation. Things went fast after that. First, teach everybody to read the papers. That's the way to salvation. Hurry, hurry, no more illiterates. We don't need them any more. Nothing but citizen soldiers who vote, who read, and who fight, and who march, and send kisses from the front. In no time the people were good and ripe. 
The enthusiasm of the liberated has to be good for something, doesn't it? Danton wasn't eloquent for the hell of it. With a few phrases so rousing that we can still hear them today, he had the people mobilized before you could say fiddlesticks. That was when the first battalions of emancipated maniacs marched off. The first voting, phlegmatic suckers that Dumouriez led away to get themselves drilled full of holes in Flanders. As for Dumouriez himself, who had come too late to these new-fangled idealistic pastimes, he discovered that he was more interested in money and deserted. He was our last mercenary. The free gratis soldier was something really new, so new that when Goethe arrived in Valmy, Goethe or not, he was flabbergasted. At the sight of those ragged, impassioned cohorts who had come of their own free will to get themselves disemboweled by the King of Prussia in defense of a patriotic fiction no one had ever heard of, Goethe realized that he still had much to learn. This day, he declaimed grandiloquently, as befitted the habits of his genius, marks the beginning of a new era. He could say that again. The system proved successful. Pretty soon they were mass-producing heroes, and in the end, the system was so well perfected that they cost practically nothing. Everyone was delighted. Bismarck, the two Napoleons, Barres, Elsa the horsewoman. The religion of the flag promptly replaced the cult of heaven, an old cloud which had already been deflated by the Reformation and reduced to a network of episcopal money boxes. In olden times, the fanatical fashion was long live Jesus, burn the heretics. But heretics, after all, were few and voluntary whereas today vast hordes of men are fired with aim and purpose by cries of hang the limp turnips, the juiceless lemons, the innocent readers, by the millions, eyes right. If anybody doesn't want to fight or murder, grab them, tear them to pieces, kill them in thirteen juicy ways. For a starter, to teach them how to live— rip their guts out of their bodies, their eyes out of their sockets, and the years out of their filthy, slobbering lives. Let whole legions of them perish, turn into smidgens, bleed, smolder in acid, and all that to make the pottery more beloved, more fair, and more joyful. And if in their midst there are any foul creatures who refuse to understand these sublime truths— they can just go and bury themselves right with the others. No, not quite. Their place will be at the far end of the cemetery, under the shameful epitaphs of cowards without an ideal. For those contemptible slugs will have forfeited the glorious right to a small patch of the shadow of the municipal monument erected by the lowest bidder in the central avenue to commemorate the reputable dead— and also the right to hear so much as a distant echo of the minister's speech next Sunday, when he comes around to urinate at the prefecture and sound off over the graves after lunch. But from the end of the garden someone was calling Princhard. The head physician had sent his orderly to get him on the double. Coming! Princhard cried. He had barely time enough to hand me the draft of the speech he had been trying out on me. A ham, if there ever was one. I never saw Princhard again. He had the same trouble as all intellectuals. He was ineffectual. He knew too many things, and they confused him. He needed all sorts of gimmicks to steam him up, help him make up his mind. It's been a long time since that night when he went away. But I remember it well. Suddenly the houses at the end of our park stood out sharply, as things do before the night takes hold of them. The trees grew larger in the twilight and shot up to the sky to meet the night. I never made any attempt to get in touch with Princhard, to find out if he had really disappeared, as they kept saying but it's best if he disappeared. While the war was still on, 
the seeds of our hateful peace were being sown. A hysterical bitch. You could see what she'd be like just by watching her cavorting in the dance hall of the Olympia. In that long cellar room, you could see her squinting out of a hundred mirrors, stamping her feet in the dust and despair to the music of a Negro Judeo Saxon band. Britishers and blacks, Levantines and Russians were everywhere, smoking and bellowing. Military melancholics lined up on the red plush sofas. Those uniforms that people are beginning to find it hard to remember were the seeds of the present day, of something that is still growing and that won't become total shit for a while yet, but will in the long run. Every week, after spending a few hours at the Olympia warming up our desires, a few of us would go calling on our friend Madame Merot, who kept a lingerie glove and bookshop in the Impasse de Beresinas, behind the Folies Bergère, a covered passage that isn't there any more, where little girls brought little dogs on leashes to do their business. We went there to grope for our happiness, which all the world was threatening with the utmost ferocity. We were ashamed of wanting what we wanted, but something had to be done about it all the same. Love is harder to give up than life, in this world we spend our time killing or adoring, or both together. I hate you. I adore you. We keep going. We fuel and refuel. We pass on our life to a biped of the next century with frenzy at any cost, as if it were the greatest of pleasures to perpetuate ourselves, as if, when all said and done, it would make us immortal. One way or another— Kissing is as indispensable as scratching. My mental state had improved, but my military situation was still uncertain. I had leave to go out now and then. Anyway, the name of our lingerie lady was Madame Erot. Her forehead was low and so narrow that at first you felt uneasy in her presence, but her lips were so smiling and voluptuous that after a while you didn't see how you could get away from her. Under a surface of staggering volubility and unforgettable ardor, she concealed the set of simple, rapacious, and piously mercantile aims. In a few months she piled up a fortune, thanks to the Allies and thanks above all to her uterus. Her ovaries had been removed. To put it plainly, she had been operated for salpingitis the year before. That liberating castration had made her fortune. Gonorrhea in a woman can be providential. A woman who spends her time worrying about pregnancy is a virtual cripple. She'll never go very far. Old men and young men thought, and so did I, that love was easily and cheaply available in the back rooms of certain lingerie bookshops. That was still true some twenty years ago. But today a lot of things aren't done any more, especially some of the most agreeable. Every month Anglo-Saxon Puritanism is drying us up a little more. It has already reduced those impromptu backroom carousals to practically nothing. Now marriage and respectability are the thing. In those days, for the last time, there was still freedom to fuck standing up and cheap, and Madame Erot put it to good use. One Sunday an auction room appraiser with time on his hands sighted her shop and went in. He's still there. He was slightly gaga, and gaga he remained, but nothing more. Their happiness aroused no interest in the neighborhood. In the shadow of the newspapers, with their delirious appeals for ultimate patriotic sacrifices, life went on, strictly rationed, larded with precautions, and more trickily resourceful than ever before. Those are the heads and tails, the light and shade of the same coin. Madame Erot's appraiser invested money in Holland for his better-informed friends, and for Madame Erot as well, once they became intimate. Her stock of neckties and brassieres and almost chemises attracted customers of both sexes, and brought them back time and time again. 
Any number of national and international encounters took place in the pink shadow of those curtains, amid the incessant loquacity of Madame Herot, whose substantial, talkative, and overwhelmingly perfumed person would have put the most bilious of males in a lecherous mood. Far from losing her head in these miscellaneous gatherings, Madame Herot turned them to her advantage, first in terms of money, since she levied a tithe on all sentimental transactions, but also through her enjoyment of all the love-making that went on around her. She took pleasure in bringing couples together, and as much or more in breaking them up by means of tale-telling, insinuations, and out-and-out -out treachery. She never wearied of fomenting happiness and tragedy. She stoked the life of the passions, and her business prospered. Proust, who was half-ghost, immersed himself with extraordinary tenacity in the infinitely watery futility of the rites and procedures that entwine the members of high society, those denizens of the void, those phantoms of desire, those irresolute daisy-chainers still waiting for their Watteau, those listless seekers after implausible Cytherius. Whereas Madame Erot, with her sturdy popular origins, was firmly fastened to the earth by her crude, stupid, and very specific appetites. Maybe, if people are so wicked, it's only because they suffer. But years can elapse between the time when they stop suffering and the time when their characters take a turn for the better. Madame Erot's impressive material and amatory success hadn't had time yet to soften her rapacious instincts. She was no more hateful than most of the shopkeeping ladies about, but she took so much trouble convincing people of the contrary that one doesn't tend to forget her. Her shop was more than a meeting place. It was a kind of secret gateway to a world of wealth and luxury, in which, much as I had wanted to, I had never set foot until then, and from which I was promptly and embarrassingly ejected after one furtive incursion my first and last. In Paris, the rich live together. Their neighborhoods adjoin and coalesce, so as to form a wedge of urban cake, the tip of which touches the Louvre, and the rounded outer edge is bounded by the trees between the Pont de Toy and the Port de Terne. That's the good part of the city. All the rest is shit and misery. At first glance, the rich neighborhoods don't look so very different from the rest of the city, except that the streets are a little cleaner. But if you want to go deeper in your excursion, to get inside the people who live there, you'll have to rely on chance or on intimate connections. Madame Erot's shop could give you some little access to this preserve, through the Argentines that came in from the privileged neighborhoods to buy shirts and underwear and flirt with the unusual selection of ambitious, theatrical, musical, and well-built young friends whom Madame Erot deliberately gathered around her. I, who, as they say, had nothing to offer but my youth, became too much interested in one of them. Little Mousine, they called her in her crowd. In the Passage de Beresinas, the shopkeepers all knew one another, it was like a provincial village wedged for years between two Paris streets. In other words, everybody slandered and spied on everybody else as much as was humanly and deliriously possible. What the shopkeepers mostly talked and complained about before the war was the petty, desperately thrifty life they all led. Among other sordid hardships, the chronic complaint of those shopkeepers was being obliged by the prevailing gloom to light their gas at four in the afternoon because of their showcases. But inside the shops, the self-same twilight made for an atmosphere conducive to off-color suggestions. Nevertheless, a good many of the shops were being ruined by the war, while Madame Erotz, thanks to the young Argentines, to officers with per diem allowances, and to the advice of her friend the appraiser, enjoyed a prosperity on which, as you can easily imagine, the whole neighborhood commented in the most vitriolic terms. 
It was just about then, for instance, that the famous pastry shop at 112 lost its best customers. The latest mobilization was to blame. So many horses had been requisitioned that the ladies with the long gloves, who had dropped in regularly at tea time, would have been obliged to walk. They stopped coming, and they never came back. Sambonet, the music binder, was suddenly unable to resist the urge, which had long tormented him, to sodomize a soldier. A bungled attempt one night did him irreparable harm with certain patriotic gentlemen who accused him forthwith of being a spy. He was obliged to close up shop. Then Mademoiselle Hermance, at number 26, who had hitherto specialized in the sale of a certain mentionable or unmentionable item made of rubber, would have been doing all right under the prevailing circumstances if she hadn't found it so unconscionably difficult to procure her merry widows, which were made in Germany. In short, it was only Madame Erot who, on the threshold of a new era of lighter-than-air democratic lingerie, found an easy way to prosperity. Plenty of anonymous letters were written from shop to shop, and they didn't mince words. Madame Erot preferred for her entertainment to write to highly placed persons, so demonstrating that a virulent ambition was the cornerstone of her character. She wrote several to the premier, for instance, just to convince him that he was a cuckold, and some to Marshal Pétain in English, with the help of a dictionary, to drive him crazy. But what's an anonymous letter? Water off a duck's back. Every day Madame Erot received a whole packet of these unsigned letters, which didn't smell good, I assure you. She'd be pensive, upset, for about ten minutes— but then she'd recover her composure. She didn't care how or by what means, but she got it back good and solid, for there was no place for doubt in her inner life, and still less for truth. Among her customers and protégés, there were several young ladies from the entertainment world, actresses and musicians, who came with more debts than clothes. Madame Erot gave them advice, and it helped them no end. One of them was Moussine, the most attractive of the lot for my money. Moussine was a musician. She played the violin, a very shrewd little angel, as I was soon to learn. Implacable in her determination to succeed here on earth and not in heaven, she was doing all right at the time of our first meeting, in an adorable, exceedingly Parisian, and now completely forgotten little act at the Varieté. She'd appear with her violin in a kind of impromptu prologue in melody and verse, a charming, complicated genre. Smitten as I was, my days became a frenzy, dashing from the hospital to the back door of her theater. I was seldom alone in waiting for her. The ground forces would snatch her away in a twinkling. The flyers had an even easier time of it, but undoubtedly the seduction prize went to the Argentines. As more and more soldiers swarmed to the colors, their cold-storage meat business assumed the proportions of a tidal wave. Little Mouzine made a good thing of those profiteering days. She knew what she was doing. Since then, the Argentines have gone out of existence. I didn't understand. I was being hornswoggled by everything and everybody, women, money, and ideas. I was a sucker, and I didn't like it. I still run into Mouzine now and then. Every two years or so she crosses my path, as people one has known well tend to. Two years is the time it takes to perceive at one glance, a glance as sure as instinct, the ugliness that can come over a face, even one that was delicious in its day. For a moment you hesitate, then you accept the face as it has become, with its repugnant, cumulative disharmony. What can you do but acquiesce in this slow, painstaking caricature which two years have etched, but accept the passage of time, that portrait of ourselves? Then we can say that we've really recognized each other, like some foreign banknote that one hesitates to accept at first sight, that we hadn't taken a wrong turn, that each on his own We'd traveled the right road, 
the inevitable road to decay for another two years. That's all there is to it. When she ran into me like that, I frightened her so with my big head, it looked as if she wanted to run away, to avoid me, to turn aside anything. Obviously, as far as she was concerned, I stank of a whole past. But I've known her age for too long. And try as she will, she absolutely can't escape me. She stands there, evidently put off by my existence as if I were a monster. She, so sensitive, feels obliged to ask me crude, stupid questions, the kind that a housemaid caught stealing sugar might ask. All women are domestics at heart, but possibly she imagines this revulsion more than she feels it. That's the only consolation I can find. Maybe I'm not really repulsive, but only give her the illusion that I am. Maybe I'm an artist in that line. After all, why wouldn't there be an art of ugliness as well as beauty? Maybe it's a gift that needs to be cultivated. For a long time I thought little Musine was stupid, but that was only because I was vain and she had run out on me. Before the war, you know, we were all a lot more ignorant and conceited than today. A little nobody like me was much more likely to take rubbish for rainbows than he would be today. I thought being in love with somebody as adorable as Musine would give me every kind of strength and virtue, especially the courage I lacked, just because she was so pretty and such a gifted musician. Love is like liquor. The drunker and more impotent you are, the stronger and smarter you think yourself, and the surer you are of your rights. Dozens of Madame Erot's cousins had made the supreme sacrifice, so she never left her passage except in deep mourning. To tell the truth, she seldom went out, because the appraiser was pretty jealous. We gathered in the dining room behind the shop, which, with the coming of prosperity, had taken on the appearance of a little salon. There we would chat and pass the time in a pleasant, well-behaved kind of way under the gas jet. Little Musine at the piano would charm us with classical pieces. Only classical music was thought fitting in those sorrowful times. We'd sit there for whole afternoons, side by side, the appraiser in the middle, musing over our secrets, our fears and hopes. Madame Erot's maid whom she had hired only a short time before, was always bursting with impatience to find out when this one would finally make up his mind to marry that one. In her village, free love was unheard of. All those Argentines and officers and slippery-fingered customers filled her with an almost animal terror. More and more often, Musine was monopolized by the South American customers. What with waiting for my angel... I soon got to know the caballeros' kitchens and servants very well. Naturally, the valets took me for a pimp. In the end, everybody took me for a pimp, including Musine, and, I'm pretty sure, the regulars at Madame Erot's shop. There was nothing I could do about it. Sooner or later, people are bound to classify you as something. I wangled another two months' convalescent leave, and there was even some talk of a medical discharge. Musine and I decided to go and live together in Biancourt. This was actually a subterfuge to ditch me, because she took advantage of its being so far away to come home less and less frequently. She was always finding some pretext for spending the night in Paris. The nights in Biancourt were soft and sweet, enlivened now and then by those childish airplane or zeppelin alarms which provided the civilian population with thrills and self-justification. While waiting for Musine, I'd walk as far as the Pont du Grenelle, where the darkness rises from the river to the overhead metro tracks, with their strings of lights traversing the darkness and their enormous metallic hulks hurling themselves like thunder at the flanks of the big buildings on the Quai du Passy. There are neighborhoods like that in big cities so stupidly ugly that you're almost always alone there. In the end, Musine was showing up at our so-called home only once a week. 
More and more often she'd spend the evening accompanying some lady singer at the house of some Argentine. She could have made a living playing at the movies, and it would have been a lot easier for me to call for her, but the Argentines were lively and paid well, while the movie houses were dismal and the pay was wretched. Life is made up of those little preferences. To complete my misery, the theater of the armies came along. In no time, Musine got to know dozens of people at the ministry. More and more often, she went off to entertain our soldier boys at the front and stayed away for weeks on end, serving up sonatas and adagios to the troops. The front seats in the orchestra would be occupied by top brass, well-placed to admire her legs, while the soldiers, seated on wooden stands behind their commanders, had to make do with melodious echoes. After the performance, of course, she would spend exceedingly complicated nights in the hotels of the army area. One day she came home as happy as a lark, brandishing a certificate of heroism, signed, if you please, by one of our glorious generals. With that diploma she became a real success. It made her ever so popular with the Argentine colony. They feted her. They were mad about my Musine. Oh, what an adorable little front-line violinist, so rosy-cheeked and curly-headed, and a heroine to boot. Those Argentines knew which side their bread was buttered on. Their admiration for our glorious generals knew no bounds. And when my Musine came back to them with her authentic document— her pretty fizz and her nimble, heroic little fingers, each tried to love her more than the next. They tried to outbid each other, so to speak. The poetry of heroism holds an irresistible appeal for people who aren't involved in a war, especially when they're making piles of money out of one. It's only natural. Ah, jaunty heroism! Strong men have swooned away, the shipbuilders of Rio offered their names and their shares to the adorable young thing who feminized the warlike valor of the French so charmingly for their benefit. Musine, I have to admit, had managed to outfit herself with a delightful little repertory of war adventures. They were wonderfully becoming like a jaunty little cap. Sometimes she amazed me with her skillful touch— and listening to her I had to own that when it came to tall stories I was a clumsy faker compared to her. She had a gift for locating her fantasies in a dramatic faraway setting that gave everything a lasting glow. It often struck me that when we combatants spun yarns they tended to be crudely chronometric and precise. Her medium was eternity." Claude Lorraine was right in saying that the foreground of a picture is always repugnant and that the interest of an artwork must be seen in the distance, in that unfathomable realm which is the refuge of lies, of those dreams caught in the act which are the only thing men love. The woman who can turn our despicable nature to account has no difficulty in becoming our darling, our indispensable and supreme hope. We expect her to preserve our illusory raison d'etre, but on the other hand she can make a very good living while performing this magic function. Instinctively, Musine did just that. The Argentines lived in the Terne area and on the fringes of the Bois, in small private houses, resplendent and well-fenced in, which were kept so delightfully warm in that wintry weather that when you came in from the street your thoughts suddenly took an optimistic turn. You couldn't help it. In my jittery despair I had taken to waiting for Musine in the butler's pantry as often as possible. A stupid thing to do. Sometimes I waited until morning. I was sleepy, but jealousy kept me awake, and so did the quantities of white wine the servants poured out for me. I seldom saw the Argentine masters of the house— I heard their songs and their blustering Spanish and the piano which never stopped, but was usually being played by other hands than those of my Musine. What, meanwhile, was she doing with her hands, the slut? When she saw me at the door in the morning she made a face. I was still as natural as an animal in those days. I was like a dog with a bone. I wouldn't let go. 
People waste a large part of their youth in stupid mistakes. It was obvious that my darling was going to leave me flat and soon. I hadn't found out yet that mankind consists of two very different races, the rich and the poor. It took me, and plenty of other people, twenty years in the war to learn to stick to my class and ask the price of things before touching them, let alone setting my heart on them. So, as I warmed myself in the pantry with the servants, I was unaware that the people dancing over my head were Argentine gods. They could have been German, French, or Chinese. That didn't mean a thing. The point was that they were gods, rich people. That's what I should have realized. Them upstairs with Musine, me downstairs with nothing. Musine was thinking seriously of her future, and naturally she preferred to do that kind of thinking with a god. I, too, was thinking of my future, but in a kind of delirium, because my constant companion was a muted fear of being killed in the war or of starving when peace came. I had a death sentence hanging over me, and I was in love. A nightmare, to put it mildly. Not far away, less than seventy miles, millions of brave, well-armed, well-trained men were waiting to settle my hash, and plenty of Frenchmen were waiting, too, to pump me full of lead if I declined to be cut into bleeding ribbons by the opposite side. A poor man in this world can be done to death in two main ways, by the absolute indifference of his fellows in peacetime, or by their homicidal mania when there's a war. When other people start thinking about you, it's to figure out how to torture you, that and nothing else. The bastards want to see you bleeding, otherwise they're not interested. Princhard was dead right. In the shadow of the slaughterhouse, you don't speculate very much about your future. You think about loving in the days you have left, because there's no other way of forgetting your body that's about to be skinned alive. Since Musine was slipping away from me, I took myself for an idealist, which is the name we give to our little instincts clothed in high-sounding words. My leave was drawing to an end. The newspapers were summoning every conceivable combatant to the colors. First of all, it goes without saying, the ones without connections— an official order had gone out that no one should think of anything but winning the war. Musine, like Lola, was extremely eager to have me get back to the front on the double and stay there, and since I seemed to be dragging my feet, she decided to expedite matters, which was unusual for her. One night, when for a change we went home to Biancourt together, the fire brigade came by blowing bugles, and everybody in our house went scrambling down to the cellar in honor of some zeppelin. Those petty panics, when a whole neighborhood in pajamas would pick up candles and vanish, cackling and clucking into the bowels of the earth to escape a peril that was almost entirely imaginary, showed up the terrifying futility of these people, who behaved by turns like frightened hens and sheepish sheep. These preposterous inconsistencies ought to disgust the most patient, the most tenacious of sociophiles for good and all. At the first blast of the bugle, Musine forgot every bit of the heroism for which she had been cited at the theater of the armies. She insisted on rushing into some hole and dragging me with her, into the metro, the sewers, anywhere, as long as it was sheltered and deep enough underground. After a while, the sight of all those people, our fellow tenants, fat and thin, jovial and majestic, descending four by four into the salutary pit, armed even me with indifference. Brave or cowardly, there's not much difference. A poltroon in one situation, a hero in another. It's the same man, and he doesn't think any more in one aspect than in the other. Everything unrelated to making money is infinitely beyond him. The question of life and death escapes him completely. Even on the subject of his own death, his cogitations are feeble and ass-backward. He understands money and theatricals, nothing else. Musine whined when I resisted. Other tenants urged us to come along, and in the end I gave in. 
There were several cellar compartments to choose from, and various suggestions were made. The majority finally favored the butcher's storage cellar. It was deeper down, so they said, than any of the others. On the stairs I caught a whiff of an acrid odor that I knew only too well and which I absolutely couldn't bear. Musine, I said, are you really going down there, with all that meat hanging on hooks? The question surprised her. Why not? Well, I said, I have certain memories. I'd rather go back upstairs. You mean you're leaving me? You'll join me as soon as it's over. But it may go on a long time. I'd rather wait for you upstairs, I said. I don't like meat, and it'll be over soon. During the alert, sheltered in their dens, the tenants exchanged sprightly comments. Some ladies in kimonos, the last to arrive, swept with elegance and grace into that odiferous chasm where the butcher and his wife bade them welcome, at the same time apologizing for the artificial cold, indispensable for the conservation of their merchandise. Muzine vanished with the rest. I waited in our apartment, a night... A whole day? A year? She never came back to me. From that time on, I became harder and harder to please. I had only two thoughts in my head, to save my skin and go to America. But getting away from the war was a first step which kept me busy and breathless for months and months. The patriots kept clamoring, Guns! Men! Ammunition! They never seemed to get tired. It looked as if they wouldn't be able to sleep until poor Belgium and innocent little Alsace were wrested from the German yoke. It was an obsession which, so we were told, prevented the best of our fellow citizens from breathing, eating, or copulating. But it didn't seem to prevent the survivors from swinging business deals. Morel was doing all right on the home front. There was every reason to ship us back to our regiments in a hurry. But when the medics looked me over, they still found me subnormal, barely good enough to be sent to another hospital, this one for the bones and nervous system. One morning, six of us, three artillerymen and three dragoons, all of us sick and wounded, left the depot in quest of this institution where shattered courage, demolished reflexes, and broken arms were repaired. First, like all wounded soldiers at the time, we stopped for a checkup at the Val de Grasse, that noble pot-bellied citadel with its beard of trees. The corridors smelled like a third-class railway carriage, a smell that's gone today, forever no doubt, compounded of feet, straw, and oil lamps. We didn't hang fire at the Val. They'd barely caught sight of us when two administrative, bedandruffed and overworked officers, chewed us out good and proper, threatened us with a court-martial, and projected us via other administrators into the street. They had no room for us, so they said, and directed us very vaguely to a bastion situated somewhere in the outskirts. From bistro to bastion, from absinthe to café creme, the six of us wandered about at the mercy of every misdirector in search of this new refuge, which seemed to specialize in the treatment of incompetent heroes like us. Only one of us had even the most rudimentary personal property, and that fitted nicely into a little tin box marked Pernod Biscuits, a well-known brand at the time, though I never hear it mentioned any more. In that box, our comrade kept a few cigarettes and a toothbrush. Come to think of it, we used to kid him about the care he took of his teeth, which was most unusual at the time. Homosexual, we used to call him. Finally, in the middle of the night, we approached the outworks, swollen with darkness of the Bicetre Bastion. Number 43, it was called. That was the place. It had just been renovated to serve as a home for elderly cripples. They hadn't even finished laying out the garden. When we got there, there wasn't a living soul in the military section, only the concierge. The rain was coming down in buckets. 
The concierge was terrified when she heard us, but we made her laugh by touching her in the right place. I thought it was the Germans, she said. They're miles away, we told her. Where are you wounded? she asked with concern. All over, but not in the cock, said one of the artillerymen. That, I don't mind telling you, was real wit, just the kind the concierge liked. Later on, some old men on welfare were lodged in that bastion with us. New buildings with miles and miles of window glass had been thrown up for them in a hurry, and there they were kept like insects until the end of the war. On the surrounding hills a rash of skimpy housing lots vied for possession of the seas of mud inadequately contained by rows of precarious shacks, in the shadow of which one would occasionally see a head of lettuce and three radishes, of which, it is hard to say why, the nauseated slugs were making the house-owner a present. Our hospital was clean. You have to hurry to see that kind of thing, move in at the beginning, the first few weeks, because maintenance isn't a French virtue. We have no taste for it. In fact, we're downright disgusting in that respect. We flopped on six metal beds, at random and by moonlight. The building was so new the electricity hadn't been put in yet. Early next morning the doctor came and introduced himself. He seemed delighted to see us and exuded cordiality. He had reasons for being pleased— He'd just been promoted to major, and, in addition, he had the most beautiful eyes you ever saw. Supernatural velvet. He made use of them to flutter the hearts of several volunteer nurses, who surrounded him with attentions and sympathetic mimicry, and feasted on every word and move of their dear doctor. At the very first meeting, he took our morale in hand and told us as much— Taking one of us by the shoulders and shaking him with paternal familiarity, he explained the regulations in a comforting tone and indicated the quickest and surest way of getting ourselves sent back to the front to be lambasted some more. Wherever they came from, no two ways about it, that was their only thought. It seemed to give them a kick. It was the new vice. "'France, my friends,' he proclaimed, "'has put her trust in you.' France is a woman. She is counting on your heroism. She has been a victim of the most cowardly, the most abominable aggression. She has a right to expect her sons to avenge her to the hilt, to restore, even at the cost of the extreme sacrifice, every square inch of her territory. All of us here in the hospital, my friends, will do our duty, and we expect you to do yours. Our science is at your disposal. It is yours." All its resources will be devoted to curing you. Help us with your good will. I know we can count on your good will. We hope, we trust, that each one of you will soon resume his place side by side with his dear comrades in the trenches. Your sacred place, defending your beloved soil. Vive la France! Forward to battle! He knew how to talk to soldiers. We were all standing at attention at the foot of our beds. Behind him a brunette, one of his group of pretty nurses, was having a hard time controlling her feelings, which were made visible by three or four tears. The other nurses, her friends, tried to comfort her. Don't worry, sweetie, he'll be back. I'm sure he will. Her cousin, a plumpish blonde, was consoling her the most. As she passed us, holding her up with both arms, the plump one told me this weakness had overcome her pretty cousin because her fiancé had just gone off to the Navy. Our impassioned medical authority tried to soothe the tragic and beautiful emotion aroused by his short, vibrant speech. He was embarrassed and grieved. The apprehension he had awakened in this profound and noble heart, all sensibility and tenderness, was too painful— "'If we had only known, doctor,' the blonde cousin whispered, "'we'd have warned you. "'They love each other so dearly you can't imagine.' "'The group of nurses and the master went their way. "'Chattering and swishing, they receded down the corridor. "'They had finished with us. "'I tried to recollect, 
and to fathom the meaning of the speech the man with the beautiful eyes had just made, but far from depressing me when I thought it over, his words struck me as just what was needed to disgust me with the whole idea of dying. My comrades were of the same opinion, but they did not, like me, see a kind of challenge or insult in them. They made no attempt to understand what was going on around us. All they saw, and that unclearly, was that the usual delirium of the world had so increased in the last few months that there was nothing stable left for a man to build his existence on. Here in the hospital, just as in the Flanders night, death stalked us. Here, to be sure, it threatened you from a distance, but just as implacably, once the administration set it in pursuit of your trembling carcass. Here, it was true, they didn't bawl us out. In fact, they spoke gently, and they never talked about death. But our death sentence showed up distinctly in the corner of every paper they asked us to sign, and in all the precautions they surrounded us with, those tags around our necks and wrists, whenever they let us out for a few hours. And all the advice they gave us. We felt counted, watched, serial numbered, enrolled in the vast multitude that would soon be leaving for the front. So, naturally, all the civilian and medical personnel around us seemed more cheerful than we were. The nurses, the bitches, weren't in the same boat. Their only thought was to go on living, to live longer and longer, to live and love, to stroll in the park, and to copulate thousands and thousands of times. Every one of those angelic creatures had a plan all worked out in her perineum, like a convict, a little plan for love later on, when all of us soldier boys should have perished in God knows what mud and God knows how. Then they would sigh with a very special commemorative tenderness that would make them more attractive than ever. Interspersed with heartbreaking silences, they would evoke the tragic days of the war, the ghosts. Do you remember little Bardamou? They would say in the gathering dusk, thinking of me, the lad who had coughed so much and given them such a time to make him stop. Poor boy. His morale was way down. I wonder what became of him. A few poetic regrets, if adroitly placed, are as becoming to a woman as gossamer hair in the moonlight. What I couldn't help hearing under their spoken words and expressions of sympathy was this. Nice little soldier boy, you're going to die. You're going to die. This is war. Everyone has his own life, his role, his death. We seem to share your distress, but no one can share anyone else's death. A person sound in body and soul should take everything that happens as entertainment, neither more nor less. And we are wholesome young women, beautiful, respected, healthy, and well-bred. For us, the automatism of biology transforms the whole world into a joyous spectacle, into pure joy. Our health demands it. We can't afford the ugly dissipations of sorrow. We need stimulants and more stimulants. You'll soon be forgotten, dear little soldier boys. Be nice, die quickly, and let's hope the war will be over soon so we can marry one of your charming officers, preferably one with dark hair. And long live the patri that papa's always talking about. How wonderful love must be when Johnny comes marching home. Our little husband will be decorated, cited for bravery. You can shine his lovely boots on our happy wedding day if you like. If you're still in existence, soldier boy, won't you be happy about our happiness, soldier boy? Every morning we saw our doctor. Time and again we saw him surrounded by his nurses. He was a scientific light, we were told. The old men from the charity hospital next door would come jerking past our rooms, making useless, disjointed leaps. They'd go from room to room spitting out gossip between their decayed teeth, purveying scraps of malignant, worn-out slander. Cloistered in their official misery as in an oozing dungeon, those aged workers ruminated the layer of shit that long years of servitude deposit on men's souls. Impotent hatreds grown rancid in the pissy idleness of dormitories. 
they employed their last quavering energies in hurting each other a little more, in destroying what little pleasure and life they had left. Their last remaining pleasure. Their shriveled carcasses contained not one solitary atom that was not absolutely vicious. As soon as it was settled that we soldiers were going to share the relative comfort of the bastion with those old men, they began to detest us in unison. But that didn't stop them from begging for the crumbs of tobacco on our window sills and the bits of stale bread that had fallen under our benches. At mealtimes they pressed their parchment-skinned faces against the windows of our mess hall. Over their crinkled, roomy noses they peered in at us like covetous rats. One of those invalids seemed smarter and wickeder than the rest. He'd come and entertain us with the songs of his day. Père Birouette, he was called. He'd do anything we asked, provided we gave him tobacco. Anything except walk past the hospital morgue, which, incidentally, was never idle. One of our jokes was to make him go that way while supposedly taking him for a little stroll. Won't you come in? we'd say when we got to the door. He'd run away, griping for all he was worth, so fast and so far we couldn't see him again for at least two days. Père Berouet had caught a glimpse of death. Professor Bestombe, our medical major with beautiful eyes, had installed a complicated assortment of gleaming electrical contraptions which periodically pumped us full of shocks. He claimed they had a tonic effect and we had to put up with them on pain of banishment. It seems that Bestombe was very rich. He must have been, to be able to buy all those expensive electrocution machines. He could afford to throw money around because his father-in-law, a political bigwig, had done some heavy finagling while purchasing land for the government. Naturally, the doctor exploited his advantages. Crime and punishment, it all adds up. We took him as he was, and we didn't hate him. He examined our nervous systems with meticulous care and questioned us in a tone of polite familiarity. This sedulously cultivated good nature enchanted the nurses in his section, who all came of excellent families. Every morning these cuties looked forward to his displays of affability, which were just so yummy. In short, we were all actors in a play. He, Bestombe, had chosen the role of a benevolent, profoundly human and humane scientist. We pulled together. That was the essential. In this new hospital I shared a room with Sergeant Bronledor, a re-enlisted man. He was an old hospital hand. He'd been dragging his perforated intestines around for months and had been in four different hospitals. He had learned in the process how to attract and to hold the active sympathy of the nurses. He vomited, pissed, and shat blood with astonishing frequency. He also had a lot of trouble breathing, but none of that would have sufficed to win him the special good graces of the nurses who had seen worse. So between two choking fits, if a doctor or nurse was passing, Bron Lador would sing out, "'Victory! Victory! Victory will be ours!' or he'd murmur those same words with one corner or the whole of his lungs, as the circumstances required. Thus attuned to the ardently aggressive literature of the day by a well-calculated bit of histrionics, he enjoyed the highest moral standing. That man knew his stuff. Since all the world was a stage, acting was the thing. Bron Lador knew what he was doing. And, indeed, nothing looks more idiotic, nothing is more irritating, than a sluggish spectator who turns up on stage by mistake. When you're up there, you've got to join in, come to life, act a part, take the plunge or clear out. Especially the women demanded a show. The bitches had no use at all for clumsy amateurs. Unquestionably, war went straight to their ovaries. They demanded heroes— and if you weren't a hero, you had to pretend to be one, or be prepared for the most ignominious fate. After a week in this new hospital, we realized that we would absolutely have to change our image, and thanks to Bran Lador, 
a lace salesman in civilian life, the self-same men who, on our arrival, had been terror-stricken, shunning the light, haunted by disgraceful memories of slaughterhouses, metamorphosed ourselves into an incredible gang of swashbucklers determined to conquer or die, and, take my word for it, armed with daring do and the most outrageous language. Our speech had become vigorous and so obscene that the ladies sometimes blushed, but they never complained, because it is generally agreed that a soldier is as brave as he is wild and cruder than there is any need to be, so much so that his bravery can be measured by the crudeness of his language. At first, though we copied Bron Lador to the best of our ability, our patriotic act wasn't quite right. It wasn't really convincing. It took a good week, two, in fact, of intensive rehearsing, before we had finally caught on. As soon as that scientific luminary, our professor, Major Dr. Bestombe, noticed the striking improvement in our moral attitudes, he decided to encourage us by admitting a few visitors, our parents to begin with. To judge by stories I had heard, certain soldiers, really gifted types, experienced a kind of intoxication. You might even speak of an exotic thrill in combat. Whenever I try to imagine this particular brand of pleasure, just trying laid me low for at least a week. I felt so incapable of killing anyone that I thought I might just as well give it up right away and abandon the whole idea. Not that I lacked experience. They'd done everything possible to inculcate a taste for killing, but I simply had no talent in that direction. Maybe my initiation should have been more gradual. One day I decided to try to tell Professor Bestombe how hard I was finding it, body and soul, to become as brave as I should have liked to be, and as the undoubtedly sublime circumstances required. I was uneasy, afraid he would think I was becoming insolent and talking out of turn. Not at all. The great man said he was delighted that I'd come to him and bared my troubled soul so fully and frankly. You're better, friend Bardemou, he concluded. You're better, that's all there is to it. Yes, Bardemou, I regard your coming to me like this, absolutely of your own free will, as a most encouraging sign of a marked improvement in your mental state. Van de Scan, that modest but infinitely wise observer of moral breakdown in the soldiers of the Empire, summed up his findings back in 1802 in a memoir that is quite unjustly neglected by students of the present day, but must nevertheless be regarded as a classic. In it, he describes with remarkable insight and precision the so-called confessional crises met with in moral convalescence, and terms them the most encouraging of all symptoms. Almost a century later, our great Dupre established his now celebrated nomenclature of the same symptom— and characterized the identical crisis as a recollection of memories. According to the same author, this crisis, if the cure is properly administered, should soon be followed by a massive breakup of anxiety percepts and the definitive liberation of the area of consciousness, this being the second stage in the process of psychic recovery. Elsewhere, employing the bold terminology that was his special gift, Dupre devises the formula disencumbering cogitative diarrhea for this crisis, which is accompanied by intense euphoria, a marked resumption of relational activity, a sudden striking restoration, among other things, of sleep, which in some cases has been known to go on for days at a time, and lastly, at a more advanced stage, by conspicuous hyperactivity of the genital functions— amounting, sometimes in patients who were previously frigid, to a positive sexual frenzy. The patient recovers not by easy stages, but at a gallop. Such was the magnificently descriptive metaphor by which another of our great French psychiatrists of the last century, Philibert Margueton, characterized this recuperative triumph, this sudden resurgence of normal functions in a patient recovering from the fear syndrome. As for you, Bardemou, I already at the present moment regard you as a true convalescent. 
Would it interest you, Bardamu, since we have arrived at this gratifying conclusion, to know that I shall be reading a paper on the fundamental characteristics of the human mind at the Society for Military Psychology tomorrow? It is not without its merits, I venture to believe. Oh, yes, Professor. I take a passionate interest in these questions. Well, then, Bardamu, to make a long story short, the thesis I put forward is that before the war, man was an unknown quantity for the psychiatrist, and the resources of his psyche an enigma. That is also my humble opinion, Professor. You see, Bardamu, the war, by providing us with such unprecedented means of trying men's nervous systems, has been a miraculous revealer of the human mind. Recent pathological disclosures have given us matter for centuries of meditation and study. Let's face it, up until now we hardly suspected the richness of man's emotional and spiritual resources. Today, thanks to the war, all that has changed. By a process of breaking and entering, painful to be sure, but decisive, nay, providential for science, we have penetrated his innermost depths. Ever since the first revelations came to my attention, the duty of the modern psychologist and moralist has been clear to me, bestombe, beyond any possible doubt. Our psychological conceptions are in need of total revision. I, Bardamu, was of exactly the same opinion. Yes, indeed, Professor, I am convinced that— Ah, you think so too, Bardamu. You say so yourself. In man, you see, there is a balance between good and evil, between egoism on the one hand and altruism on the other. In elite subjects, more altruism than egoism. Am I right? Don't you agree? Exactly, Professor. You've hit the nail on the head. And what, Bardamu, I ask you, what is the highest known concept? the concept best suited to arousing the altruism of the elite subject and compelling it to manifest itself unequivocally. Patriotism, Professor. Ah, you see? The word is yours, not mine. You understand, Bardamu. Patriotism and glory, which is its corollary and proof. How true. Ah, our soldier boys— at their first baptism of fire they spontaneously cast off all sophisms and subsidiary concepts, in particular the sophism of self-preservation. Instinctively and immediately they merge with our true raison d'etre, the patri. For the attainment of truth, Bardamu, intelligence is not only superfluous, it is in the way. Like all essential truths, the patri is a truth of the heart. The common people understand that, and that is where the inept scientist goes wrong. It's beautiful, Professor, too beautiful. I am reminded of the ancients. Bestombe pressed both my hands almost affectionately, and in a fatherly tone he added for my special benefit, That, Bardamu, is how I mean to treat my patients. Electricity for the body and for the mind— Massive doses of patriotic ethics, injections, as it were, of invigorating morality. I understand, Professor. I was indeed beginning to understand more and more. On leaving him, I joined my invigorated companions at Mass in the brand new chapel. I caught sight of Bran Lador in a corner demonstrating his moral vigor by giving the concierge's little girl lessons in enthusiasm. He beckoned me to join him, and I did. That afternoon, some of our parents came from Paris for the first time since we'd been there, and from then on they came every week. I had finally written to my mother. She was glad to see me again, and whimpered like a bitch whose puppy has been given back to her. She thought she was doing me a lot of good by kissing me, but she was miles behind the bitch, because she believed what they said when they took me away from her. A dog only believes what it can smell. One afternoon my mother and I took a long walk through the streets around the hospital, dawdling down half-finished byways with lampposts that hadn't been painted yet, between long, oozing house fronts with their windows full of gaudy, dangling rags, 
the shirts of the poor. We listened to the crackling song of the frying pans, a tempest of rancid fat. In the great shapeless desert surrounding the city, the rot in which its false luxury ends, the city shows everyone who wants to look the garbage piles of its enormous posterior. There are factories one avoids when out for a stroll, which emit smells of all sorts, some of them hardly believable. The air roundabout couldn't possibly stink any worse. Nearby, a little street carnival molders between two chimneys of unequal height. The wooden horses cost too much for the rickety, dribbling children with nosefuls of fingers who long for them and stand spellbound, sometimes for weeks on end, attracted and repelled by their forlorn, run-down look and the music. What efforts are made to keep the truth away from these places? But it comes back again and again to grieve for everybody. Drinking is no help. Red wine as thick as ink. Nothing helps. The sky in those places never changes. It's a vast lake of suburban smoke shutting them in. Underfoot the mud drags you down with fatigue and the sides of existence are also closed, shut off by hotels and more factories. Even the walls in that section are coffins. With Lola gone for good, and Musine, too, I had nobody left. That's why I finally wrote to my mother, just to see somebody. I was only twenty, and all I had was a past. The two of us together, my mother and I, walked through dozens of Sunday streets. She told me little things about her business, what the people around her were saying about the war, that it was sad, horrible, in fact, but that with plenty of courage we'd all come through in the end. The ones that got killed were an accident, like in the races, if you kept your seat properly you wouldn't fall. To her the war was just one more affliction. She tried not to think about it too much, because it frightened her in a way. It was full of terrifying things she didn't understand. She had no doubt that poor people like her were born to suffer in every way, that that was their role on earth, and that if things had been going so badly of late, the cumulative faults of the poor must have a good deal to do with it. They must have been very naughty. Of course, they hadn't meant to be, but they were guilty all the same and giving them a chance to expiate their transgressions by suffering was a great kindness. My mother was an untouchable. That resigned, tragic optimism was her only faith and the foundation of her character. The two of us, in the rain, went down streets of vacant lots. The sidewalks in that part of the world sink and evade your step, in winter, the branches of the little ash trees at the edge hold the raindrops a long time, a tenuous fairyland trembling in the breeze. Our way back to the hospital led past a number of newly built hotels. Some had names, others hadn't even gone to that much trouble. Rooms by the week was all they had to say for themselves. The war had suddenly emptied them of all the workers and wage slaves who had lived there. They wouldn't even come back to die. Dying is work, too. But they'd do it somewhere else. My mother was tearful as she took me back to the hospital. She accepted the accident of my death, and, not content to acquiesce, she wondered if I was as resigned to it as she was. She believed in fate as implicitly as she did in the beautiful standard meter at the Conservatoire des Arts et Métiers, which she had always spoken of with respect, because she had learned in her youth that the one she used in her notion shop was a scrupulous copy of that superb official original. Between the housing lots in that degraded countryside there were still a few fields and gardens here and there, and, attached to those scraps of land, a few aged peasants wedged in between the new buildings. When there was time left before I had to be back, my mother and I went to watch them, those comical peasants obstinately poking iron into the earth, that soft, grainy substance, 
where the dead are laid to rot, but which gives us our bread all the same. The ground must be terribly hard, my mother said every time she saw them. She was puzzled. You see, she only understood miseries that resembled her own, city miseries, and she tried to figure out what the country kind could be like. That was the only curiosity I ever saw in my mother. It was all the diversion she needed for a Sunday. Then she took it back to the city with her. I never heard from Lola, or from Musin either. Those sluts were on the good side of the situation, from which we, the flesh earmarked for sacrifice, were barred by smiling but implacable orders. Twice I'd been sent back to the places where the hostages were corralled. My future was all settled. As I've told you, Bran Lador, my neighbor at the hospital, enjoyed permanent popularity with the nurses. He was swathed in bandages and dripping with optimism. All the other patients envied him and copied his manner. Once we'd become presentable and ceased to be moral lepers, we all began to get visits from socialites and political bigwigs. People started telling each other in the drawing rooms that Professor Bestombe's Neuromedical Center had become a temple and home, as it were, of the most intense patriotic fervor. Our visiting days came to be patronized not only by bishops, but also by an Italian duchess, a big munitions magnate, and before long by the personnel of the Opéra and the Comédie Française. A beautiful young actress from the Comédie, who recited poetry like nobody's business, came to my personal bedside and declaimed some superlatively heroic lines for my special benefit. As she spoke, her perverse red hair, she had the complexion that went with it, was tossed by extraordinary waves that sent vibrations straight to my perineum. When this divine creature questioned me about my feats of arms, I gave her so many poignant details that she began to devour me with her eyes. Deeply moved, she asked leave to have the most intense passages in my narrative framed in verse by a poet who happened to be one of her admirers. I consented without hesitation. Informed of this project, Professor Bestombe expressed his special approval. He even granted an interview on the subject to an illustrated national weekly, whose photographer took our picture all together on the hospital steps with the beautiful actress beside us. In these tragic days, cried Professor Bestombe, who never missed a trick, it is the poet's highest duty to revive our taste for the epic. This is no time for trivial artifice. Down with emasculated literature. A new soul has been born to us in the great and noble tumult of battle, the great patriotic renewal, the lofty summits to which our glory is destined. We demand the sustaining grandeur of the epic. For my part, I find it admirable that this sublime, creative, and never-to-be-forgotten collaboration between a poet and one of our heroes should have taken place under our very eyes in the hospital which I direct. Bron Lador, my roommate, whose imagination had been rather outdistanced by mine, and who didn't figure in the photograph, was seized by a keen, tenacious jealousy. He became my embittered rival for the palms of heroism. He made up new stories. He surpassed himself. No one could stop him. His exploits verged on delirium. It was difficult for me to get the jump on him, to improve on his extravagances, yet none of us at the hospital resigned himself to defeat. In a fever of emulation, we all vied with one another in composing brilliant pages of military history in which to figure sublimely. In those heroic romances we wore the skins of phantasmagoric characters, but deep within them our ludicrous selves trembled body and soul. I'd like to have seen people's faces if they had found out what we were really like. The war had been going on too long. Our great friend, Bestombe, received the visits of innumerable foreign celebrities, neutrals, skeptics, and scientists of all persuasions. 
spruce, besabered inspectors from the war ministry passed through our wards. Their military careers had been extended. They had been rejuvenated and revitalized with pay increases. So, naturally, they were generous with praise and citations. Everything was perfect. Bestombe and his wounded heroes were the pride of the medical profession. My fair admirer from the Comédie came back and paid me a private visit, while her pet poet was completing the rhymed narrative of my exploits. One day I finally ran into this pale, anxious young man in one of the corridors. The doctors, he told me, had assured him that the fragility of his heartstrings was well-nigh miraculous. Consequently, these same doctors, always concerned with the protection of the frail, had kept him out of the army. To make up for which, our young bard had undertaken, at the risk of his health and last spiritual energies, to forge the moral canon of our victory. A magnificent, and it goes without saying, unforgettable weapon. Practically everything was unforgettable in those days. I wasn't going to complain, since he had picked me from among so many undeniably brave men as his hero. And I have to admit they honored me royally. It was magnificent. The recitation was given at the Comédie Française itself, as part of a so-called poetic afternoon. The whole hospital was invited. When my vibrant redhead appeared on the stage, striding grandly, her figure draped in the for once voluptuous folds of the tricolor, the whole audience, flushed with desire, rose to its feet and gave her one of those ovations that never seemed to end. Naturally, I had known what to expect, but my amazement was real all the same. I could not conceal my stupefaction from my neighbors at hearing her, my magnificent friend, thrill and throb and sigh in such a way as to make the dramatic effect of the episode I had dreamed up for her more vivid and more moving. Her poet was miles beyond me for fantasy. He had monstrously magnified mine, enhanced it with flamboyant rhymes and high-sounding adjectives, which fell with a solemn reverberation on the breathless, admiring silence. Coming to the climax of a period, the most impassioned of the lot, the actress turned toward the box where Bron Lador and I and a few other wounded men were sitting, and held out her two magnificent arms as though offering herself to the most heroic among us. At that particular moment the poet was faithfully rendering a deed of awe-inspiring bravery that I had attributed to myself. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I'm sure it was something pretty good. Luckily, when it comes to heroism, people are willing to believe anything. The audience caught the meaning of her symbolic offering, turned in our direction, ecstatic, stamping, bellowing with joy, and clamored for the hero. Bron Lador took up the whole front row of the box and blotted out the rest of us. He hid us almost completely with his bandages. He did it on purpose, the bastard. But two of our comrades climbed up on chairs behind him so the crowd could admire them over his head and shoulders. They brought the house down. I came close to crying out, but it's all about me, me and nobody else. I knew my Bron Lador. We'd have exchanged insults in front of all those people. We might even have used our fists. So in the end, he was the winner. He triumphed. Just as he'd planned, he had the whole storm of applause to himself. Defeated, we took refuge backstage, where fortunately we were feted again. That was some comfort. But our actress and inspiration wasn't alone in her dressing room. The poet, her poet, our poet, was with her. He had the same weakness for young soldier boys as she did. They made it clear to me very artistically. A handsome offer. They repeated it. But I ignored their kind suggestions. I was the loser because they had influence and things might have worked out very well. I left them abruptly. I was nettled. Silly of me. I was young. To recapitulate... The aviators had snatched Lola away from me, 
The Argentines had taken Mouzine, and now this harmonious invert had filched my magnificent actress. Sadly, I left the Comédie as the last torches were being extinguished in the corridors and returned alone, without recourse to the streetcar, to our hospital, that man-trap plunked down in the tenacious mud of the rebellious suburbs. The plain truth, I may as well admit it, is that I've never been really right in the head. But just then such fits of dizziness would come over me for no reason at all that I could easily have been run over. The war had given me the staggers. When it came to pocket money, all I could count on during my stay at the hospital was the few francs my mother managed to scrape up for me each week. So as soon as I could, I went looking for little extras here and there wherever I could find them. One of my old bosses looked like a likely prospect, and I went right over to see him. I remembered opportunely that in a certain obscure period of my life shortly before the war, I had worked as a helper for this Roger Puta, who owned a jewelry shop near the Madeleine. My work for that loathsome jeweler consisted of menial jobs, such as polishing the silverware in the shop. There was lots of it, every shape and size, and it was hard to take care of in the gift-giving holiday season because it was always being handled. As soon as my classes were out at medical school, where I was engaged in exacting and, because I kept flunking the exams, interminable studies, I hightailed it to the back room of Monsieur Puta's shop, where I labored for two or three hours until dinner time, applying whiting to his chocolatiers. In return for my work, I was fed, copiously, I have to admit, in the kitchen. Then, in the morning before school, I had to take the watchdogs out for a piss. All that for forty francs a month. Puta's jewelry shop on the corner of Rue Vignon sparkled with thousands of diamonds, each one of which cost several decades of my salary. They're still sparkling in the exact same place, by the way. When everybody was mobilized, this puta got himself assigned to the auxiliaries and put under the special orders of a certain cabinet minister, whose car he drove from time to time. But he also made himself useful, unofficially, of course, by supplying the ministry with jewels. The higher officials speculated, with gratifying results, on present and future transactions, and the longer the war went on the more jewels were needed. Monsieur Puta got so many orders that he sometimes had trouble filling them. When he was overworked, Monsieur Puta managed to look slightly intelligent because of the fatigue that tormented him, but only then. When he rested, his face, in spite of his undeniably fine features, became so harmonious in its idiotic placidity that it would be hard not to carry a despairing memory of it with one to the grave. His wife, Madame Puta, seldom left the cashier's desk. In a manner of speaking, she and the desk were one. She had been brought up to be a jeweler's wife. That had been her parents' ambition. She knew her duty inside and out. The prosperity of the cash drawer brought happiness to husband and wife. Not that Madame Puta was bad-looking, not at all. She could even, like so many others, have been rather pretty. But she was so careful, so distrustful, that she stopped short of beauty just as she stopped short of life. Her hair was a little too well-dressed, her smile a little too facile and sudden, and her gestures a bit too abrupt or too furtive. You racked your brains trying to figure out what was too calculated about her, and why you always felt uneasy when she came near you. This instinctive revulsion that shopkeepers inspire in anyone who goes near them, and who knows what's what, is one of the few consolations for being as down at heel as people who don't sell anything to anybody tend to be. The petty cares of business were everything to Madame Puta. In this she resembled Madame Erot, but with a difference. In her case, they possessed her body and soul, just as God possesses his nuns. And yet, from time to time, she would give a thought to the world around her. 
For instance, she might indulge in some little expression of sympathy for parents with sons at the front. How dreadful this war must be for people with grown-up children. Think before you shoot your mouth off, her husband responded without delay. Such mawkishness found him ready and resolute. I suppose there's no need of defending France? Good as gold, but first and foremost good patriots, Stoics in short, they went to sleep every night of the war directly above their shop with its millions. A French fortune. In the brothels that he visited now and then, Monsieur Puta, though demanding, refused to be taken for a spendthrift. He'd set them straight at the outset. I'm no Englishman, dearie, and I know the score. I'm just a little French soldier, and I'm not in a hurry. That was his opening statement. The girls respected him for his well-regulated way of taking his pleasure. He liked to enjoy himself, but couldn't be taken in. A real man. He knew human nature and took advantage of his knowledge to sell a few jewels to the assistant madame, who had no faith in stocks and bonds. As for his military career, Monsieur Puta was making impressive progress, from temporary discharges to permanent deferments. After God knows how many providential medical examinations, he was finally exempted for good. One of the highest joys of his existence was to contemplate, and if possible, to handle a shapely thigh. In this one pleasure, at least, he got the better of his wife who took no interest in anything but the business. Take a man and woman with otherwise equal qualities, you always seem to find a little more uneasiness in a man, however stagnant and narrow-minded. This puta had just a dash of the artist in him. Lots of men are like that. Their artistic leanings never go beyond a weakness for shapely thighs. Madame Puta was glad she had no children. She voiced her pleasure in being sterile so often that one day Monsieur Puta spoke of their satisfaction to the assistant madame. Yes, said the assistant madame. But after all, somebody's children have to go. It's a duty. That was true. The war involved duties. The cabinet minister whose car Puta drove had no children either. Cabinet ministers never have children. Around 1913, at the same time as me, there was another helper doing menial jobs in the shop. His name was Jean Voirus. At night he was some kind of super in the little theaters, and in the afternoon he delivered parcels for Puta. The pay was small, but he didn't mind. He managed to make ends meet thanks to the metro. He delivered his parcels on foot almost as quickly as if he'd taken the metro and kept the price of the ticket all velvet. True, his feet smelled a little, quite a lot, in fact, but he knew it and asked me to let him know when there were no customers in the shop so he could safely go in and settle his accounts with Madame Puta. As soon as she had the money, she'd send him out to the back room with me. During the war, again, his feet stood him in good stead. He was reputed to be the fastest courier in his regiment, while on convalescent leave, he came to see me at the Bicetre Fort. In fact, it was then we decided to get in touch with our old boss. We didn't let the grass grow under our feet. When we got to the Boulevard de la Madeleine, they had just finished dressing the shop window. Well, well, who'd have expected? Monsieur Puta was rather surprised to see us. But I'm glad to see you all the same. Come right in. You're looking well, Voirus, fine and dandy. But you, Bardomou, you look sick, my boy. Oh, well, you're young. You'll recover. You youngsters are in luck when all's said and done. Great days, great experience for you. Up there and out in the open, too. This is history, my boys. Make no mistake. And what history? We didn't answer. We thought we'd let Monsieur Puta go on a while before touching him. And on he went. It's rough in the trenches, I won't deny that. But it's no bed of roses here, either, you know. You boys have been wounded? All right. 
but I'm absolutely bushed. For two years now, I've been on night duty. Do you know what that means? Exhausted. Worn to a frazzle. Oh, my God. The streets of Paris at night. No lights. Driving a car, as often as not, with the minister in it. In a hurry. You simply can't imagine. I could get killed a dozen times every night. Oh, yes, Madame Puta put in. And sometimes he drives the minister's wife, too. Oh, yes, and it's not over yet. Dreadful, we said in unison. What about the dogs? Voirus asked to be polite. What's become of them? Does somebody still take them out in the Tuileries? I've had them put away. They were bad for business. German shepherds, the customers, you see. A pity, said his wife. But the new dogs we have now are very nice. They're scotch. They smell a little. Not like our German shepherds. Do you remember, Voirus? They hardly smelled at all. We could shut them up in the shop, even after the rain. That's right, said Monsieur Puta. Not like old Voirus here with his feet. Do your feet still smell, Jean, you young scamp? They still smell a little, I think, said Voirus. At that moment some customers came in. "'I won't keep you any longer, my boys,' said Monsieur Puta, intent on getting Jean out of the shop as quickly as possible. "'Keep well, that's the main thing. I won't ask you where you've come from. Certainly not. Security first is my motto.' At the word security, Puta made a very serious face, like when giving back change. "'So that was the end of our visit.' As we were leaving, Madame Puta gave us each twenty francs. The shop was polished as spick and span as a yacht. We were afraid to walk through because of our boots, which looked monstrous on the fine carpet. Oh, Roger, look at them, Madame Puta cried out. Aren't they comical? They're not in the habit any more. They walk as if they'd stepped in something. The habit will come back said Monsieur Puta amiably, glad to be rid of us so quickly and cheaply. Out on the street we realized we couldn't go far with our twenty francs each, but Voirus had another idea. Come on, he says. We'll go and see a lady I know. Her son was a buddy of mine, killed on the Marne. I go and see his parents every week and tell them how their son was killed. They're rich, the mother gives me a hundred francs or so every time. They say it makes them happy, so... But what'll I do? What'll I say to this lady? Well, you tell her that you were there too. She'll give you another hundred francs. They're the right kind of rich. Take it from me. Not like that stinking puta. They don't count their pennies. All right, I said. But are you sure she won't ask me for details? Because I didn't know her son, see? I'll be flummoxed if she asks for— No, no, don't worry. Say the same as me. Just nod your head and say yes. Nothing to worry about. The woman is broken-hearted, so if someone comes and talks about her son, it makes her happy. That's all she wants. Anything at all. It's easy. I wasn't very enthusiastic— but I badly wanted the hundred francs, which struck me as providential and unusually easy to come by. All right, I said finally. But don't expect me to make anything up, I'm warning you. Promise? I'll say the same as you, not a word more. How did he get killed anyway? A shell hit him smack in the face. A pretty big one. At Garance, the place was called, on the Meuse front on the bank of some river. Boy, they didn't find this much of him. Absolutely nothing left, a memory. And you know, he was a big man, strong and husky and athletic. But what would you expect? Nobody can stand up against a shell. That's a fact. Wiped off the face of the earth. His mother still finds it hard to believe. I've told her over and over again. She insists that he's just missing. Crazy idea, missing. It's not her fault. She never saw a shell. She doesn't see how a man can vanish into thin air, like a fart, and that it's all over. 
especially when the man is her son. It's only natural. By the way, I haven't been to see her for two weeks, but you'll see how it is when I go in. The mother receives me right away in the drawing room. It's a beautiful house. You'll see. So many curtains and carpets and mirrors you'd think you were in a theater. A hundred francs is nothing to them. They'll hardly miss it. About like five francs to me. Today she'll be good for two hundred because she hasn't seen me for two weeks. You'll see. The servants with gilded buttons. At the Avenue Henri Martin, we turned left and went on a little way. Then we came to a gate surrounded by trees in a little private road. See, said Voirus, when we were standing in front of it, it's practically a chateau. What did I tell you? The father's supposed to be high up in the railroads, a big shot. You're sure he's not a station master? I said, making a joke. Don't be stupid. There he is now. He's coming to meet us. But the old man didn't come out right away. He was walking around the lawn, stooped over, talking to a soldier. We went nearer. I recognized the soldier. It was the reservist I had met that night at Noisseur sur la Lys, when I was on reconnaissance. I even remembered the name he'd given me, Robinson. Do you know that footslogger? Voirus asked me. Yes, I know him. Maybe he's a friend of theirs. They must be talking about the mother. I hope they don't prevent us from going to see her, because she's the one mostly that forks over the money. The old gentleman came over to us. My dear friend, he said to Voirus in a quavering voice, it grieves me to tell you that since your last visit my poor wife has succumbed to our great sorrow. Last Thursday we left her alone for a moment. She had asked us to. She was in tears. He couldn't finish his sentence. Suddenly he turned away and left us. I know you, I said to Robinson as soon as the old gentleman was far enough away. And I know you. What happened to the old lady? I asked him. Well, he informed us, she hanged herself the day before yesterday, that's all. He added, of all the lousy luck, she was my army godmother. Such things only happened to me, a calamity, my first leave. For six months I'd been looking forward to this day. Voirus and I couldn't help laughing at Robinson's discomfiture. A nasty surprise, if there ever was one. But her being dead didn't give us our two hundred smackers, and we'd made up a new story special for the occasion. So none of us was very happy. You and your big, mealy mouth. We were ragging Robinson, trying to get a rise out of him. You thought you had a good thing, didn't you? A sweet little feed with the old folks? Or maybe you thought you'd screw your fairy godmother. Serves you goddamn right. We couldn't stay there all day, looking at the grass and laughing. So we all three together started off in the direction of Grenelle. We all counted our money. It didn't come to much. Seeing we had to get back to our respective hospitals and barracks that same evening, there was just enough for dinner at a bistro and maybe there'd be a little something left over, but not enough to go upstairs at the cat-house. We went in, anyway, but we only had a drink at the bar. Say, said Robinson, it's good to see you again. But what do you think of that kid's mother? The bitch hanging herself just when I'm due to arrive. I won't forget her in a hurry. Do you see me hanging myself? Unhappy, you say? I'd hang myself every day. What about you? Rich people are more sensitive, said Voirus. Voirus had a good heart. If I had six francs, he went on, I'd go upstairs with the brunette over there by the slot machine. Go ahead, we told him. You'll tell us if she knows how to suck. We rummaged in our pockets. But counting the tip, there wasn't enough to give him his peace. 
just enough for another coffee each and a cassis. When we'd finished, we went out and roamed around some more. We broke up on the Place Vendôme and went our separate ways. Saying goodbye, we couldn't see one another, and we spoke softly because of the echoes. No light, it wasn't allowed. I never saw Voirus again. I've often run into Robinson. As for Jean Voirus, it was the gas that got him on the Somme. He died two years later by the sea in Brittany in a Navy sanatorium. He wrote to me twice when he first got there, but no more after that. He'd never seen the ocean. You can't imagine how beautiful it is, he wrote me. I bathe a little. It's good for my feet. But I think my voice is gone for good. That made him unhappy, because his big ambition was to get into a theater chorus some day. The chorus is better paid and more artistic than being an ordinary super. The army finally dropped me. I'd saved my guts, but my brains were scrambled for good. Undeniably. Beat it, they said. You're no good for anything any more. To Africa, I said to myself, the further the better. The ship that took me on board was a ship like any other. Consolidated Corsairs, that was the line. I was bound for the tropics with a cargo of cotton goods, officers, and civil servants. That boat was so old that the copper plate with its birth date had been removed from the upper deck. The date was such ancient history, and it inspired the passengers with fear and witticisms. So they shoved me on board in the hope that I'd recuperate in the colonies. My well-wishers were dead set on my making my fortune. Personally, I just wanted to get away, but a man should always try to look useful if he's not rich. It didn't look as if my studies would ever end, and I couldn't go on forever. I didn't have enough money to go to America, so Africa it is, I said, and let myself be steered to the tropics, where I was told you were sure to get ahead fast, provided you behaved and were reasonably temperate. Those prognostics gave me food for thought. There wasn't much to be said for me, but my manners were all right, and I was self-effacing. Deference came easy to me. I lived in constant fear of not being on time, but took good care never to get ahead of anybody. In short, I had delicacy. After all, if you manage to escape alive from an international slaughterhouse run rampant, it's a sign of tact and discretion. But let's get back to our trip. It looked fairly promising as long as we were in European waters. In small, adenoidal, mutually suspicious groups, the passengers lolled and lounged in the shade between decks, in the toilets, and in the smoking room. From morning to night they steeped themselves in pecan and gossip. They belched, they dozed, they shouted, and never expressed the least regret for anything they had left behind in Europe. Our ship's name was the Admiral Bragaton. If it kept afloat on those tepid seas, it was only thanks to its paint. Any number of coats laid on, layer after layer, had given the Admiral Bragaton a kind of second hull, something like an onion. We were heading for Africa, the real grandiose Africa of impenetrable forests, fetid swamps, inviolate wildernesses, where black tyrants wallowed in sloth and cruelty on the banks of never-ending rivers. I would barter a pack of pilet razor blades for big, long elephant's tusks, gaudy-colored birds, and juvenile slaves. Guaranteed. That would be life. Nothing in common with the emasculated Africa of travel agencies and monuments, of railways and candy bars. Certainly not. We'd be seeing Africa in the raw, the real Africa. We, the boozing passengers of the Admiral Bragaton. But as soon as we'd passed the coast of Portugal, things started going bad. One morning we woke up in the midst of a steam bath, pervasive and alarming. The water in our glasses, the sea, the air, our sheets, our sweat, 
Everything was hot, sultry. From then on, by night and day, it was impossible to have anything cool in your hands, under your ass, or in your throat, except the ice from the bar in your whiskey. A dull despair descended on the passengers of the Admiral Bragaton, condemned to sitting permanently in the bar, held fast by little pieces of ice, exchanging threats and incoherent apologies after their card games. It didn't take long. In that despondent, changeless heat, the entire human content of the ship congealed into massive drunkenness. People moved flabbily about like squid in a tank of tepid, smelly water. From that moment on, we saw, rising to the surface, the terrifying nature of white men, exasperated, freed from constraint, absolutely unbuttoned, their true nature, same as in the war. That tropical steam bath called forth instincts as August breeds toads and snakes on the fissured walls of prisons. In the European cold, under gray, puritanical northern skies, we seldom get to see our brothers' festering cruelty except in times of carnage. But when roused by the foul fevers of the tropics, their rottenness rises to the surface. That's when the frantic unbuttoning sets in, when filth triumphs and covers us entirely. It's a biological confession— once work and cold weather cease to constrain us, once they relax their grip, the white man shows you the same spectacle as a beautiful beach when the tide goes out. The truth. Fetid pools, crabs, carrion, and turds. Once we had passed Portugal, everybody on board started unleashing his instincts ferociously. Alcohol helped, and so did the blissful feeling conferred especially on soldiers and civil servants, by the knowledge that the trip was absolutely free of charge. The knowledge that for four consecutive weeks their bed, board, and liquor won't cost a thing is in itself enough to make most people delirious with thrift. Consequently, when it became known that, alone of all the ship's passengers, I had paid my own fare, I was looked upon as a shameless and intolerable swine. If, on leaving Marseilles, I had had some experience of colonial society, I would have gone down on my knees and begged the pardon and indulgence of the colonial infantry officer I kept running into, the highest in rank of those on board, for my unworthiness, and perhaps for safety's sake, I'd also have humbled myself before the senior civil servant. Then those phantasmagorical passengers might have tolerated my presence in their midst, and nothing would have happened. But I was ignorant, and my foolhardiness in supposing that I was entitled to breathe the same air as they almost cost me my life. One can never be too anxious. Thanks to a certain ingenuity, I lost nothing but what self-respect I had left. This is what happened. Some time after the Canary Islands, I learned from one of the stewards that my fellow passengers, by common accord, thought me affected not to say insolent, that they suspected me of being a pimp and a pederast, something of a cocaine addict on the side, but only on the side. Then the suspicion made its way around that I must have left France to escape the consequences of certain heinous crimes. But I was only at the beginning of my troubles. At that point I learned that on this line it was customary to view paying passengers with extreme caution, accompanied by persecution. I'm speaking of those who were not traveling free, either on military transportation orders or on the basis of some bureaucratic arrangement, for as everyone knows, the colonies belong to the upper reaches of the administration. After all, there are few plausible reasons for an unknown civilian to venture into those parts. A spy, a suspicious character. They found a thousand reasons for giving me sinister looks. The officers straight in the eye, the ladies with a knowing smile. After a while, even the deckhands and stewards, encouraged by the passengers, took to exchanging heavily caustic remarks behind my back. In the end, no one doubted that I was the biggest and most intolerable, in fact the only out-and-out -out blackguard on board.
a promising outlook. My neighbors at table were four toothless and bilious postal officials from Gabon. They had been friendly to me, chummy, in fact, at the start of the voyage. Now they never said a word to me. They had tacitly agreed that I was a man to be watched. I seldom left my cabin, and then only with infinite precautions. The air was so hot it weighed on our skins like a solid. Behind my bolted door I lay naked, trying to imagine what plan those diabolical passengers had cooked up to destroy me. I didn't know anyone on board, yet they all seemed to know me. An exact description of me must have taken instant form in their minds, like that of a famous criminal published in the newspapers. Through no fault of mine, I had been cast in the indispensable role of the foul and loathsome villain, shame of the human race, whose presence has been recorded down through the centuries, who is as well known to everyone as God and the devil, but who, during his passage on this earth, is so polymorphous and evasive as to elude everyone's grasp. For this villain, to be at last isolated, identified, and cornered, exceptional circumstances had been needed such as were to be met with only in the narrow confines of this ship. A great moral carnival was in the offing aboard the Admiral Bragaton. The unclean beast would not escape his fate. That was me. This in itself made the trip worthwhile. Isolated among these spontaneous enemies, I labored to identify them without their noticing. Especially in the morning, I was able to watch them with impunity through the porthole of my cabin. Before breakfast, covered with hair from pubis to eyebrows and from their rectums to the soles of their feet, they would emerge to take the air in pajamas that were transparent in the sunlight. Or, glass in hand, sprawled against the rail, they would belch and retch, especially the captain with the bulging bloodshot eyes, whose liver started plaguing him at daybreak. Regularly at dawn he would ask his cronies about me, curious to know if I'd been tossed overboard yet, like a gob of spit. And he'd illustrate his remark by projecting a turgid oyster into the frothing sea. Boy, oh boy! The Admiral wasn't getting ahead very fast, just groaning along from roll to roll. It was more like a sickness than a voyage. As I examined the members of the morning council from my porthole, they all seemed rather seriously ill, malarial, alcoholic, syphilitic in all likelihood. At a distance of thirty feet their visible decay was some consolation for my own troubles. These big mouths, after all, were just as defeated as I was. Still bragging nothing more. That was the only difference. The mosquitoes had worked them over, sucking their blood and pumping their veins full of poisons that would never go away. Treponemas were filing away their arteries. Alcohol was corroding their livers. The sun was cracking their kidneys. Crab lice were clinging to their pubic hair and eczema to the skins of their bellies. The searing light would scorch their retinas. In not so long a time, what would be left of them? A bit of brain? To do what with, I ask you? Where were they going? To commit suicide? Where they were going, a brain wouldn't do them a bit of good. No two ways. It's no joke growing old in a place where there's nothing to do. But look at yourself in a mirror with verdigris for silvering, and see yourself getting seedier and seedier, more and more decrepit. Rot sets in quickly in the green mansions, especially when it's atrociously hot. The North at least preserves your flesh. Northerners are pale once and for all. Between a dead Swede and a young man who has had a bad night, there's not much to choose. But the day after a colonial lands, he's already full of maggots. Those infinitely laborious little worms have been waiting for him personally, and they'll stay with him a lot longer than life will. He's a bag of worms, that's all. We had another week at sea before putting into Bragamance, 
the first of the promised lands. I felt as if I were living in a case of dynamite. I had just about given up eating for fear of sitting down at their table or crossing the deck in the daytime. I'd stopped talking altogether. I was never seen taking the air. It would have been hard to be as little in evidence on that ship as I was and yet stay on board. My cabin steward, a family man, was kind enough to inform me that those dashing colonial officers had lifted their glasses and sworn a solemn oath to slap my face at the first opportunity and then chuck me overboard. When I asked him why, he didn't know, and asked me in turn what I had done to warrant so much hard feeling. We were left with our perplexity. It was unlikely to be cleared up. They didn't like my face, that's all. You won't catch me taking another trip with people so hard to please. In addition, they had so much time on their hands, sequestered with themselves for thirty whole days, that it didn't take much to stir them up. And besides, when you stop to think about it, at least a hundred people must want you dead in the course of an average day. The ones in line behind you at the ticket window in the metro, the ones who look up at your apartment when they haven't got one themselves, the ones who wish you'd finish pissing and give them a chance, your children, and a lot more. It happens all the time, and you get used to it. On a boat, this same impatience is more noticeable, which makes it more upsetting. In that bubbling cauldron, the suint of those scalded beings is concentrated, the presentiment of the vast colonial solitude that will soon bury them and their destinies and make them groan like the dying. They cling, they bite, they rend, they froth at the mouth. My importance on the ship increased prodigiously from day to day. My rare appearances at table, silent and stealthy as I tried to make them, took on the magnitude of significant events. The moment I entered the dining room, the hundred and twenty passengers gave a start and began to whisper. Advancing from malignant suppositions to slanderous conclusions, the colonial officers at the captain's table, fortified with operatif after operatif, the tax collectors and especially the lady schoolteachers on their way back to the Congo, of these there was quite an assortment on board the Admiral Bragaton, puffed me up to infernal proportions. On boarding the ship in Marseille, I had been nothing, just a dreamy sort of nobody. But now, thanks to the concentrated attention of all those alcoholics and frustrated vaginas, I found myself changed beyond recognition, endowed with alarming prestige. The captain of the ship, a shady, breezy, racketeering type, had gone out of his way to shake hands with me at the start. When he crossed my path now, he didn't even seem to know me. It was as if I'd been wanted for some sordid crime, guilty from the start. Guilty of what? When men can hate without risk, their stupidity is easily convinced. The motives supply themselves. From what I seem to discern of the compact malevolence that held me in its vice, the female section of the conspiracy was masterminded by one of the schoolteachers. She was going back to the Congo to die, or so at least I hoped, the bitch. Almost always she was trailing around after the officers, so handsome in their resplendent, tight-fitting tunics, and further embellished by the oath they had sworn to crush me like a noisome slug well before the next port of call. They wondered out loud whether I would be as repulsive, flattened out, as I was erect, in short, they were having a fine time. The schoolteacher wetted their fury, called down thunders on the desk of the Admiral Bragaton, resolved to know no rest until I had been picked up gasping, punished forever for my imaginary impertinence, chastised for daring to exist, brutally beaten, bruised and bleeding, imploring pity under the boot and fist of one of those heroes whose muscular prowess and spectacular rage she was burning to admire. A scene of high carnage from which her weary ovaries promised themselves an awakening, as good as being raped by a gorilla. 
Time was passing, and it's dangerous to keep the aficionados waiting too long. I was the bull. The whole ship was clamoring, quivering from port to starboard. The sea enclosed us in that boiler-plated circus. Even the engine room crew knew what was going on. And since we only had three days ahead of us before putting into port, three decisive days, several matadors volunteered. The more I avoided the showdown, the more aggressive, the more impending they became. The executioners began to rehearse. They cornered me between two cabins at a bend in the corridor. I escaped by the skin of my teeth, but going to the toilet was getting downright dangerous. With only three days to go, I decided to forego the needs of nature. The portholes were all I needed. Crushing hatred and boredom were all around me. It can't be denied, the boredom on ships is something unbelievable. To tell the truth, it's cosmic. It fills the sea, the ship, the heavens. It's enough to unhinge the soundest of minds. So what would you expect of these chimerical deadheads? A sacrifice. And I was the victim. Things came to a head one evening after dinner, at which, ravaged by hunger, I had put in an appearance. I bent over my plate and didn't budge. I didn't even dare to take out my handkerchief to wipe the sweat off my brow. Nobody had ever eaten his dinner more discreetly. From the engines a faint, continuous vibration rose up under my behind. My table companions must have known what sentence had been passed on me, for to my surprise they started talking to me freely and amiably about duels and stabbings, and asking me questions. Just then, the schoolteacher from the Congo, the one whose breath was so strong, appeared in the lounge. I had barely time to notice that she was wearing a sumptuous lace evening dress. With nervous haste, she sat down at the piano and played, if you can call it playing, a number of pieces, always skipping the finale. The atmosphere became intensely furtive and strained. I jumped up and ran hoping to take refuge in my cabin. I had almost reached it when one of the colonial officers, the chestiest and most muscular of the lot, barred my way, without violence but firmly. Suppose we go up on deck, he enjoined me. We had only a few steps to go. For the occasion he was wearing his gold braidiest cap, and he had buttoned his buttons from collar to fly, something he hadn't done since our departure. So this was to be a full-dress dramatic ceremony. A tight spot for me. My heart was pounding on a level with my belly button. This preamble, this abnormal full-dress, made me foresee a slow and painful execution. That officer looked to me like a chunk of the war, obstinate, inexorable, murderous, which someone had suddenly plunked down in front of me. Behind him, blocking the doorway, appeared four junior officers, vigilant in the extreme, the escort of doom. Flight was impossible. The speech that followed must have been carefully rehearsed. Sir, you have before you Captain Frémison of the Colonial Army. In the name of my comrades in arms and of the passengers on this ship, who are justly indignant at your unspeakable behavior, I have the honor to demand an explanation. Certain remarks you have made about us since we left Marseille are intolerable. If you have any grievances, sir, the time has come to state them out loud, to proclaim audibly what you have been saying in a shameful undertone for the last twenty-one days, to tell us at last what you think. On hearing these words I was very much relieved. I had feared some sudden death blow impossible to parry, but in talking the Major was offering me a way out. Any possibility of cowardice becomes a glowing hope if you're not a fool. That's my opinion. Never be picky and choosy about means of escaping disembowelment, or waste your time trying to find reasons for the persecution you're a victim of. 
Escape is good enough for the wise. Captain, I replied, putting into my voice all the conviction of which I was capable under the circumstances. What an extraordinary mistake you are in danger of making. You, me. How can you think me capable of such ignominious sentiments? How monstrously unjust! Indeed, it is more than I can bear. When only yesterday I was fighting for our beloved country, when over the years my blood has mingled with yours in innumerable battles, oh, Captain, sir, how could you think of crushing me beneath such an injustice? Then, addressing the whole group, What abominable slander has abused you, gentlemen! leading you to imagine that I, to all intents and purposes your brother, would dream of spreading foul calumnies about heroic officers. This is too much, really too much. And I went on. Oh, for such a thing to happen at the very moment when these heroes, these incomparable heroes, are preparing to resume, with what courage I need not say, their sacred duty of safeguarding our immortal colonial empire where the most glorious soldiers of our race have covered themselves with eternal glory. The Mangins, the Faidherbes, the Guyanese. Oh, Captain, to suspect me of this! At that point I pulled up short. I hoped my silence would impress them. Luckily it did for a moment. Thereupon, without delay, taking advantage of the oratorical armistice, I went straight up to the captain, and, in an access of emotion, gripped both his hands. With his hands enclosed in mine, I felt fairly safe. Still clasping them, I continued, as volubly as ever, and while assuring him that he was right, a thousand times right, suggested that we make a fresh start, but get our signals straight this time. This unbelievable misunderstanding, I assured him, had been brought about by my stupid, though natural, timidity. I admitted that my behavior could reasonably have been interpreted as unconscionable disdain by the ladies and gentlemen present, these heroes and charmers, this providential conclave of astounding characters and talents, not forgetting the incomparably musical ladies, the ornaments of our good ship. After making this profuse and elaborate apology, I implored them to admit me without delay or restriction to their joyous patriotic brotherhood, in which I hoped now and forever to cut an admirable figure. And, of course, without releasing the Major's hands, I redoubled my eloquence. As long as a soldier isn't killing, he's a child and easily amused. Since he is not in the habit of thinking— it costs him a crushing effort to understand when spoken to. Captain Frémison wasn't killing me, he wasn't drinking, and he wasn't doing anything with his hands or feet. He was only trying to think. For him, that was much too much. In short, I'd caught him by the head. Gradually, during this ordeal by humiliation— I felt my self-respect weakening, weakening a little more, seeping away and finally abandoning me completely, officially, as it were. Say what you please, that's a beautiful moment. After that incident I became infinitely light and free, morally speaking, of course. Fear is probably, more often than not, the best means of getting you out of a tight spot. Since that day, I've never felt the need of any other weapons, or virtues for that matter. The captain couldn't make up his mind, and his friends, who had come there expressly to wipe up my blood and play knuckle-bones with my dispersed teeth, had to content themselves with catching words in mid-air. The civilians who had come rushing, tingling with eagerness at the news of an impending corrida, were looking very dangerous. Since I didn't know exactly what I was talking about, but only that I'd better keep it lyrical at all costs, I held on to the captain's hands and stared at an imaginary point in the cottony fog through which the Admiral Bragaton was making its way, puffing and spitting from one turn of the propeller to the next. Finally, to wind up my harangue, I ventured to raise one arm above my head, 
releasing one of the captain's hands, but only one, and flung myself into my peroration. Gentlemen, aren't we all agreed that brave men will always come to an understanding in the end? So damn it all, vive la France! Vive la France! That was Sergeant Bron Lador's gimmick. And once again it worked. That was the only time France ever saved my life. Otherwise, the opposite has been closer to the truth. I observed a moment's hesitation in my audience. After all, it's hard for an officer, however ill-disposed, to strike a civilian who has just shouted, Vive la France, as loud as I had. That hesitation saved me. I reached into the group of officers, grabbed two arms at random, and invited everybody to come to the bar and drink to my health and our reconciliation. The heroes resisted for barely a minute, and then we drank for two hours. But the females, silent and increasingly disappointed, kept their eyes on us. Through the portholes of the bar I saw the obstinate schoolteacher pianist prowling like a hyena surrounded by other females. The bitches had a strong suspicion that I'd conned myself out of the trap and were determined to nab me at the next turn. Meanwhile, men among men, we went on drinking under the useless but stupefying electric fan, which, since the canaries, had been wearing itself out, churning the tepid, cottony atmosphere. Still, I had to keep up my verb and spout the kind of talk, nothing too difficult, that would appeal to my new friends. For fear of putting my foot in it, I overflowed with patriotic admiration, and kept asking those heroes one after another for stories and more stories of colonial feats of arms. War stories, like dirty stories, appeal to the military of all countries. The best way to make a sort of peace, a fragile armistice to be sure, but precious all the same, with men, officers or not, is to let them bask and wallow in childish self-glorification. There's no such thing as intelligent vanity. It's an instinct. And you'll never find a man who is not first and foremost vain. The role of admiring doormat is about the only one that one man is glad to tolerate in another. With these soldiers, I had no need to tax my imagination. It was enough to appear impressed. It's easy to ask for more and more war stories. Those boys were crammed full of them. It was like the good old hospital days. After each story I made sure to express my approbation, as Bron Lador had taught me, with a glowing phrase, Splendid! Why, that deserves to go down in history! There's a formula that can't be beat. Little by little, the group I had wormed my way into decided that I was all right. They started telling the same kind of cock-and-bull war stories as I had heard in the old days, and later dished out myself in imagination contests with my pals in the hospital. Except their setting was different. Their fairy tales happened in the jungles of the Congo, instead of the Vosges or Flanders. Once Captain Frémison, the one who a moment before had volunteered to purge the ship of my putrid presence, perceived that I listened more attentively than anyone else, he began to give me credit for no end of delightful qualities. His arterial flux seemed attenuated by the effect of my original praises. His vision cleared. His bloodshot, alcoholic eyes even began to sparkle despite his besotted state, and the sprinkling of doubts about his own worth, which he had somehow conceived deep within him, and which assailed him in times of extreme depression, were for a time adorably dissipated by the miraculous effect of my intelligent and pertinent comments. No doubt about it. I was a creator of euphoria. I had them slapping their thighs for all they were worth. I alone knew how to make life worth living in spite of the agonizing humidity. Wasn't I the most inspired of listeners? As we were thus shooting the shit, the Admiral Bragaton began to slow down. She seemed to be making hardly any headway. Not an atom of breeze around us. We must have been skirting the coast, moving as sluggishly as if the sea had been molasses. 
The sky above us was molasses, too, a black, viscous mass that I eyed hungrily. I'd have liked best to get back into the night, even sweating and groaning, no matter how. Fremison went on and on with his stories. I had the impression that land was near, but my plan for escape filled me with alarm. Gradually our conversation ceased to be military and became first ribald, then frankly filthy, and in the end so incoherent that it was hard to keep it going. One after another of the company gave up and fell asleep, crushed under the weight of their snores, a nasty kind of sleep that scraped the caverns of their noses. That was the time to get away. One must never miss up on those remissions of cruelty that nature manages to impose on the most vicious and aggressive of this world's organisms. By then we were anchored a short distance from the coast. All we could see of the shore was some lanterns moving back and forth. Very quickly a hundred bobbing canoes full of screeching black men came crowding around the ship. There were black men all over the decks, offering their services. In a few seconds I carried the few bundles I had done up in secret to the gangway and slipped down it behind one of the boatmen, whose features and movements were almost entirely hidden from me by the darkness. At the bottom of the steps, on a level with the plashing water, I wondered anxiously where we were going. "'Where are we?' I asked. "'At Bambola Fort Gono,' the shadow answered. We pushed off and paddled hard. To make us go faster, I helped him. I had time to get one last look at my menacing fellow passengers. In the light of the cabin lamps, laid low by apathy and gastritis, they grunted and fermented in their sleep. Bloated and sprawling, they all looked alike now. Officers, civil servants, engineers, and traders, pimply, pot-bellied, and swarthy, intermingled and more or less identical. Dogs look like wolves when they're asleep. A few moments later I was back on land. Under the trees the night was thicker than ever, and behind the night lay all the complicities of silence. In this colony of Bambola Bragamance, the governor reigned triumphant over everybody. His soldiers and civil servants hardly dared breathe when he deigned to let his eyes fall on them. Far below these notables, the resident traders seemed to thieve and thrive more easily than in Europe. Not one coconut, not one peanut in the entire colony evaded their brigandage. As fatigue and ill health overcame the civil servants, it began to dawn on them that they'd been had, that all they had gained by being sent out here was braid and forms to fill out and very little pay. So, naturally, they looked at the traders with a bilious eye. The military faction, even more dull-witted than the other two, subsisted on a diet of colonial glory, washed down by quantities of quinine and miles of red tape. Understandably, a life spent waiting for the thermometer to go down made everybody more and more cantankerous. The consequence was private and collective quarrels, preposterous and interminable, between the military and the administration, between the administration and the traders, between these two in temporary alliance and the military, between the whole lot of them and the black population, and finally between blacks and blacks. The little energy that hadn't been sapped by malaria, thirst, and the heat was consumed by hatred so fierce and deep-seated that it wasn't uncommon for these colonials to drop dead on the spot, poisoned by themselves like scorpions. Nevertheless, this virulent anarchy was held in check, like crabs in a basket, by a hermetic police structure. The civil servants griped in vain— for the governor, to keep his colony in subjection, was able to recruit all the moth-eaten mercenaries he needed, the impoverished blacks driven to the coast by debts, defeated by the law of supply and demand, and needful of something to eat. These recruits were taught the law and how to admire the governor. The governor seemed to wear all the gold in his treasury on his uniform, 
In the blazing sunshine it surpassed belief, even without the plumes. He went to Vichy for the cure every year, and he never read anything but the official gazette. A number of the civil servants cherished the hope that he'd sleep with their wives some day, but the governor didn't care for women. He didn't care for anything. He survived each new epidemic of yellow fever like a charm, while so many of the men who'd have liked to bury him died like flies at the first whiff of fever. There was a story that one fourteenth of July, as he was reviewing the troops of the residency, caracoling up ahead of his spahi guards who were carrying a flag as big as a house, some sergeant, delirious with fever, no doubt, rushed out in front of him, shouting, Get back, you jerk! It seems the governor was very much upset by this outrage, which, as it happened, was never satisfactorily explained. It is hard to get a faithful look at people and things in the tropics because of the colors that emanate from them. In the tropics, colors and things are in a turmoil. To the eye, a small sardine can lying upon the road at midday can take on the dimensions of an accident. You've got to watch out. It's not just the people who are hysterical down there. Objects are the same way. Life only becomes tolerable at nightfall, but then almost immediately the darkness is taken over by swarms of mosquitoes, not one or two or a hundred, but billions of them. Survival under those conditions is quite an achievement. A carnival by day, a colander by night. A quiet war. When the hut you sleep in has filled at last with silence and the air is almost fit to breathe, the termites, those loathsome beasts eternally engaged in eating away the uprights of your cabin, get to work. The day a tornado hits this treacherous filigree, whole streets will go up in dust. The town of Fort Gono, where I'd landed, the capital of Bragamance, was perched precariously between sea and jungle, but supplied, adorned, so to speak, with enough banks, brothels, cafes, café terraces, and even a recruiting office to make it a small metropolis. There was even a place Federbe and a boulevard Bougeot, in case you wanted to take a walk. The whole was a clump of gleaming edifices surrounded by jagged rocks, riddled with larvae, trampled by generations of soldiers and officials. At about five o'clock the military element would grouse and gripe over their aperitifs, the price of which, as it happened, had just gone up when I arrived. A delegation of consumers was about to petition the governor to issue a decree enjoining the café owners from playing fast and loose with the prices of absinthe and cassis. If some of the regulars were to be believed, the very foundations of colonization were threatened by ice. Indeed, it cannot be denied that the introduction of ice into the colonies had sparked off a process of devirilization. Riveted by force of habit to his iced aperitif, the colonial could no longer hope to dominate the climate by stoicism alone. The fed herbs, the Stanleys, the Marchands, be it noted in passing, had nothing but good to say of the tepid, muddy beer, wine, and water they drank for years without complaining. There you have it. That's how colonies are lost. I learned plenty more in the shade of the palm trees, which, all along those avenues of precarious dwellings, throve in provocative contrast. It was only that garish, raw greenery which prevented the place from looking exactly like La Garenne Baison. At nightfall the native hookers came out in strength, wending their way between clouds of hungry mosquitoes armed with yellow fever. There were Sudanese girls as well, offering the passer-by the treasures under their loincloths. For extremely moderate prices, you could treat yourself to a whole family for an hour or two. I'd have liked to flit from twat to vagina, but necessity obliged me to look for work. The director of the Compagnie Pordurière du Petit Congo, so I heard, was looking for an inexperienced man to take charge of one of the trading posts in the bush, I went without delay to offer my incompetent but enthusiastic services. The director's reception of me was not exactly friendly. 
That lunatic, I may as well call a spade a spade, lived not far from the government house in a spacious straw bungalow built on piles. Before even looking at me, he fired several questions about my past. Then, somewhat appeased by my naive answers, his contempt took a more indulgent turn. Still, he did not yet see fit to offer me a seat. "'To judge by your papers, you know something about medicine?' he observed. I replied that I had indeed studied for a time in that field. "'It'll come in handy,' he said. "'How about some whiskey?" I told him I didn't drink. "'Smoke?' Again I declined. Such abstinence surprised him. In fact, he scowled. "'I'm suspicious of employees who don't smoke and drink. Are you a pederast by any chance?' "'No. Too bad. They don't steal as much. That's been my experience. They get attached. Well,' he was kind enough to hedge. By and large, I seem to have noticed that quality, that advantage in pederasts. Maybe you'll prove me wrong. And changing the subject, You're hot, aren't you? You'll get used to it. You'll have to. How was your trip? Uncomfortable, I said. Well, my friend, you haven't seen a thing. Come and tell me what you think of this country when you've spent a year in Bico Mimbo, the place where I'm sending you to replace that joker— his negress, squatting beside the table, was fiddling with her feet and scraping them with a little piece of wood. "'Beat it, you slut!' her master flung at her. "'Go and call the houseboy, and get me some ice while you're at it.' The boy took his time coming. Infuriated, the director sprang to his feet and received him with two brutal slaps in the face and the same number of resounding kicks in the gut. These people will be the death of me, the director predicted with a sigh, and slumped back into his armchair that was covered with dirty, rumpled yellow canvas. Look, old man, he said, suddenly grown friendly, as though liberated for a while by his access of brutality. Would you mind handing me my whip and my quinine? They're on the table. I oughtn't to get so excited. It's stupid to fly off the handle like that. From his house we overlooked the river port, which shimmered through dust so dense, so compact, that we heard the clanking and thumping more clearly than we could see what was going on. On the shore files of black men were busy, encouraged by whips and curses, unloading hold after hold of ships that were never empty, climbing up flimsy, teetering gangplanks with big baskets balanced on their heads, like vertical ants. Through a scarlet haze I saw them coming and going in jerky lines. Some of these working shapes carried an extra black spot on their backs. Those were mothers toting their babies along with their sacks of palm cabbage. I wonder if ants can do that. "'Doesn't it always seem like Sunday here?' the director joked. "'So jolly, so colorful, and the females always naked. You've noticed?' Good lookers, too, don't you agree? Of course it seems strange when you've just arrived from Paris, I won't deny it. And look at us, always in white ducks, like at the seashore. Aren't we a sight for sore eyes, all dressed up for First Communion? It's always a holiday here, take it from me, day in and day out, just one glorious 14th of July. And it's like this all the way to the Sahara, think of it. He stopped talking, sighed, grunted, said shit two or three times, mopped his forehead, and started in again. Out where the company's sending you, it's deep in the bush. Very damp. Ten days' trip from here, first by sea, then up the river. The river's all red, you'll see. And on the other side, it's the Spaniards. The man you're replacing at the post up there is a rotter. Just between you and me, he simply won't send us his accounts. Nothing we can do. We've sent him letter after letter. The man doesn't stay honest long when he's alone. You'll see. He's written, says he's sick. Big deal. Sick. I'm sick, too. 
What does he mean, sick? We're all sick. You'll be sick yourself before you know it. That's no excuse. What do we care if he's sick? The company comes first. When you get there, take inventory. That's essential. There's food enough for three months and merchandise for at least a year. You won't run short. Don't start at night, whatever you do. Be on your guard. He's got his own niggers. He'll send them down the river to pick you up. Maybe they'll chuck you overboard. I bet he's trained them. They're as rascally as he is. Fact. He's probably dropped a hint to those niggers about you. That's the kind of thing they do around here. And be sure to take your quinine with you, your own. Get it before you leave. He might doctor his. I wouldn't put it past him. The director thought he'd given me enough advice and stood up to say goodbye. The tin roof over our heads seemed to weigh at least two thousand tons. It absorbed all the heat of the day and sent it down on us. We were both making faces with the heat. We could just as well have dropped dead. Perhaps, he said, there's no point in our meeting again before you leave, Bardamu. Everything wears one out so down here. Well, no, maybe I'll run down to the warehouse before you go and see how you're making out. You'll hear from us when you get there. There's a mail every month. The mail goes out from here. Well, good luck. And he vanished into the shadow between his tropical helmet and his jacket. I could clearly see the tendons in the back of his neck, curved like two fingers pressing against his head. He turned around again. Don't forget to tell that loafer to come back here in a hurry. I've got a few things to say to him. And not to waste time on the way. Oh, the rat! I only hope he doesn't croak before he gets here. That would be a shame. A bleeding shame. Oh, the blackguard! One of his blacks went ahead of me with a big lantern and took me to the place where I was to live before leaving for the Bico Mimbo of my dreams. We passed through avenues full of people who seemed to have come out for a stroll after dark. The night, hammered by gongs, was all around us, interspersed by brief snatches of song as incoherent as sobs, the big black night of the hot countries, with its brutal tom-tom heart that always beats too fast. My young guide glided along easily on bare feet. There must have been Europeans in the bushes. You could hear them wandering about, their easily recognizable white men's voices, aggressive and hypocritical. The bats came whirling and weaving through the swarms of insects attracted by our light. Under every leaf of the trees there must have been at least one cricket, to judge by the deafening din. Halfway up a hill we were stopped at a crossroads by a group of native riflemen arguing around a coffin draped in a big French flag. It was somebody who had died in the hospital, and they didn't know exactly where to bury him. Their orders were vague. Some wanted to put him in one of the fields down below. Some insisted on a garden at the top of the hill. The question had to be decided one way or the other, so the boy and I joined the discussion. In the end, the pallbearers decided for the lower rather than the upper burial ground, because it was easier to walk downhill. Then we met three young white boys, the kind that in Europe go to rugby matches on Sunday, enthusiastic, noisy, pale-faced spectators. Like myself, they were employed by the Société Pordurière, and were kind enough to show me the way to the unfinished shanty where my portable folding bed was temporarily situated. The edifice, when I got there, was absolutely empty except for a few utensils and my so-called bed. As soon as I lay down on that wobbly, filiform object— Two dozen bats emerged from the corners and took to whishing back and forth like a volley of fans over my apprehensive repose. The young black, my guide, came back to offer me his intimate services. Then, disappointed when I told him I wasn't in the mood that evening, he offered to introduce me to his sister. I'd have been curious to know how he expected to find his sister in such darkness. 
Not far away, the village Tom Tom chopped my patience into little bits. Thousands of hard working mosquitoes took possession of my legs, but I didn't dare set foot on the ground because of the scorpions and snakes, which I assumed had started on their abominable hunting expeditions. The snakes had plenty of rats to choose from. Rats were gnawing away at everything that can be gnawed. I heard them on the wall, on the floor, and quivering, ready to drop, on the ceiling. Finally the moon rose, and things were a little quieter in the shanty. All things considered, life in the colonies was no great shakes. Nevertheless, the next day came, a steaming cauldron. An enormous desire to go back to Europe took hold of me, body and soul. Only one thing prevented me from clearing out. Lack of money. That was enough. Anyway, I only had another week to spend in Fort Gono before going to my job in Bicomimbo, which I'd heard described so delightfully. The biggest building in Fort Gono, after the governor's palace, was the hospital. I ran into it wherever I went. I couldn't walk a hundred yards in the town without coming across one of its pavilions, smelling faintly of carbolic acid. From time to time I ventured down to the docks to watch my anemic young colleagues, whom the Compagnie Pordurière recruited in France by emptying whole settlement houses, at work. They seemed possessed by a bellicose haste to unload freighter after freighter without stopping. Harbor fees are so dreadfully costly, they kept saying, sincerely distressed, as if it had been their own money. They belabored the black porters with a will. They were conscientious, you couldn't deny it, and they were also flabby, heartless sons of bitches. In other words, they were well chosen, as mindlessly enthusiastic as any employer could dream of. Sons that would have delighted my mother worshipping their bosses, if only she could have had one all to herself, a son she could have been proud of in the eyes of the world, a real legitimate son. Those half-baked little specimens had come to tropical Africa to offer their flesh, their blood, their lives, their youth to their bosses, martyrs for twenty-two francs a day, minus deductions, and they were happy, yes, happy down to their last red corpuscle, for which ten million mosquitoes were lying in wait. The colonies make these little clerks fat or make them thin. Either way, they hold them fast. There are only two ways to die under the sun, the fat way and the thin way. There's no other. You may have a preference, but it's your constitution that decides whether you get fat or whether the bones jab at your skin. The director up there on the red cliff, cavorting diabolically with his negress under the tin roof with the ten thousand kilos of sunshine on it, would be no better off when his time was up. He was the skinny kind. Sure, he was putting up a fight. It looked as if he could beat the climate. Looked. In reality, he was crumbling even faster than the others. The story was that he'd thought up a beautiful scheme that would make him a fortune in two years, but he'd never have time to carry it out, even if he applied himself to defrauding the company day and night. Twenty-two directors before him had tried to make a fortune, each with his own system, like at roulette. All this was well known to the stockholders, who were keeping an eye on him from up above, still higher up, from the Rue Moncy in Paris. The director made them laugh. How childish! The stockholders were the biggest bandits of all. They knew their director was syphilitic and much too horny for the tropics. They knew he downed enough quinine and bismuth to burst his eardrums and enough arsenic to make his gums drop out. In the company's bookkeeping, the director's months were numbered, numbered like the months of a pig's life. My little colleagues never exchanged ideas, only set formulas, baked and rebaked like dry crusts of thought. Worry won't get us anywhere, they said. Never say die. The director's a jerk. Nigger skin is good for tanning, etc. 
In the evening, after work, we'd meet for operatifs with an assistant manager, a Monsieur Tanderneau from La Rochelle. If Tanderneau hobnobbed with the traders, it was only because they'd pay for his drinks. He was a pitiful case. Stone broke. His position in the colonial hierarchy was the lowest possible, overseeing road construction in the middle of the jungle. His militiamen had clubs, and naturally the natives worked. But since no white man ever used the new roads that Tondorno built, and since the blacks preferred their own tracks through the jungle where it was harder to lay hands on them for tax purposes, and since Tondorno's government roads didn't actually go anywhere— they soon vanished under a dense growth of vegetation, from month to month, if the truth be known. Believe it or not, that astonishing pioneer would say, last year I lost a hundred and twenty-two kilometers of them. During my stay, I only heard Tondorneau boast about one thing, the one achievement he was humbly vain about— he was the only European capable of catching cold in Bragamance with the thermometer at a hundred and ten in the shade. That one distinction consoled him for many sorrows. I've caught another rotten cold, he denounced proudly over his operatif. You don't see that happening to anyone else. And other members of our sickly group would cry out, Good old Thunder, no, what a man! This little satisfaction was better than nothing. Where vanity is at stake, anything is better than nothing. Another way the company's petty clerks amused themselves was putting on fever contests. It wasn't difficult. These matches could go on for days, and they whiled away the time. When evening came, and almost always the fever with it, they'd take their temperatures. Hey, I've got a hundred and one. Hell, that's nothing. I can work up a hundred and three any time I feel like it. These readings were absolutely accurate and above board. By the light of hurricane lamps, they'd compare thermometers. The winner would tremble and gloat. I'm sweating so much I can't piss, said the most emaciated of the lot, a skinny young fellow from the Pyrenees a champion of fibrility who had come to Bragamance, so he told me, to get away from a seminary where he hadn't enough freedom. But time was passing, and none of my companions could tell me exactly what species of freak the man I was replacing in Bico Mimbo belonged to. He's funny, they told me, and that was all. When you start out in a job like that, said the little Pyrenean with the high fever. You've got to show what you're good for. It's all one way or the other. As far as the director's concerned, you'll either be solid gold or solid shit. And another thing, he'll judge you right away. I was very much afraid of being put down as solid shit, or worse. These young slave drivers, my friends, took me to see another employee of the Port d'Ouvrière, who deserves special mention. He operated a store in the European quarter, moldering with fatigue, oily and decrepit. He dreaded the slightest ray of light because of his eyes, which two years of uninterrupted baking under a tin roof had dried out atrociously. It took him a good half hour every morning to open them, so he told me, and another half hour before he could see more or less clearly. Every ray of light was torture. A big mangy mole. Suffocation and suffering had become second nature with him, and so had thieving. If he'd suddenly woken up healthy and honest, it would really have thrown him off balance. Even today, at this distance, I'd call his hatred for the Director General one of the most violent passions it has ever been given me to observe. At the thought of the Director, a violent rage would make him forget the pain he was in, and on the slightest pretext he'd rant and rave, all the while scratching himself from top to toe. He never stopped scratching, in ellipses, so to speak, 
from the lower end of his spinal column to the top of his neck. He dug furrows into his epidermis and dermis with his bloody fingernails while continuing to wait on his numerous customers, most of them virtually naked blacks. With his free hand, he would plunge busily into various repositories to the right and left of him in the dark shop. Without ever making a mistake, deft and admirably quick, he would take out exactly what the customer wanted. Stinking leaf tobacco, damp matches, cans of sardines, a ladle full of molasses, super-alcoholic beer in phony bottles, which he'd suddenly drop if overcome by the desire to scratch in the cavernous depths of his trousers. Then he would thrust in his whole arm, and it would emerge through the fly, which he always left partly open as a precaution. He referred to the ailment that was eating away his skin by its local name, Korokoro. This miserable Korokoro! When I think that the stinking director hasn't caught it yet, it makes me itch a hundred times worse. The Koro Koro can't get a hold on him. He's too rotten already. That pimp isn't a man, he's a smell. Pure, unadulterated shit. When he said that, we'd all burst out laughing. The black customers, too, in emulation. He frightened us a little. But he had one friend a wheezing, graying little fellow who drove a truck for the Port du Rire. He used to bring us ice that he'd stolen here and there from ships tied up at the wharf. We'd drink his health at the bar, surrounded by the black customers who looked on enviously. These customers were the more sophisticated blacks, who had lost their fear of doing business with white men, a kind of elite, so to speak. The other blacks, not so smart, preferred to keep their distance. Matter of instinct. But the most enterprising, the most contaminated of the blacks got taken on as clerks in the store. You could recognize the black clerks by the way they cursed and yelled at other blacks. My colleague with the Koro Koro traded in crude rubber. It came in sticky balls that the natives would bring in from the bush in big sacks. While we were in the store, listening to him by the hour, a family of rubber-gatherers came to the door and froze with timidity, the father in the lead, wrinkled, girt in a skimpy orange loincloth, and holding his long machete. The savage was afraid to come in, despite the encouragements of one of the native clerks. "'Come on in, nigger! Come look-see! We no eat savages!' Won over by these kind words, they stepped into the sweltering shack, at the back of which our Koro Koro man was ranting. Apparently the native had never seen a store or possibly even a white man before. One of the women, with a big basket of crude rubber balanced on her head, followed him with downcast eyes. Quickly the recruiting clerks grabbed her basket and put the contents on the scales. The savage didn't know what the scales were about or anything else. His wife was still afraid to raise her head. The rest of the family waited outside. The clerk told them to come in. Too bad if they missed the show. That was the first time they had all trekked in from the bush to the white man's town. It must have taken them a good long time to collect all that rubber. So naturally they were interested in the outcome. You hang little cups on the trunks of the trees, and the rubber oozes into them very, very slowly. Sometimes you don't get so much as a small glassful in two months. After the weighing, our scratcher dragged the bewildered native behind the counter, did a little reckoning with a pencil stub, and shoved a few coins into the man's hand. Then he said, Beat it, that's it. All his little white friends were convulsed to see how cleverly he had handled the transaction. The black man stood there by the counter, looking lost in his skimpy orange underdrawers. One of the black clerks yelled at him to wake him up. You no know savvy money? You savage? This clerk knew his onions. He was used to these peremptory transactions. He had probably been trained. 
You know speaky French? He went on. You missing link, eh? What you speak em anyway? Couscous? Mabilia? Jackass? Bushman? You heap big jackass. The savage just stood there with his hand closed on his coins. He would have run away if he had dared, but he didn't dare. What you buy with dough? the scratcher put in. I haven't seen such a jughead in a long time. He must have come a long way. What you wait for? Give me that dough. He grabbed the money and, in place of the coins, gave the black man a bright green handkerchief that he had deftly spirited from some secret hiding place under the counter. When the black man hesitated to leave with the handkerchief, the scratcher went a step further. He certainly knew all the tricks of the conqueror's trade. Shaking the big square of muslin before the eyes of a wee black child, he said, "'Ain't it pretty, you little turd?' Did you ever see one like it, little sweetie, little stink pot, little fart? And one, two, three, he tied it around the child's neck. Now the child was dressed. The whole family stared at the child, decked out in the green cotton object. There was nothing more they could do because the handkerchief had come into the family. They could only accept it, take it, and go. They all backed slowly out. They crossed the threshold. When the father, who was last, turned around to say something, the sharpest of the clerks, who was wearing shoes, helped him leave with a swift kick in the ass. The entire little tribe stood silently on the other side of the Avenue Federbe, under the magnolia tree, watching us finish our operatifs. It looked as if they were trying to understand what had happened to them. The Koro Koro man was treating us. He even played his phonograph for us. You could find anything in his store. It made me think of the supply depots in the war. As I've told you, there were lots of blacks and small whites like myself working in the warehouses and plantations of the Compagnie Pordurier du Petit Togo at the same time as me. The natives, by and large, had to be driven to work with clubs. They preserved that much dignity, whereas the whites, perfected by public education, worked of their own free will. Wielding a club is fatiguing in the long run. The white men's hearts and minds, on the other hand, have been crammed full of the hope of becoming rich and powerful, and that costs nothing, absolutely nothing. We've heard enough about Egypt and the Tatars' tyrants, and the art of squeezing the last ounce of labor out of a two-legged animal. Those primitive ancients were pretentious incompetence. Did they ever think of calling their slave monsieur? or letting him vote now and then, or giving him his newspaper? And especially had they thought of sending him to war to work off his passions? After twenty centuries of Christianity, as I personally can bear witness, your modern man simply can't control himself when a regiment passes before his eyes. It puts too many ideas into his head. Accordingly, I decided to keep a close watch on myself from then on, and learn to keep my mouth scrupulously shut, to conceal my longing to get away. In short, to prosper, if possible, and come what may, in the service of the Compagnie Pordurière. Not a moment to lose. Alongside our warehouses, on the muddy river banks, whole nests of crocodiles, insidious and unmoving, lurked in wait. Built of metal, they enjoyed the delirious heat, and so apparently did the blacks. At midday you couldn't help wondering if all this bustle of toiling masses, this hubbub of screeching, overexcited blacks on the docks, was possible. To learn the secret of numbering sacks before taking to the bush, I had to submit to gradual asphyxiations in the company's main warehouse along with the other clerks, 
between two scales wedged into the alkaline crowd of ragged, pustulous, singing black men. Each one of them drew a little cloud behind him and shook it in cadence. The dull thuds of the overseer's clubs descended on their magnificent backs without provoking the least complaint or protest. Dazed and passive, they suffered pain as unquestioningly as the torrid air of that dusty furnace. The director came by from time to time, always aggressive, to make sure I was mastering the techniques of numbering sacks and falsifying weights. With sweeping blows of his club, he cleared his path to the scales through the press of natives. Bartamu, he said to me one morning when he was in high spirits, you see these niggers all around us? Well, when I came to Little Togo almost thirty years ago, those loafers still lived by hunting, fishing, and intertribal massacres. I was a small trader then. Well, as true as I'm standing here, I'd seen them coming home to their village after a victory loaded with more than a hundred baskets of bleeding human flesh to stuff their bellies with. Hear that, Bardamu? Bleeding! Their enemies! A feast! Today, no more victories. We've accomplished that much. No more tribes. No more flim-flam and foolishness. Today, we've got a labor force and peanuts. Good hard work. No more hunting. No more guns. Peanuts and rubber. To pay taxes with. Taxes to get us more rubber and peanuts. This is life, Bardamu. Peanuts. Peanuts and rubber. And say, well, I'll be damned. There's General Tombat. True enough, he was coming our way. An old man crumpling under the enormous weight of the sun. The general wasn't exactly a soldier any more, but he wasn't exactly a civilian either. Confidential agent of the Porturier, he took care of liaison between the administration and the business community, an indispensable function, although the two lived in a state of permanent competition and hostility. But the general was a shrewd maneuverer. For instance, he had disentangled the shady deal in enemy holdings, which had been judged inextricable in high places. At the beginning of the war, General Tombat's ear had been split, not very badly, just enough to get him honorably retired after Charleroi. He had immediately offered his services to Greater France. But long after Verdun, that epic battle was still on his mind. He was always shuffling a handful of telegrams. Our little poilus will hold on. They are holding on. It was so hot in the warehouse, and France was so far away that we could have done without General Tombat's predictions. But just to be polite, we all, and the director with us, declared in chorus, They're marvelous. On these words, Tombat left us. A few moments later, the director opened up another violent path through the tightly packed torsos and vanished in his turn into the peppery dust. The director had eyes like glowing coals. He was consumed with a passion to hornswoggle the company. He frightened me a little, and I had difficulty in getting used to his presence. I found it hard to believe that in all the world there could be a human carcass capable of such maximum tension greed. He seldom said anything to us straight out. He spoke only in muffled hints, and he seemed to live and breathe for the sole purpose of conspiring, spying, and betraying. I was told that he stole, swindled, and peculated incomparably more than all the other officials put together, and they were no slouches, I assure you but I can easily believe it. During my stay at Fort Gono, I had a little leisure in which to roam around. The only really desirable spot I came across in the whole town was the hospital. Whenever you get to a new place, certain ambitions turn up inside you. My ambition was to be sick, just plain sick. Every man to his taste. 
I walked around those promising hospital pavilions, so doleful, withdrawn, and unmolested, and I never relinquished their antiseptic charm without regret. The lawns around them were brightened by furtive little birds and anxious multicolored lizards. An earthly paradise in its way. As for the blacks, one soon gets used to them. Their sluggish good nature, their slow gestures, and the protuberant bellies of their women. Those blacks stink of their misery, their interminable vanities, and their repugnant resignation. Actually, they're just like our poor people, except they have more children, less dirty washing, and less red wine. When I'd finished inhaling and sniffing at the hospital, I followed the native crowd and stopped for a while outside the pagoda-like edifice near the fort that a restaurant owner had built for the entertainment of the sexy young jokers of the colony. The prosperous whites of Fort Gono went there at night and gambled doggedly, meanwhile drinking and yawning and belching with a will. For two hundred francs, you could lay the luscious patron. The young jokers had a lot of trouble with their trousers when they wanted to scratch, because their suspenders kept sliding off. At night, big crowds poured out of the native huts and collected around the pagoda, never weary of seeing and hearing the whites jigging around the mechanical piano as off-key waltzes wheezed from its moth-eaten strings. When she heard the music, a blissful look came over the patron meaning that she felt like dancing. After trying in vain for several days, I managed to have a few talks with her in private. Her periods, she confided, lasted no less than three weeks. Fault of the tropics. In addition, her customers wore her out. Not that they made love very often, but since drinks at the pagoda were on the expensive side, they tried to get their money's worth by pinching her ass something terrible before leaving. That was what wore her out, mostly. As a competent businesswoman, the patron knew all of the gossip of the colony, all the desperate love affairs that transpired between the fever-harried officers and the handful of civil servants' wives, they too menstruating interminably, and languishing for days on end in the deep reclining chairs of their verandas. The streets, offices, and shops of Fort Gono were awash with mutilated desires. To do everything people did in Europe, despite the abominable temperature and their own progressive, insurmountable decay, seemed to be the prime obsession, satisfaction, and grimace of those maniacs. The fences could hardly contain the swollen, wildly aggressive vegetation of the gardens. The rampant foliage molded delirious lettuces around the houses, those chunks of dried-out egg white, in which some jaundiced European was rotting away. All along the Avenue Fachoda, the liveliest and most fashionable street in Fort Gono, there were as many overflowing salad bowls as government officials. Every night I went to my no-doubt unfinished shack, where my skeleton of a bed had been put up by my depraved boy. He set traps for me. He was as sensual as a cat. He wanted to become part of my family. I, however, was haunted by other, far more pressing preoccupations especially by my plan to take refuge for a while in the hospital, the only armistice within my reach in that torrid carnival. In peace, as in war, I took no interest at all in futile pastimes. Even the sincerely and eminently obscene offers that came to me through the boss's cook struck me as colorless. For the last time I made the rounds of my young friends at the Port de Rire trying to cull some information about that disloyal employee, the one I had orders to replace at all costs in the bush. Empty chit-chat. Nor did I learn anything substantial in the Café Federbe at the end of the Avenue Fachoda, a buzz at the twilight hour with hundreds of slanders, rumors, and calumnies. Nothing but impressions. 
Whole dustbins full of impressions were overturned in that half-light encrusted with multicolored lamps. Shaking the lace of the giant palm trees, the wind blew clouds of mosquitoes into the customer's saucers. The governor, thanks to his exalted rank, figured prominently in the discourse round about. His inexpiable crumminess was the mainstay of the operatif conversation in which the nauseated colonial liver seeks relief before dinner. At that hour, all the cars in Fort Gono, ten in all, drove back and forth past the café. They never seemed to go very far. The Place Federbe had the characteristic atmosphere, the overdone decor, the floral and verbal excess of a sub-prefecture in southern France gone mad. The ten cars left the Place Federbe only to come back five minutes later, having once more completed the same circuit with their cargo of anemic Europeans, dressed in unbleached linen, fragile creatures as wobbly as melting sherbet. For weeks and years these colonials passed the same forms and faces until they were so sick of hating them that they didn't even look at one another. The officers now and then would take their families for a walk, paying close attention to military salutes and civilian greetings, the wives swaddled in their special sanitary napkins, the children, unbearably plump European maggots, wilted by the heat and constant diarrhea. To command, you need more than a kepi. You also need troops. In the climate of Fort Gono, the European cadres melted faster than butter. A battalion was like a lump of sugar in your coffee. The longer you looked, the less you saw. Most of the white conscripts were permanently in the hospital, sleeping off their malaria, riddled with parasites made to order for every nook and cranny in the body, Whole squads stretched out flat between cigarettes and flies, masturbating under moldy sheets, spinning endless yarns between fits of painstakingly provoked and coddled fever. Poor bastards! They were having a rough time. A pitiful crew in the soft half-light of the green shutters. Re-enlisted men, soon fallen from celebrity side by side, the hospital was mixed, with civilians all hunted men in flight from the bosses and the bush. In the apathy of those long malarial siestas, the heat is such that the flies also rest. From bloodless, hairy arms on both sides of the beds dangle grimy books, all in tatters. Half the pages are missing because of the dysentery cases who never have enough paper, and also because of the sourpuss nuns, who have their own way of censoring wicked books. The military crabs victimize the nuns as much as everybody else. When they want a good scratch, they lift up their habits behind the screen where this morning's stiff is still so hot that he hasn't yet managed to grow cold. Depressing as the hospital was, it was the only place in the whole colony where you could feel forgotten safe from the people outside, the bosses. A vacation from slavery, that was the main thing. Anyway, the only happiness within my reach. I made inquiries about the requirements for admission, the habits and idiosyncrasies of the doctors. By that time, the prospect of leaving for the bush filled me with despair and thoughts of revolt. Already I was planning to contract every available fever as soon as possible, to return to Fort Gono desperately ill and so emaciated, so repulsive, that they'd not only have to take me, but also to ship me back to France. I already knew some wonderful tricks for getting sick, and I was learning special new ones for the colonies. I prepared to overcome a thousand difficulties— for neither the directors of the Compagnie Pordurière nor the military authorities were easily discouraged from tracking their chill-racked, cadaverous prey and pouncing on them as they played cards between the pissy beds. They would find me resolved to rot with whatever disease proved necessary. 
Unfortunately, you didn't usually stay in the hospital for long, unless you wrote Fini there to your colonial career once and for all. Sometimes the toughest and smartest of the fever patients, those with the greatest strength of character, managed to slip aboard a transport bound for France. That was a happy miracle. Most of the hospital patients gave up, recognized that the regulations had defeated them, and went back to the bush to lose what weight they had left. If the quinine relinquished them to their maggots while they were still in the hospital, the chaplain would simply close their eyes at about six in the evening, and four Senegalese would carry the bloodless husks to the plot of red clay beside the church in Fort Gono. That church, incidentally, was so hot under its tin roof that you never went there twice. More tropical than the tropics. To stand up in that church, you'd have to pant like a dog. That's the way it goes. You can't deny it. Men have a hard time doing all that's demanded of them. Butterflies in their youth, maggots at the end. I tried here and there to get a little more information, a few facts to go by. Because what the director had told me about Biko Mimbo seemed incredible. Apparently the place was an experimental trading post, an attempt to penetrate the bush, at least ten days' journey from the coast, isolated in the midst of the natives and their jungle, which had been described to me as an enormous reservation, crawling with animals and diseases. I wondered if my young friends at the Port d'Urière, who oscillated between aggressiveness and extreme depression, weren't simply jealous of me. Their idiocy, which is all they could call their own, varied with the amount of liquor they had ingested, the letters they had received, and the amount of hope they had lost during the day. As a general rule, the more moribund they felt, the more they swaggered and strutted. If they'd been ghosts, like Gortolan at the front, their gall would have known no bounds. Our operatifs went on for three whole hours. We always talked about the governor, the pivot of all our conversations. Then we talked about possible and impossible swindles, and lastly about sex, the three colors of the colonial flag. The civil servants present made no bones about accusing the military of wallowing in peculation and abuse of authority, but the military paid them back in kind. The traders, for their part, regarded all these prebendaries as hypocritical impostors and bandits. A rumor that the governor was being recalled had been in circulation every morning for the past ten years, yet the delightful telegram announcing his disgrace never arrived. And this, in spite of the at least two anonymous letters mailed to the minister for the colonies each week, imputing a thousand meticulously described atrocities to that local tyrant. The blacks are lucky with their onion skins. The white man, encased between his acid sweat and his tropical shirt, poisons himself. It's not safe to go near him. I'd learned my lesson on board the Admiral Bragaton. In only a few days I heard some sweet stories about my director. His past was as full of low dodges as a prison in a seaport town. His past had just about everything in it, including, I imagine, some magnificent miscarriages of justice. True, his looks were against him. His face had the terrifying look of an undeniable murderer, or, rather, to be fair, the look of a reckless man in a terrible hurry to get ahead, which amounts to the same thing. If you pass by at siesta time, you might see, sprawled in the shade of their houses on the boulevard Federbe, a few white women, the wives of officers or settlers, who were even more devastated by the climate than the men frail creatures with pleasingly hesitant voices, infinitely indulgent smiles, their pallor coated with rouge, as though happy on their deathbeds. These transplanted middle-class women showed less courage and pride of bearing than the patron of the pagoda, 
who had no one but herself to lean on. The Compagnie Pordurière consumed quantities of small clerks like me. Every year it lost dozens of these subhumans in the jungle trading posts not far from the swamps. Pioneers! Every morning the army and business came to the office of the hospital, whimpering and begging for their men. Not a day went by, but some captain came threatening and calling down God's thunders on the head physician to make him send those three malarial card-playing sergeants and two syphilitic corporals back to their units on the double, because how could he put a company together without noncoms? If told that his gold bricks were dead, he'd stop bothering the hospital management and go back to the pagoda for a few more drinks. Men, days, things. They passed before you knew it in this hotbed of vegetation, heat, humidity, and mosquitoes. Everything passed, disgustingly, in little pieces, in phrases, particles of flesh and bone, in regrets and corpuscles. Demolished by the sun, they melted away in a torrent of light and colors, and taste and time went with them. Everything went. Nothing remained but shimmering dread. At last, the freighter, which was to take me along the coast to the vicinity of my trading post, anchored within sight of Fort Gono. The Papauta was her name. A small ship, wood-burning and flat-bottomed, built for estuaries. I was the only white on board, and they assigned me a small space between the kitchen and the toilet. We moved so slowly that at first I thought we were being cautious in getting out of the roadstead. But we never went any faster. This papauta was incredibly short on power. We edged along within sight of the coast an endless gray line tufted with small trees in the dancing heat mists. What a trip! The papauta plowed through the water as slowly and painfully as if she herself had sweated it all. She would undo one little wave after another as cautiously as if they'd been bandages. The pilot, it seemed to me from a distance, must have been a mulatto. I say seemed— because I never summoned up the energy to go up on the bridge and see for myself. Until about five o'clock I stayed in the shaded gangway, wedged in among the blacks, who were the only passengers. If you don't want the sun to burn your brains through your eyes, you have to blink like a rat. After five you can indulge in a look around. The good life. That gray fringe— that tufted country at the water's edge looked like flattened dress shields and didn't appeal to me at all. The air was unbreathable. Even at night it was hot, sultry, and salty. Everything was so cloying it raised my bile, what with the smell of the engine and in the daytime the water that was too brown on one side and too blue on the other. This was even worse than the Admiral Bragaton minus, of course, the murderous officers. At last we approached the port of my destination. Its name, I was told, was Topo. After coughing, spitting, and quaking on the surface of that oily dishwater for three times as long as it takes to eat four canned meals, the papauta finally pulled up at the landing. Three enormous thatched huts stood out from the shaggy banks. From a distance, and at first glance, the place was rather attractive. This, I was told, was the mouth of a big sandy river, which I was to mount by canoe on my way to the heart of the jungle. I was scheduled to spend only a few days here at Topo by the sea, just time enough to frame my last colonial resolutions. We headed for a flimsy dock, and before reaching it, the papauta scraped a sandbar with its fat belly. Well, I remember that dock. It was made of bamboo, a story in itself. They told me it had to be rebuilt every month, because of the tricky, nimble little mollusks that came by the thousands and ate it up. 
This endless rebuilding, in fact, was one of the heartbreaking occupations that weighed on Lieutenant Grappa, commander of the Topo Station and the surrounding territory. The Papauta called only once a month, but a month was all the mollusks needed to eat up her dock. As soon as I landed, Lieutenant Grappa took possession of my papers, checked them for authenticity, copied them into a virgin register, and invited me in for an aperitif. I was the first traveler, he informed me, to come to Topo in two years. Nobody came to Topo. There was no reason to come to Topo. Sergeant Alcide was Lieutenant Grappa's second in command. In their isolation, there was no love lost between them. I always have to watch that subordinate of mine, said Lieutenant Grappa at our first meeting, or he tends to get too familiar. Since any happenings they might have imagined in that wilderness would have been too implausible, for what could happen in such a place, Sergeant Alcide prepared in advance a whole sheaf of nothing-to-report reports, which Grappa signed without delay, and the Papuata carried them away to the Governor-General. Among the lagoons round about and in the depths of the jungle, several moth-eaten tribes lived in misery and stagnation, decimated and befuddled by trypanosoma and chronic poverty. Even so, these tribes paid a small tax, collected, of course, with clubs. From among their younger set, a few militiamen were recruited to wield these same clubs. The militia consisted of twelve men. Lucky bastards! I know whereof I speak. I knew them well. Lieutenant Grappa equipped them in his own way and fed them regulation rice. One rifle for all twelve, but each had his own little flag. No shoes. But since all things are relative and comparative in this world, the native recruits thought Grappa was treating them splendidly. Every day, in fact, he turned away volunteers and enthusiasts, young men who had had their fill of the bush. The hunt in these parts didn't yield much, and at least one grandmother a week was eaten for want of gazelles. At seven o'clock every morning, Alcide's militiamen reported for drill. Since I lived in one corner of his hut, where he had made room for me, I had a ringside seat for the Fantasia. Never has any army in the world had more willing soldiers. In response to Alcide's commands, those primitives would wear themselves out pacing the sand in columns of four, eight, and finally twelve, imagining they had packs, shoes, and even bayonets, and better still, going through the motions of using them. Barely emerged from a nature so vigorous and so close at hand, they wore nothing but an apology for khaki shorts. They had to imagine all the rest, and did. At Alcide's peremptory command, these ingenious warriors deposited their imaginary packs on the ground and lunged into empty space to disembowel illusory enemies with illusory bayonets. Then... After simulating the unbuttoning of jackets, they would stack invisible rifles, and in response to another sign, fling themselves with unfeigned passion into an abstraction of rifle drill. To see them disperse, gesticulating with studied precision, and lose themselves in intricate, epileptic, and insanely useless movements, was deeply depressing especially when you remember that in Topo the raw, stifling heat, so perfectly concentrated in that sand pit between the conjugated polished mirrors of the sea and the river, would have made you swear by your bleeding buttocks that you were being forced to sit on a chunk of sun that had just fallen off. But these implacable conditions did not stop Alcide from sounding off. Not at all. Passing over the heads of his incredible drill squads, his roars mounted to the tops of the venerable cedars at the edge of the jungle. And the thunder of his tension 
reverberated still further, further still. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Grappa was administering justice. We'll have more to say about that. Or, from a distance from the shade of his hut, he'd be supervising the ephemeral construction of his ill-fated dock. He had ordered complete uniforms and equipment for his recruits, and every time the Papa Uta showed up, he went down to the dock with skeptical optimism to take delivery. For two years he'd been clamoring for those uniforms. It may have been especially humiliating for Grappa as a Corsican to see that his militiamen were still stark naked. In our hut, Alcides, I mean, a small, semi-clandestine trade was carried on in small objects and miscellaneous odds and ends. As a matter of fact, all the commerce of Topo passed through Alcides' hands, for he and he alone possessed a small stock of tobacco, both packaged and in the leaf, several liters of brandy, and a few bolts of cotton goods. It was plain that the twelve militiamen felt a real liking for Alcide, though he chewed them out interminably and kicked their rear ends rather unjustly. But those nudist soldiers had discerned in Alcide the unquestionable signs of kinship, of fellow membership in the great family of the innately incurably poor. Black or not, tobacco created a tie. It always does. I had brought a few newspapers with me from Europe. Alcide looked through them, trying to take an interest in the news, but though he tried three times to fix his attention on those ill-assorted columns, he couldn't get through them. You know he confessed to me after his vain effort. I don't really give a shit about the news any more. I've been here for three years now. It shouldn't be thought that Alcide was trying to impress me by playing the hermit. Actually, the ruthlessness, the manifest indifference of the whole world where he was concerned, had driven him, in his capacity as a re-enlisted sergeant, to regard the whole world outside of Topo as a distant planet. Alcide was a good sort, obliging, generous and all. I realized that later, a little too late. He was crushed by his enormous resignation. That basic quality that makes it as easy to kill poor bastards in and out of the army as to let them live. Poor people never, or hardly ever, ask for an explanation of all they have to put up with, they hate one another and content themselves with that. Around our hut, scattered over the lagoon of torrid, pitiless sand, there were strange little flowers, fresh and short-lived, green, pink, or purple, the kind that in Europe you only see painted on certain pieces of porcelain, a kind of primitive, no-nonsense morning glory. Closed on their stems, they endured the long, abominable days then opened in the evening and trembled in the first balmy breezes. One day, when Alcide saw me picking a little bunch of them, he warned me, Pick them if you want to, but don't water the little bitches. It kills them. They're delicate, not at all like the sunflowers we used to grow for the army kids in Rambouillet. You could piss on them. They'd drink anything. If you ask me, flowers are like men. The bigger, the dumber. That was an obvious dig at Lieutenant Grappa, whose body was bulky and ramshackle, his hands short, purple, and terrifying, the kind of hands that would never understand anything. And indeed, Grappa made no attempt to understand. I stayed in Topo for two weeks, during which I shared not only Alcide's existence and food, his bed fleas and sand fleas, two species, but also his quinine and the inexorably tepid and diarrheic water of the nearby well. One day, when Lieutenant Grappa was feeling convivial, he invited me to his house for coffee. Grappa was jealous. He never let anyone see his native concubine. Consequently, he picked a day when his negress was visiting her parents in their village. It was also the day when his court of justice convened, and he wanted to impress me. 
The motley mass of complainants and screeching witnesses had arrived early in the morning. In bright-colored loincloths, they crowded around the hut. Defendants and mere public stood mixed helter-skelter, all smelling strongly of garlic, sandalwood, rancid butter, and saffron-scented sweat. Like Alcide's militiamen, all these people seemed intent first and foremost on frenzied, illusory motion. In transports of imaginary argument, they spewed castanet language and shook their clenched fists. Deep in his creaking, groaning cane chair, Lieutenant Grappa smiled at all this assembled incoherence. He trusted for guidance in the post-interpreter, who in a loud and barely intelligible mumbo-jumbo communicated unbelievable complaints. Take, for instance, the one-eyed sheep that a certain girl's parents refused to return despite the fact that their daughter, though married in due form, had never been delivered to her husband, because in the meantime the bride's brother had somehow seen fit to murder the bridegroom's sister, who had been guarding the sheep at the time, and many similar but even more complicated grievances. Around us a hundred faces, impassioned by these questions of custom and interest, bared their teeth with little clicking or big gurgling sounds, black African words. The heat was nearing its height. I looked up past the edge of the roof to see if some disaster was approaching in the sky. Not even a storm. I'm going to straighten this whole thing out immediately, Grappa finally declared. The heat and interminable palavers had driven him to a decision. Where's the bride's father? Bring him here. Here he is, cried a dozen natives, pushing an elderly, decrepit-looking black man swathed with great dignity in a yellow panya. Roman style, to the front. With one clenched fist, the old man beat time to everything that was being said around him. He didn't look as if he'd come to make a complaint. More likely, he hoped for a bit of entertainment, long after he'd given up expecting any tangible results from his lawsuit. All right, said Grappa. Twenty strokes. Let's get this over with. Give this old pimp twenty strokes. That'll teach him to pester me every Thursday for the last two months with his batty sheep story. The old man saw four husky militiamen coming toward him. At first he didn't understand what they wanted with him, but then he began to roll his eyes, which were bloodshot like the eyes of a terrified old animal that has never been beaten before. He made no real attempt to resist. But neither did he know what position to take so the scourge of justice would inflict the least pain. The militiamen pulled him by the toga. Two of them wanted him to kneel, but the other two told him to lie prone. In the end they just laid him out on the ground any which way, lifted up his toga, and subjected his back and buttocks to a score of blows with a flexible rod that would have made a healthy mule bellow for a week. He wiggled and writhed. The fine sand spurted all around him, mixed with blood. He spat, and as he howled, he made me think of an enormous pregnant basset bitch being tortured. The public was silent while this was going on. All you could hear was the sound of the beating. When it was over, the old man, though half unconscious, tried to get up and cover himself with his Roman panya. His mouth and nose and most of all his back were bleeding profusely. Droning their comments and chit-chat in funereal tones, the crowd led him away. Lieutenant Grappa relit his cigar. In my presence, he affected an air of aloofness from these things. I don't believe he was more Neronian than anyone else, but he disliked being obliged to think. That infuriated him. What exasperated him when performing his judicial functions was the questions he was asked. The same day we witnessed another two memorable thrashings pursuant to further disconcerting reports of dowries taken back, poisonings threatened, promises unfulfilled, children of uncertain origin, etc. Oh, Grappa cried, if they only knew how completely cold their bickerings leave me, 
They'd stay in their jungle where they belong instead of chewing my ear off with their cock-and-bull stories. Do I bother them with my troubles? But then he started on a different idea. You know, I'm almost beginning to think those apes are developing a taste for my justice. For two years I've been trying to get them disgusted with it, but every Thursday they come back for more. Believe it or not, young man, it's almost always the same ones who keep coming. A bunch of perverts, if you ask me. Then the conversation turned to Toulouse, where he spent all his leaves and where he was planning to settle in six years when he retired. It was all right with me. We had pleasantly arrived at the Calvado stage when we were disturbed again by a native who'd been sentenced the week before but was late in having his sentence carried out. Now, two hours after everyone else, he'd come of his own free will to get his thrashing. He'd been on the trail for two days and two nights, and he had no intention of going back to his village with his business undone. But he was late and in matters of penal punctuality, Grappa was uncompromising. He asked for it. Why didn't he wait his turn last time? I sentenced the motherfucker to those fifty strokes last Thursday, not today. Still, the client protested, for he had a good excuse. He'd had to hurry back to his village to bury his mother. He had three or four mothers all to himself. Excellent arguments. It will have to wait till the next session. But our client would barely have time for the trip to his village and back before the following Thursday. He went on protesting. He wouldn't budge. It took several violent kicks in the ass to get that masochist out of the camp. They gave him some pleasure, but not enough. In the end, he went to Alcide, who took advantage of the situation to sell him a whole assortment of tobacco, in leaf, in packages, and in the form of snuff. Well entertained by these various incidents, I took my leave of Grappa. It was time for his siesta, and he withdrew to the interior of his hut, where his native housekeeper, who had just come back from her village, was already reclining. The black woman had a magnificent pair of tits, and she had been well schooled by the sisters in Gabon. Not only did the young lady speak French, with a lisp, she also knew how to administer quinine in jam and to dig chiggers out of the soles of one's feet. She knew a hundred ways of making herself agreeable to a white man without tiring him or by tiring him, whichever he preferred. Alcide was waiting for me. He was rather miffed. It was probably the invitation with which Grappa had honored me that decided him to confide in me. What he told me was pretty strong stuff. Unasked, he modeled Grappa's portrait in steaming cow flop. I replied that he had taken the words out of my mouth. Alcide's vulnerable point was that in defiance of army regulations, which strictly forbade it, he was trading with the natives in the jungle round about and with his twelve militiamen as well. He mercilessly sold those people tobacco on credit, when payday came around, there was no pay for the militiamen to collect. They had smoked it all up. They smoked up advances. This petty irregularity, what with the rarity of cash in the region, hampered the collection of taxes. Lieutenant Grappa was too cautious a man to provoke a scandal in Topo while he was in command, but he was definitely pissed off. Maybe he was jealous. Understandably enough, he felt that whatever negligible sums of money the natives called their own should remain available to the tax collector, each man to his taste and humble ambitions. At first, this system of credit against their pay had seemed rather strange and even outrageous to the rifleman, whose sole purpose in working was to smoke all seeds tobacco, but he had got them used to it by kicking them in the ass. By that time, they'd given up trying to collect their pay. They calmly smoked it up in advance, among the bright-colored flowers outside Alcide's hut, between two stints of imaginary drill. In short, there was room in Topo, small as it was, for two systems of civilization, Grappas, which you might call Roman, 
and which consisted of flogging your subjects for the sole purpose of extracting tribute, of which, if Alcide was to be believed, Grappa retained a disgraceful percentage for his own strictly personal use, and the more elaborate Alcide system bearing witness to a higher stage of civilization in which every soldier becomes a customer. This military-commercial complex is much more modern and hypocritical. It is, indeed, the basis of our own system. Lieutenant Grappa was no great shakes at geography. For his knowledge of the vast territories committed to his charge, he relied on a few rudimentary maps that he had at the post. He was none too eager to know more about those territories. After all, we know what trees and the jungle are. We can see them very nicely from a distance. Tucked away in the fronds and hollows of that immense steam bath, a few thinly disseminated tribes, stagnated amid their fleas and flies, stultified by their totems, and unflaggingly gorging themselves with putrid manioc. Utterly native, frankly cannibalistic, maddened by poverty and ravaged by a thousand plagues. No earthly reason to go near them. Nothing to justify troublesome administrative incursions which could yield no results whatsoever. When Grappa had finished meeting out justice, he preferred to turn toward the sea and contemplate the horizon from which he had come one day, and across which he would sail one day if all went well. Familiar and all in all agreeable as the place had become to me, the time came when I had to think of leaving Topo for the post that was to be my dwelling place and occupation after several days of fluvial navigation and sylvan peregrinations. Alcide and I were getting on fine together. We tried to fish for swordfish, a variety of shark that infested the waters in front of our hut. He was just as clumsy as I was. We never caught anything. The only furnishings in his hut were his folding bed, mine, a few crates, some empty, some full. I had the impression that what with his little business he must be putting quite a lot of money aside. Where do you keep it? I asked him several times. Where do you hide your filthy lucre? Just to get his goat. Planning a big spree when you get back? I was only teasing him. Twenty times at least, as we dug into the inevitable canned tomatoes, I'd entertain him with amazing episodes of the heroic joy ride from cat house to cat house that would celebrate his return to Bordeaux. He never said anything. He'd only laugh, as though my little stories amused him. Apart from the drill and the court sessions, nothing happened in Topo, nothing whatsoever. So, naturally, for want of other subjects, I'd take up the same old joke as often as possible. Once, toward the end of my stay, I thought of writing to Monsieur Puta to touch him for some money. Alcide promised to mail my letter the next time the papauta called. Alcide kept his writing materials in a small biscuit tin, just like the one Bron Lador had had, exactly the same. All re-enlisted sergeants seemed to have them. When he saw me start opening the box, Alcide made a movement to stop me. I was surprised and embarrassed. I had no idea why he wouldn't let me open it, but I put it down on the table. All right, open it, he said finally. Hell, it doesn't matter. The photograph of a little girl was pasted to the inside of the lid. Just the head, a sweet little face with long curls, the way they wore them in those days. I took out pen and paper and quickly closed the lid. I was embarrassed at my indiscretion, but I also wondered why it had upset him so. First, I figured that the child must be his, and he hadn't wanted to talk about her. I asked no questions, but then I heard him behind my back, trying to tell me something in a strange, bumbling voice I'd never heard. I felt very uncomfortable. I knew I ought to help him tell me his story, but I didn't know how to go about it. I knew it would be a painful story to listen to, and I wasn't looking forward to it. It's nothing, 
I finally heard him say. It's my brother's daughter. They're both dead. Her parents? Yes, her parents. Then who's bringing her up, your mother? I asked him to show that I was taking an interest. My mother's dead, too. Who, then? Well, me. He grinned and blushed crimson, as if he'd done something absolutely indecent. Then he hastened to rectify. All right, I'll explain. I'm having her brought up in Bordeaux by the sisters, but don't get me wrong, they're no sisters of charity, high-class sisters. She's my responsibility, and you needn't worry. She'll want for nothing. Her name is Jeanette. Sweet little girl, like her mother. She writes to me. She's making good progress, but you know, those schools are expensive, especially now that she's ten. I want her to have piano lessons at the same time. What do you think of the piano? Well, in my opinion, the piano is the right thing for girls. Don't you agree? And what about English? English can come in handy. Do you know English? As Alcide confessed his failing, not being generous enough, I began to look at him more closely, with his little cosmetic mustache, his eccentric eyebrows, and his burnt black skin. The delicacy of the man! And how he must have scrimped and saved on his meager wages, his pitiful allowances and tiny clandestine business, for months and years in this infernal topo! I didn't know what to say. I had no experience. But his heart was so much superior to mine that I went red in the face. Next to Alcide, I was an impotent slob, boorish and vain, no two ways, plain as day. I didn't dare speak to him any more. Suddenly I felt unworthy to say a word to him. I, who only yesterday had kept him at a distance and even looked down on him a little. I haven't been lucky, he went on unaware that he was embarrassing me with his confidences. Imagine, two years ago she had infantile paralysis. You know what infantile paralysis is? He went on to explain that the child's left leg was atrophied, and that a specialist in Bordeaux was treating her with electricity. You think she'll get it back? he asked me. I assured him that she would recover completely with time and electricity. He spoke very circumspectly of his dead mother and of the child's infirmity. He was afraid, even at a distance, of harming her. Have you been to see her since her illness? No, I've been here the whole time. Will you go and see her soon? I don't think I'll be able to go for another three years. You see, I do a little business here. That's a big help to her. If I went on leave now, my place here would be taken before I got back, especially with that bastard. So Alcide had asked to do a double hitch, to stay in Topo for six consecutive years instead of three, for the sake of his little niece, of whom he had nothing but a few letters and that little photograph. What bothers me? he said after we'd gone to bed, is that she hasn't anybody for the holidays. That's hard on a little girl. Obviously, Alcide was perfectly at ease, at home, so to speak, in the higher regions, on terms of familiarity with the angels. You wouldn't have known it to look at him. With hardly a thought of what he was doing, he had consented to years of torture, to the crushing of his life in this torrid monotony for the sake of a little girl to whom he was vaguely related. Motivated by nothing but his good heart, he had set no conditions and asked nothing in return. To that little girl far away, he was giving enough tenderness to make the whole world over, and he never showed it. Suddenly he fell asleep in the candlelight. After a while I got up to look at his face. He slept like everybody else. He looked quite ordinary. There ought to be some mark by which to distinguish good people from bad.
There are two ways of getting into the jungle. One is to cut a tunnel through it, the way rats do in a bale of hay. That's the stifling way. I jibbed at that. Or you can endure the misery of sitting huddled in a hollow tree trunk while they paddle you up the winding river from copse to snag, waiting for the endless days to pass and laying yourself open without defense to the deadly glare. And finally, dazed by the yapping of the black men, you reach your destination in some sort of condition. At first, your paddlers always need time to catch the cadence. Arguments. A paddle strikes the water, two or three rhythmic howls, the jungle sends back an answer, eddies, she's gliding, two paddles, three, still groping for the rhythm, waves, inarticulate burblings, a backward glance at the sea, flattening out as it recedes, and up ahead the long, smooth expanse into which you're toiling. And for a while yet, far away on his dock, almost swallowed up by the sea mists, Alcide, under his enormous bell-shaped pith helmet, a chunk of head, the face a small cheese, and below it the rest of him, floating in his tunic, lost in a strange white-trousered memory. That's all I have left of the place, of Topo. Have they managed to defend that scorching hamlet against the insidious side of the yellowish-brown river? Are its flea-bitten huts still standing? Are new grappas and unknown alcides still training new recruits in imaginary combat? Is the same plain-dealing brand of justice still being meted out? Is the drinking water still so rancid, so tepid, so bad that whenever you try to drink it it leaves you disgusted for days on end? Is there still no refrigeration? And what of those acoustic battles between the flies and the everlasting hum of the quinine, sulfate, chloride, in your ears? But most of all, are there still black people sweltering and pustulating in that cauldron? Who knows? Maybe not. Maybe none of all that is there any more. Maybe a tornado broke loose one night, Maybe the little Congo, just in passing, gave Topo one good lick with its muddy tongue and it was all over. Maybe the whole place is dead and gone, the very name wiped off the maps, and nobody left to remember Alcide. Maybe his little niece has forgotten him, too. Maybe Lieutenant Grappa never saw his Toulouse again. Maybe the jungle, which as always, year after year, when the rainy season sets in, had designs on the dune, has recaptured the whole settlement, crushed it beneath the shade of its giant mahogany trees, even those unexpected little sand flowers that all seed didn't want me to water. Maybe it's all gone. I long remember those ten days going up the river, huddled in the bottom of the canoe, watching out for muddy whirlpools, picking furtive passages between enormous drifting branches nimbly avoided. A labor for convicts on the lamb. After every sundown, we'd camp on a rocky promontory. Finally, one morning, we left that filthy native canoe and slipped into the forest by a hidden path that twined through the moist green gloom, lit only here and there by a ray of sunlight falling from the roof of that vast cathedral of leaves. Monstrous felled trees forced us to make frequent detours. Whole metro trains could have maneuvered with ease in the hollows left by their roots. Suddenly the full light was on us again. We had come to a clearing and had to climb, an additional effort. The rise we had come to overlooked the endless forest, rolling over red, yellow, and green peaks, modeling and smoothing hill and dale as monstrously spacious as the sea and sky. I was given to understand by signs that the man whose habitation we were looking for lived just a little further on, in another valley. And there he was, waiting for us. He had built a sort of hut between two big boulders, sheltered, as he informed me, from the eastern tornadoes, which were the worst, the most furious. That, I was willing to admit, was an advantage, 
but the hut itself definitely belonged to the lowest, most ramshackle category, an almost theoretical edifice coming apart at every seam. I had foreseen something of the sort, but this surpassed all my expectations. The man must have thought I looked downcast, because he addressed me rather brusquely to shake me out of my thoughts. Come off it. You'll be better off here than in the trenches. Here at least you can worry along. The food is rotten, I can't deny it, and there's nothing to drink but pure mud. But you can sleep as much as you like. There's no big guns here and no bullets. All in all, it's a bargain. He talked something like the director general, but he had pale eyes like Alcides. He must have been close to thirty, with a beard. I hadn't taken a good look at him on arriving, because on arriving I'd been thrown off by the dilapidation of the setup he was supposed to bequeath me, and which might possibly be my home for years. But observing him later on, I found a distinctly adventurous face with sharply accentuated angles, one of those rebellious faces that plunge into life head-on instead of rolling with the waves, with a big round nose and cheeks like coal barges, plashing against destiny with a soft babbling sound. That was an unhappy man. It's true, I said. There's nothing worse than war. I thought we'd said enough for the moment. I had no desire to say any more. It was he who went on. Especially now that they make them so long. Well, anyway, friend, you'll see that it's no joke here. There's nothing to do. It's sort of a vacation. Except who'd want to spend a vacation in a place like this? Well, maybe it's a matter of temperament. I wouldn't know. How about the water? I asked. The water I saw in the cup I had poured myself had me worried. It was yellowish. I drank some. It was sickening and as warm as in Topo, a three-day sediment of mud. Is this the water? The water torture was starting all over again. Yes, that's all there is, except rainwater. But when it starts raining, the shack won't last long. You see the condition it's in. I saw. The food, he went on, is all canned. That's what I've been eating for a whole year. It hasn't killed me. Convenient in a way, but it doesn't stick to the ribs. The natives eat putrid manioc. That's their business. They like it. For the last three months it's been running through me. Diarrhea. Maybe it's fever, too. I've got both. Around five o'clock I'm more lucid. That's how I know I've got fever, because it's hard to feel hotter than you do already in this climate. Actually, it's probably the chills that tell you you've got a fever. And not being quite so bored, maybe that's another sign. But that's a matter of temperament, too. Maybe a few drinks would cheer us up, but I don't go for drink. It doesn't agree with me. He seemed to think very highly of what he called temperament. Then, while he was at it, he gave me a little more of his delightful information. By day it's the heat, at night it's the noise that's hard to bear. It's unbelievable. The animals go chasing round and round to fuck or to kill each other, how do I know? Either way, you never heard such a hullabaloo. The loudest are the hyenas. They come up close to the shack. You'll hear them. You won't have any doubts. It's nothing like the quinine music. Sometimes you can mistake birds or big flies for quinine. It's conceivable, but hyenas, the enormous way they laugh, they're smelling your flesh. That's what makes them laugh. They're in a hurry to see you pass on. You can even see their eyes shining, so I'm told. They feed on dead bodies. I've never looked into their eyes. I'm sorry in a way. Sounds delightful, I said. But he hadn't finished with the nightlife. Then there's the village, he went on. There aren't a hundred niggers in it, but they make enough rumpus for ten thousand. You'll tell me what you think of it. 
And man, if it's tom-toms you're after, you've come to the right place. If they're not beating them because the moon is out, they're beating them because the moon has gone by. There's always some reason. The sons of bitches seem to be in cahoots with the animals to drive us crazy. So help me, I'd shoot the whole lot of them if I weren't so tired. As it is, I put cotton in my ears. That's even better. As long as I had Vaseline in my medicine chest, I greased the cotton with it. Now I use banana oil. Banana oil does the trick. That way they can gargle with thunderstorms if it makes them happy. It's no skin off my ass with my ears full of greased cotton. I don't hear a damn thing. These niggers are sick. They're perverts, you'll see. All day long they squat on the ground. You wouldn't think them capable of moving as far as the next tree to piss against. But the minute it's dark, surprise, vice, nerves, hysteria, chunks of the night gone hysterical. That's niggers for you. Take it from me, degenerate scum. Do they often come and buy from you? Buy? You're out of your mind. The trick is to rob them before they rob you. That's business. At night, of course, they do as they please, with greased cotton in both ears. They'd be fools to stand on ceremony. Besides, as you see, my shack has no door, so naturally they help themselves. For them it's the good life. But what about your inventory? I asked, utterly dismayed at what he had told me. The director general told me, he made himself very clear, to draw up a meticulous inventory the moment I got here. I have the honor, he replied with perfect calm, of telling you that the director can kiss my ass. But won't you have to see him on your way through Fort Gono? I will never see either Fort Gono or the director again. It's a big forest, my young friend. But where will you go? If anyone asks you, tell them you don't know. But since you seem eager to learn, let me give you some very good advice before it's too late. Don't worry about the company any more than the company worries about you. If you can run as fast as the company screws its employees, I can tell you right now that you're due to win the Grand Prix. So be thankful that I'm leaving you a little cash and ask no more. As for the stock, if it's true that the director told you to take charge of it, tell him there isn't any left, and that's that. If he won't believe you, who cares? They take us all for thieves anyway. So it won't make any difference to public opinion if for once we get a little something out of it. And besides, don't worry, the director knows more about financial monkey shines than anybody. So why contradict him? That's my opinion. What's yours? Everybody knows that for a man to come here, he has to be prepared to kill his father and mother, am I right? I wasn't so sure all he'd been telling me was true, but either way, this predecessor of mine struck me as an out-and-out -out bandit. I wasn't at all easy in my mind. Another mess I've fallen into, I said to myself with increasing conviction. I stopped talking with that thug. In one corner, stowed every which way, I found the merchandise he was leaving me. A few scraps of cotton goods, but loincloths and shoes by the dozen. Some boxes of pepper, several lamps, a douche can, a staggering quantity of canned cassoulet a la Bordelaise, and lastly a picture postcard of the Place Clichy. Next to the ridge pole you'll find the rubber and ivory I've bought from the niggers. I worked hard at first. And oh yes, here are three hundred francs. That's what's coming to you. Coming to me for what? I had no idea, but I didn't bother to ask him. You may still be able to manage a bit of barter, he said, because you know you'll have no use for money out here, only when you want to clear out. He started laughing. Not wanting to cross him at the moment, I did likewise. I chimed in as if everything were hunky-dory. In spite of the extreme destitution in which he'd been living for many months, he had surrounded himself with an elaborate domestic staff, 
consisting mostly of young boys who fell all over themselves in their eagerness to bring him the household's one and only spoon, or the matchless cup, or to extract with consummate skill the classical and inevitable burrowing chiggers from the soles of his feet. In return, he would often oblige them with a kindly hand between their thighs. The only work I ever saw him do was scratching himself, but that, like the shopkeeper at Fort Gono, he did with the marvelous agility that can be observed only in the colonies. The chairs and tables he bequeathed me showed me what ingenuity can do with crushed soapboxes. That sinister individual also taught me how it is possible, for want of anything better to do, to propel those ungainly caparisoned caterpillars, which, quivering and foaming at the mouth, kept assailing our forest cabin far into the distance with a short, swift kick. God help you if you're clumsy enough to crush one. You'll be punished with an entire week of intense stench, which rises slowly from that unforgettable mash. He had read somewhere that those horrible monsters were the oldest animals in the world, dating, so he claimed, back to the second geological period. When we've come as far as they have, my boy, won't we stink too? His exact words. The sunsets in that African hell proved to be fabulous. They never missed. As tragic every time as a monumental murder of the sun. But the marvel was too great for one man alone. For a whole hour the sky paraded in great delirious spurts of scarlet from end to end. After that the green of the trees exploded and rose up in quivering trails to meet the first stars. Then the whole horizon turned gray again and then red, but this time a tired red that didn't last long. That was the end. All the colors fell back down on the forest in tatters, like streamers after the hundredth performance. It happened every day at exactly six o'clock. Then the night set in with all its monsters and its thousands and thousands of croaking toads. The forest is only waiting for their signal to start trembling, hissing, and roaring from its depths. An enormous, love-maddened, unlighted railway station full to bursting. Whole trees bristling with living noisemakers, mutilated erections, horror. After a while, we couldn't hear each other talk in the hut. I had to hoot across the table like a hoot owl for my companion to understand me. I was getting my money's worth. And remember, I didn't like the country. What's your name? I asked him. Did you say Robinson? He had just been telling me that the natives in those parts suffered horribly from every conceivable disease, and that the poor bastards were in no condition to engage in any kind of trade. While we were talking about the natives, so many flies and insects, so large and in such great numbers, dashed against the lamp in such dense squalls that we finally had to put it out. Before dousing the lamp, I caught a glimpse of Robinson's face veiled by a curtain of insects. That may be why his features impressed themselves more sharply on my memory, whereas before that they hadn't reminded me of anything in particular. He went on talking to me in the darkness while I retraced the steps of my past with the sound of his voice as a charm with which to open the doors of the years and months, and finally of my days, wondering where I could have run into this man but I found nothing. No answer. You can lose your way groping among the shadows of the past. It's frightening how many people and things there are in a man's past that have stopped moving. The living people we've lost in the crypts of time sleep so soundly side by side with the dead that the same darkness envelops them all. As we grow older, we no longer know whom to awaken, the living or the dead. I was trying to identify this Robinson when gales of hideously exaggerated laughter not far away in the night made me jump. Then they fell silent. It must have been the hyenas he'd told me about. 
And then there was nothing but the villagers and their tom-toms, those crazy drums made of hollow wood, termites of the wind. The name Robinson gnawed at me more and more insistently. In the darkness we talked about Europe and the meals you can order if you've got the money, not to mention the drinks. So deliciously cool. Not a word about the next day, when I was to be left alone, for years perhaps, with all those cans of cassoulet. Would war have been better? No, worse, definitely worse. He thought so, too. He'd been in the war himself. And, nevertheless, he was getting out of here. He was fed up with the forest, and that was that. I tried to bring him back to the war, but he wouldn't oblige. Finally, as we were getting ready for bed, each in his corner of that shambles of leaves and partitions, he came right out with it. He preferred the risk of being hauled into court for theft to living on cassoulet, as he'd been doing for almost a year. Then I saw the lie of the land. "'Haven't you any cotton for your ears?' he asked me. If not, you better make some with the nap of a blanket and a drop of banana oil. You can make very nice little plugs that way. I, for my part, refuse to put up with the bellowing of those baboons. Actually, the concert had everything in it but baboons, but he clung to his inept generic term. It suddenly occurred to me that this business with the cotton must be a cloak for some fiendish trick. I was seized with fear that he'd murder me there on my folding bed and make off with what was left in the money box. The idea paralyzed me. But what could I do? Call for help? Call who? The village cannibals? I thought of myself as missing. Even in Paris, a man without money, without debts, without hope of an inheritance, hardly exists. He's missing to all intents and purposes. So what could I expect here? Who'd bother to come to Biko Mimbo and even honor my memory by spitting in the water? Nobody, of course. Hours of intermittent terror. He didn't snore. All those sounds, those calls from the forest, made it hard for me to hear him breathe. No need of cotton. I kept puzzling, and finally the name Robinson revealed a body, a posture, a voice I had known. And just as I was giving in to sleep, the whole man stood before my bed. I held him fast. Not him, of course, but the memory of this Robinson. The man at Noisseur sur la Lys in Flanders, who had been with me on the fringes of that night when we went looking for a hole through which to escape from the war. And then the same man later in Paris. It all came back to me. Years passed in a few moments. I'd been unhappy, sick in the head. Now that I knew, now that I'd placed him, I couldn't help it. I was thoroughly scared. Had he recognized me? In any case, he could count on my silence and complicity. Robinson! Robinson! I cried out cheerfully, as if I had good news for him. Hey, old man! Hey, Robinson! No answer. With pounding heart, I got up, expecting a mean jab in the gut. Nothing. Then, rather bravely, I groped my way to the other end of the shack where I'd seen him go to bed. He was gone. Striking a match now and then, I waited for daybreak. The day came in a burst of light, and so did the black servants, laughing and offering me their enormous uselessness. At least they were cheerful, I'll admit that. From the first they tried to teach me the art of not giving a damn. I did my best to explain with a series of carefully studied gestures how terribly Robinson's disappearance had me worried. No use. It was all the same to them. True, it's senseless to worry about anything that isn't right in front of your nose. What bothered me most about all this was the money box. But when someone walks off with a money box, you seldom see him again. I therefore decided that Robinson was most unlikely to come back and murder me, which was that much gained. 
So the whole landscape was mine. I'd have all the time I needed, I thought, to study the surface and the depths of this leafy immensity, this ocean of red, of mottled yellow, of flamboyant hams and head cheeses, magnificent, no doubt, for people who love nature. I definitely didn't. The poetry of the tropics turned my stomach. The thought of all those vistas repeated on me like tuna fish. Say what you like. It will never be anything but a country for mosquitoes and panthers, and not for me. I preferred to go back to my shack and fix it up in anticipation of the tornado that could not be long in coming. But I was soon obliged to abandon my attempts at reinforcement. The standard parts of the structure were amenable to further disintegration, but defied repair. The vermin-infested thatch was coming apart. You couldn't have made a decent urinal out of my home. After I had described a few listless circles in the bush, the sun forced me to go back in and silently collapse. The same old sun. At the noon hour, everything falls silent. Everything is afraid of burning up. And it wouldn't take much. Grass, animals, and people are heated through. Meridian apoplexy. My one and only chicken, bequeathed to me by Robinson, dreaded the noon hour the same as I did. He'd go back in with me. For three weeks the chicken lived with me like that, following me like a dog, clucking constantly, seeing snakes wherever he went. One day of extreme boredom, I ate him. He had no taste at all. His flesh had been bleached by the sun like an awning. Maybe he was what made me so sick. Be that as it may, the morning after the meal I couldn't get up. Around noon, completely groggy, I dragged myself to the medicine chest. There was nothing in it but some iodine and a map of the Nord Sud metro. I hadn't seen a single customer in the store, only a few villagers who came to look-see, interminably gesticulating and chewing cola ridden with sex and malaria. They gathered in a circle around me and seemed to be discussing my ugly mug. I was a hundred percent sick. I felt as if I had no further use for my legs. They just hung over the edge of my bed like unimportant and rather ridiculous objects. All the runners brought me from the director in Fort Gono was letters stinking with insults and idiocy and threatening what's more. Businessmen all think of themselves as big or little professional wizards, but in practice they usually turn out to be hopeless incompetence. My mother, writing from France, admonished me to take care of my health, as she had during the war. My head could be all set for the guillotine, and still my mother would scold me for forgetting my muffler. She never missed an opportunity to try and convince me that the world is a kindly place, and that she'd done a good job in conceiving me. This alleged providence was the great subterfuge of maternal thoughtlessness. It was easy for me, I have to admit, to leave all my bosses and mother's hogwash unanswered, and the fact is I never did answer their letters. Clever of me, but it didn't improve my situation. Robinson had made off with almost everything that fragile edifice had contained, but who'd believe me if I said so? Write letters? What for? To whom? At about five every afternoon I shook with a violent fever. My bed jiggled and rattled as if I'd been vigorously jerking off. A bunch of blacks from the village had come to wait on me and taken possession of the hut. I hadn't sent for them, but to send them away would have been too much of an effort. They squabbled over the remains of the stock, rummaged through the kegs of tobacco, tried on the last of the loincloths, felt the material, and took them off, adding, if that was possible, to the general disorder of my establishment. The rubber was all over the ground, mingling its juice with the bush melons and those sickly sweet papayas that taste like pissy pears. I ate so many of them in place of beans that now, fifteen years later, the memory of them still turns my stomach. 
I tried to gauge the degree of hopelessness to which I had fallen. I couldn't. Everybody steals, Robinson had said to me three times before disappearing. The director was of the same opinion. In my fever, those words ran through me like shooting pains. You've got to figure the angles. He'd said that, too. I tried to get up. I couldn't make it. He'd been right about the water we had to drink. It was concentrated muck. Little black boys brought me bananas, big ones, little ones, red ones, and more and more papayas. But I was so sick of all that and everything else. I'd have vomited up the whole globe. As soon as I felt a tiny bit better and not quite so dazed, I was seized again with a horrible fear, the fear that the company would call me to account. What would I say to those devils? How would I get them to believe me? They'd have me arrested for sure. And who would try me? A bunch of special judges, something like a court-martial, armed with terrible laws they had gotten from God knows where, who never tell their real intentions, and who, for the sheer fun of it, make you drag your bleeding steps up the steep path overlooking hell, the path that leads poor bastards to their death. The law is a big Luna Park of suffering. When a poor man lets himself get caught in it, you'll hear him screaming for centuries on end. I preferred to lie there in a stupor, trembling and foaming at the mouth with a hundred four-degree fever than to be lucid and forced to think of what would happen to me in Fort Gono. I even stopped taking my quinine, because I figured the fever would keep life away from me. You get drunk on what you've got. While I lay there sweltering, I ran out of matches. They'd been in short supply. Robinson hadn't left me a thing, only cassoulet a la Bordelaise. But plenty of that, I assure you. I threw up whole tins of it. And even to arrive at that result, you had to heat them. The shortage of matches provided me with one little amusement, watching my cook light his fire with two pieces of flint and some dry grass. It was while I was watching him that the idea came to me. With plenty of fever added, my idea became wonderfully vivid. Though clumsy by nature, I was able, after applying myself for a month, to light a fire with two sharp stones, like a savage. In short, I was learning how to make do under primitive conditions. Fire is the first thing. Then there's hunting, but I wasn't interested in that. My flame was all I needed, and I practiced conscientiously. Day after day I had nothing else to do. I never got nearly as good at the sport of propelling those secondary caterpillars. I didn't quite get the knack. I squashed a lot of them, and then I lost interest. I gave them the run of the house, like old friends. There were two big storms. The second went on for three days, and worse, for three nights. At last I had drinking water in the bucket— tepid, to be sure, but even so. In the deluge, the scraps of goods in my little stock began to run and intermingle. A disgusting mess. Some of the natives obligingly brought me lianas from the forest to anchor my shack to the ground, but in vain. At the slightest wind, the leafy walls would flap wildly against the roof like wounded wings. There was nothing I could do about it. Never a dull moment. Blacks, big and small, decided to join me in my downfall. They got more and more familiar. And they were so very happy. What fun! They came and went as they pleased in my so-called home. Freedom! As a sign of perfect understanding, we exchanged signs. If I hadn't had fever, I might have started learning their language. There wasn't enough time. I made very good progress in fire-making, but I hadn't yet mastered their best manner. I wasn't very quick about it. Showers of sparks still flew into my eyes, which gave my black friends a good laugh. When I wasn't moldering with fever on my folding bed or working my primitive tinderbox, 
I thought of the company's accounts. It's funny how hard it is to throw off one's dread of irregular accounts. I'd undoubtedly inherited that from my mother. She'd contaminated me with her, he who steals a pin will steal a pound and end up murdering his mother. We all find it hard to throw off those ideas. We pick them up in childhood and they come back to terrify us later on in every crisis. Our only hope of getting rid of them is the force of circumstances. Luckily, the force of circumstances is enormous. Meanwhile, the store and I were sinking. One of these days we'd be swallowed up by the mud, which got thicker and more viscous with every downpour. The rainy season. What looked like a boulder yesterday was oozy molasses today. Tepid water fell in cascades from dangling branches and followed one everywhere. It invaded the hut and spread round about as in an old abandoned riverbed. The rain made a porridge of my merchandise, my hopes, and my accounts, and so did my fever, which was also very moist. The rain was so compact that when it hit you it stopped your mouth like a lukewarm gag. But the flood didn't stop the animals from getting together. The nightingales started making as much noise as jackals. Anarchy all over the ark, and I a doddering Noah. This, I thought, had been going on long enough. All my mother's adages weren't about honesty. As I remembered opportunely, she used to say when burning old bandages, Nothing purifies like fire. A mother leaves you something for every turn of fate. You just have to take your pick. The time had come. My pieces of flint were not very well chosen, not sharp enough. Most of the sparks struck my hands. In the end, however, some of my merchandise took fire in spite of the dampness. A parcel of sopping wet socks. It happened after sundown. The flames rose impetuously. Wildly jabbering, the villagers gathered around the blaze. The crude rubber that Robinson had bought was sizzling in the middle, and the smell reminded me invincibly of the famous telephone company fire on the Quai de Grenelle that I'd gone to see with my Uncle Charles, who sang sentimental ballads so well. That was the year before the big exposition, when I was very young. Nothing brings memories to the surface like smells and flames. My shack smelled exactly that way. Though drenched, it burned very thoroughly to the ground, merchandise and all. No more accounts. The owls and leopards, toads and parrots must have been flabbergasted. It takes something to impress that crowd. Like war with us. Now the forest could come back and cover the wreckage with its thundering leaves. I hadn't saved anything but my personal belongings, my folding bed, the three hundred francs, and, naturally, sad to say, a few cans of cassoulet for the road. When the fire had been burning for an hour, hardly anything was left of the shack. A few tongues of flame in the rain and a few jabbering black men poking about in the ashes with the tips of their spears amid gusts of the smell that clings to all catastrophes emanates from all the defeats of this world, the smell of smoking gunpowder. Now was the time to make quick tracks. Back to Fort Gono, retrace my steps, try to explain my conduct and the circumstances of the present disaster. I hesitated. Not for long. Nothing can be explained. The world only knows how to do one thing, to roll over and kill you as a sleeper kills his fleas. That would be a stupid way to die, I said to myself, to let myself be crushed like everybody else. To put your trust in men is to get yourself killed a little. In spite of the condition I was in, I decided to head straight into the bush in the direction taken by that infernal Robinson. Often on my way I heard the beasts of the jungle with their plaints and calls and tremolos, but I hardly ever saw them. I don't count the little wild pig I almost stepped on one day not far from my shelter. 
Hearing those torrents of calls and screams and roars, you had the impression that they were close by, hundreds and thousands of them. And yet, when you got to the place where the hubbub came from, there was nobody there, except for those big blue guinea fowl, all trussed up in their plumage as if they were going to a wedding, and so clumsy when they jumped coughing from branch to branch that you thought they must have had an accident. Lower down, in the musty undergrowth, big heavy butterflies, bordered like death notices, quivered with the effort of opening their wings. And lower still it was us, sloshing through the yellow mud. We had trouble getting ahead, especially because the blacks were carrying me in a litter made of sacks sewn end to end. They could easily have tossed me in the drink while we were crossing a stream. Why didn't they? I found out later. Or they could have eaten me, since that was one of their customs. Now and then I questioned them with my thick tongue, and every time they answered, Yes, yes. Always glad to oblige. Good fellows. Whenever my diarrhea let me go for a while, the fever took hold. You wouldn't believe how sick I was. I couldn't see things clearly any more, or rather, everything was beginning to look green. After nightfall, all the animals of creation surrounded our camp. We'd make a fire, but here and there, even so, a cry would pierce the great black awning that stifled us. Despite its horror of men and fire, a wounded, dying animal would manage to complain to us, seeing we were right there. After the fourth day, I stopped even trying to distinguish reality from the absurd fever images that went chasing one another through my head, along with fragments of people and endless tatters of resolutions and disappointments. Even so, I tell myself today, when I think about it, that the bearded white man we met one morning on a stony promontory near the meeting of two rivers must have been real. A cataract nearby was making a hellish din. He was a sergeant, something like Alcide, except this one was Spanish. Worrying along from trail to trail, we'd ended up in the colony of Rio del Rio, an ancient possession of the Crown of Castile. That poor Spanish soldier also had a shack. I seem to remember that he laughed when I told him about my misadventures and what I'd done with my shack. His, I have to admit, looked a little better, but not much. His special cross was the red ants. On their annual migration, those little bitches had elected to pass straight through his shack, and they'd been at it for going on two months. They took up practically all the space. You could hardly turn around, and if you got in their way, they pinched you hard. He was overjoyed when I gave him some of my cassoulet, because he'd been living on tomatoes for the last three years. I couldn't better that. All by himself, he told me, he had downed more than three thousand cans. Tired of preparing tomatoes in different ways, he had taken to sucking the cans like eggs, through two little holes in the lid. When the red ants discovered that a new variety of canned goods had arrived, they mounted guard around the cassoulet. It wouldn't have been advisable to leave a freshly opened can standing. They'd have summoned the whole nation of red ants to the shack. There are no bigger communists anywhere, and they'd have eaten up the Spaniard, too. My host informed me that the capital of Rio del Rio was called Santa Peta, a seaport famous all along the coast for its transoceanic galleys. It so happened that the track we were on ended there. We would just have to go straight ahead for three days and three nights. I was good and sick of my delirium, so I asked the Spaniard if he knew of some good native medicine that would straighten me out. My head was acting up something terrible. But he wouldn't hear of any such mumbo-jumbo. For a Spanish colonial, he was strangely Africanophobic, so much so that when he went to the toilet, he refused to use banana leaves and kept a whole sheaf of the Boletin de Asturias cut up in little pieces for that express purpose. And he didn't read the paper. Same as Alcide. For three years he'd been living there alone with the ants, a few little kinks, and his old newspaper. What with his awful Spanish accent, which was so strong it was like having somebody else in the room, it was hard to get him stirred up about anything. 
When he chewed out his natives, it was like a tempest. For loudness of mouth, Alcide couldn't hold a candle to him. I took such a liking to that Spaniard that in the end I gave him all my cassoulet. Out of gratitude, he made me a lovely passport on grainy paper stamped with the arms of Castile, with a signature so elaborate, so finicky, that it took him at least ten minutes to get it right. He told the truth. You couldn't miss the road to Santa Peta. You only had to follow your nose. I don't remember the trip, but of one thing I'm sure, that as soon as we got there they handed me over to a priest who was so gaga that having him beside me gave me a kind of comparative self-confidence. But not for long. The town of Santa Peta was plunked down on the side of a rock directly facing the sea. It was hard to believe how green the place was. A magnificent spectacle, no doubt, seen from the roadstead, splendid from a distance. On the spot, though, there was nothing to admire but the same overworked carcasses as in Fort Gono, everlastingly sweating and pustulating. In a lucid moment, I dismissed the blacks of my little caravan. They'd crossed a long stretch of jungle and feared for their lives going back, so they said. In leaving me, they wept in advance at the thought of the journey, but I hadn't the strength to feel sorry for them. I had suffered and sweated too much, and I was still at it. By day and by night, to the best of my recollection, a lot of jabberers, they were decidedly in plentiful supply, crowded around my bed, which had been set up for that very purpose in the presbytery, since entertainment was rare in Santa Peta. The priest filled me with tisans, a long gilded crucifix dangled over his belly, and when he came near me a loud clinking of coins rose from the depths of his soutane. Conversation with those people was out of the question. It exhausted me completely just to mumble a word or two. I really thought it was all up with me, and I tried to take a last look at what could be seen of the world through the priest's window. I doubt if I could describe those gardens today without gross and outlandish mistakes. The sun was there, I can vouch for that, always the same, as if somebody had opened a big furnace in your face, and then behind it there was more sun and insane trees, whole avenues of them, those lettuces as big as oaks, and those African dandelions, three or four of which would add up to a perfectly good chestnut tree in France throw in a toad or two, as hefty as spaniels, waddling furtively from one flower-bed to the next. People, countries, and objects all end up as smells. I kept my eyes closed because I really couldn't open them any more. Then, from night to night, the sharp smell of Africa was blunted. It became harder for me to recapture that heavy mixture of decaying soil, human crotches, and ground saffron. Time, patches of the past, then more time, and then at a certain moment I felt a series of jolts and twists, and then the jolting became more regular, a swaying, a rocking. I was still lying down, that was sure, but whatever I was lying on was moving. I let myself go. I vomited, then I woke up again and fell asleep again. I was on the sea. I felt so faint that I barely had the strength to catch the new smell of ropes and tar. It was cool in the heaving niche where I was lying directly under a wide-open porthole. They'd left me alone. Evidently my journey was continuing. But what journey? I heard steps on the deck, a wooden deck right over my nose, and voices, and the waves lashing and melting against the ship's side. Life seldom comes back to your deathbed, wherever you may be, except in the form of a low-down trick. The one those people in Santa Peta had played on me filled the bill. Taking advantage of my befuddled state, they'd sold me to the captain of a galley. A fine galley, to be sure, high of hull, well-fitted with oars, crowned with beautiful purple sails, gilded figurehead, superbly upholstered officers' quarters, and on the prow a magnificent cod-liver oil painting of the Infanta Combita dressed for polo. The Infanta, I was told later on, was the ship's sponsor, 
offering it the protection of her name, her tits, and her royal dignity. It was flattering. After all, I reflected when I realized what had happened, in Santa Peta I was sick as a dog, the whole world was spinning, and I'd certainly have died in that presbytery where the natives had left me. Return to Fort Gono? Those accounts would certainly have got me fifteen years. Here, at least, I was moving, and that was ground for hope. Come to think of it, the captain of the Infanta Combita had taken a big chance in buying me, even dirt cheap, from that priest before weighing anchor. It was a risky investment, for that captain could have lost all his money. He was counting on the brisk sea air to revive me. He deserved a reward, and obviously he was winning his bet, for I was already recovering. I could see he was as pleased as punch. I still raved quite a lot, but with a certain logic, and after I opened my eyes he often came to see me in my cubbyhole. He was always wearing his plumed hat. That's how I saw him. It amused him to see me try to raise myself on my pallet in spite of my fever. All right, shit-ass, he'd say. You'll soon be able to row with the rest of them. A kindly thought. He roared with laughter, giving me little strokes of his whip, but in a friendly kind of way, on the back of my neck, not on my rear end. He wanted me to laugh, too, to share his pleasure at the business acumen he'd shown in acquiring me. The food on board struck me as quite acceptable. My speech was still muddled. Soon, as the captain had foreseen, I recovered enough strength to join the boys at the oars. But where there were ten oarsmen, I saw a hundred. Multiple vision. The crossing wasn't fatiguing because most of the time we were under sail. Our conditions between decks were no more nauseating than those of the usual third-class passengers on a Sunday excursion train, and not nearly as perilous as what I'd endured on the Admiral Bragaton coming out. There was always plenty of breeze on this voyage from the east to the west of the Atlantic. The temperature dropped. Nobody complained about that between decks. The only trouble was that the trip seemed to be taking a long time. For my part, I had seen enough seascapes and jungle vistas to last me an eternity. I'd have liked to ask the captain a few questions about the aim and purpose of this trip, but once I was definitely on the mend, he lost interest in me. Anyway, I was still driveling too much for conversation. From then on, I saw him only from a distance, like a real boss. I started looking for Robinson among the galley slaves, and several times in the silence of the night I called him in a loud voice. There was no answer except for a few insults and threats from the other galley slaves. Still, the more I thought about the details and circumstances of my adventure, the more likely it seemed to me that the same thing must have happened to him in Santa Peta, except that Robinson must be rowing on some other galley. Those jungle niggers, I thought, must all have a hand in the racket. Why shouldn't they take their turn? They've got to live, haven't they? So, naturally, they sell the things and people they can't eat right away. The natives' relative kindness to me could be attributed to the most sordid of motives. For weeks and weeks the Infanta Combita sailed over the rolling Atlantic from fit of fever to fit of seasickness, and then one evening all was calm around us. My delirium was gone. We were bobbing at anchor. Waking next day, we realized on opening the portholes that we had reached our destination. And what a sight it was! Talk of surprises! What we suddenly discovered through the fog was so amazing that at first we refused to believe it. But then, when we were face to face with it, galley slaves or not, we couldn't help laughing, seeing it right there in front of us. Just imagine! That city was standing absolutely erect. New York was a standing city. Of course, we'd seen cities, fine ones too, and magnificent seaports. But in our part of the world, cities lie along the seacoast or on rivers. They recline on the landscape, awaiting the traveler, while this American city had nothing languid about her, 
She stood there as stiff as a board, not seductive at all, terrifyingly stiff. We laughed like fools. You can't help laughing at a city built straight up and down like that. But we could only laugh from the neck up, because of the cold blowing in from the sea through a gray and pink mist, a brisk, sharp wind that attacked our pants and the chinks in that wall, I mean the city streets, which engulfed the wind-borne clouds. Our galley spun its narrow wake just outside the docks at the end of the shit-colored bay, a splash with schools of rowboats and avid, tooting tugs. When you're down at heel, it's never much fun landing anywhere, but for a galley slave it's a lot worse, especially in America, because those people don't like the galley slaves that come over from Europe at all. They're anarchists, that's what they say. The only people they really welcome are tourists who bring them dough, because all the currencies of Europe are relatives of the dollar. I might have tried what others had succeeded in doing, swimming across the harbor and once on land start shouting, Long live dollar! Long live dollar! It's a gimmick. A lot of people have landed that way and made a fortune. It's not certain, but so they say. Even worse things happen in dreams. I had a different plan in my head, along with my fever. On board the galley I'd become an expert at counting fleas. Not just catching them, but adding and subtracting them. In short, compiling statistics. A subtle skill, which looks like nothing at all, but still it's a technique and I thought I'd make use of it. You can say what you like about the Americans, but when it comes to techniques, they're connoisseurs. They'd be crazy about my way of counting fleas. I was sure of that in advance. I was convinced that I couldn't fail. I was about to offer them my services when suddenly our galley was ordered to its quarantine station, a sheltered cove nearby, within hailing distance of a small village at the end of a quiet bay, two miles east of New York. There we remained under observation for weeks and weeks, long enough to acquire a daily routine. Every evening after supper, for instance, our water squad would go ashore and make its way to the village. To attain my ends, I'd have to go along. My shipmates knew what I had in mind, but the adventure didn't tempt them. He's mad but harmless, they said. The food wasn't bad on board the Infanta Combita. They got clubbed now and then, but not too badly, and all in all, it was bearable. An average sort of job. And it had one sublime advantage. You couldn't be fired from a galley, and the king had even promised them a small pension at the age of sixty-two. That prospect made them happy. It gave them something to dream about. And another thing. They played at voting on Sundays. It gave them a feeling of freedom. We were kept in quarantine for weeks. The men bellowed between decks. They fought and buggered one another by turns. But their main reason for not wanting to escape with me was that they were absolutely down on this America that I was so smitten with. We all have our bugaboos, and theirs was America. They even tried to sour me on it. I told them I knew people there, my little Lola among others, who must have been loaded by then, and Robinson, no doubt, who had surely carved himself a niche in the business world. But they clung to their aversion for the United States, their disgust, their hatred. You'll always have a screw loose, they said. One day I made as if to join their expedition to the village water tap, and then I told them I wasn't going back to the galley. Goodbye. They were a good bunch, all in all, hard workers, they told me again that they didn't approve one bit of what I was doing, but they wished me good luck and plenty of fun all the same, in their own way. Go, they said. Go right ahead, but we're warning you. You haven't got the right ideas for a beggar. It's your fever that scrambles your brains. You'll come back from that America of yours in worse condition than we are. Your fancy ideas will be the end of you. You want to learn things? You know too much already for the likes of you. I tried to tell them I had friends who were expecting me. I spluttered and stammered. Friends, they said. Your friends couldn't care less. Your friends forgot you long ago. But I want to see Americans, I insisted. 
And besides, they've got women like nowhere else in the world. Wise guy, they said. Come on back with us. Believe us, it's not worth it. You'll make yourself sicker than you are. We'll tell you what Americans are like. They're either millionaires or skunks. There's nothing in between. The shape you're in, you certainly won't be seeing any millionaires. But don't worry, you'll get your fill of skunks. You can be sure of that. And it won't be long. Oh, no. That's the way they spoke to me. A bunch of jerks, cocksuckers, subhumans. They made me sick. Beat it, the whole lot of you, I told them. You're green with envy, that's all. We'll see if the Americans skin me alive. But one thing is sure. You've all got lady fingers between your legs and limp ones at that. I told them off, and after that I felt fine. Night was coming on, and the galley was blowing the whistle for them. They all started rowing in cadence, all but one, me. I waited till I couldn't hear them any more, then I counted up to a hundred and ran to the village as fast as I could. That village was a pretty little place, well-lit wooden houses just waiting to be used, lined up to the right and left of a chapel, all perfectly silent. Unfortunately, I was shivering with malaria and fear. Here and there I came across a sailor from the garrison. Those people seemed to be taking it pretty easy, and even a few children, and then a young girl with delightful muscles. That was America. I had arrived. It's a pleasure to see that sort of thing after so many parched adventures. It's as life-giving as fruit. I'd stumbled on the one useless village in the whole country. A small garrison of sailors and their families kept its installations in readiness for the conceivable day when a raging plague, imported by a boat like ours, would threaten the metropolis. Those installations would be used for killing off as many foreigners as possible, so as to keep the city population from catching anything. They even had a cemetery ready, with flowers all over. They were waiting. For sixty years they'd been waiting. Waiting was all they did. Finding an empty shack, I slipped in and fell asleep instantly. In the morning, the streets were full of sailors in short pants, sturdy, well-built fellows, wielding brooms and sloshing water around my refuge and on all the streets and squares of that theoretical village. I tried to look unconcerned, but I was so hungry that in spite of my fears, I headed for a place where there was a smell of cooking. That's where I was spotted and cornered between two squads of sailors, determined to identify me. Their first idea was to chuck me in the water. Taken straight to the head quarantine officer, I was in a bad way. Though constant adversity had led me to develop a certain crust, I still felt too steeped in fever to risk any of my brilliant improvisations. My mind was wandering, and my heart wasn't in it. The best policy was to lose consciousness, which I did. In the office, where I later came to, some ladies in light-colored dresses had replaced the men around me. They put me through a vague and benevolent interrogation, which would have been plenty for me. But benevolence never lasts in this world, and the next day the men started talking prison to me again. I took the opportunity to bring up fleas, just in passing, so to speak, how I could catch them, and count them, my specialty, as well as classify these parasites and compile flawless statistics. I saw that my approach interested my guards. I had captured their attention. They were listening. But as for believing me, that was a different kettle of fish. Finally, the commanding officer of the station turned up. He was called the Surgeon General, which would be a good name for a fish. He spoke roughly, but with more authority than the others. "'What's this you're telling us, boy?' he said. "'You say you can count fleas? Really, now?' He thought that would shut me up, but not at all. One, two, three, I reeled off the little spiel I'd prepared. "'I believe in the enumeration of fleas. It's a civilizing factor because enumeration is the basis of the most invaluable statistical data.' A progressive country must know the number of its fleas, broken down according to sex, age group, year, and season. 
Come, come, young man, enough of your hogwash, the Surgeon General broke in. You're not the first. Other young scamps from Europe have been here before you, telling us the same kind of fairy tales. But in the end, they turned out to be anarchists like the rest of them. Only worse. They didn't even believe in anarchy any more. Enough of your boasting. Tomorrow we'll try you out on the immigrants over there on Ellis Island in the shower room. Major Mischief, my assistant, will tell me if you've been lying. For two months now, Major Mischief has been clamoring for an expert flea counter. We'll assign you to him for a try. Dismissed. And if you've lied to us, we'll chuck you in the drink. Dismissed. And watch your step. I withdrew from the presence of that American authority, as I had withdrawn from so many authorities, by presenting first my pecker, and then, by a deft about face, my rear end, accompanying the whole with a military salute. This statistics racket, it seemed to me, was as good a way as any other of getting me into New York. The very next day, Mischief, the major in question, told me in a few words what my work would be. He was a fat, jaundiced-looking man, as nearsighted as it's possible to be, with enormous smoked glasses. He must have recognized me the way wild animals recognize their victims, by the general outline, because with those glasses he was wearing he couldn't possibly have distinguished any features. On the job we got along fine. I even think that by the end of my stay mischief had taken quite a liking to me. In the first place, not seeing a person is an excellent reason for taking a liking to him, and besides he was delighted at my brilliant flea-catching technique. Nobody else in the whole station could hold a candle to me when it came to catching and boxing the most restive, keratosed, and impatient of fleas. I was able to classify them by sex before they had even been removed from the immigrant. I don't mind telling you, my work was amazing. In the end, mischief trusted my skill implicitly. By late afternoon, the nails of my thumb and forefinger were bruised from crushing fleas, but my day's work wasn't over. I still had to line up the columns of my daily statistical table. So and so many Polish, Yugoslavian, Spanish fleas, Crimean crabs, Peruvian chiggers, every furtive biting thing that travels on human derelicts ended under my fingernails. As you see, my work was both monumental and meticulous. Our calculations were completed in New York in a special office equipped with electric flea-counting machines. Every day the little quarantine tug crossed the whole harbor, carrying our figures to be processed or checked. Days and days passed. My health picked up, but as my fever and delirium abated in those comfortable surroundings— my craving for adventure and daring exploits revived and became imperious. At 98.6, everything is boring. Yet I could have stayed there with not a thing to worry about, well fed at the station mess. Best of all, it seems worth adding, Major Mischief's daughter, a stunning young lady of fifteen, used to turn up in extremely short skirts after five o'clock and play tennis directly under the window of our office. I've seldom seen finer legs, still slightly on the mannish side, perhaps, yet on their way to becoming more delicate, a splendid specimen of burgeoning flesh. A challenge to happiness, a promise to make a man shout for joy. Some of the young ensigns of the detachment followed her everywhere. Those young scamps had no need to justify themselves by doing useful work like me. I didn't miss the slightest detail of their caperings around my little idol. Just watching them, I found myself blanching several times a day. After a while, I began to think that maybe at night I could pass for a sailor myself. I was still fondling that hope when, one Saturday in the twenty-third week of my stay, the situation ripened. The man in charge of shuttling the statistics back and forth, an Armenian, was suddenly promoted to the post of executive flea counter in Alaska, where he'd be dealing with the prospector's dogs. A fine promotion if ever there was one, and true enough the man was delighted. The Alaskan dog teams are invaluable. Since they are always needed, they are well cared for. 
whereas nobody gives a damn about immigrants, of whom there are always too many. That left no one to take our figures to New York, and, in a twinkling, I was assigned to the task. Before I shoved off, Mischief, my boss, shook hands with me and urged me to be good and behave myself in town. That was the last bit of advice that estimable man ever gave me, and just as he had never seen me up to that time, he never saw me again. As soon as we went ashore, the rain came down in buckets, penetrated my thin jacket, and soaked the statistics, which gradually melted away in my hand. Nevertheless, I made a big wad with some of them and let it stick out of my pocket to make me look more or less like a businessman when I hit town. Thereupon, trembling with fear and emotion, I hurried off in quest of new adventures. Raising my eyes to the ramparts, I felt a kind of reverse vertigo, because there were really too many windows and so much alike whichever way you looked that it turned my stomach. Flimsily clad, chilled to the bone, I made for the darkest crevice I could find in that giant façade, hoping that the people would hardly notice me in their midst. My embarrassment was quite superfluous. I had nothing to fear. In the street I had chosen, really the narrowest of all, no wider than a good-sized brook in our part of the world, and extraordinarily dirty, damp, and dark at the bottom, there were so many other people, big and little, thin and fat, that they carried me along with them like a shadow. They were going to town like me, on their way to work, no doubt. Poor people, like everywhere else. As if I knew where I was going, I put on an air of choosing and changed my direction, taking a different street on my right, one that was better lit. Broadway, it was called. I read the name on a sign. High up, far above the uppermost stories, there was still a bit of daylight, with seagulls and patches of sky. We moved in the lower light, a sick sort of jungle light, so gray that the street seemed to be full of grimy cotton waste. That street was like a dismal gash, endless, with us at the bottom of it, filling it in from side to side, advancing from sorrow to sorrow toward an end that is never in sight, the end of all the streets in the world. There were no cars or carriages, only people and more people. This was the priceless district, I was told later, the gold district, Manhattan. You can enter it only on foot, like a church. It's the banking heart and center of the present-day world. Yet some of those people spit on the sidewalk as they pass. You've got to have your nerve with you. It's a district filled with gold, a miracle, and through the doors you can actually hear the miracle, the sound of dollars being crumpled, for the dollar is always too light, a genuine holy ghost, more precious than blood. I found time to go and see them. I even went in and spoke to the employees who guard the cash. They're sad and underpaid. When the faithful enter their bank, don't go thinking they can help themselves as they please. Far from it. In speaking to dollar, they mumble words through a little grill. That's their confessional. Not much sound, dim light, a tiny wicket between high arches, that's all. They don't swallow the host, they put it on their hearts. I couldn't stay there long admiring them. I had to follow the crowd in the street, between those walls of smooth shadow. Suddenly our street widened, like a crevasse opening out into a bright clearing. Up ahead of us we saw a great pool of sea-green light, wedged between hordes of monstrous buildings. And in the middle of the clearing stood a rather countrified-looking house, surrounded by woebegone lawns. I asked several people in the crowd what this edifice was, but most of them pretended not to hear me. They couldn't spare the time. But one young fellow right next to me was kind enough to tell me it was City Hall, adding that it was an ancient monument dating back to colonial times, ever so historical, so they'd left it there. The fringes of this oasis formed a kind of park with benches, where you could sit comfortably enough and look at the building. When I got there, there was hardly anything else to see. 
I waited more than an hour in the same place, and then toward noon, from the half-light, from the shuffling, discontinuous, dismal crowd, there erupted a sudden avalanche of absolutely and undeniably beautiful women. What a discovery! What an America! What ecstasy! I thought of Lola. Her promises had not deceived me. It was true. I had come to the heart of my pilgrimage. And if my appetite hadn't kept calling itself to my attention, that would have struck me as one of those moments of supernatural aesthetic revelation. If I'd been a little more comfortable and confident, the incessant beauties I was discovering might have ravished me from my base human condition. In short, all I needed was a sandwich to make me believe in miracles. But how I needed that sandwich! And yet, what supple grace! What incredible delicacy of form and feature! What inspired harmonies! What perilous nuances! Triumphant where the danger is greatest! Every conceivable promise of face and figure fulfilled! Those blondes, those brunettes, those Titian redheads! And more and more kept coming! Maybe, I thought, this is Greece starting all over again. Looks like I got here just in time. What made those apparitions all the more divine in my eyes was that they seemed totally unaware of my existence as I sat on a bench close by, slap-happy, drooling with erotico-mystical admiration and quinine, but also, I have to admit, with hunger. If it were possible for a man to jump out of his skin, I'd have done it then once and for all. There was nothing to hold me back. Those unlikely middenettes could have wafted me away sublimated me. A gesture, a word would have sufficed, and in that moment I'd have been transported, all of me, into the world of dreams. But I suppose they had other fish to fry. I sat there for an hour, two hours, in that state of stupefaction. I had nothing more in the world to hope for. You know about innards? The trick they play on tramps in the country? They stuff an old wallet with putrid chicken innards. Well, take it from me, a man is just like that, except that he's fatter and hungrier and can move around, and inside there's a dream. I had to look at the practical side of things and not dip into my small supply of money right away. I didn't have much. I was even afraid to count it. I couldn't have anyway because I was seeing double— I could only feel those thin, bashful banknotes through the material of my pocket, side by side with my phony statistics. Men were passing, too, mostly young ones with faces that seemed to be made of pink wood, with a dry, monotonous expression, and jowls so wide and coarse they were hard to get used to. Well, maybe that was the kind of jowls their womenfolk wanted. The sexes seemed to stay on different sides of the street. The women looked only at the shop windows. Their whole attention was taken by the handbags, scarves, and little silk doodads, displayed very little at a time, but with precision and authority. You didn't see many old people in that crowd. Not many couples, either. Nobody seemed to find it strange that I should sit on that bench for hours all by myself, watching the people pass— but all at once the policeman, standing like an inkwell in the middle of the street, seemed to suspect me of sinister intentions. I could tell. Wherever you may be, the moment you draw the attention of the authorities, the best thing you can do is disappear in a hurry. Don't try to explain. Sink into the earth, I said to myself. It so happened that just to one side of my bench there was a big hole in the sidewalk, something like the metro at home. That hole seemed propitious, so vast, with a stairway all of pink marble inside it. I'd seen quite a few people from the street disappear into it and come out again. It was in that underground vault that they answered the call of nature. I caught on right away. The hall where the business was done was likewise of marble, a kind of swimming pool, but drained of all its water, a fetid swimming pool filled only with filtered, moribund light, which fell on the forms of unbuttoned men surrounded by their smells, red in the face from the effect of expelling their stinking feces with barbarous noises in front of everybody. 
men among men, all free and easy. They laughed and joked and cheered one another on. It made me think of a football game. The first thing you did when you got there was to take off your jacket, as if in preparation for strenuous exercise. This was a rite, and shirt sleeves were the uniform. In that state of undress, belching and worse, gesticulating like lunatics, they settled down in the fecal grotto. The new arrivals were assailed with a thousand revolting jokes while descending the stairs from the street, but they all seemed delighted. The morose aloofness of the men on the street above was equaled only by the air of liberation and rejoicing that came over them at the prospect of emptying their bowels in tumultuous company. The splotched and spotted doors to the cabins hung loose, wrenched from their hinges. Some customers went from one cell to another for a little chat. Those waiting for an empty seat smoked heavy cigars and slapped the backs of the obstinately toiling occupants who sat there straining with their heads between their hands. Some groaned like wounded men or women in labor. The constipated were threatened with ingenious tortures. When a gush of water announced a vacancy, the clamor around the free compartment redoubled, and as often as not a coin would be tossed for its possession. No sooner read, newspapers, though as thick as pillows, were dismembered by the horde of rectal toilers. The smoke made it hard to distinguish faces, and the smells deterred me from going too close. To a foreigner the contrast was disconcerting. Such free and easy intimacy, such extraordinary intestinal familiarity, and up on the street such perfect restraint. It left me stunned. I returned to the light of day by the same stairway and went back to the same bench to rest. Sudden outburst of digestive vulgarity. Discovery of a joyous, shitting communism. I ignored both these disconcerting aspects of the same adventure. I hadn't the strength for analysis or synthesis. My pressing desire was to sleep. Oh, rare, delicious frenzy! So I joined the line of pedestrians entering one of the neighboring streets. We progressed by fits and starts because of the shop windows which fragmented the crowd. At one point the door of a hotel created a great eddy. People poured out onto the sidewalk through a big revolving door. I was caught up and poured the other way, into the big lobby inside. Instant amazement. You had to divine, to imagine, the majesty of the edifice, the generous proportions, because the lights were so veiled that it took you some time to know what you were looking at. Lots of young women in the half-light plunged in deep armchairs as in jewel cases, Around them, attentive men, moving silently, with timid curiosity, to and fro, just offshore from the row of crossed legs and magnificent silk-encased thighs. Those miraculous beings seemed to be waiting for grave and costly events. Obviously, they weren't giving me a thought. So, ever so furtively, I, in my turn, passed that long and palpable temptation. Since at least a hundred of those divine leg-owners were sitting in a single row of chairs, I reached the reception desk in so dreamy a condition, having absorbed a ration of beauty so much too strong for my constitution, that I was reeling. At the desk, a pomaded clerk violently offered me a room. I asked for the smallest in the hotel. I can't have had more than fifty dollars at the time. Also, I was pretty well out of ideas and self-assurance. I hoped the room the clerk was giving me was really the smallest, because his hotel, the Laugh Calvin, was advertised as the most luxurious and sumptuously furnished on the whole North American continent. Over my head, what an infinity of furnished rooms! And all around me, in those chairs, what inducements to multiple rape! What abysses! What perils! Is the poor man's aesthetic torment to have no end? Is it to be even more long-lasting than his hunger? But there was no time to succumb. Before I knew it, the clerk had thrust a heavy key into my hand. I was afraid to move. 
A sharp youngster, dressed like a juvenile brigadier general, stepped imperious and commanding out of the gloom. The smooth reception clerk rang his metallic bell three times, and the little boy started whistling. That was my send-off. Time to go. And away we went. As black and resolute as a subway train, we raced down a corridor, the youngster in the lead. A twist, a turn, another. We didn't dawdle. We veered a bit to the left. Here we go. The elevator. Stitch in my side. Is this it? No, another corridor. Even darker. Ebony paneling, it looks like, all along the walls. No time to examine it. The kid's whistling. He's carrying my frail valise. I don't dare ask him questions. My job was to keep walking. That was clear to me. In the darkness here and there as we passed, a red and green light flashed a command. Long lines of gold marked the doors. We had passed the 1800s long ago, and then the 3000s, and still we were on our way, drawn by our invincible destiny. As though driven by instinct, the little bellhop, in his braid and stripes, pursued the nameless in the darkness. Nothing in this cavern seemed to take him unawares. His whistling modulated plaintively when we passed a black man and a black chambermaid, and that was all. Struggling to walk faster in those corridors, I lost what little self-assurance I had left when I escaped from quarantine. I was falling apart, just as I had seen my shack fall apart in the African wind and the floods of warm water. Here I was attacked by a torrent of unfamiliar sensations. There's a moment between two brands of humanity when you find yourself thrashing around in a vacuum. Suddenly, without warning, the youngster pivoted. We had arrived. I bumped into a chair. It was my room, a big box with ebony walls. The only light was a faint ring surrounding the bashful greenish lamp on the table. The manager of the Laugh Calvin Hotel begged the visitor to look upon him as a friend and assured him that he, the manager, would make a special point of keeping him, the visitor, cheerful throughout his stay in New York. Reading this notice, which was displayed where no one could possibly miss it, added, if possible, to my depression. Once I was left alone, it deepened. All America had followed me to my room and was asking me enormous questions, reviving awful forebodings. Reclining anxiously on the bed, I tried to adjust to the darkness of my cubbyhole. At regular intervals, the walls on the window side trembled. An elevated railway train was passing. It bounded between two streets like a cannonball filled with quivering flesh, jolting from section to section of this lunatic city. You could see it far away, its carcass trembling as it passed over a torrent of steel girders, which went on echoing from rampart to rampart long after the train had roared by at seventy miles an hour. Dinner time passed as I lay thus prostrate, and bedtime as well. What had horrified me most of all was that elevated railway. On the other side of the court, which was more like a well shaft, the wall began to light up, first one, then two rooms, then dozens. I could see what was going on in some of them, couples going to bed. These Americans seemed as worn out as our own people after their vertical hours. The women had very full, very pale thighs, at least the ones I was able to get a good look at. Before going to bed, most of the men shaved without taking the cigars out of their mouths. In bed, they first took off their glasses, then put their false teeth in a glass of water, which they left in evidence. Same as in the street, the sexes didn't seem to talk to each other. They impressed me as fat, docile animals, used to being bored. In all, I only saw two couples engaging with the light on in the kind of thing I expected, and not at all violently. The other women ate chocolates in bed while waiting for their husbands to finish shaving. And then they all put their lights out. There's something sad about people going to bed. 
You can see why they don't give a damn whether they're getting what they want out of life or not. You can see they don't even try to understand what we're here for. They just don't care. Americans are not. They sleep no matter what. They're bloated mollusks. No sensibility. No trouble with their conscience. I'd seen too many puzzling things to be easy in my mind. I knew too much and not enough. I'd better go out, I said to myself. I'd better go out again. Maybe I'll meet Robinson. Naturally, that was an idiotic idea, but I dreamed it up as an excuse for going out again, because no matter how much I tossed and turned on my narrow bed, I couldn't snatch the tiniest scrap of sleep. Even masturbation, at times like that, provides neither comfort nor entertainment. Then you're really in despair. The worst part is wondering how you'll find the strength tomorrow to go on doing what you did today and have been doing for much too long, where you'll find the strength for all that stupid running around, those projects that come to nothing, those attempts to escape from crushing necessity, which always founder and serve only to convince you one more time that destiny is implacable, that every night will find you down and out, crushed by the dread of more and more sordid and insecure tomorrows. And maybe it's treacherous old age coming on, threatening the worst. Not much music left inside us for life to dance to. Our youth has gone to the ends of the earth to die in the silence of the truth. And where, I ask you, can a man escape to when he hasn't enough madness left inside him? The truth is an endless death agony. The truth is death. You have to choose. Death or lies. I've never been able to kill myself. I'd better go out into the street. A partial suicide. Everyone has his little knacks, his ways of getting sleep and food. I'd need to sleep if I wanted to recover the strength I'd need to go to work next day, get back the zip it would take to find a job in the morning, and in the meantime force my way into the unknown realm of sleep. Don't go thinking it's easy to fall asleep when you've started doubting everything, mostly because of the awful fears people have given you. I dressed and somehow found my way to the elevator, but feeling kind of foggy. I still had to cross the lobby to pass more rows of ravishing enigmas with legs so tempting, faces so delicate and severe. Goddesses, in short, hustling goddesses. We might have tried to make an arrangement, but I was afraid of being arrested. Complications. Nearly all a poor bastard's desires are punishable by jail. So there I was on the street again. It wasn't the same crowd as before. This one billowed over the sidewalks and showed a little more life, as if it had landed in a country less arid, the land of entertainment, of nightlife. The people surged in the direction of lights suspended far off in the darkness, writhing multicolored snakes. They flowed in from all the neighborhood streets. A crowd like that, I said to myself, adds up to a lot of dollars in handkerchiefs alone or silk stockings, or just in cigarettes for that matter, and to think that you can go out among all that money and nobody will give you a single penny, not even to go and eat with. It's heartbreaking to think how people shut themselves off from one another, like houses. I, too, dragged myself toward the lights, a movie house, and then another right next to it, and another all along the street. We lost big chunks of crowd to each of them. I picked a movie house with posters of women in slips, and what legs! Boy, oh boy! Heavy, ample, shapely, and pretty faces on top! as though drawn for the contrast, no need of retouching, not a blemish, not a flaw, perfect, I tell you, delicate, but firm and concise. Life can engender no greater peril than these incautious beauties, these indiscreet variations on perfect divine harmony. It was warm and cozy in the movie house. An enormous organ, as mellow as in a cathedral, a heated cathedral, I mean, Organ pipes like thighs. They don't waste a moment. Before you know it, you're bathing in an all-forgiving warmth. 
Just let yourself go and you'll begin to think the world has been converted to loving kindness. I almost was myself. Dreams rise in the darkness and catch fire from the mirage of moving light. What happens on the screen isn't quite real. It leaves open a vague, cloudy space for the poor, for dreams and the dead. Hurry, hurry, cram yourself full of dreams to carry you through the life that's waiting for you outside when you leave here, to help you last a few days more in that nightmare of things and people. Among the dreams, choose the ones most likely to warm your soul. I have to confess that I picked the sexy ones. No point in being proud. When it comes to miracles, take the ones that will stay with you. A blonde with unforgettable tits and shoulders saw fit to break the silence of the screen with a song about her loneliness. I'd have been glad to cry about it with her. There's nothing like it. What a lift it gives you. After that, I knew I'd have courage enough in my guts to last me at least two days. I didn't even wait for the lights to go on. Once I'd absorbed a small dose of that admirable ecstasy, I knew I'd sleep. My mind was made up. When I got back to the Laugh Calvin, the night clerk, despite my greeting, neglected to say good evening the way they do at home. But his contempt didn't mean a thing to me any more. An intense inner life suffices to itself. It can melt an ice pack that has been building up for twenty years. That's a fact. In my room, I'd barely closed my eyes when the blonde from the movie house came along and sang her whole song of sorrow just for me. I helped her put me to sleep, so to speak, and succeeded pretty well. I wasn't entirely alone. It's not possible to sleep alone. To eat cheaply in America, you can buy yourself a hot roll with a sausage in it. It's handy, they sell them on street corners in the poor neighborhoods, and they're not at all expensive. I didn't mind eating in poor neighborhoods, but never meeting those splendid creatures designed for the rich, that bothered me. Under those conditions, it wasn't worth eating. True, at the Laugh Calvin, on those thick carpets, I could pretend to be looking for somebody among the two pretty women in the lobby— after a while, I was able to face that sultry atmosphere without quailing. Thinking about it, I had to admit that the boys on the Infanta Combita had been right. Experience was teaching me that I didn't have sensible tastes for a poor slob. My shipmates on the galley had been right in giving me hell. Anyway, my morale was still low. More and more, I dosed myself on movies, in this street or that street, but all they gave me was enough energy for a little stroll or two. No more. The loneliness in Africa had been pretty rough, but my isolation in this American anthill was even more crushing. I'd always worried about being practically empty, about having no serious reason for living, and now, confronted with the facts, I was sure of my individual nullity. In that environment, too different from the one where my petty habits were at home, I seemed to have disintegrated. I felt very close to non-existence. I discovered that with no one to speak to me of familiar things, there was nothing to stop me from sinking into irresistible boredom, a terrifying, sickly sweet torpor, nauseating. On the point of dropping my last dollar in this adventure, I was still bored, so profoundly that I even refused to envisage the most urgent steps I should be taking. We are so trivial by nature that only amusements can stop us from dying for real. I clung to the movies with desperate fervor. Leaving the delirious gloom of my hotel, I attempted a few excursions in the main streets roundabout an insipid carnival of dizzying buildings. My weariness increased at the sight of those endless house fronts, that turgid monotony of pavements, of windows upon windows, of business and more business, that chancre of the world, bursting with pustulant advertisements, false promises, driveling lies. 
Along the river I explored other streets, more and more of them. Here the dimensions were more normal. For instance, from the sidewalk where I was standing, I might have smashed every window in the house across the street. Those neighborhoods were full of the smell of constant frying. The shops dispensed with sidewalk displays for fear of theft. Everything reminded me of the streets around my hospital in Vijuif, even the children with their crooked, swollen knees all along the sidewalks, and the barrel organs. I'd been glad to stay there with them, but poor people wouldn't have fed me any more than the rich. Besides, I'd have had to look at them all, and their too much misery frightened me. So I went back to Richtown. You no good, I said to myself. Really, you have no virtue. A man should be resigned to knowing himself a little better each day if he hasn't got the guts to put an end to his sniveling once and for all. A streetcar was running beside the Hudson, heading for the Midtown section. An ancient vehicle, trembling in every wheel and all its terrified carcass. It took a solid hour to get there. The passengers submitted without impatience to a complicated ritual— you paid by tossing coins into a kind of coffee mill stationed at the entrance. The conductor, dressed like ours, in the uniform of a Balkan prisoner of war, watched them doing it. At last we arrived. Returning exhausted from those populist excursions, I once again passed that inexhaustible double row of beauties in my Tantalian lobby. Again and again I passed, pensive and prodded by desire, my poverty was such that I didn't dare rummage through my pockets to make sure. If only, I thought, Lola hasn't picked this particular moment to leave town. But will she want to see me in the first place? Should I touch her for a fifty or for a hundred dollars as a starter? I hesitated. I felt that I wouldn't have the nerve till I'd eaten and slept properly for once. And then, if this first touch was successful, I'd go looking for Robinson right away. That is, as soon as I got my strength back. Robinson was nothing like me. He was determined, courageous. Oh, yes, I could bet he knew all about America by now, all the ins and outs. Maybe he knew some way of acquiring the certainty, the peace of mind, in which I was so sadly lacking. If, as I supposed, he, too, had come on a galley and trodden these shores before me, He'd be well launched on his American career by now. These jumpy lunatics wouldn't faze him. I myself, come to think of it, might have looked for a job in one of those offices whose dazzling signs I saw outside. But at the thought of having to enter that sort of building, I crumpled with fear. My hotel, that gigantic, loathsomely animated tomb, was enough for me. Maybe those vast accretions of matter, those commercial honeycombs, those endless figments of brick and steel didn't affect the habitués the way they did me. To them, perhaps, that suspended deluge meant security, while to me it was simply an abominable system of constraints, of corridors, locks, and wickets, a vast, inexpiable architectural crime. Philosophizing is simply one way of being afraid a cowardly pretense that doesn't get you anywhere. I went out and watched my last three dollars wriggling in the palm of my hand under the electric signs on Times Square, that amazing intersection where the crowds engaged in picking their movie show are bathed in floods of advertising. In search of a cheap restaurant, I went into one of those rationalized public refectories where the service is reduced to a minimum and the alimentary right is cut down to the exact measure of nature's requirements. They hand you a tray at the entrance, and you take your place in a line. You wait. The girls around me, delightful candidates for dinner, didn't say a word to me. It must feel really funny, I thought, to be able to go right up to one of those young ladies with the tidy, prettily shaped noses and say, Miss, I'm rich, very rich. Just tell me what it might please you to accept. Everything that was so complicated a moment before would suddenly become so simple, so divinely simple. Everything would be changed. 
The forbiddingly hostile world would turn into a playful, docile, velvety ball rolling at your feet. Then and there, perhaps, you'd throw off the exhausting habit of dreaming about successful people and enormous fortunes, because then you'd be able to put your hands on all that. The life of people without resources is nothing but one long rebuff and one long frenzy of desire, and a man can truly know, truly deliver himself, only from what he possesses. As for me, I'd picked up and dropped so many dreams, my mind was cracked and fissured, full of drafts, and disgustingly out of order. In the meantime, I was afraid to attempt even the most inoffensive conversation with these young things in the restaurant. I went ahead with my tray in well-behaved silence. When it came my turn to pass the earthenware hollows filled with sausages and beans, I took what was given me. That restaurant was so clean and well-lighted that, skimming its mosaic floor, I felt like a fly on milk. Waitresses dressed like nurses stood behind the noodles, rice, and stewed fruit. Each had her specialty. I took what the most attractive ones were dishing out. To my regret, they didn't smile at the customers at all. As soon as you were served, you had to leave your place in line and find yourself a table. You balance your tray and take little mincing steps as if it were an operating room. It was a change from the laugh Calvin and my gold-bordered ebony cubbyhole. But if they showered the customers with so much light, if they lifted us for a moment from the habitual darkness of our condition, there was method in their madness. The owner was up to something. I had my suspicions. After days of darkness, it feels strange to be suddenly bathed in torrents of light. It made me a little giddier than usual which wasn't difficult, I admit. I couldn't manage to hide my feet under the immaculate little enamel-top table I had landed at. They stuck out in all directions. I'd have liked my feet to be somewhere else, because we were being watched through the window by the line of people we had just left in the street. They were waiting for us to finish eating, so they could come and take our tables. Actually, that was the reason, to keep up their appetite, why we were so well-lighted and displayed so prominently. We were living advertisements, so to speak. The strawberries on my cake shimmered and sparkled so brightly that I couldn't bring myself to eat them. You can't get away from American business enterprise. Yet, despite the dazzling glare and my cramped posture, I perceived the comings and goings in my immediate vicinity of a very nice waitress and decided not to miss a single one of her delightful movements. When my turn came to have her clear my table, I took careful note of the unusual shape of her eyes, the outer ends of which tilted upwards more sharply than is common among French women. The eyelids also inclined slightly toward the eyebrows on the temple side. A sign of cruelty, but just enough. The kind of cruelty you can kiss, an insidious tartness, like the Rhine wines one can't help liking. When she came close to me, I made little gestures of complicity, as if I knew her. She looked me over as if I'd been an animal, without indulgence, but with a certain curiosity. This, I said to myself, is the first American woman who has been forced to look at me. Once I'd finished my luminous cake, there was no help for it. I had to give up my place to someone else. Reeling slightly, instead of taking the obvious way to the exit, I braced myself and circled round the man at the cash desk who was waiting for all of us and our money. Sticking out like a sore thumb in the bright, disciplined light, I headed for the blonde. The twenty-five waitresses at their posts behind the simmering dishes all signaled to me in unison that I was mistaken— headed the wrong way. In the plate-glass window I saw a great stir among the people waiting, and the people behind me, who were supposed to start eating, hesitated to sit down. I had broken the foreordained order of things. All the people around me cried out in consternation, It must be a foreigner! But I had my idea for what it was worth. I wasn't going to lose the beauty who had waited on me. The sweet thing had asked for it. She had looked at me. I was sick of being alone. 
I was sick of dreams. I wanted sympathy, human contact. Miss, I said, you hardly know me, but I already love you. Shall we get married? That's how I addressed her, most respectfully. Her answer never reached me, for a giant guard, he too dressed all in white, stepped up at that exact moment and simply shoved me out into the night, without insults or brutality, like a dog that is misbehaved. The whole thing went off like clockwork. There was nothing I could say. I went back to the laugh Calvin. In my room the same thunders were still shattering their echoes. First the roar of the L, which seemed to hurl itself at us from far away, smashing the city every time it passed by, carrying away the aqueducts, and in between, incoherent mechanical sounds from far below, coming up from the street, plus the soft murmur of the eddying crowd, hesitant, monotonous, always starting up again, then hesitating again and starting up again, the great stew-pot of people in a city. From up high where I was, you could shout anything you liked at them. I tried. They made me sick, the whole lot of them. I hadn't the nerve to tell them so in the daytime to their face, but up there it was safe. Help! Help! I shouted, just to see if it would have any effect on them. None whatsoever. Those people were pushing life and night and day in front of them. Life hides everything from people. Their own noise prevents them from hearing anything else. They couldn't care less. The bigger and taller the city, the less they care. Take it from me. I've tried. It's a waste of time. I have to admit it was only for need of money, but how very pressing, how imperious a need, that I started looking for Lola. If it hadn't been for that pitiful need... Man, I would have let that little bitch of a girlfriend grow old and die without ever setting eyes on her again. All in all, and when I thought about it I had no doubt whatsoever, her behavior to me had been most crummily ruthless. When, grown older, we look back on the selfishness of the people who've been mixed up with our lives, we see it undeniably for what it was as hard as steel or platinum, and a lot more durable than time itself. As long as we're young, we manage to find excuses for the stoniest indifference, the most blatant caddishness. We put them down to emotional eccentricity, or some sort of romantic inexperience. But later on, when life shows us how much cunning, cruelty, and malice are required just to keep the body at 98.6, we catch on. We know the score. We begin to understand how much swinishness it takes to make up a past. Just take a close look at yourself and the degree of rottenness you've come to. There's no mystery about it, no more room for fairy tales. If you've lived this long, it's because you've squashed any poetry you had in you. Life is keeping body and soul together. I finally, with a good deal of trouble, found my little bitch on the twenty-third floor of a building on 77th Street. It's incredible how revolting people seem when you're about to ask a favor of them. Her place was posh, pretty much what I'd imagined. Having steeped myself in large doses of cinema, I was mentally in pretty good shape, almost out of the depression that had weighed on me ever since I landed in New York, so our first contact wasn't as unpleasant as I'd expected. Lola didn't even seem terribly surprised at seeing me. It was only when she recognized me that she seemed rather put out. By way of preamble, I tried to strike up an inoffensive sort of conversation, drawing on our common past. I kept it as discreet as possible, and mentioned the war just in passing, without any particular emphasis. There I was putting my foot in it. She didn't want to hear about the war, not one word. It aged her, and she didn't like that. She lost no time in getting back at me. Age, she said, had so wrinkled, bloated, and caricatured me that she wouldn't have known me in the street. In short, we exchanged compliments. If the little tart thought she could get me down with such foolishness, 
I didn't even deign to react to her sleazy impertinence. Her furnishings didn't bowl me over with their elegance, but the place was cheerful enough, or at least I thought so, after the laugh Calvin. There always seemed to be a certain magic about getting rich quickly. Since the rise of Mousine and Madame Erot, I knew that a poor woman's ass is her gold mine. Those sudden female metamorphoses fascinated me, and I'd have given Lola's concierge my last dollar to make her talk. But there was no concierge in the house. There were no concierges in the whole city. A city without concierges has no history, no savor. It's as insipid as a soup without pepper and salt. Nondescript slop. Oh, luscious scrapings. Oh, garbage. Oh, muck oozing from bedrooms, kitchens, and attics, cascading down to the concierge's den, the center of life. What luscious, tasty hellfire! Some of our concierges are victims of their profession. Laconic, throat-clearing, delectable, struck dumb with amazement, martyrs, stupefied and consumed by the truth. To counter the abomination of being poor, why deny it, we are in duty bound to try everything, to get drunk on anything we can, cheap wine, masturbation, movies. No sense in being difficult, particular, as they say in America. Year in and year out, we may as well admit, our concierges in France provide anyone who knows how to take it and coddle it close to his heart with a free, gratis supply of all-purpose hatred, enough to blow up the world. In New York, they're cruelly lacking in this vital spice, so sordid and irrefutably alive, without which the spirit is stifled, condemned to vague slanders and pallid, bumbled calumnies. Without a concierge, you get nothing that stings, wounds, lacerates, torments, obsesses, and adds without fail to the world's stock of hatred, illuminating it with thousands of undeniable details. What made this lack all the more deplorable was that Lola, surprised in her native environment, inspired me with a new sort of disgust. I longed to pour out my revulsion at the vulgarity of her success, at her trivial, loathsome pride, but how could I? In that same moment, by the workings of an instant contagion, the memory of Mousine became equally hostile and repugnant to me. An intense hatred for those two women arose in me. It's still with me. It has become part and parcel of my being. I'd have needed a whole panoply of evidence to rid myself on time and for good of all present and future indulgence for Lola. We can't live our lives over again. Courage doesn't consist in forgiveness. We always forgive too much. And it does no good. That's a known fact. Why was the housemaid put in the last row after all other human beings? Not for nothing, we can be sure of that. One night while they're asleep, all happy people, believe me, ought to be put to sleep for real. That'll be the end of them and their happiness once and for all. The next day they'll all be forgotten and we'll be free to be as unhappy as we please, along with the housemaid. But what's all this, I'm telling you? Lola was pacing the floor without many clothes on, and in spite of everything her body still struck me as very desirable. Where there's a luxurious body, there's always a possibility of rape, of a direct, violent, breaking and entering into the heart of wealth and luxury, with no fear of having to return the loot. Maybe she was just waiting for me to make a move, and then she'd have shown me the door. Anyway, I was careful, mostly because I was so abominably hungry. Eat first. Besides... She was going on and on about the vulgar trivia of her daily life. The world would certainly have to be shut down for at least two or three generations if there were no more lies to tell. People would have practically nothing to say to one another. She finally got around to asking me what I thought of her America. I owned that I'd become so weakened, so terror-stricken, that almost everyone and almost everything frightened me, and that her country, as such, terrified me more than all the direct, occult, and unforeseeable menaces I found in it 
chiefly because of the enormous indifference toward me, which, to my way of thinking, was its very essence. I had my living to make, I told her, so I'd soon have to cure myself of my excessive sensibility. In that respect, I admitted, I was very backward, and I assured her that I'd be exceedingly grateful if she could recommend me to some possible employer among her acquaintances. But please, as soon as possible, I'd be quite satisfied with a modest salary. And considerably more of this insipid hogwash. She took my modest, but nevertheless indiscreet, suggestion pretty badly. Her replies were discouraging from the start. She couldn't think of anyone at all who might give me a job or help me. Naturally, that drove us back to talking about life in general, and hers in particular. We were still sizing each other up morally and physically when the bell rang. And then, with practically no pause or interval, Four women swept into the room, painted, corpulent, middle-aged, muscular, bejeweled, and very free and easy. Lola introduced us very summarily. She was visibly embarrassed and tried to drag them away somewhere, but, thwarting all her efforts, they competed for my attention, telling me everything they knew about Europe. Europe was an old-fashioned garden full of old-fashioned, erotic, grasping lunatics, they knew all there was to know about the Chabonnet and the Envelide. Personally, I hadn't been to either of those places, the first being too expensive, the second too out of the way. In replying, I was overcome by a blast of automatic patriotism that made me even sillier than usual on such occasions. I told them their city gave me the creeps, an unsuccessful carnival, a nauseating flop, though the people in charge were knocking themselves out to put it over. While perorating thus artificially and conventionally, I couldn't help realizing that there were other reasons than malaria for my physical prostration and moral depression. There was also the change in habits. Once again, I was having to get used to new faces in new surroundings and to learn new ways of talking and lying. Laziness is almost as compelling as life. The new farce you're having to play crushes you with its banality, and all in all it takes more cowardice than courage to start all over again. That's what exile, a foreign country, is, inexorable perception of existence as it really is, during those long, lucid hours, exceptional in the flux of human time, when the ways of the old country abandon you, but the new ways haven't sufficiently stupefied you as yet. At such moments, everything adds to your loathsome distress, forcing you in your weakened state to see things, people, and the future as they are, that is, as skeletons, as nothings, which you nevertheless have to love, cherish, and defend as if they existed. A different country, different people, carrying on rather strangely, the loss of a few little vanities, of a certain pride that has lost its justification— the lie it's based on, its familiar echo, no more is needed. Your head swims, doubt takes hold of you, the infinite opens up just for you, a ridiculously small infinite, and you fall into it. Travel is the search for this nothing, this bit of intoxication for numbskulls. Lola's four visitors had a good laugh listening to my wild confessions my little Jean-Jacques act. They called me all sorts of names that I hardly understood because of their American mispronunciation and oily, indecent way of speaking. Loudmouthed cats. When the Negro servant came in with tea, we all fell silent. One of the visitors must have had more discernment than the others, for she announced in a loud voice that I was shaking with fever and must be frightfully thirsty. In spite of my shakes, I loved the food that was served. Those sandwiches, I can say without exaggeration, saved my life. The conversation turned to the relative merits of the Paris brothels, but I didn't bother to join in. The ladies dabbled in various complicated drinks, and then, flushed, warmed, and communicative, started talking about marriages. 
Busy as I was with the food, I couldn't help realizing in one corner of my mind that these were marriages of a very special kind, matings, I was pretty sure, between juveniles, and that the ladies collected a commission on them. Lola saw that this talk caught my attention and aroused my curiosity. She gave me a pretty mean look. She had stopped drinking. The American men Lola knew weren't like me. They never showed curiosity. Under her watchful eye, I controlled myself with some difficulty. I'd have liked to ask those ladies a hundred questions. Finally, the guests left us, moving heavily, enlivened by drink, sexually stimulated. Bouncing and wriggling, they held forth with a curiously elegant and cynical eroticism. I sensed an Elizabethan something deep down, and I'd have liked to feel its undoubtedly choice and concentrated vibrations at the end of my organ. But, much to my regret and increased sadness, I got no more than a presentiment of that biological communion, that vital message so essential for a traveler. Incurable melancholy. As soon as they had left, Lola made no secret of her exasperation. That intermezzo had really annoyed her. I didn't say a word. Those hags! she cried a few minutes later. How did you get to know them? I asked her. I've always known them. No inclination to tell me more at the moment. Judging by their rather arrogant manner toward her, I had the impression that in a certain society these women must have enjoyed greater prestige than Lola, a considerable authority, in fact. I never found out any more about it. Lola said something about going downtown, but told me I could stay and wait for her and have some more to eat if I was still hungry. Seeing that I'd left the laugh Calvin without paying my bill and had no intention of going back, for good reason, I was delighted with her suggestion. A few more moments of warmth before going out and facing the street, and oh, my aching back, what a street! As soon as I was alone, I made for the hallway leading to the place the Negro servant had emerged from. We met halfway to the pantry, and I shook hands with him. He trusted me right off and led me to the kitchen, a fine, well-arranged place, much more logical and attractive than the living room. Right away he started spitting on the beautiful tile floor, as only black men know how to spit, abundantly and consummately. As a matter of politeness, I, too, spat as best I could. That did it. He took me into his confidence. Lola, he informed me, had a yacht on the river, two cars in the garage, a cellar stocked with liquor from all over the world. The Paris department stores sent her their catalogs. That was the story. And he proceeded to repeat the same meager information over and over again. I stopped listening. I dozed beside him, and the past came back to me, the days when Lola had left me in wartime Paris. The chase that sly, glib-lying minx had led me. Mousine, the Argentines, their ships full of meat. Topo, the bedraggled cohorts on the Place Clichy. Robinson, the waves, the sea, poverty. Lola's gleaming white kitchen her negro servant, and me sitting there as if I were somebody else. Everything would go on. The war had burned some and warmed others, same as fire tortures you or comforts you, depending on whether you're in it or in front of it. You've got to work the angles, that's all. It was true what she'd said about my having changed. I couldn't deny it. Life twists you and squashes your face. It had squashed her face, too, but less so. It's no joke being poor. Poverty is a giant. It uses your face like a mop to clear away the world's garbage. There's plenty left. Still, it seemed to me that I'd noticed something new in Lola. Moments of depression, of melancholy. Gaps in her optimistic stupidity. The moments when a person has to stop and gather the strength to carry his life his years a little further, 
because they've become too heavy for the vitality he has left, his lousy little bit of poetry. Suddenly the negro began to jiggle and hop. Something had come over him. I was his new friend, and he was determined to stuff me full of cakes and load me with cigars. Finally, with infinite precautions, he removed a round leaden object from a drawer. The bomb! he cried furiously. I retreated. Liberta! Liberia! he shouted exultantly. He put it back where it belonged and spat again, superbly. What emotion! What jubilation! His laughter, that gut sensation, infected me. Why not? A little thing like that, I said to myself, doesn't mean a thing. When Lola finally got back from her errands, she found us in the living room, plunged in smoke and laughter. She pretended not to notice. The negro quickly made himself scarce. She took me to her room. I found her sad, pale, and trembling. Where could she have been? It was getting late, the time of day when Americans are at a loss because the pulse of life around them has gone into slow motion. Every second car is back in the garage. It's the time for half-confidences. But to benefit by it, you've got to hurry. To put me in the mood, she questioned me. But the tone she took when asking certain questions about the life I'd been leading in Europe stuck in my craw. She made it quite clear that she thought me capable of every kind of beastliness. That hypothesis didn't make me angry, it only embarrassed me. She had a good idea that I'd come to ask her for money, and that in itself created a natural animosity between us. Such feelings verge on murder. We stuck to commonplaces, and I did my level best to avoid an out-and-out -out quarrel. She asked, among other things, about my sexual escapades, wanting to know if, somewhere in the course of my bummings around, I hadn't abandoned a child she could adopt. A bug that had got into her. She was obsessed with the idea of adopting a child. She thought rather naively that a tramp like me must have sired clandestine families all over the world. She was rich, she confided, and not having a child to devote herself to was more than she could bear. She had read every available book on child care, especially the ones that go into a lyrical swoon about motherhood, those books that cure you, if you really assimilate them, of all desire to copulate forever and ever. Every virtue has its contemptible literature. Since she wanted to sacrifice herself exclusively for a little creature, I was out of luck. All I had to offer her was a big creature, and one who struck her as too disgusting for words. Poverty doesn't draw unless it's properly presented, swathed in imagination. Our conversation languished. Look, Ferdinand she finally suggested. We've had enough talk. I'm going to take you across town to see my little protege. I enjoy looking after him, but his mother drives me crazy. It was a strange time to be visiting. In the car on the way, we talked about her catastrophic negro. Did he show you his bombs? she asked. I owned that he had put me through that ordeal. He's a maniac, Ferdinand, but not dangerous. He fills his bombs with my old bills. Years ago in Chicago he had his day. He belonged to a dangerous secret society for black emancipation. Horrible people, to judge by what he's told me. The police broke up the gang, but he still has a weakness for bombs. He never puts explosives in them. The spirit of the thing is enough for him. He's really an artist. He'll be a revolutionary as long as he lives. But I keep him. He's an excellent servant. And, all things considered, he's probably more honest than the ones who aren't revolutionaries. And she came back to her adoption mania. It's really too bad you haven't a little girl somewhere. A dreamy nature like yours is no good at all for a man, but it would be fine for a woman. The rain poured down, closing the night around our car as it glided over the long band of smooth concrete. Everything was hostile and cold to me, even her hand, which I was holding tight in mine all the same. 
everything came between us. We pulled up in front of a house that looked very different from the one we had just left. In an apartment on the second floor, a little boy of about ten was waiting for us with his mother. The furniture had pretensions to Louis XV, and the cooking smells of a recent meal were still in the air. The child jumped up on Lola's lap and kissed her affectionately. The mother also seemed very fond of Lola. While Lola was talking to the child, I managed to take the mother into the next room. When we came back, the boy was performing for Lola's benefit a dance step he had just learned at the conservatory. He'll need a few more private lessons, Lola observed. Then I may introduce him to my friend Vera at the Globe Theater. I wouldn't be surprised if the child had quite a future ahead of him. After these kind, encouraging words, the mother thanked her tearfully and profusely. At the same time, she accepted a small wad of green dollars, which she tucked away in her bosom like a love letter. "'I'd be rather pleased with that little boy,' said Lola once we were outside. "'But I have to put up with the mother at the same time, and I don't care for mothers who are too sharp for their own good. Besides, the kid is too depraved. That's not the sort of attachment I want. What I long for is a purely maternal feeling.' Do you understand me, Ferdinand? When it comes to making a living, I can put up with anything. It's not a matter of intelligence. I just know I have to adapt. She couldn't stop talking about her desire for purity. A few streets further on, she asked me where I was planning to sleep that night and took a few more steps beside me. I said that if I didn't get hold of a few dollars, I wouldn't be sleeping anywhere. All right she said. Come home with me. I'll give you a little change, and then you can go where you please. She was determined to put me out into the night as soon as possible. The usual thing. Always getting shoved out into the night like this, I said to myself. I'm bound to end up somewhere. That's some consolation. Chin up, Ferdinand, I kept saying to myself, to keep up my courage. What with being chucked out of everywhere, you're sure to find whatever it is that scares all those bastards so. It must be at the end of the night, and that's why they're so dead set against going to the end of the night. After that, it was very cold between us in her car. The streets we passed threatened us with all the armored silence of their infinitely towering stone with a kind of suspended deluge. A city lurking in ambush, an unpredictable monster, viscous with asphalt and rain. At last we slowed down. Lola went in ahead of me. Come up, she said. Follow me. Her living room again. I wondered how much she'd part with to get this business over with and be rid of me. She took some banknotes out of a small handbag she had left on the table. I heard an enormous rustling of crumpled bills. Great moments. In the whole city there was no other sound. But I was so embarrassed that I asked her, I don't know why, and it was most out of place, for news of her mother, whom I had forgotten. My mother is ill, she said, turning around and looking me full in the face. Where is she now? In Chicago. What's wrong with her? Cancer of the liver. I've put her in the hands of the finest specialists in town. They're costing me a fortune, but they'll save her, they promised. More and more details of her mother's condition in Chicago poured out of her. Her feeling for her mother made for familiarity, and in spite of herself she appealed to me for comfort. I had her where I wanted her. And you, Ferdinand? You believe they'll cure her, don't you? No, I said briskly and firmly. Cancer of the liver is absolutely incurable. At that she went deathly pale. The bitch! That was the first time I'd ever seen anything disconcert her. But Ferdinand, the specialists assured me she'd recover. They guaranteed it. They gave it to me in writing. They're great doctors, Ferdinand. For cash, Lola, there will always be great doctors, luckily. I'd do the same for you myself if I were in their place, and so would you, Lola. 
suddenly what I was saying struck her as so incontrovertible, so obvious that she couldn't even put up a fight. For once, maybe for the first time in her life, she lost her nerve. But Ferdinand, don't you realize how terribly you're hurting me? I love my mother. Didn't you know that I love her? Glad to hear it. Good grief. Who the hell cares whether she loves her mother or not? Lola was sobbing in her emptiness. Ferdinand, you're a worthless monster, she shouted in a rage. You're wicked, wicked. Saying awful things like that is just your cowardly way of avenging yourself for the rotten situation you're in. And I just know you're doing my mother a lot of harm by talking that way. In her despair, I sniffed vestiges of the Kue method. Her fury didn't frighten me as much as that of the officers on the Admiral Bragaton, who'd wanted to annihilate me to give the bored ladies a kick. I watched Lola closely as she was calling me every name in the book, and it gave me a certain feeling of pride to observe that, by contrast, the more she insulted me, the more my indifference, no, my joy, increased. We're nice people deep down. Now, I figured, she'll have to give me at least twenty dollars to get rid of me, maybe even more. I took the offensive. Lola, lend me the money you promised or I'll sleep here, and you'll hear me repeat all I know about cancer, its complications, its hereditary character, because you know, Lola, cancer is hereditary, and don't forget it. As I developed and refined on the details of her mother's case, I saw Lola blanch, weaken, crumple before my eyes. Oh, the bitch, I said to myself. Keep a good hold on her. For once you've got the good end. Don't let her off the line. You won't find such a good one in a hurry. She was beside herself. Here, she screamed. Take it. Take your hundred dollars and get out and never come back. Here, never. Out, 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 you beast. Won't you kiss me all the same, Lola? Come on, we're still friends, aren't we? I suggested, to see how far I could go in disgusting her. At that point she took a revolver out of a drawer, and she wasn't joking. The stairs were good enough for me. I didn't even ring for the elevator. That good, solid fight restored my taste for work, and picked up my morale. The next day I took the train to Detroit, where, I'd been assured, it was easy to get hired and there were lots of little jobs that were well paid and didn't take too much out of you. The passers-by spoke to me the way the sergeant had spoken to me in the forest. You can't go wrong, they said. Just follow your nose. And, true enough, I saw some big squat buildings, all of glass, enormous dollhouses, inside which you could see men moving, but hardly moving, as if they were struggling against something impossible. Was that Ford's? And then all around me, and above me, as far as the sky, the heavy, composite, muffled roar of torrents of machines, hard, wheels obstinately turning, grinding, groaning, always on the point of breaking down, but never breaking down. So this is the place, I said to myself. It's not very promising. Actually, it was worse than everywhere else. I went closer, up to a door where it was written on a slate that men were wanted. I wasn't the only one waiting. One of the men, cooling their heels, told me he had been there on the same spot for two days. The poor sucker had come all the way from Yugoslavia for this job. Another deadbeat spoke to me. He said he'd decided to work just for the fun of it. A nut. A phony. Hardly anybody in that crowd spoke English. They eyed each other distrustfully like animals who had often been beaten. They gave off a smell of urinous crotches, like in the hospital. When they spoke to you, you kept away from their mouths, because in there poor people smell of death. Rain was falling on our little crowd. The files of men stood compressed under the eaves. People looking for work are very compressible. What he liked at Ford's, an old Russian in a confiding frame of mind told me, was that they didn't care who or what they hired. But what's your step? he added for my instruction. Don't get uppity. 
because if you get uppity, they'll throw you out in two seconds, and in two seconds you'll be replaced by one of those mechanical machines that he always keeps on hand, and it's no soap if you try to get back. That Russian spoke good Parisian, because he'd been a taxi driver for years, but then he'd been fired because of some cocaine business in Bezon, and in the end he'd staked his cab in a game of Zanzi with a fare and lost it. It was true what he told me, that they took on anybody at all at Ford's. He hadn't lied. I had my suspicions, though, because down-and-outers like that tend to be off their rockers. There's a degree of destitution when the mind doesn't always stay with the body. It's too uncomfortable. What's talking to you is practically a disembodied soul, and a soul isn't responsible for what it says. Naturally, they stripped us stark naked for a starter. The examination was given in a kind of laboratory. We filed slowly past. You're in terrible shape, said the medical assistant the moment he laid eyes on me but it doesn't matter. And me, with my worry about being turned down because of my African fevers, in case they chanced to palpate my liver. Not at all. They seemed delighted at the cripples and weaklings in our batch. For the kind of work you'll be doing here, the doctor assured me, your health is of no importance. Glad to hear it, I said. But you know, doctor, I'm an educated man. I even studied medicine at one time. At that, he gave me a dirty look. I saw that I'd put my foot in it again, to my detriment. Your studies won't do you a bit of good around here, son. You're not here to think, you're here to make the movements you're told to do. We don't need imaginative types in our factory. What we need is chimpanzees. Let me give you a piece of advice. Never mention your intelligence again. We'll think for you, my boy. A word to the wise. Lucky for me that he warned me. It was just as well that I should know the manners and customs of the house. I'd already made enough stupid blunders to last me at least ten years. From then on, I was determined to pass for a quiet little drudge. When we had our clothes back on, we were sent off in slow-moving files, hesitant groups, in the direction where the stupendous roar of machinery came from. Everything trembled in the enormous building, and we ourselves, from our ears to the soles of our feet, were gathered into this trembling, which came from the windows, the floor, and all the clanking metal, tremors that shook the whole building from top to bottom. We ourselves became machines. Our flesh trembled in the furious din, it gripped us around our heads and in our bowels and rose up to the eyes in quick, continuous jolts. The further we went, the more of our companions we lost. In leaving them, we gave them bright little smiles, as if all this were just lovely. It was no longer possible to speak to them or hear them. Each time, three or four of them stopped at a machine. Still, you resist. It's hard to despise your own substance. You'd like to stop all this, give yourself time to think about it, and listen without difficulty to your heartbeat. But it's too late for that. This thing can never stop. This enormous steel box is on a collision course. We inside it are whirling madly with the machines and the earth, all together, along with the thousands of little wheels and the hammers that never strike at the same time, that make noises which shatter one another, some so violent that they release a kind of silence around them, which makes you feel a little better. The slow-moving little car full of hardware has trouble passing between the machine tools. Gangway! The workers jump aside to let the hysterical thing through, and the clanking fool goes on between the belts and flywheels, bringing the men their ration of servitude. It's sickening to watch the workers bent over their machines, intent on giving them all possible pleasure, calibrating bolts and more bolts, instead of putting an end once and for all to this stench of oil, this vapor that burns your throat and attacks your eardrums from inside. It's not shame that makes them bow their heads. You give in to noise as you give in to war. 
At the machines, you let yourself go with the two, three ideas that are wobbling about at the top of your head, and that's the end. From then on, everything you look at, everything you touch, is hard, and everything you still manage to remember, more or less, becomes as rigid as iron and loses its savor in your thoughts. All of a sudden, you've become disgustingly old. All outside life must be done away with, made into steel, into something useful. We didn't love it enough the way it was, that's why. So it has to be made into an object, into something solid. The regulations say so. I tried to shout something into the foreman's ear. He grunted like a pig in answer and made motions to show me, very patiently, the simple operation I was to perform forever and ever. My minutes, my hours, like those of the others, all my time, would go into passing linchpins to the blind man next to me, who had been calibrating these same linchpins for years. I did the work very badly from the start. Nobody reprimanded me, but after three days of that first job I was transferred, already a failure, to pushing the little trolley full of washers that went jolting along from machine to machine. At one machine I left three, at another a dozen, at still another only five. Nobody spoke to me. Existence was reduced to a kind of hesitation between stupor and frenzy. Nothing mattered but the ear-splitting continuity of the machines that commanded all men. At six o'clock, when everything stops, you carry the noise away in your head. I had enough noise to last me all night, not to mention the smell of oil, as if I'd been given a new nose and a new brain for all time. By dint of renunciation, I became, little by little, a different man, a new Ferdinand. It took several weeks, but then the desire to see people came back to me. Naturally, not the factory hands. They were mere echoes and smells of machines like myself, lumps of flesh convulsed with vibrations. I wanted to touch a real body, a pink body made of soft, quiet life. I didn't know a soul in that city, least of all any women. Finally, after a good deal of trouble, I obtained the vague address of a house, a clandestine brothel at the north end of town. On several evenings in a row, after work, I strolled around the neighborhood on reconnaissance. The street was like any other, though maybe a little cleaner than the one where I lived. I located the house in question. It had a garden around it. To get in, you had to move quickly so the cop on duty nearby wouldn't notice. That was the first place in America where I was received without brutality, amiably, in fact, for my five dollars. And what beautiful young women, well-rounded, bursting with health and graceful strength, almost as beautiful, come to think of it, as the ones at the Laugh Calvin. And these, at last, you could come right out and touch. I couldn't help myself. I got to be a regular customer. It used up all my pay. When night came, I needed the erotic promiscuity of those splendid, welcoming creatures to restore my soul. The movies were no longer enough. That mild antidote was powerless to fight the physical horror of the factory. To survive, I needed lecherous tonics, drastic elixirs. In that house, I didn't have to pay much. They gave me friendly terms because I brought the girls a few little refinements from France. Except on Saturday night. Then there was no time for refinements. Business boomed, and I had to make way for baseball teams on a spree. Magnificently vigorous young bruisers to whom happiness came as easily as breath. While the baseball teams were at it, I, likewise in high spirits, would sit alone in the kitchen, writing my short stories. I'm sure those athletes' enthusiasm for the ladies of the establishment didn't measure up to my own slightly impotent fervor. Confident in their own strength, those baseball players were blasé about physical perfection. Beauty is like drink or comfort. Once you get used to it, you stop paying attention. They visited the brothel mostly to make whoopee. 
Often they'd end up having terrible fights. The police would burst in and take them all away in little trucks. Toward Molly, one of the lovely girls there, I soon developed an uncommon feeling of trust, which in frightened people takes the place of love. I remember her kindness as if it were yesterday, and her long, blonde, magnificently strong, lithe legs, noble legs. Say what you like, the mark of true aristocracy in humankind is the legs. We became intimate in body and mind, and took walks around town for a few hours every week. She was comfortably off, since she took in about a hundred dollars a day in the cat house, while I made barely ten at Ford's. The lovemaking she did for a living didn't tire her in the least. Americans do it like birds. In the evening, when I'd finished pushing my little delivery wagon around, I'd meet her after dinner and force myself to put on a cheerful face. You've got to be cheerful with women, in the beginning at least. A vague desire came over me to suggest things we could do, but I hadn't the strength. She understood the industrial blues. She was used to factory workers. One evening, just like that, apropos of nothing, she presented me with fifty dollars. First I looked at her. I didn't dare. I thought about my mother and what she'd have said. And then it came to me that my mother, poor thing, had never given me that much. To please Molly, I went right out with her dollars and bought a lovely tan four-piece suit, which was what they were wearing that spring. They had never seen me arrive at the cat house looking so natty. The madam played her big phonograph just to teach me how to dance. Later, Molly and I went to the movies to break in my new suit. She asked me on the way if I was jealous, because the suit made me look sad and so did not wanting to go back to the factory. A new suit always throws you off. She gave my suit passionate little kisses when nobody was looking. I tried to think of something else. What a woman my Molly was! What generosity! What a body! What fullness of youth, a feast of desires. And then I was worried again. Was this pimping? To make matters worse, Molly pleaded, Don't go back to Ford's. Get yourself a little job in an office. As a translator, for instance. That's the thing for you. You like books. Her advice was kindly given. She wanted me to be happy. For the first time, somebody was taking an interest in me, looking at me from the inside, so to speak, taking my egoism into account, putting herself in my place, not just judging me from her point of view like everyone else. If only I had met Molly sooner, when it was still possible to choose one road rather than another, before that bitch Muzine and that little turd Lola crimped my enthusiasm. But it was too late to start being young again. I didn't believe in it any more. We grow old so quickly, and, what's more, irremediably. You can tell by the way you start loving your misery in spite of yourself. Nature is stronger than we are, no two ways about it. She tries us in one particular mold, and we're never able to throw it off. I had started out as the restless type. Little by little, without realizing it, you begin to take your role in fate seriously, and before you know it, it's too late to change. You're a hundred percent restless, and it's set that way for good. Very lovingly, Molly tried to keep me with her, to dissuade me. Life can be just as pleasant here as in Europe, Ferdinand. We won't be unhappy together. And in a sense, she was right. We'll invest our savings. We'll buy a little business. We'll be like other people. She said that to quiet my scruples. Plans for the future. I agreed with her. I was even rather ashamed of all the trouble she was taking to hold me. I was very fond of her, but I was even fonder of my vice, my mania for running away from everywhere in search of God knows what, driven, I suppose, by stupid pride, 
by a sense of some sort of superiority. I was afraid of hurting her. She understood and anticipated my concern. She was so nice that I finally told her about the mania that drove me to clear out of wherever I happened to be. She listened to me for days and days while I held forth, laying myself disgustingly bare, fighting with phantasms and points of pride, and she never lost patience. Far from it. She only tried to help me get over my foolish and futile anxiety. She didn't quite get the point of my ravings, but she always took my part against my phantoms or with them, whichever I preferred. She was so gentle and persuasive that I grew accustomed to her kindness and took it almost personally. But I felt that I was beginning to cheat on my so-called destiny, my raison d'etre, as I called it, and stopped telling her everything that passed through my mind. I crawled back into myself all alone, just delighted to observe that I was even more miserable than before, because I had brought a new kind of distress and something that resembled true feeling into my solitude. All that is commonplace. But Molly was gifted with angelic patience and had an unshakable belief in vocations. For instance, her younger sister at the University of Arizona had been smitten with a craze for photographing birds in their nests and wild animals in their dens. So, to enable her to study that astonishing specialty, Molly regularly sent this photographer sister of hers fifty dollars a month. A really unbounded heart, containing something sublime, convertible into cash and not phony like mine and so many others. Molly would have liked nothing better than to take a financial interest in my dotty career, though at times I struck her as pretty well off the beam. She thought my convictions real and not to be discouraged. She offered me an allowance and only asked me to draw up a little budget. I couldn't make up my mind to accept. A last vestige of delicacy prevented me from banking any further, from speculating on her really too noble and kindly nature. And that's how I deliberately got myself in bad with Providence. I was so ashamed of myself that I even made a feeble attempt to go back to Ford's. Nothing came of my heroic little gesture. I got as far as the factory gate, but at that liminal point I froze. The thought of all those machines whirring as they lay in wait for me demolished my feeble work impulse once and for all. I stationed myself outside the glass front of the main power plant, that multi-form giant which roars as it pumps something or other God knows where and brings it back again through a thousand gleaming pipes as intricate and menacing as Liana's. One morning, as I stood there in drooling contemplation, my Russian taxi driver came by. "'Hey, you old rascal,' he says to me. "'You've been fired. It's been three weeks since you showed up. They've already put a machine in your place. I warned you.' At least, I said to myself, that finishes it. No need to come back. And I beat it back to town. On the way home, I dropped in at the consulate to ask if by any chance they'd had news of a Frenchman by the name of Robinson. Oh, yes, said the consuls. Yes, indeed. He's been in here to see us twice, with false papers, what's more. Actually, he's wanted by the police. Do you know him? I let it go at that. After that, I expected to meet Robinson any minute. I felt it in my bones. Molly was as kind and affectionate as ever. Once she felt sure I was planning to go away for good, she was even nicer than before. There was no point in being nice to me. Often on Molly's free afternoons, we took trips to the outskirts. Bare little hills clumps of birches around tiny little lakes, people here and there reading dingy magazines under a sky heavy with leaden clouds. Molly and I avoided elaborate confessions. She knew the score. She was too sincere to say much about her grief. She knew what went on inside, in her heart, and that was enough for her. We kissed. But I didn't kiss her properly, as I should have, on my knees, if the truth be known. 
I was always partly thinking about something else at the same time, about not wasting time and tenderness, as if I wanted to keep them for something magnificent, something sublime for later, but not for Molly and not for this particular kiss, as if life would carry away from me everything I longed to know about it, about life in the thick of the night, and hide it from me while I was expending my passion in kissing Molly, and then I wouldn't have enough left. I'd have lost everything for want of strength, and life, life, the true mistress of all real men, would have tricked me as it tricks everyone else. We went back to the crowds, and then I'd leave her outside her house, because the customers would keep her busy all night until early morning. While she was taking care of them, I can't deny I was sad, and my sadness spoke to me so plainly of her that I felt she was with me even more than when she really was. I went to the movies to kill time. After the show, I'd board a streetcar going this way or that and tour around in the night. After two o'clock, flocks of timid passengers would get on, a type you seldom see before or after that hour, always pale and sleepy, in docile groups, bound for the suburbs. With them, you could go a long way, much further than the factories, to vague housing developments, little streets of shapeless bungalows. On pavements sticky with the small rain of dawn, the daylight glistened blue. My streetcar companions vanished along with their shadows. They closed their eyes on the day. It was hard to make those specters talk. Too tired. They didn't complain, not at all. They were the men who cleaned stores and more stores during the night and all the offices in the city after closing time. They didn't seem as anxious as we day people, maybe because they'd sunk to the very bottom of things. One of those nights, when I'd taken still another streetcar and we got to the last stop and everybody was quietly getting off, I thought I heard someone calling me by name. Ferdinand! Hey, Ferdinand! Naturally, it sounded outrageous in that dim light. I didn't like it. Above the rooftops, the sky was coming back in cold little patches, cut out by the eaves. Sure enough, someone was calling me. I turned around and instantly recognized Léon. He came over to me, speaking in a whisper, and we filled each other in. He'd been cleaning an office like the rest of them. That was as much of a gimmick as he'd managed to find. He walked heavily with a certain true majesty, as if he had been doing dangerous and, in a way, sacred things in the city. Actually, I'd noticed that all those night cleaners had that look. In fatigue and solitude, men emanate the divine. His eyes were also full of it when, in the bluish half-light where we were standing, he opened them wider than eyes usually open. He, too, had cleaned endless rows of toilets, and made whole mountains of silent offices sparkle. Ferdinand, he said, I recognized you right away, by the way you got into the car, by the sad look on your face when you saw there were no women on board. Am I right? Isn't that your style? He was right. It was my style. Unquestionably, my soul was as obscene as an open fly. So his observation was apt and nothing to be surprised at. What I hadn't expected was that he, too, was a failure in America. That came as a surprise. I told him about the galley at Santa Peta, but he didn't know what I was talking about. You're delirious, he said simply. He'd come over on a freighter. He'd have tried for a job at Ford's, but his papers were just too phony. He wouldn't have dared show them. They're barely good enough to keep in my pocket, he said. For cleaning offices, they didn't much care who you were. They didn't pay much either, but they looked the other way. This night work was a kind of foreign legion. What about you? he asked me then. What are you doing? You still cracked? Still chasing rainbows? Still got the travel bug? I want to go back to France, I said. I've seen enough, you're right. 
Best thing you can do, he said. For us, the jig is up. We've aged without noticing it, I know. I'd like to go home, too, but there's still this trouble with my papers. I'll wait a while and try to get hold of some good ones. I can't complain about the work I'm doing. There's worse. But I'm not learning English. Some of the guys have been at it for thirty years, and all they've learned is exit, because it's written on the doors they polish. And lavatory. You get the drift? I got the drift. If Molly should ever fail me, I'd have to go into night work myself. No reason why that should ever stop. The fact is that when you're at war, you say peace will be better. You bite into that hope as if it were a chocolate bar. But it's only shit, after all. You don't dare say so at first for fear of making people mad. You try to be nice. When you're good and sick of wallowing in muck, you speak up. Then everybody thinks you were raised in a barn. And there you have it. I met Robinson two or three times after that. He wasn't looking at all well. A French deserter who made bootleg liquor for the gangsters of Detroit let him occupy a corner of his shop. The business tempted Robinson. I'd make a little rot gut for those bastards to pour down their throats, he confided. But you know, I've lost my nerve. The first going over a cop gave me, I know I'd fold up. I've been through too much. Besides, I'm sleepy all the time. Not to mention the dust in those offices. My lungs are full of it. See what I mean? It wears you down. We arranged to meet another night. I went back to Molly and told her the whole story. She tried not to show how bad I was making her feel, but it wasn't hard to see she was miserable. I kissed her more often now, but her unhappiness was deep, more real than in other people, because most of us tend to talk as if things were worse than they are. American women are different. We're afraid to understand, to admit it. It's rather humiliating, but this is real unhappiness, not pride, not jealousy. There are no scenes. It's genuine heartbreak. We may as well admit that we haven't got it in us, and that when it comes to the pleasure of being really unhappy, we're bone dry. We're ashamed of not being richer in heart and everything else, and also of having judged humanity worse than it really is. Now and then Molly would let go and say something mildly reproachful, but it was always said gently and kindly. "'You're sweet, Ferdinand,' she'd say. "'I know you try hard not to be as beastly as other people, but sometimes I wonder if you really know what you want. Think it over. You'll have to find a way of earning your living when you get back there, Ferdinand. You won't be able to roam around all night dreaming the way you do here.' the way you enjoy so much, while I'm working. Have you thought of that, Ferdinand? In a way, she was dead right. But I couldn't help being the way I was. I was afraid of hurting her. She was so easy to hurt. Believe me, Molly, I love you. I always will, as best I can, in my own way. My own way didn't amount to much. And yet Molly had a perfect body. She was very tempting. But I had that lousy weakness for phantoms. Maybe I wasn't entirely to blame. Life forces you to spend too much of your time with phantoms. You're very affectionate, Ferdinand, she reassured me. Don't worry about me. You've got this sickness, always wanting to know more and more. That's all. Anyway, you have to live your own life, out there all alone. You'll go further traveling alone. Will you be leaving soon? Yes. I'll finish medical school in France, and then I'll come back. I had the gall to assure her. No, Ferdinand, you won't be back. And I won't be here either. She was nobody's fool. It came time for me to go. One evening, shortly before she'd have to start working, we went to the station. 
I'd said goodbye to Robinson during the day. He wasn't happy either to see me go. I was always leaving people. On the station platform, while we were waiting for the train, some men passed. They pretended not to know her, but they exchanged whispers. You're already far away, Ferdinand. You're doing exactly what you want, aren't you? That's the main thing. It's the only thing that counts. The train pulled in. I wasn't so sure of my plans once I saw the engine. I kissed Molly with all the spirit I had left. I was sad for once, really sad, for everybody, for myself, for her, for everybody. Maybe that's what we look for all our lives, the worst possible grief to make us truly ourselves before we die. Years have passed since I left her, years and more years. I wrote many times to Detroit at all the other addresses I remembered where I thought she might be known. I never received an answer. The house is closed now. That's all I've been able to find out. Good, admirable Molly, if ever she reads these lines in some place I never heard of, I want her to know that my feelings for her haven't changed, that I still love her and always will in my own way, that she can come here any time she pleases and share my bread and furtive destiny. If she's no longer beautiful, hell, that's all right, too. We'll manage. I've kept so much of her beauty in me, so living and so warm, that I've plenty for both of us to last at least twenty years, the rest of our lives. To leave her I certainly had to be mad, and in a cold, disgusting way. Still, I've kept my soul in one place up to now, and if death were to come and take me tomorrow, I'm sure I wouldn't be quite as cold as ugly, as heavy as other men. And it's thanks to the kindness and the dream that Molly gave me during my few months in America. Getting back from the other world isn't the half of it. You pick up the sticky, precarious thread of your days just as you left it dangling. It's waiting for you. For weeks and months I hung around the Place Clichy, where I'd started from, and in Vinerans. The Batignol, for instance, doing odd jobs. Ghastly. Under the rain or in the heat of the cars when June came, that burns your throat and nose almost like at Ford's. For entertainment, I'd watch them pass, people and more people, on their way to the theater or the bois in the evening. Always more or less alone in my free time, I'd mull over books and newspapers and all the things I'd seen. I resumed my studies, all the while working for a living, and finally managed to pass my examinations. Science, take it from me, is closely guarded. The Faculty of Medicine is a well-locked cupboard, plenty of jars and very little jam. But after braving five or six years of academic tribulations, I got my degree, a very high-sounding piece of paper. Then I put up my shingle in the suburbs my sort of place, at La Garenne-Rancy, right after the Porte Brancion, on your way out of Paris. I had no great opinion of myself and no ambition. All I wanted was a chance to breathe and to eat a little better. I put my nameplate over the door and waited. The neighborhood people came and dyed my nameplate suspiciously. They even went to the police station to ask if I was a real doctor. Yes, they were told. He's filed his diploma. He's a doctor, all right. The news spread all over Rancy that a real doctor had set up shop in addition to all the others. He'll never make a living, my concierge predicted. There are too many doctors around here already. She was perfectly right. In the suburbs, it's mostly by streetcar that life turns up in the morning. Starting at dawn, whole strings of them would come clanking down the boulevard Minotaur, carrying loads of dazed citizens to work. The young ones actually seemed happy about it. They'd cheer the traffic on and cling to the running boards, laughing for all they were worth, the darlings. 
It's hard to believe. But when you've known the telephone booth on the corner cafe for twenty years, so filthy you always mistake it for the crapper, you lose all desire to joke about serious things, and about Rancy in particular. Then you realize where they've put you. These houses are your prison, pissy within, flat facades. Their heart belongs to the landlord. You never see him. He wouldn't dare show his face. The bastard sends his agent. Yet the neighborhood people say he's affable enough when you meet him. It doesn't cost him a thing. The sky in Rancy is the same as in Detroit, a smoky soup that bathes the plain all the way to Levallois. Cast-off buildings bogged down in black muck. From a distance the chimneys, big ones and little ones, look like the fat steaks that rise out of the muck by the seaside. And inside, it's us. You need the courage of a crab at Rancy, especially when you're not as young as you used to be, and you know you'll never get away. There, at the end of the streetcar line, a grimy bridge spans the Seine, that enormous sewer which displays everything that's in it. Along the banks, on Sunday and at night, men climb up on the piles of garbage to take a leak. Flowing water makes men meditative. They urinate with a sense of eternity like sailors. Women never meditate, sen or no sen. In the morning the streetcar carries away its crowds to get themselves compressed in the metro. Seeing them all fleeing in that direction, you'd think there must have been some catastrophe at Argentuil, that the town was on fire. Every day in the gray of dawn it comes over them. Whole clusters cling to the doors and handrails. One enormous rout. Yet all they're going to Paris for is a boss, the man who saves you from starvation. The cowards. They're scared to death of losing him, though he makes them sweat for their pittance. For ten years you stink of it, for twenty years and more. It's no bargain. Plenty of bitching and beefing in the streetcar just to get into practice. The women gripe even worse than the kids. If they caught somebody without a ticket, they'd stop the whole line. It's true that some of those women are already stinko, especially the ones headed for the market at Saint-Ouen, the semi-bourgeoises. How much are the carrots? they ask long before they get there to show they've got money to spend. Compressed like garbage in this tin box, they cross Rancy, stinking good and proper, especially in the summer. Passing the fortifications, they threaten one another. They let out one last shout, and then they scatter. The metro swallows them up. Limp suits, discouraged dresses, silk stockings, sour stomachs, dirty feet, dirty socks. Wear ever collars as stiff as boundary posts, pending abortions, war heroes, all scramble down the coal tar and carbolic acid stairs into the black pit, holding their return ticket, which all by itself costs as much as two breakfast rolls. The nagging dread of being fired without ceremony, something accompanied by a tight-lipped reference that can happen to a tardy worker any time the boss decides to cut down on expenses. Never dormant recollections of the slump, of the last time they were unemployed, of all the newspapers they had to buy for the want ads, five sous apiece the waiting in line at employment offices. Such memories can strangle a man, however well protected he may seem in his all-weather coat. The city does a good job of hiding its crowds of dirty feet in those long electric sewers. They won't rise to the surface again until Sunday. You'd better stay indoors when they emerge. Just one Sunday watching their attempts to amuse themselves will permanently spoil your taste for pleasure. Around the metro entrance, near the bastions, you catch the endemic, stagnant smell of long-drawn-out wars, of spoiled, half-burned villages, aborted revolutions, and bankrupt businesses. For years the rag-pickers of the fortified zone have been burning the same damp little piles of rubbish in ditches sheltered from the wind. Half-assed barbarians, undone by red wine and fatigue. 
They take their ruined lungs to the local dispensary instead of pushing the streetcars off the embankment and emptying their bladders in the toll house. No blood left in their veins. When the next war comes, they'll get rich again selling rat skins, cocaine, and corrugated iron masks. For my practice, I had found a small apartment at the edge of the zone, from which I had a good view of the embankment and the workman who's always standing up top, looking at nothing, with his arm in a big white bandage, the victim of a work accident, who doesn't know what to do or what to think and hasn't enough money to buy himself a drink and fill his mind. Molly had been right. I was beginning to understand her. Study changes a man, puts pride into him. You need it to get to the bottom of life. Without it, you just skim the surface. You think you're in the know, but trifles throw you off. You dream too much. You content yourself with words instead of going deeper. That's not what you wanted. Intentions, appearances, no more. A man of character can't content himself with that. Medicine, even if I wasn't very gifted, had brought me a good deal closer to people, to animals, everything. Now all I had to do was plunge straight into the heart of things. Death is chasing you. You've got to hurry. And while you're looking, you've got to eat and keep away from wars. That's a lot of things to do. It's no picnic. In the meantime, I wasn't getting many patients. It takes time to get started, people said, to comfort me. At the moment, the patient was mostly me. Nothing, it seemed to me, can be gloomier than La Garenrancy when you've got no patience. No doubt about it. You shouldn't think in a place like that. And I'd come from the other end of the earth, what's more, precisely to think at my ease. Wasn't I in luck? Stuck-up simpleton. Black and heavy it came over me. No joke, and it stayed with me. There's no tyrant like a brain. Below me lived Bézin, the little junk dealer. Whenever I stopped outside his door, he said to me, You got to choose, doctor. Play the races or drink. It's one or the other. You can't have everything. I prefer my aperitif. I don't care for gambling. His favorite aperitif was Jancian Cassis. Not a bad-natured man, ordinarily, but unpleasant after a few drinks. When he went to the flea market to stock up, he'd stay away for three days. His expedition, he called it. They'd bring him back. And then he'd prophesy, I can see what the future will be like. An endless sex orgy, with movies in between. You can see how it is already. On those occasions, he could see even further. I also see that people will stop drinking. I'll be the last drinker in the future. I've got to hurry. I know my weakness. Everybody coughed in my street. It keeps you busy. To see the sun, you have to climb up to Sacre Coeur, at least, because of the smoke. From up there, you get a beautiful view. Then you realize that way down at the bottom of the plain, it's us and the houses we live in. But if you try to pick out any particular place... Everything you see is so ugly, so uniformly ugly, that you can't find it. Still further down, it's always the Seine, winding from bridge to bridge like an elongated blob of phlegm. When you live in Rancy, you don't even realize how sad you've become. You simply stop feeling like doing anything much. What with scrimping and going without this and that, you stop wanting anything. For months I borrowed money right and left. The people were so poor and so suspicious in my neighborhood that they couldn't make up their minds to send for me before dark, though I was the cheapest doctor imaginable. I spent nights and nights crossing little moonless courtyards in quest of ten or fifteen francs. In the morning there was such a beating of carpets, the whole street sounded like one big drum. One morning I met Bébert on the sidewalk. His aunt, the concierge, was out shopping, and he was holding down the lodge for her. He was raising a cloud from the sidewalk with a broom. 
Anybody who didn't raise dust at seven o'clock in the morning in those parts would get himself known all up and down the street as an out-and-out pig. Carpet-beating was a sign of cleanliness, good housekeeping. Nothing more was needed. Your breath could stink all it liked, no matter. Bebert swallowed all the dust he raised in addition to what was sent down from the upper floors. Still, a few spots of sunlight reached the street, but, like inside a church, pale, muffled, mystic. Bebert had seen me coming. I was the neighborhood doctor who lived near the bus stop. Bebert had the greenish look of an apple that would never get ripe. He was scratching himself, and watching him made me want to scratch, too. The fact is, I had fleas myself. I'd caught them from patients during the night. They like to jump up on your overcoat because it's the warmest and dampest place available. You learn that in medical school. Bebert abandoned his carpet to come and say good morning. From every window they watched us talking. If you've got to love something, you'll be taking less of a chance with children than with grown-ups. You'll at least have the excuse of hoping they won't turn out as crummy as the rest of us. How are you to know? I've never been able to forget the infinite little smile of pure affection that danced across his livid face. Enough gaiety to fill the universe. Few people past twenty preserve any of that affection, the affection of animals. The world isn't what we expected, so our looks change. They change plenty. We made a mistake and turned into a thorough stinker in next to no time. Past twenty it shows in our face. A mistake. Our face is just a mistake. Hey, doctor, Bebert sings out. Is it true that they picked up a guy on the Place de Fête last night? Throat cut open with a razor? You were on duty, weren't you? Is it true? No, Bebert, I wasn't on duty. It wasn't me. It was Dr. Frolichon. That's too bad, because my aunt said she wished you'd have been on duty and you'd have told her all about it. Maybe next time, Bebert. Do they often kill people around here? Bebert asked. I passed through the dust, but just then the municipal street sweeper wished past, and, whirling up from the gutters, a howling typhoon filled the whole street with new clouds, more dense and stinging than the others. We couldn't see each other any more. Bebert jumped up and down, sneezing and shouting for joy. His haggard face, his greasy hair, his emaciated monkey legs, the whole of him danced convulsively at the end of his broom. Bebert's aunt came home from shopping. She had already downed a glass or two. I have to add that she sniffed ether now and then, a habit contracted when she was working for a doctor and having such trouble with her wisdom teeth. The only teeth she had left were two in front, but she never failed to brush them. When you've worked for a doctor like I have, you don't forget your hygiene. She gave medical consultations in the neighborhood, and as far away as Bezon. I'd have been interested to know if Bebert's aunt ever thought of anything. No, she thought of nothing. She talked enormously without ever thinking. When we were alone with no one listening, she'd touch me for a free consultation. It was flattering in a way. Bebert, doctor, I have to tell you because you're a doctor. He's a little pig. He touches himself. I noticed it two months ago and I wonder who could have taught him such a filthy habit. I've always brought him up right. I tell him to stop, but he keeps right on. I gave her the classic advice. Tell him he'll go crazy. Bebert, who'd been listening, wasn't pleased. I don't touch myself. It's not true. It's the Gaga kid who suggested... See, said the aunt, I suspected as much. The Gagas, you know, the people on the fifth floor, they're all perverts. It seems the grandfather runs after female lion tamers. Really, I ask you, lion tamers. Look, doctor, while you're here, couldn't you prescribe a syrup to make him stop touching himself? 
I followed her to her lodge to write out an anti-vice prescription for Bebert. I was too easy with everybody. I knew that. Nobody paid me. I treated them all free of charge, mostly out of curiosity. That's a mistake. People avenge themselves for the favors done them. Bebert's aunt took advantage of my lofty disinterestedness. In fact, she imposed on me outrageously. I let things ride. I let them lie to me. I gave them what they wanted. My patients had me in their clutches. Every day they sniveled more. They had me at their mercy. And while they were at it, they showed me all the ugliness they kept hidden behind the doors of their souls and exhibited to no one but me. The fee for witnessing such horrors can never be high enough. They slither through your fingers like slimy snakes. I'll tell you the whole story some day if I live long enough. Listen, you scum. Let me do you favors for a few years more. Don't kill me yet. Looking so servile and defenseless. I'll tell the whole story. You'll fade away like the oozing caterpillars in Africa that came into my shack to shit. I'll make you into subtler cowards and skunks than you are and maybe it'll kill you in the end. Is it sweet? Bebert asked about the medicine. Don't make it sweet, whatever you do, said the aunt. For that little creep, he don't deserve to have it sweet. He steals enough sugar from me already. He has every vice. He'll stop at nothing. He'll end up murdering his mother. I haven't got a mother, said Bebert peremptorily. He had his wits about him. Damn you, cried the aunt. None of your back talk, or I'll give you the cat o' nine tails. Then and there she takes it off the hook, but he'd already beat it out into the street. Cocksucker! he shouted back at her from the corridor. The aunt went red in the face and came back to me. Silence. We changed the subject. Maybe, doctor, you ought to go and see the lady on the mezzanine at four rue des Mineurs. She used to be a notary's clerk. She's heard about you. I told her what a wonderful doctor you are, so nice to the patients. I know she's lying. Her favorite doctor is Frolichon. She always recommends him when she can and runs me down at every opportunity. As far as she's concerned, my humanitarianism has earned me an animal hatred. Because, don't forget, she's an animal except that this Frolichon she admires makes her pay cash, so she consults me on the run. If she recommends me, this must be a strictly non-paying patient, or there's something very shady somewhere. As I'm leaving, I remember Bebert. You ought to take him out, I said. The child doesn't get out enough. Where do you want us to go? I can't go very far on account of my lodge, Take him to the park, at least on Sunday. But there are even more people and more dust in the park than here. It's so crowded. There's some sense in what she says. I try to think of another place to suggest. Diffidently, I propose the cemetery. The cemetery of La Garenne Rancy is the only open space of any size in the neighborhood with a few trees in it. Say, that's a fact. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe we'll go. Bebert had just come in. How about it, Bebert? Would you like to go for a walk in the cemetery? I have to ask him, doctor, because I don't mind telling you he's as stubborn as a mule about taking a walk. Actually, Bebert has no opinion. But the idea appeals to his aunt, and that's enough. She has a weakness for cemeteries, like all Parisians. It looks as if she were about to start thinking. She examines the pros and cons. The fortifications are too low class. The park is definitely too dusty, while the cemetery, sure enough, isn't bad. The people who go there on Sunday are mostly respectable folk who know how to behave. And another thing that makes it really convenient is that on the way back you can shop on the Boulevard de la Liberté, where some of the stores keep open on Sunday. And she concluded, Bebert, take the doctor to see Madame Anne-Rouy on the Rue des Manures. 
You know where Madame Henri lives, don't you, Bébert? Bébert knew where everything was, if only it gave him a chance to roam around. Between the Rue Ventru and the Place Lénine, it's all apartment houses. The contractors have taken over practically all the fields that were left around here, at Les Garennes, as the area was called. There was just a tiny bit of country at the end, a few empty lots after the last gas lamp. Wedged in between apartment buildings, a few private houses are still holding out, four rooms with a big coal stove in the downstairs hallway. True, for reasons of thrift, the stove is seldom lit. The dampness makes it smoke. These remaining private houses belong to people who have retired on small incomes. The moment you go in, the smoke makes you cough. The people who've stayed in the neighborhood haven't got big incomes, especially these on the Ruiz I was being sent to. They had a little something, though. In addition to the smoke, as you stepped in, the Jean Ruiz house smelled of the toilet and stew. They'd just finished paying for the place. It represented the savings of at least fifty years. The first time you saw them, you noticed something was wrong and wondered what it was. Well... The unnatural side of the Jean Ruiz was that for fifty years they had never spent one sou without regretting it. They'd put their flesh and spirit into that house of theirs like a snail. But the snail doesn't know what he's doing. The Jean Ruiz had spent a lifetime acquiring a house, and once it was theirs, they couldn't get over it. Like people who've just been dug out of an earthquake, they were flabbergasted. Folks who've just been let out of a dungeon must get a funny look on their faces. The Unruis had thought about buying a house even before they were married, first separately, then together. For half a century they had refused to think about anything else, and when life had forced them to think about something else, the war, for instance, and especially their son, it made them very unhappy. When, as newlyweds, they had moved into their house, each with the savings of ten years, it wasn't quite finished, and it was still in the middle of the fields. To reach it in winter, they had to put on sabots. They'd leave them at the grocery store on the corner of the Rue de la Revolte in the morning when they set out for work in Paris, three kilometers distance, by horse cart, two sous a ticket. You need a sturdy constitution to get through a whole lifetime on such a schedule. There was a picture of them over the bed on the upper floor taken on their wedding day. Their bedroom furniture had all been paid for, ages ago, in fact. All the receipted bills that had accumulated in the last ten, twenty, forty years lie pinned together in the top bureau drawer, and the account book, fully up to date, is downstairs in the dining room where they never eat. Henri will show you all that if you ask him. On Saturdays he balances the account in the dining room. They've always eaten in the kitchen. I learned these things little by little from them and other people, and some from Bebert's aunt. When I knew them a little better, they themselves told me about the terror that had haunted them all their lives, the fear that their only son, who was in business, might find himself in difficulties. For thirty years that ugly thought had more or less kept them awake nearly every night. The boy had set himself up in the feather business. The ups and downs of feathers in the last thirty years are almost unimaginable. Perhaps there's no worse, no more unstable business in all the world than feathers. Some businesses are so shaky that no one would think of borrowing money to put them back on their feet. But there are others where the question of a loan keeps coming up almost constantly. When it occurred to them, even now that the house was paid for, that their son might approach them for a loan, the Henriis stood up from their chairs, looked at each other, and went red in the face. What would they do if that happened? They would refuse. Their minds had been made up from the first to turn down all requests for a loan, because of their principles, and so as to have a nest egg waiting for him, a legacy, a house, an inheritance. That was their way of thinking. 
There was no nonsense about their son, but in business it's so easy to go wrong. When they asked me for my opinion, it was the same as theirs. My own mother was in business. Her business had never brought us anything but misery, a little bread, and a lot of trouble. So naturally I was down on business. I had no difficulty in understanding the perils facing the boy, the risk involved in a loan he might be forced to envisage if hard-pressed. I needed no explanations. For fifty years old man Henri had been a petty clerk in a notary's office on the boulevard Sebastopol. He knew how fortunes can go to wreck and ruin, and told me some hair-raising stories about it, beginning with his own father, whose bankruptcy had prevented Henri from studying to be a teacher on leaving school and obliged him to go right into clerking. You remember things like that. Well, now that their house was bought and paid for and they didn't owe a single sou, they had nothing to worry about on the security side. They were both sixty-five. Just then, Henri became aware of a strange ailment. Or rather, he'd felt it for a long time, but hadn't thought about it because there was still the house to be paid for. Once that was all settled and signed, he began to dwell on his strange trouble. Dizzy spells and a whistling as of steam in both ears. About that time he began buying the newspaper, because then they could afford it. And in the paper he saw an advertisement describing exactly what he felt in his ears. He bought the medicine it recommended, but it didn't do his ailment a bit of good. On the contrary, the whistling seemed to get worse, maybe just from thinking about it. They finally decided on a visit to the dispensary. It's high blood pressure, the doctor told them. Those words came as a shock, but his new obsession came at just the right time. He had worried about the house and his son's bills for so many years that they had left a kind of hole in the tissue of fears that had gripped him body and soul for forty years and raised him to the same pitch of anguished trepidation every time a bill came due. Now that the doctor had spoken of blood pressure, he listened to the pressure beating against his ears from deep inside. He'd get up out of his bed to feel his pulse and stand motionless beside his bed, feeling a faint quaver run through his body at every heartbeat. All this, he said to himself, was his death. He had always been afraid of life, and now he attached his fear to something different, to death, to his blood pressure, just as for forty years he had attached it to the peril of not being able to finish paying for the house. He had always been just as unhappy, but now he had quickly to find a good new reason for being unhappy. That's not as easy as it sounds. Just saying I'm unhappy won't do it. You've got to prove it, to make absolutely sure. That's all he wanted, to be able to state a good substantial motive for his fear. According to the doctor, his blood pressure was twenty-two. Twenty-two is something. The doctor had taught him to find the way to his own death. Their son in the feather business hardly ever came to see them. Once or twice around New Year's, no more. There wasn't much point in his coming any more. His mother and father had nothing left to lend, so he hardly ever turned up. It took me longer to get to know Madame Henri. She had no fears, not even the fear of her own death which she couldn't conceive of. She only complained of old age, but without really thinking about it, just to be like other people, and about the high cost of living. Their life's labor was behind them. The house was paid for. To speed up the final payments, she'd even taken to sewing buttons on waistcoats for one of the department stores. The amount of buttons you've got to sew on for five francs, you wouldn't believe it, she'd say. And delivering her work on the bus, she rode second class, and things were always happening. One afternoon a woman had bumped into her. Madame Henri had given her a piece of her mind. The woman was a foreigner, the first and only foreigner Madame Henri had ever spoken to. The walls of the house had kept good and dry in the old days when there was still air circulating around them. But now that there were tall apartment buildings next door— 
Everything oozed and trickled with humidity. Even the curtains had a musty smell. Once the house was really theirs, Madame Henri had been all smiles for a whole month, as blissful as a nun after communion. In fact, she was the one who had suggested, Look, Jules, suppose we buy a newspaper every day, now we can afford it. Just like that. She had thought of her husband. She had looked at him. But then she looked around her, and after a while she thought of his mother, her mother-in-law, Henri. At that, the daughter-in-law went suddenly serious again, the way she had been before they finished paying for the house. That thought brought them back to square one. It meant they would have to go on saving for the old woman, her husband's mother, whom the two of them never mentioned to each other or to anyone outside. She lived at the far end of the garden with an accumulation of old brooms, old chicken crates, and the shadows of buildings. Her home was a low shed, from which she seldom emerged. Just getting meals into her was a long, complicated business. She wouldn't admit anyone to her antrum, not even her son. She was afraid of being murdered, so she said. When the daughter-in-law thought of embarking on a new course of savings, she first said a few words to her husband to sound him out. Why, for instance, wouldn't they send the old woman to St. Vincent's convent, where the sisters took care of feeble-minded old women like her? The son said neither yes nor no. He was busy with something else at the moment, those sounds in his ears that never stopped. What with thinking about that abominable whistling and listening to it, he convinced himself that it would prevent him from sleeping. And true enough, instead of falling asleep, he'd listen to his whistling, drummings, and hummings, a new torture that kept him busy day and night. He had all those noises inside him. Little by little, though, his anxiety wore itself out, and there wasn't enough left to keep him busy all by itself. So then he and his wife started going back to the market at San Juan. Everyone said it was the cheapest for miles around. They'd leave home in the morning, and it took them all day, because of all the figures they added up and the discussions they'd have about the prices of things and the money they might have saved by buying one thing rather than another. Back home at about eleven that night, they'd be seized again by the fear of being murdered. That fear hit them regularly, especially the wife. He was more concerned with the sounds in his ears. He'd cling to them desperately at that hour when the street was perfectly still. "'I'll never be able to sleep,' he'd repeat to himself out loud to increase his terror. "'You can't imagine!' But she never tried to understand what he meant, or to imagine why this buzzing in his ears should trouble him so. "'You hear me when I speak, don't you?' she'd ask him. "'Yes,' he'd say. Well, then you're all right. And it would make more sense to start thinking about your mother, who's been costing us a fortune, what with prices going up every day, and the stink in that shack of hers. The cleaning woman came in for three hours a week to do the washing. She was the only visitor they had had for years. She also helped Madame Henri to make her bed. Every time they had turned the mattress in the last ten years, Madame Henri, wanting it to be repeated all over the neighborhood, had told the cleaning woman in the loudest voice she could manage, We never keep money in the house. Just as a precaution, to discourage thieves and prospective murderers. Before going up to their room together, they would close all the doors and windows with great care, each checking up on the other. Then they'd go out in the garden to make sure the mother-in-law's lamp was still burning a sign she was still alive. She consumed quantities of oil. She never put her lamp out. She, too, was afraid of murderers and afraid of her son and daughter-in-law. In all the twenty years she'd been living there, she had never opened her windows, summer or winter, and never let her lamp go out. Her son kept his mother's money, a small pension. He took care of it. They left her meals outside the door, they kept her money, not a bad arrangement. But she complained about the arrangement, and that wasn't all. She complained about everything. 
She'd shout through the door at anybody who approached her shack. The daughter-in-law would try to pacify her. It's not our fault if you're getting old. All old people get the same pains. Old yourself, you slattern, you scum. It's you that's killing me with your filthy lies. She denied her age ferociously. And through the door she battled irreconcilably against the evils of the whole world. She rejected the fatalities and compromises of the life outside as a base imposture. She refused all contact with such things. She wouldn't hear of them. It's all a pack of lies, she'd scream. You made it up. She defended herself bitterly against everything that happened outside her hovel and rejected all temptation to compromise or be reconciled. She was sure that if she opened the door, hostile forces would burst in, grab her, and finish her off once and for all. They're sly nowadays, she would scream. They have eyes all around their heads and mouths all the way down to their assholes, and then some, all to tell lies with. It's them all over. She had the gift of gab. She had picked it up as a girl, peddling bric-a-brac at the temple market with her mother. She harked back to the old days when the common people hadn't yet learned to listen to themselves growing old. If you won't give me my money, I'm going out to work, she'd shout at her daughter-in-law. Here, you slut! I'm going out to work! I want to work! But, Grandmother, you're not strong enough. Oh, I'm not strong enough. Try to get in here, and you'll see if I'm not strong enough. So, one more time, they left her barricaded in her shack. But they were dead set on my seeing the old woman. That's what I'd come for. It took some doing before she let us in. To tell the truth, I couldn't quite see what they wanted of me. It was the concierge, Baybear's aunt, who had told them what a nice doctor I was, so kind and considerate. They asked me if I couldn't give her some medicine to keep her quiet. But what they, especially the daughter-in-law, wanted even more was for me to get the old woman committed once and for all. After we'd knocked for a good half hour, she suddenly flung the door open, and there she was in front of me with her watery red-rimmed eyes. But there was a look in those eyes that danced merrily over her gray shrunken cheeks. It caught your attention and made you forget the rest. It gave you a feeling, in spite of yourself, of lightness and pleasure, a feeling of youth that you tried instinctively to hold on to. That bright look lit up everything in the darkness around her with a youthful joy a frail but pure delight that we no longer have at our command. Her voice, which cracked when she screamed, gave her words a cheery ring when she consented to talk like other people. It made her phrases and sentences hop, skip, and jump as brightly as you please, the way people were able to do with their voices and the things around them in the days when not being able to sing or tell a story properly was looked upon as stupid, shameful, and sick. Age had covered her like a sturdy old tree with smiling branches. Grandma Henri was merry, discontented and filthy, but merry. The destitution in which she had lived for more than twenty years had not marked her soul. Her dread, on the contrary, was the outside world, as though cold, horror, and death could come to her only from that direction and not from within. She evidently feared nothing from within. She seemed absolutely sure of her mind, as of something undeniable, acknowledged, and certified, once and for all. And to think that I'd been chasing mine halfway around the world. They called the old woman mad. That's easy to say. She hadn't set foot outside her den more than three times in the last twelve years, and that's all there was to it. She may have had her reasons. She was afraid of losing something. She wasn't going to tell them to people like us, people who were no longer inspired by life. Her daughter-in-law brought up her commitment project again. What do you say, doctor? Don't you think she's mad? We can't get her to go out any more. It would do her good to get out now and then. Oh, yes, grandmother, it would do you good. Don't say it wouldn't. It would do you good, I assure you. The old woman shook her head. 
She shut herself in, stubborn and savage, when that kind of pressure was put on her. She won't let us take care of her. She'd rather relieve herself in the corners. It's cold in her shack and there's no fire. We really can't let her go on like this. Don't you agree, doctor, that we can't? I pretended not to understand. Henri had stayed home beside the stove. He preferred not to know exactly what his wife and mother and I were cooking up. The old woman flew off the handle again. Give me back everything that's mine and I'll go away. I have money to live on, and that's the last you'll ever hear of me. Money to live on? But, Grandmother, you can't expect to live on your three thousand a year. The cost of living has gone up since the last time you went out. You tell her, Doctor, wouldn't it be better for her to go and live with the sisters like we told her? The sisters are good and kind. But the thought of the sisters gave her the creeps. The sisters, the sisters, she rebelled. I've never stayed with any sisters. Why not send me to live with the priest while you're at it? If I haven't got enough money, as you say, I'll go to work. Work, Grandmother, where? Oh, doctor, would you listen to her? Work at her age? She'll soon be eighty. It's madness, doctor. Who'd want her? Why, you're insane, Grandmother. Insane? Nobody. Nowhere. Aren't you somewhere? You lump of shit, you? Listen to her, doctor. She's raving and insulting me. How can you expect us to keep her here? The old woman turned to confront me, the new peril. How does he know if I'm crazy or not? Is he inside my head? Is he inside yours? He'd have to be to know. Beat it, both of you. Get out of my home. The way you keep at me, you're meaner than six months of winter. Go and examine my son instead of standing there jabbering in the henbane. He needs a doctor a sight more than I do. Not a tooth left in his head, and they were perfect when I was taking care of him. Go on, beat it, get out, the both of you. And she slammed the door in our faces. From behind her lamp, she watched us retreating across the yard. When we'd reached the other side, when we were far enough away, she started snickering again. She'd given a good account of herself. When we got back from that disagreeable incursion, Henri was still standing by the stove with his back to us. His wife went on pestering me with questions, all aimed in the same direction. She had a dark, sly little face. Her elbows hugged her body when she spoke. She never gestured. She was determined that this medical consultation shouldn't be wasted. She wanted it to serve some purpose. The cost of living was going up all the time. Her mother-in-law's pension wasn't enough any more. They were getting old themselves, after all. They couldn't go on forever, living in fear that the old woman would die without proper care, that she'd set the house on fire, in her fleas and filth, instead of going to a perfectly good institution where she'd be taken care of. Since I put on an air of agreeing with them, they were both as affable as could be. They promised to sing my praises in the neighborhood, if only I'd help them take pity on them, rid them of the old woman, who was miserable herself, living in the conditions she brought on herself with her obstinacy. We could even rent her a little house, suggested the husband, who had suddenly woken up. He'd put his foot in it, saying that in front of me. His wife stepped on his foot under the table. He didn't understand why. While they were wrangling, I thought about the thousand francs I could pocket just by making out a certificate of commitment. They seemed to want it badly. Bebert's aunt had probably told them all about me and assured them that I was the down at heelist doctor in all Rene, and would do anything they asked. They'd never have expected Frolichon to do a thing like that. He was virtuous. I was deep in these reflections when the old woman burst into the room where we were plotting. She must have suspected something. What a spectacle! She had bunched her ragged skirts over her belly, and there she was, all tucked up, screaming at us and me in particular. She'd come in from the far end of the garden for that express purpose. Blaggard! she yelled at me point-blank. You can go home. Didn't I tell you to beat it? You won't gain anything by hanging around. I'm not going to the nuthouse, nor to the sisters either. 
do your damnedest, lie your head off. You won't get me, you bought and paid for pimp. They'll go before I do, the thieves robbing an old woman, and you too, you rotter. You'll end up in jail. I'm telling you, and it won't be long. I was certainly out of luck. For once, I'd had a chance of making a thousand francs at one stroke. I took to my heels. When I was out in the street, she leaned over the little peristyle to shout after me in the darkness. Scoundrel! Scoundrel! she shrieked. And the echo came back. The rain was coming down. I ran from lamppost to lamppost as far as the urinal on the Place de Fête, the first available shelter. In that idicola at hip height I found Bébert. He, too, had gone there for shelter. He had seen me running out of the Enrouy house. So that's where you've been, he said. Now you'll have to go up and see the people on the fifth floor of our house. It's their daughter. The girl he was referring to, I knew her well. Wide hips, beautiful thighs, long and silky. There was something tender yet willful about her and in her movements the precise grace that you often find in women who are sexually fit. She had consulted me several times about her pains in the abdomen. At twenty-five, after her third abortion, she was having complications. Her family called it anemia. You should have seen her, so solidly built and with a taste for coitus unusual in females, discreet in her ways, modest in dress and speech, not the least bit hysterical, but well-endowed, well-fed, well-balanced, a champion in her line, an athlete of pleasure. No harm in that. She only went with married men, and only with connoisseurs, men capable of recognizing and appreciating nature's triumphs, who won't settle for some vicious little slut. No, her soft skin, her sweet smile, her way of walking, and the nobly mobile fullness of her hips earned her the heartfelt, well-merited enthusiasm of certain office managers who knew their stuff. Unfortunately, these office managers couldn't divorce their wives on her account. On the contrary, she helped them to stay happily married. So, every time she found herself three months gone, it never failed. She went to the midwife. When you're a hot number and you haven't got a sucker handy, life is no bed of roses. Her mother opened the door by a crack, as cautiously as if she'd been expecting a murderer. She spoke in whispers, but they were so loud, so intense, she might just as well have been cursing. Oh, doctor, what have I done to deserve such a daughter? Oh, doctor, you won't breathe a word to anyone in the neighborhood, will you? I trust you. She went on and on, airing her fears and spluttering about what the neighbors might think. She was having an attack of knuckle-headed anxiety. Those attacks last a long time. She gave me time to get used to the dim light in the hallway, the smell of leeks in the soup, the wallpaper with its idiotic leaves and flowers, and her strangled voice. Finally, amid bumblings and exclamations, we reached her daughter's bedside. She lay prostrate, her mind wandering. I'd have liked to examine her, but she was losing so much blood. There was such a gooey mess I couldn't see anything in her vagina. Blood clots. A glug-glug between her legs, like in the decapitated colonel's neck in the war. All I could do was put back the big wad of cotton and pull up the blanket. The mother was looking at nothing and listening to nothing but herself. It'll kill me, doctor. I'll die of shame. I made no attempt to dissuade her. I didn't know what to do. We could see the father pacing back and forth in the little dining room next door. Apparently he hadn't finished composing his attitude for the occasion. Maybe he was waiting for things to come to a head before selecting a posture. He was in a kind of limbo. People live from one play to the next. In between, before the curtain goes up, they don't quite know what the plot will be or what part will be right for them. They stand there at a loss, waiting to see what will happen, 
their instincts folded up like an umbrella, squirming, incoherent, reduced to themselves, that is, to nothing. Cows without a train. But the mother had the leading part as intermediary between her daughter and me. The stage could cave in. She didn't give a damn. She was happy and convinced of her goodness and beauty. I couldn't count on anyone but myself to break this sickening spell. I risked suggesting that the girl should be sent straight to the hospital for an emergency operation. A big mistake. I'd given her her cue for her finest speech, the one she'd been waiting for. Oh, God, the disgrace! The hospital! Oh, doctor, the disgrace of it! All we needed! The last straw! There was nothing I could say. I sat down and listened to the mother thrashing about more tumultuously than ever, entangled in her tragic absurdities. Too much humiliation, too much misery culminate in total inertia. The world is too much for you to bear. You give up. While she invoked and provoked heaven and hell, thundering disaster, I looked down in defeat and, looking, saw a small puddle of blood forming under the girl's bed, from which a thin trickle oozed slowly along the wall toward the door. A drop fell regularly from the bed springs. Drip, drip. The towels between her legs were soaked red. I managed to ask, very timidly, whether the whole placenta had been ejected. The girl's hands, pale and bluish at the tips, hung down on either side of the bed. It was the mother again who answered my question with a flood of disgusting jeremiads. I should have reacted, but I hadn't the strength. I myself had been so obsessed by my bad luck for so long. I was sleeping so badly that I was just drifting. I didn't care whether one thing happened rather than another. My only thought was that if I had to listen to this screeching mother, I was better off sitting than standing. It doesn't take much to please you once you're thoroughly resigned. And anyway, where would I have found the fortitude to interrupt this wild woman who didn't know how she was going to save the family's honor? What a part! And how she ranted! After every abortion, I knew from experience, she let loose in the same way, trying, it goes without saying, to outdo herself each time. How long it went on, she alone could decide. Today she seemed determined to decuple the effect. She, it occurred to me, must have been beautiful herself, as luscious as you please in her day, but more verbose, I'm pretty sure, more wasteful of energy, more demonstrative than her daughter, whose concentrated intimacy had been one of nature's truly admirable achievements. Those things haven't been studied as closely as they deserve. The mother sensed her daughter's animal superiority and instinctively condemned it out of hand. The unforgettable depth of her fucking, her way of coming like a continent. In any case, she was delighted with the theatrical aspect of the disaster. Her mournful tremolos monopolized the attention of our little group, as, thanks to her, we floundered in chorus. There was no hope of getting her out of there. I ought to have tried, though, to do something. It was my duty, as they say. But I was too comfortable sitting, and too uncomfortable standing. Their place was a bit more cheerful than the Anruis, just as ugly but more comfortable, cozy, not sinister like the Anruis, just plain ugly. Dazed with fatigue, I glanced around the room. Little things without value that had always been in the family, especially the mantelpiece cover with its little pink velvet bells that you can't buy any more, and the porcelain Neapolitan, and the sewing table with the beveled mirror, a present no doubt from an aunt in the provinces who had had two of them. I said nothing to the mother about the puddle of blood I saw forming under the bed, or the drops that kept falling punctually. She'd have screeched even louder and wouldn't have listened to me any more. She was never going to stop complaining and venting her indignation. She was dedicated. 
just as well to keep still and look out of the window as the gray velvet of evening took hold of the avenue house by house. First the smallest, then the others. In the end, the big ones are taken, too. And the people moving about in between, more and more faint, vague and blurred, hesitating as they pass from sidewalk to sidewalk before vanishing into the darkness. Further away, far beyond the fortifications, strings and rows of lights scattered through the night like tacks to hang forgetfulness over the city, and other little lights, red and green, boats and more boats, a whole flotilla come from all directions, tremulously waiting for the great gates of night to open behind the tower. If that mother had taken a moment to breathe, or better still, if there had been a long moment of silence, I might have dropped everything and tried to forget that it was necessary to live. But she kept at me. Couldn't I give her an enema, doctor? What do you think? I didn't say yes or no, but once again, since she gave me a chance to speak, I advised immediate removal to the hospital. The only response was more yelping, sharper, more resolute, more strident than ever. There was nothing to be done. I made slowly and quietly for the door. The shadows now lay between us and the bed. I could scarcely see the girl's hands resting on the sheet, because the two pallors were so much alike. I went back and felt her pulse, which was weaker, more furtive than before. Her breath came in gasps. I could still hear her blood dripping on the floor like a watch ticking more and more slowly, more and more faintly. I couldn't do a thing. The mother went ahead of me to the door. Especially, doctor, she said in a paroxysm of terror. Promise you won't say a word to anyone, she implored me. Give me your word. I promised anything she wanted. I held out my hand. She gave me twenty francs. She closed the door behind me, little by little. Downstairs, Bebert's aunt was waiting for me with her most solemn expression. Is it bad? she inquired. I realized that she'd been waiting for half an hour to collect her usual commission of two francs, to make sure I wouldn't get away. And how about the Henri's? Everything all right? she asked. She was hoping to collect a tip for them, too. They didn't pay me, I replied. Which was true. Her prepared smile turned to a pout. She suspected me. It's really too bad, doctor, if you can't get people to pay you. How can you expect people to respect you? Nowadays, people pay right away or not at all. That, too, was true. I beat it. I had put my beans on to cook before leaving. Now was the time, at nightfall, to go and buy my milk. During the day, people smiled to see me with my bottle. Naturally. No maid. Winter dragged on, stretching out over months and months. We were always deep in rain and mist. They were at the bottom of everything. There were plenty of patients, but not many who were willing and able to pay. Medicine is a thankless profession. When you get paid by the rich, you feel like a flunky, by the poor like a thief. How can you take a fee from people who can't afford to eat or go to the movies, especially when they're at their last gasp? It's not easy. You let it ride. You get soft-hearted. And your ship goes down. When the quarterly rent came due in January, I first sold my sideboard. I told the neighborhood people I needed the space because I was planning to give physical culture classes in my dining room. I wonder if anyone believed me. In February, to pay my taxes, I sold my bicycle and the phonograph Molly had given me as a going-away present. It played No More Worries. The tune is still running through my head. It's all I've got left. As for the records, Bezin had them in his shop for a long time, and then in the end he sold them. 
To make myself sound even richer, I told people I was going to buy a car as soon as the warm weather set in, and in preparation I wanted to take in a little cash. I suppose I just didn't have the gall to practice medicine seriously. When I was being escorted to the door after giving the family plenty of advice and handing them my prescription, I'd start talking about everything under the sun just to postpone the moment of payment a little longer. I was no good at playing the prostitute. Most of my patients were so wretchedly poor and foul-smelling, so disagreeable, too, that I always wondered where they would ever find the twenty francs owing to me, and whether they mightn't murder me to get them back. And yet I needed those twenty francs badly. Shameful. I still blush to think of it. Fees! as my colleagues persisted in saying. It didn't stick in their craw, as if the words made it perfectly natural and there were no need to explain. Shameful, I couldn't help thinking. You can't get around it. Everything could be explained, I know that. But that doesn't change the fact that the man who takes five francs from the poor and the wicked will be a louse to his dying day. Ever since then, in fact? I've been sure of being as slimy a customer as anyone else. It's not that I've committed orgies and follies with their ten francs. Certainly not. The landlord took most of it, but that's no excuse either. I wish it were, but it isn't. The landlord is shittier than shit, but that's another story. What with eating my heart out and navigating in the icy showers of the season— I was beginning to look tubercular myself. Naturally. That's what happens when you have to forego practically every pleasure. Now and then I'd buy a few eggs, but my diet consisted mainly of beans and lentils. They take a long time to cook. I'd spend hours in the kitchen watching them boil after my visiting hours, and since I lived on the second floor I had a fine view of the back court. Back courts are the dungeons of row houses. I had plenty of time to look at my court, especially to hear it. That's where the shouts and yells of the twenty houses round about crash and rebound, even the cries of the concierge's little birds, rotting away as they pipe for the spring they will never see in their cages beside the privies, which are all clustered together out at the dark end with their ill-fitting banging doors. A hundred male and female drunks inhabit those bricks and feed the echoes with their boasting quarrels and muddled eruptive oaths, especially after lunch on Saturday. That's the intense moment in family life. Shouts of defiance as the drink pours down. Papa is brandishing a chair, a sight worth seeing, like an axe, and Mama a log like a saber. Heaven help the weak! It's the kid who suffers. Anyone unable to defend himself or fight back, children, dogs, and cats, is flattened against the wall. After the third glass of wine, the black kind, the worst, it's the dog's turn. Papa stamps on his paw. That'll teach him to be hungry at the same time as people. It's good for a laugh when he crawls under the bed, whimpering for all he's worth. That's the signal. Nothing arouses a drunken woman so much as an animal in pain, and bulls aren't always handy. The argument starts up again, vindictive, compulsive, delirious. The wife takes the lead, hurling shrill calls to battle at the male. Then comes the melee, the smash-up. The uproar descends on the court, the echo swirls through the half-darkness, the children yap with horror. They've found out what Mama and Papa have in them. Their yells drown out parental thunders. I spent whole days waiting for what sometimes happens after these family scenes to happen. It happened on the fourth floor, across from my window, in the house on the other side. I couldn't see a thing, but I heard it clearly. There's an end to everything. It's not always death. It's often something else, and possibly worse, especially when there are children. 
That's where those tenants lived, at the level where the shadow begins to pale. If the father and mother were alone on the days when this kind of thing happened, they'd first have a long argument, and then there'd be a long silence. The situation was building up. They had a bone to pick with the little girl. They called her. She knew. She started whimpering right away. She knew what she was in for. To judge by her voice, she must have been about ten. It took me quite a few times before I understood what the two of them did to her. First they tied her up. It took a long time, like getting ready for an operation. That gave them a kick. You little skunk, cried the father. The filthy slut, went the mother. We'll teach you, they'd shout together, and bawl here out for all sorts of things that they probably made up. I think they tied her to the bedposts. Meanwhile, the child was squeaking like a mouse in a trap. That won't help you, you little scum. You've got it coming. Oh, yes, you've got it coming. Then come a volley of oaths. You'd have thought she was cursing at a horse, all steamed up. Stop talking, Mama, said the little girl gently. Stop talking, Mama. Hit me, but stop talking. They gave her a terrible thrashing. I listened to the end to make sure I wasn't mistaken, that this was really happening. I couldn't have eaten my beans with that going on. I couldn't close the window either. I was no good for anything. I was helpless. I just stayed there listening, same as everywhere and always. Still, I believed I gained strength listening to such things. The strength to go further. A strange sort of strength. Next time I'd be able to go down even deeper and lower and listen to other plaints that I hadn't heard before or had had difficulty in understanding, because beyond the plaints we hear there always seem to be others that we haven't yet heard or understood. When they had beaten her so much she couldn't howl any more, A little sob continued to come out every time she breathed. And then I heard the man saying, All right, old girl, step lively. In here. As happy as a lark. He said that to the mother, and then the door into the next room would slam behind them. Once she said to him, I heard her, Oh, Julien, I love you so much, I could eat your shit even if you made turds this big. That was their way of making love, their concierge told me. They'd do it in the kitchen, leaning against the sink. They couldn't do it any other way. I learned those things about them little by little in the street. When I met them, the three of them together, there was nothing to attract notice. They'd be out for a walk like a normal family, and now and then I'd see the father outside his shop on the corner of the Boulevard Poincaré, where they sold shoes for sensitive feet. He was the head salesman. Most of the time our court had only unrelieved horrors to offer. Especially in the summer it thundered with threats and echoes and blows, with falling objects and people and unintelligible insults. The sun never reached the bottom. The walls seemed to be painted with dense blue shadows, especially in the corners. The concierges had their own little privies, clustered like so many beehives. At night, when they went out to pee, they'd bump into the garbage cans, which would boom like thunder. Washing, strung from window to window, would be trying to dry. After dinner, when there were no brutalities underway, what you heard was mostly arguments about the races. But those sporting polemics also ended badly, as often as not, with assorted swaths and wallops, and behind one of the windows, for one reason or another, someone was always knocked cold in the end. In the summer, everything smelled strong. There was no air left in the court, only smells. The prevailing smell by far is cauliflower. 
A cauliflower can beat ten toilets, even if they're overflowing. It's a known fact. The ones on the third floor were always overflowing. Madame Cezanne, the concierge at number eight, would come up with her rattan unplugger. I'd watch her working away, and in the end we got to talking. If I were you, she advised me, I'd take care of the pregnant women on the quiet. Some of the women in this neighborhood really live it up. You'd hardly believe it. They'd like nothing better than to use your services. Take it from me. It's better than treating cheap clerks for varicose veins. Besides, they pay cash. Madame Cezanne had an enormous aristocratic contempt, I don't know where she got it, for anybody who worked. The tenants here are never satisfied. You'd think they were in jail. They've got to make trouble for everybody. One day their toilets are plugged up, another day their gas leaks, or their letters are being opened, always making nuisances of themselves. Pests! The other day one of them spat in his rent envelope. Did you ever hear the like? Sometimes she'd have to give up trying to unplug a toilet. It was too hard. I don't know what they put in there, but at least they shouldn't let it dry. I know them. They'll always send for me too late. If you ask me, they do it on purpose. In the place where I used to work, it was so hard they had to melt the pipe. I can't imagine what those people eat. It's double strength. You'd have a hard time talking me out of the idea that Robinson wasn't mostly to blame for my trouble starting up again. At first I didn't pay much attention to my spells— I somehow kept dragging myself from one patient to the next, but I'd become even uneasier than before, more and more so, like in New York, and I was beginning to sleep even worse than usual. In short, meeting Robinson again had given me a shock, and I seemed to be falling sick again. With the misery painted all over his face, I felt he was bringing back a bad dream that I'd been unable to get rid of all those years. It was driving me nuts. All of a sudden he turned up. I'd never see the last of him. He must have been looking for me in the neighborhood. I certainly wasn't looking for him. He was bound to come back again and make me think about his rotten life. Actually, everything conspired to make me think of his repulsive substance. Even those people I saw out the window who didn't look like anything much, just walking in the street, chewing the fat in doorways, rubbing shoulders, made me think of him. I knew what they were after and what they were hiding behind their innocent look. To kill and get killed. That's what they wanted. Not all at once, of course, but little by little, like Robinson, with all the old sorrows they could summon up all the new miseries and still nameless hatreds, except when they do it without an out war, and then it's quicker. I didn't even dare go out for fear of meeting him. My patients would have to send for me two or three times in a row before I'd make up my mind to visit them. Usually they had called in someone else by the time I got there. My head was a shambles like life itself. I was called to 12 Rue Saint-Vincent, fourth floor, where I'd been only once before. Actually, they came to get me in a car. I recognized the grandfather right away. He wiped his feet elaborately on my doormat. A furtive type, gray and stooped. His grandson was sick and he wanted me to hurry. I remember his daughter, too. Another strapping wench, a little faded, but strong and silent, she always came home to her parents for her abortions. They never scolded her, but all the same they wished she'd finally get married, all the more so since she already had a little boy of two staying with the grandparents. For no reason at all, this child was always getting sick, and when he was sick, the grandfather, the grandmother, and the mother wept together. What made them weep all the more was that he had no legitimate father. It's at times like that that families are most afflicted by irregular situations. The grandparents were convinced, without quite admitting it to themselves, that illegitimate children are more delicate and prone to illness than others. 
The father, at any rate the putative father, had cleared out for good. They had talked marriage to him so much that he couldn't take it any more. He'd beat it so fast that if he was still running, he must have been far away by then. Nobody could understand why he had run out on her like that, least of all the girl herself, because he had really enjoyed fucking her. Now that the fickle lover had gone, all three of them contemplated the child and blubbered. She had given herself to that man body and soul, as they say. In her opinion, that explained everything. It was bound to happen. The baby had come out of her body and left her thighs all wrinkled. The mind is satisfied with phrases, but not the body. The body is more fastidious. It wants muscles. A body always tells the truth. That's why it's usually depressing and disgusting to look at. It's true that I've rarely known a single childbirth to demolish so much youth. All that mother had left, in a manner of speaking, was feelings and a soul. No one wanted her any more. Before that clandestine birth, the family had lived in the Fille du Calvaire quarter. They had lived there for years. If they exiled themselves to Rancy, it wasn't for the pleasure of it. It was to hide, to get themselves forgotten, to disappear. As soon as it became impossible to conceal the pregnancy from the neighbors, they decided to leave their Paris neighborhood to avoid all comments. A removal for honor's sake. In Rancy, they didn't need the respect of their neighbors. In the first place, no one knew them in Rancy, and the second place, the municipal government was known all over France for its abominable politics. Not to mince words, they were anarchists. Thugs. In that kind of community, public opinion is of no account. The family had punished themselves voluntarily, cutting themselves off from all their old relations and old friends. Their tragedy was complete. Nothing more to lose, so they said. Declassed. When you're determined to lose your name, you go among the common people. They found no fault with anyone. They merely tried to discover, by feeble little acts of rebellion, what destiny could have had in mind the day it had played them such a dirty trick. Living in Rancy gave the daughter only one consolation, but that was a big one. Now she could talk freely to all and sundry about her new responsibilities. In deserting her, her lover had awakened a passion for heroism and singularity that had laid dormant in her nature. As soon as she felt sure that she would never for the rest of her days lead the same sort of life as most women of her class and background, and that she would always be in a position to invoke the tragedy of a life ruined by her very first love, she adjusted with alacrity to the great disaster that had befallen her, and, all things considered, the ravages of fate became tragically welcome. She glorified in her unmarried mother act. In the dining room, as her father and I went in, the economy lighting stopped at half tints, and faces appeared only as pale spots, blobs of flesh mumbling words that hung suspended in a penumbra heavy with the smell of old pepper that all heirloom furniture exudes. The child, lying swaddled on his back in the middle of the table, let me palpate him. To begin with, I pressed the wall of his abdomen, ever so carefully and slowly, from the navel to the testicles, and then still very gravely, I auscultated him. His heartbeat was like a kitten's, sharp and nervous. Then the child had enough of my exploring fingers and began to yell, as children can do at that age, incredibly. That was too much. Since Robinson's return, I'd been feeling very funny in body and mind, and the little innocent screams made an abominable impression on me. What screams? Heavens above, what screams? I was at the end of my rope. Another idea must have helped to provoke my idiotic behavior. In my exasperation, I couldn't stop myself from blurting out all the rancor and disgust I had been holding in for too long. Hey! I said to that little bellower, 
Don't be in such a hurry, you little fool. You'll have plenty of time for bellowing. Never fear, you little idiot. There'll be time to spare. Save your strength. There'll be enough misery to melt your eyes and your head and everything else if you don't watch out. The grandmother gave a start. What are you saying, doctor? I repeated simply. There will be plenty. What? she asked in horror. Plenty of what? You have to understand, I said. You have to understand. You're always having things explained to you. That's the whole trouble. Try to understand. Make an effort. What will be left? What's he saying? They all three asked one another. The daughter, with the responsibilities, made a strange face and started emitting prodigiously long screams. Here was a marvelous occasion for a fit, and she wasn't going to miss it. She meant business. She kicked. She choked. She squinted horribly. I'd done it all right. You should have seen her. Mama, he's mad! She bellowed so hard she almost choked. The doctor's gone mad! Mama, take my baby away from him! She was saving her child. I shall never know why. She began in her agitation to take on a Basque accent. He's saying such awful things! Mama, he's insane! They snatched the baby out of my hands as if they were rescuing him from the flames. The grandfather, who had been so deferential only a short while ago, unhooked an enormous mahogany thermometer from the wall. It was as big as a club. And he pursued me at a distance to the door, which he slammed violently behind me with a big kick. Naturally, they took advantage of the incident not to pay for my call. When I found myself back on the street, I wasn't exactly pleased with what had happened. Not so much because of my reputation, which couldn't have been worse in the neighborhood than people had already made it with no help from me, as because of Robinson, from whom I had hoped to deliver myself with my outburst of frankness, to find the strength never to see him again by deliberately creating a scandal, by stirring up this hideous scene with myself. Here's what I figured. By my little experiment, I'd see how much of a stink it's possible to kick up at one throw. The trouble with scenes and tantrums is that you're never finished. You never know how far you'll be forced to go in your frankness. What people are still hiding from you, and what they'll show you some day, if you live long enough, if you go far enough into the heart of their cock-and-bull stories. The whole business would have to be started all over again. I, too, just then, was in a hurry to hide. I started for home by way of the Impasse Gibet. Then I took the Rue Valentin. It was quite a distance. Time to change my mind. I headed for the lights. On the Place Transitoire, I met Peridon, the lamplighter. We exchanged a few innocent remarks. On your way to the movies, doctor, he asked me. That gave me the idea. A good one, I thought. The bus gets you there quicker than the metro. After that shameful incident, I'd have been glad to leave Rancy for good if I'd been able to. When you stay too long in the same place, things and people go to pot on you. They rot and start stinking for your special benefit. In spite of everything, it was just as well that I went back to Rancy next day because of Bébert, who fell sick just then. My colleague, Frolichon, had just gone off on his vacation. Bébert's aunt hesitated. Then she asked me to take care of her nephew after all, probably because I charged less than any other doctor she knew. It was after Easter. The weather was looking up. The first south winds were passing over Rancy, the ones that blew all the soot from the factories down on our window panes. Bebert was sick for weeks and weeks. I went to see him twice a day. The neighborhood people would wait for me outside the lodge, pretending to be just passing by, and on the doorsteps of their houses. It gave them something to do. People would come a long way to find out if he was better or worse. The sunshine has too many things to pass through, 
It never gives the street anything better than an autumn light full of regrets and clouds. People gave me lots of advice in connection with Bebert. The fact is, the whole neighborhood took an interest in his case. Some thought well, others poorly of my intelligence. When I went into the lodge, a critical, rather hostile, and most of all crushingly stupid silence set in. The lodge was always full of the ants' cronies. It smelled strongly of petticoats and rabbit piss. Each had her own favorite doctor, who was cleverer and more learned than any other. I presented only one advantage, but one that's hard to forgive. I charged hardly anything. A free gratis doctor is bad for the reputation of a patient and his family, however poor they may be. Bebert wasn't delirious yet. He had just lost all desire to move. He was losing weight by the day. A bit of yellow, flabby flesh still clung to his bones and quivered from top to bottom every time his heart beat. He got so thin in over a month of illness that his heart seemed to be all over his body. He'd look at me with a lucid smile when I came to see him. Sweetly, he ran a temperature of a hundred two, then of a hundred three, and there he lay with a pensive look on his face for days and weeks. After a while, Bebert's aunt had shut up and stopped bothering us. She had said everything she knew. That took the wind out of her sails, so she'd go and blubber in one corner of her lodge after another. Grief had come to her when she ran out of words, and she didn't seem to know what to do with it. She'd try to wipe it off with her handkerchief, but it came back in her throat all mixed with tears, and she'd start all over again. She'd get it all over her and manage to be a little dirtier than usual. That would upset her, and she'd cry out, Oh, dear, oh, dear! That was all. She had cried so much she was exhausted. Her arms would fall to her sides, and she'd stand there in front of me, absolutely bewildered. But then, after all, she'd go back into her grief and give herself a jolt and start sobbing again. These comings and goings in her misery went on for weeks. I couldn't dispel the feeling that this illness would end badly. It was a kind of malignant typhoid that baffled all my efforts, baths, serum, dry diet, vaccines— Nothing helped. I did everything I could think of, all in vain. Bebert was going, being carried away irresistibly, smiling all the while. He was high up, balanced on top of his fever, and I was down below making a fool of myself. Naturally, a lot of people were advising the aunt— pressing her to fire me in no uncertain terms and call in another, more imposing and more experienced doctor in a hurry. The incident of the girl with the responsibilities had gone the rounds and been liberally commented on. The whole neighborhood was gargling with it. But since the other doctors, once informed of the nature of Bebert's illness, showed no eagerness to take the case— I was kept on in the end. As long as Bebert had fallen to my lot, my colleagues figured, I might as well see him through. All I could do was go to the bistro now and then and phone various doctors in the Paris hospitals with whom I was more or less acquainted and ask those sage, widely respected luminaries what they would do if faced with a case of typhoid like the one that was driving me mad. They all gave me excellent, ineffectual advice, but all the same it pleased me to hear them making an effort free of charge for the benefit of the unknown child I had taken under my wing. After a while you start taking pleasure in the merest trifles, the small consolations life deigns to give us. While I was busying myself with such subtleties, Bebert's aunt was collapsing on every chair and staircase in the house. She'd emerge from her days only to eat, but she never missed a meal. Her neighbors wouldn't have let her forget. They watched over her. They stuffed her between sobs. 
It'll keep your strength up, they declared. She even began to put on weight. Speaking of Brussels sprouts, the smell rose to orgiastic heights at the peak of Bebert's illness. It was the season. Everyone was making her presents of Brussels sprouts, ready cooked and steaming hot. It's true, she was glad to admit. They give me strength. And besides, they make me urinate. Before bedtime, because of the doorbell, so as to sleep lightly and hear the very first ring, she'd fill herself full of coffee. That way the tenants wouldn't wake Bebert by ringing two or three times. Passing by the house in the evening, I'd go in to see if maybe it was all over. She'd speculate out loud. Don't you think it may have been the rum and chamomile tea he drank at the fruit store the day of the bicycle race that made him sick? That idea had been plaguing her from the start. The stupid fool. Chamomile, Bebert murmured faintly, an echo submerged in his fever. Why well, try to tell her different? I'd go through the two or three professional motions she expected of me, and then I'd go and face the night, not at all pleased with myself, because, like my mother, I could never feel entirely innocent of any horrible thing that happened. About the seventeenth day, I decided that it might not be a bad idea to drop in at the Joseph Biodore Institute and ask them what they thought about a typhoid case of this kind. Maybe they'd give me a bit of advice or recommend some vaccine. That way, if Bebert were to die, I'd have done everything possible, tried everything, however out of the way, and then perhaps I wouldn't feel eternally guilty. At about eleven o'clock one morning I arrived at the Institute near La Viette at the other end of Paris. First they sent me wandering through laboratories and more laboratories, looking for a man of science. There wasn't a soul in those laboratories at that hour, neither laymen nor men of science, only various objects in wild disorder, the gutted bodies of small animals, cigarette butts, chipped gas jets, cases and jars with mice suffocating inside them, retorts, bladders, broken stools, books, dust, and more cigarette butts, which, mingled with the effluvia of the urinals, made up the prevailing smell. Since I was early, I thought, while I was at it, I'd go and visit the tomb of that great scientist, Joseph Biodore, which was right there in the basement of the Institute, in with the gold and marble. A bourgeoiseau Byzantine fantasy in the best of taste. The collection was taken on your way out of the crypt, and the guard was grumbling because someone had slipped him a Belgian coin. In the last half century, the shining example of this Biodore had led any number of young people to choose the scientific career. And the scientific career had produced as many failures as the conservatory. After a certain number of years of failure, scientists turn out to be pretty much alike. In the mass graves of the great debacle, a doctor of medicine is as good as a pre de Rome. The only difference is that they don't take the bus at exactly the same time of day. That's all. I had to wait quite a long while in the garden of the Institute, a combination of prison yard and city square, with flowers carefully lined up along malignantly decorated walls. At last some underlings began to turn up. Several, dragging their feet listlessly, were carrying provisions from the nearby market in large shopping bags. Then, in small, unshaven, whispering groups, the men of science came sauntering through the gate, more slowly and diffidently than their humble assistants, and dispersed down different corridors, scraping the paint off the walls as they passed. Gray-haired, umbrella-carrying schoolboys, stupefied by the pedantic routine and intensely revolting experiments, riveted by starvation wages for their whole adult lives to these little microbe kitchens, there to spend interminable days warming up mixtures of vegetable scrapings, asphyxiated guinea pigs, and other nondescript garbage.
They themselves, when all said and done, were nothing but monstrous old rodents in overcoats. Glory in our time smiles only on the rich, men of science or not. All those plebeians of research had to keep them going was their fear of losing their niches in this heated, illustrious, and compartmented garbage pail. What meant most to them was the title of official scientist, thanks to which the pharmacists of the city still trusted them more or less to analyze, for the most niggardly pay, incidentally, their customers' urine and sputum. The Slimy Wages of Science Arriving in his compartment, the methodic researcher would spend a few moments gazing ritually at the bilious, decaying viscera of last week's rabbit, which was on classic and permanent display in one corner of the room, a putrid font. When the smell became really intolerable, another rabbit would be sacrificed, but not before, because of the fanatic thrift of Professor Jonisset, who was then Secretary General of the Institute. Thanks to his thrift, some of the rotting animals gave rise to unbelievable byproducts and derivatives. It's all a matter of habit. Some of the more practiced laboratory technicians had become so accustomed to the smell of putrefaction that they would have had no objection to cooking in an operational coffin. These modest auxiliaries of exalted scientific research sometimes outdid the thrift of Professor Jonisset himself, taking advantage of the Bunsen burners to cook themselves countless ragouts and other still riskier concoctions. After absently examining the viscera of the ritual guinea pig and rabbit, the men of science slowly proceeded to the second act of their scientific daily life, the smoking of cigarettes. Thus they strove to neutralize the ambient stench and their boredom with tobacco smoke, and managed from butt to butt to get through the day. At five o'clock they put the various putrefactions back in the ramshackle incubator cabinet to keep them warm. Octave, the technician, hid the string beans he had cooked behind a newspaper to get them safely past the concierge. Subterfuges. Taking them home to Gargan, all ready for supper. The man of science, his master, was still writing a little something, diffidently, doubtingly, in one corner of his laboratory book, with a view to a forthcoming and utterly pointless paper that he would feel obliged to present before long to some infinitely impartial and disinterested academy, and that would serve to justify his presence at the Institute and the meager advantages it conferred. A true man of science takes at least twenty years on average to make the great discovery that is, to convince himself that one man's lunacy is not necessarily another man's delight, and that all of us here below are bored with the bees in our neighbor's bonnets. The coldest, most rational scientific madness is also the most intolerable. But when a man has acquired a certain ability to subsist, even rather scantily, in a certain niche with the help of a few grimaces, he must either keep at it or resign himself to dying the death of a guinea pig. Habits are acquired more quickly than courage, especially the habit of filling one's stomach. I ransacked the Institute for Parapine. I'd come all the way from Rancy to see him, so naturally I kept on looking. It was no small order. I made several false starts, hesitating a long while before choosing among so many corridors and doors. Parapine was an old bachelor. He never ate lunch, and I doubt if he ate dinner more than two or three times a week, but then enormously, with the frenzy of the Russian student, all of whose outlandish ways he had retained. Parapine was an undisputed eminence in his special field. He knew all there was to know about typhoid in animals as well as human beings. His reputation went back twenty years to the day when certain German authors claimed to have isolated the Eberthella in the vaginal excreta of an eighteen-month-old girl, so creating an enormous stir in the halls of truth. Only too delighted to take up the challenge in the name of the National Institute, Parapine had outdone those Teutonic braggarts 
by breeding the same microbes, now in its pure form, in the sperm of a 72-year-old invalid. Instantly famous, he managed to hold the limelight for the rest of his life by publishing a few unreadable columns in various medical journals. This he had done without difficulty ever since his day of audacity and good fortune. The serious scientific public trusted him implicitly, and consequently had no need to read him. If those people were to start getting critical, no further progress would be possible. They would spend a whole year over every page. When I came to the door of his cell, Serge Parapin was spitting steady streams into all four corners of his laboratory with a grimace of such disgust that it made you wonder. Parapin shaved now and then, but he always had enough hair on his cheeks to make him look like an escaped convict. He was always shivering, or at least he seemed to be, though he never removed his overcoat, which presented a large assortment of spots and still more of dandruff, which he would scatter far and wide with little flicks of his fingernails, at the same time bringing his always oscillating forelock back into position over his red and green nose. In the course of my laboratory work in medical school, Parapin had given me some instruction in the use of the microscope and had shown me unquestionable kindness on several occasions. I hoped he had not forgotten me completely since those remote days, and that he might consent to give me valuable advice in connection with Bebert, with whose case I was really obsessed. Undoubtedly, I was much more interested in preventing Bebert from dying than if he had been an adult. You never mind very much when an adult passes on. If nothing else, you say to yourself, it's one less stinker on earth. But with a child, you can never be so sure. There's always the future. Once acquainted with my difficulties, Parapin asked nothing better than to help me and to orient my perilous therapy. But unfortunately, in twenty years he had learned so many, so diverse, and so often contradictory things about typhoid, that by that time he was just about unable to formulate any clear and definite opinion concerning that most commonplace ailment and its treatment. First of all, my dear colleague, he said, do you believe in serums, huh? Give me your honest opinion. And vaccines? What do you really think? Some of the best minds today have no use for vaccines at all. That, of course, is a bold way of thinking. Yes, indeed, but even so, in the last analysis, don't you think there's a certain truth in that sort of negativism? The sentences issued from his mouth in terrifying bursts, amid avalanches of tremendous R's. While he was struggling like a lion against other enraged and desperate hypotheses, Jean Essay, the illustrious secretary-general of the Institute, who was still alive at the time, passed our windows frowning superciliously. At the sight of him, Parapin turned, if possible, paler than ever, and abruptly changed the subject in his haste to show me all the disgust aroused in him by the mere daily sight of this jeunesse, who was glorified by just about everyone else. In half a second he disposed of jeunesse as a crook and maniac of the first water, accusing him of enough monstrous, unprecedented, and secret crimes to fill a penal colony for a century. I was powerless to stop Parapin from giving me hundreds of hate-ridden pointers about the clownish trade of medical research, which he was obliged to practice if he wanted to eat. This hatred of his was more precise, more scientific, you might say, than the hatreds emanating from other men occupying similar positions in offices or shops. He spoke in a very loud voice, and I was amazed at his outspokenness. His technician was listening to us. He, too, had finished his bit of cookery and was still moving about, for form's sake, between incubator and test tubes. But he had grown so accustomed to listening to Parapin pouring out his more or less daily maledictions that he had come to regard these tirades, however extravagant, as absolutely academic and meaningless. Certain little private experiments that this technician pursued with great seriousness in one of the laboratory's incubators struck him, on the other hand, as prodigiously and deliciously instructive 
compared to Parapin's outpourings. Parapin's rages in no way tempered his enthusiasm. Before leaving, he tenderly, scrupulously shut the door of the incubator on his private microbes, as if it were a tabernacle. Did you notice that technician of mine, my dear colleague? said Parapin as soon as he had gone. Did you notice that old fool? He's been cleaning up my rubbish for almost thirty years, and all he ever hears people talk about is science, but that most abundantly and sincerely. Well, far from being disgusted, he, unlike everyone else in this whole place, has come to believe in it. After handling my cultures for years, he thinks they're marvelous. He dotes on them. The most meaningless of my buffooneries enchants him. Isn't it the same with all religions? Hasn't the priest stopped believing in God years ago while his sacristan goes on believing, heart and soul? It's sickening. That old fool carries absurdity to the point of aping the dress and goatee of the illustrious Joseph Biodoré. Did you notice? Between you and me, the great Biodoré wasn't so different from my technician, except for his worldwide reputation and the intensity of his manias. That giant of experimental science, with his mania for rinsing his bottles with care— and observing the hatching out of moths in incredible detail has always struck me as monstrously vulgar. Take away his prodigious pettiness, his housekeeping, and I ask you, what's left to admire about the great Biodoré? All right, I'll tell you. The hateful look of a malignant, cantankerous concierge, that's all. In his twenty years of membership in the Academy— he had ample time to exhibit his vile, contemptible character. Nearly everyone hated him. He quarreled, and what quarrels? With just about everyone in sight. The man was an ingenious megalomaniac, nothing more. Parapine was slowly getting ready to leave. I helped him put a scarf around his neck and a sort of mantilla over his eternal dandruff. Then he remembered that I'd come to see him about something precise and urgent. "'My word,' he said. "'Here I've been boring you with my own little problems "'and forgetting your patient. "'Forgive me, colleague, and let's get back to our subject. "'But after all, what can I tell you that you don't already know? "'Among so many shaky theories and questionable experiments, "'reason, in the last analysis, forbids us to choose. "'Just do your best, colleague. "'Since you have to do something, do your best.' Personally, I must tell you in all confidence, the typhoidal infections have come to disgust me beyond all measure, beyond all imagination. When I came to typhoid as a young man, there were only a few of us prospecting the field. We were able to help one another, to advance one another's reputation. While now, what can I say? They pour in from Lapland, my friend, from Peru, more and more every day, Specialists are turning up from all over the world. In Japan, they roll off the assembly line. In less than a few years, I've seen the world become a hotbed of universal and preposterous publications on this same hackneyed subject. To maintain and more or less defend my position, I've resigned myself to writing and rewriting my same little article from Congress to Congress, from journal to journal, throwing in a few subtle, innocuous, and quite tangential modifications toward the end of each season. Believe me, colleague, typhoid in our time is as botched and bungled as the mandolin or banjo. It's maddening. Everyone wants to play some little tune in his own way. I may as well admit it. I haven't the strength to drive myself any more. What I'm looking for to see me through to the end of my days— is some quiet little backwater of research that will bring me neither enemies nor disciples, but only the mediocre celebrity without jealousy, which I sorely need and which I shall gladly content myself. Among other absurdities, I have considered studying the comparative influence of central heating on hemorrhoids in northern and southern countries. What do you think of it? The role of hygiene? Of diet? That kind of thing is fashionable nowadays. Such a study, properly handled and ingeniously dragged out, 
is sure to be favorably received by the Academy, since the majority of its members are old men to whom these problems of heating and hemorrhoids can hardly be indifferent. Look what they've done for cancer, which concerns them so closely. Don't you think the Academy might vote me one of its hygiene awards? Why not? Ten thousand francs? Not bad. Enough for a trip to Venice? Yes, my young friend, I was in Venice once as a young man. Oh, yes, you can starve there just as well as anywhere else, but you breathe a sumptuous aroma of death that's not easy to forget. By then we were out on the street, but had to hurry back for his galoshes, which he'd forgotten. That delayed us. Then we rushed through the streets, but he didn't tell me where we were going. Making our way down the long Rue du Vaugirard, strewn with vegetables and other encumbrances, we approached a square surrounded by chestnut trees and policemen, and we slipped into the back room of a small café, where Parpin sat down at a curtained window. "'Too late,' he moaned. "'They've gone.' "'Who?' "'The little girls from the lycée. "'Some of them are charming.' I know their legs by heart. I ask for nothing more at the end of my day. Let's get out of here. I'll see them another day. I'd have been glad if I'd never have had to go back to Rancy. Since the morning when I'd left it, I'd almost forgotten my daily cares. They were so deeply encrusted in Rancy that they didn't follow me. Perhaps they'd have died of neglect, like Bebert, if I hadn't gone back. They were suburban cares. Even so, on the Rue Bonaparte, reflection came back to me, the gloomy kind, though it's a street that would normally be pleasing to a passerby. Few streets are so smiling and so gracious. But on approaching the Seine I began to worry. I strolled aimlessly about, I couldn't make up my mind to cross the river. Everybody can't be Caesar. Across the bridge on the opposite bank, my troubles would begin. I reserved the right to wait on the left bank until nightfall. At least, I said to myself, I'd be saving a few hours of sunlight. The water lapped against the bank where the fishermen were, and I sat down to watch them. I really was in no hurry at all, no more than they were. I'd pretty well come to the point, the age, you might say, when a man knows what he's losing with every hour that passes. But he hasn't yet built up the wisdom to pull up sharp on the road of time. And anyway, even if you did stop, you wouldn't know what to do without the frenzy for going forward that has possessed you and won your admiration ever since you were young. Even now you're not as pleased with your youth as you used to be, but you don't yet dare admit in public that youth may be nothing more than a hurry to grow old. In the whole of your absurd past, you discover so much that's absurd, so much deceit and credulity, that it might be a good idea to stop being young this minute, to wait for youth to break away from you and pass you by, to watch it going away, receding in the distance, to see all its vanity, run your hand through the empty space it has left behind, take a last look at it, and then start moving. Make sure your youth is really gone, and then calmly, all by yourself, cross to the other side of time to see what people and things really look like. The fishermen on the bank weren't catching anything. They didn't even seem to care very much whether they caught any fish or not. The fish must have known them. They were all just pretending. A fine last glow of sunshine maintained a little warmth around us and sent reflections sprinkled with blue and gold leaping over the water. A cool wind came over to us through the big trees on the far side, a smiling wind blowing through thousands of leaves in gentle gusts, a nice place to be. For two whole hours we stayed there, catching nothing, doing nothing. Then the sun darkened, and the corner of the bridge turned red with the sunset. The people on the quay above had forgotten us as we sat there between the embankment and the water. The night came out from under the arches and climbed along the chateau 
taking the façade and, one by one, the sunset flaming windows. Again, there was nothing I could do but go away. The booksellers on the quay were shutting up their boxes. Are you coming? a woman shouted over the parapet to her fisherman husband beside me, who was putting away his tackle, camp chair, and worms. He grumbled, then the other fisherman grumbled after him, and up we went, all of us grumbling, to the quay. I spoke to his wife, just to be saying something pleasant, before night took everything away. Then and there she wanted to sell me a book. She had forgotten, so she said, to put it away in her box. I let you have it at half price, for next to nothing. A little old Montaigne, absolutely authentic, for one franc. For that little money, I was glad to give her pleasure. I took her Montaigne. Under the bridge, the water looked dark and heavy. I had lost all desire to go anywhere. On the boulevards, I drank a café creme and opened the book she had sold me. I just chanced to open it at a letter Montaigne once wrote to his wife after a son of theirs had died. The passage caught my interest at once, probably because it made me think of Bébert. Roughly, this is what Montaigne says to his wife. Ah, my dear wife, don't eat your heart out. Cheer up. Everything will turn out all right. It always does. And by the way, rummaging through some old papers belonging to a friend of mine, I've just found a letter that Plutarch wrote to his wife under circumstances very similar to ours. That letter, dear wife, struck me as so apt, so much to the point, that I'm sending it on to you. A splendid letter. Well, I won't keep you waiting any longer. Just let me know if it doesn't do a good job of healing your sorrow. Dear wife, I'm sending you Plutarch's fine letter. It's really something. I'm sure you'll like it. Pay close attention, dear wife. Read it carefully. Show it to your friends and read it over. Now my mind is at rest. I'm sure it will set you up. Your devoted husband, Michel. Now that, I said to myself, is a good job. How happy his wife must have been to have a husband like her Michel, who never let anything get him down. Well, it's their business. Maybe we go wrong when we try to judge other people's hearts. Maybe they felt real grief. Period grief. But as far as Bebert was concerned, my day hadn't been so good. I had no luck with Bebert, dead or alive. It seemed to me that there was nothing for him on earth, not even in Montaigne. Maybe, come to think of it, it's the same for everybody. Nothingness. No getting around it. I'd left Rene that morning, and now I had to go back empty-handed. I had absolutely nothing to offer him, or his aunt either. A short stroll around the Place Blanche before going back. I see people all up and down the Rue Le Pic, even more than usual. So I go up there, too, to see what's going on. The crowd was outside a butcher shop. You had to squeeze into the circle to see what was going on. It was a pig, an enormous pig. He was groaning in the middle of the circle, like a man who's being pestered, but louder. The people were tormenting him. They never stopped. They'd twist his ears just to hear him squeal. He'd tug at his rope and try to escape and squirm and wriggle his feet in the air. Other people would poke him and prod him, and he'd bellow even louder with the pain. Everybody was laughing more and more. The pig couldn't manage to hide in the little straw he had. It would fly away when he grunted and puffed into it. He couldn't escape from those people, and he knew it. He kept urinating the whole time, but that didn't help him either, any more than his grunting or bellowing. No hope. Everybody was laughing. The butcher, back in his shop, was exchanging signs and jokes with his customers and gesticulating with a big knife. He was happy, too. He had bought the pig and tied it up as an advertisement. He couldn't have had a better time at his daughter's wedding. 
More people kept arriving at the shop to watch the pig crumpling in big pink folds after every attempt to escape. But that wasn't enough yet. They put a vicious little dog on the pig's back and incited it to jump and snap at the fat, dilated flesh. They were having such a wonderful time that they blocked off the street completely. The police had to come and disperse the crowd. When you get to the top of the Colancourt Bridge at about that hour, you see the first lights of Rancy beyond the great lake of night that covers the cemetery. To get there, you have to go all the way around. It's a long way. You need so much time and so many steps to get around the cemetery to the fortifications, you get the feeling you're going around the night itself. When you get to the port and the toll station, you pass the stinking old office where the little green official is rotting away. The dogs of the zone are at their barking posts. In spite of everything, you see some flowers in the light of a gas lamp. They belong to the flower woman who is always there, waiting for the dead who pass from day to day, from hour to hour. The cemetery, another cemetery next to it, and then the Boulevard de la Revolte, with its street lamps, heading straight into the night. You just turn left and follow it. That was my street. There was really no fear of meeting anyone. Even so, I'd have liked to be somewhere else and far away. I'd also like to be wearing slippers so no one would hear me going in. Yet I was in no way to blame if Bebert wasn't getting better. I had done all I could. I had nothing to reproach myself with. It wasn't my fault if such cases are hopeless. I passed his door, without being noticed, I thought. Upstairs I didn't open the blinds. I looked through the slits to see if there were still people talking outside Bebert's. Some visitors were still coming out of the house, but they didn't look the same as yesterday's visitors. A neighborhood cleaning woman I knew was crying as she left. It looks bad, I said to myself. He's certainly no better. Maybe he's dead, if one of them is in tears already. The day was over. I racked my brains. Was I really not at all to blame? It was cold and still in my place, like a little night just for me in a corner of the big one. Now and then the sound of steps rose up to me, and the echo came in louder and louder, droning, then dying away. Silence. I looked out again to see if anything was happening across the way. Nothing was happening except inside me, still asking myself the same questions. I was so tired from walking and finding nothing that I finally fell asleep in my coffin, my private night.